a guy with dark hair, covered in bruises and bruises, wakes up and wonders how long he was unconscious. He thought about how tomorrow was his first day at university, and he couldn't be late. Hanging upside down with a rope, he opened one eye and remembered that they had taken him to a vacant lot and beaten him so badly that he lost consciousness. So he was suspended from a tree. There are several guys standing in front of him with malicious smiles. A guy with pink hair slicked back said that he was unlucky to be a classmate of such trash at school, but he couldn't even imagine that it would happen again at university. The main character thought that they were not planning to let him down. Throwing the blue notebook back, the pink-haired guy told Lin C that he was tough enough for an orphan. He said he was constantly beating him up at school, and he never died. Lin Kue thought about the fact that this guy's name was Hai Gu, and he was a former classmate, or rather a bully. Hai Gu, with a wicked grin, told him that he had seen his character in the game and he looked cool. He guessed that Ling Si was so shabby in reality that he thought he would be a pretty boy in the game at least. Hai Gu's eyes opened wide, and after saying that the mere sight of him annoyed him when he saw him, he punched him in the chest. Ling Kue coughed up blood and thought about how he had been clinging to it ever since he accidentally bumped into it at school, and it was useless to apologize. Hai Gu chuckled viciously. Frowning, the protagonist thought that there was no point in asking for mercy from people like him. He asked who had allowed him to become an awakened one. The awakened one is a symbol of humanity's second evolution. Under the influence of the growing popularity of the game Sky Valley, players who reach the maximum level faster than others get the opportunity to make the game their profession. Thanks to this, their in-game skills are transferred to real life. This is the second evolution, the awakening. The younger and stronger the awakened, the more valuable they are to the state. With their superiority over ordinary people and their special privileges in everyday life and education, the awakened become the top of the elite. Hai Gu mockingly shook his hand and said that he had smeared his hand with the blood of trash. The two guys next to him looked at Ling Si in surprise, and one of them said that if he continued to beat him up, he might die. With a threatening expression, Hai Gu turned to him and asked if he felt sorry for him. The guy said in a frightened voice that he was just afraid that if he really died, he might have problems. Hai Gu asked if he thought that if such squalor died, it would somehow affect him, the elite. Lin Si was hanging upside down in front of them, bleeding profusely. Another guy noticed the main character's gaze. Lin Si's eyes were calm. Hai Gu was angry, the veins on his face bulging. He shouted that this was what he hated most about him. The Hai Gu skill is a battle cry. Effect, the power of the battle cry hits the opponent's body and mind. The sound wave from Hai Gu's head rocked the hanging Lin Si. He shouted at him to admit that he was trash. Glaring furiously at him, he asked why he could see the steadfastness in his eyes. He shouted that he was an awakened one and asked who he thought he was. Blood gushed out of Ling Si's mouth and he thought that if he had the chance to become an awakened person, it would be different. One of the guys said it was getting late and it was time to go. The sun began to set over the city, turning the buildings orange. Hai Gu said it was boring and he didn't even warm up. He added that he would hit him even harder next time. One of the guys started talking about what would happen if they didn't untie him. Hai Gu shouted that he wasn't finished yet and threatened that if he interrupted him, he would hang him up as well. Ling Kue hangs from the tree by his feet and thinks that if only he could start over, it would be great. He thought about how that wouldn't happen. Late evening, residential building. Lin Si gets out of the shower, wiping her head with a towel. His body is covered in bruises and abrasions. He looked at the helmet lying on the table with its wires and glowing screens. After entering the game, Lin Si, as his white-haired game character, shook his head and thought about how he wouldn't be ranked in the top 100 thieves. He walked forward, surrounded by trees, with his head down, and thought about the fact that the intimidating top of the battle power can also not be talked about. He thought that if he had another chance, perhaps he would also become an awakened one. A muscular guy in armor turned to the girl and said that for such quests, you don't need to ask for help from outsiders, and they can call their clan for help. A girl with light pink hair, wearing a dark blue robe, was standing with a purple book hovering over her hand. She retorted with a worried face and said that if she hadn't met him, she would have already joined the other player's group. She said that she didn't want to use the clan's help, and besides, she had already taken advantage of his offer and hired other players. Lin Si is lying on the bed, wearing a diving helmet. A blue circle appeared on his helmet. Sky Valley, the main city of Kasva. The name of the main character in the game, as in life, is Lin Si. He is a maximum level 120 thief. He is standing in front of the blue table of players. Lin Si considers himself a talented player, but unfortunately, he started playing a year later than others and because of this, in many ways he is inferior to those who play longer. Looking up, Lin Si said that he had barely obtained the legendary dagger yesterday, but his rank in the thieves' table had only dropped. Looking at the player table, he said that they were lucky enough to find good items in an uncharted cave or they were helped by high-level players. The main character said that he is now ranked 3,960,000. Flipping through the screen with his hand, Lin Si frowned. 
from 2061 to 2062, he spent an entire year to get into the top 100,000 players of his class. Perhaps this would be a great achievement for another player. On the first page of the top 100 players on Thief, there must be gods. The armored man smiled awkwardly, scratched his head, and told the girl that as a bodyguard, he was responsible for her safety, and there were a lot of crooks and people with bad intentions in Paradise Valley. Opening one eye slightly, the girl replied that she was not a child and could recognize such things. He asked if he had spent a lot to hire the three behind them. The man replied that it was, and said that there was one thief, and most likely this one is the one who is standing near the teleport. Lindsay turned to them and introduced himself with his hand on his chest. He said he was a level 120 ghost thief, and they hired him. The grim-faced man said he didn't have to introduce himself because they'd seen his message. He told him that he was only here to fill out the group, and his job was just not to slow them down. Lin Kuei glared at him gloomily and thought about how he didn't really like to talk in reality. He wondered why some people didn't know how to watch their tongues. The man was frowning at him. A hooded girl with animal ears and a face wrapped in bandages told Lin Si that she had heard that he wasn't a member of any class, not even the Union of All Clans. The main character replied that he was a solo player. The Union of All Classes is a gathering place for the best players, an organization that passes any quests and fulfills all possible requirements for money. Lin Si's skills have long been sufficient to join the Union, but he can't afford the entry fee, and he needs to withdraw money from the game to make a living. A woman with a bow, dressed in armor and a green hooded cloak, said it was loners like him who scared her the most. They explained that he has no qualifications and no guarantees, and it is possible that he is here by accident. Ling Kuei replied indifferently. The archer gritted her teeth in exasperation and asked who he thought he was. The blonde-haired girl asked them to calm down and not fight, and said that since they were all there, they should start the quest. She thought about how things had gone wrong before the quest even started, and wondered if everything was going to be okay. The man jerked his thumb at himself and grinned, saying that she had no reason to worry because he was here. They announced that the group was assembled and it was time for them to teleport. They told Lin Si that he would go first. Frowning, he entered the portal. The tower of levitating rectangular figures glowed with a bright blue light. Bolts of blue energy enveloped everything. The surprised group asks what's going on and why the teleport field is so strange. They ask what's the matter, looking at the brightly glowing teleport. The girl with a worried face said that this had never happened before. She assumed that it was a system error and said that Lin Si had already logged in. Lin Si stands surrounded by a bright blue energy. He asked where he was and said that he was supposed to teleport to the quest location. He assumed it was some kind of mistake. Looking around in surprise, he noticed that the teleport's energy was very chaotic. He noticed that his body was wrapped in blue rectangles. He was surprised to find that his body was disintegrating. Lin Si presses the exit button unsuccessfully and assumes that the game is broken. Blue rectangles wrapped around his arm, and he realized that his body was disappearing. Chuckling bitterly, he thought about how unlucky he was to encounter such a bug. He asked if there was anything in his life that should be expected at all. Narrowing his eyes, he asked me to quickly erase it. As he half disappeared, he noticed that, despite everything, it was getting very quiet inside. He asked why. The main character thought that he was feeling calm. Chuckling, he said it didn't matter. He said he was tired and wanted to be erased in reality as well. He thought that in any case, he didn't have anything to live for, and he had too many regrets. Looking at the teleport, the man noticed that Lin Si still hadn't come out. He frowned thoughtfully. The man looked at the dialogue box in surprise. He noticed that Lin Si's account was also missing. Opening his eyes, the protagonist saw a yellow lamp in front of him and wondered if he had returned. Stretching his arm out in front of him, he thought about why his arm was so long. He assumed they were hallucinations. Sitting up, he said that something was wrong and thought that his body was very strange. He noticed a mirror nearby. Looking at it, he saw the face of his game character. He asked in surprise if he was in the game. The white-haired man with a receding hairline noticed that Lin Si was awake. Lin Si asked who he was in a frightened voice. He realized that this was real. The man asked if it had scared him. He noted that he didn't seem to remember anything. He said he found it in an alley when he was picking up meat. He immediately corrected himself and said that he found it while throwing out the trash. Lin Si asked worriedly where they were now. Pouring something into a bowl with a ladle, the man replied that they were in his home. He said that Lin Kue had been unconscious for a day and should be hungry. He told him to get some food. The main character asked what had happened. A TV with a non-working image said that Sky Valley, a new game launched in several countries, was released three months ago. Lin Si frowned and glanced at the TV. The voice on the TV said that since the very beginning of its launch, this game has attracted a myriad of players, 
and their number is breaking all historical records. The main character drew attention to the fact that the Sky Valley was launched three months ago. The voice on TV announced that this will be the biggest event of 2060 and encouraged people to connect to the Paradise Valley and make their dreams come true. Lin Kuo was surprised to think that the year 2060 was three years ago. He turned to her and asked her what year it was. He replied that, as they said on TV, it is now 2060. He asked if he was mad from hunger. Lin Kuo was shocked to think that he had returned to three years ago and whether the sky had heard his pleas. He realized that he really got a chance to start over. The man asked if he was okay. Lin Kuo was sitting with his back to him, shaking and laughing. Grinning, he replied that he felt better than fine. He thought that this time, he had goals to get into the top 100 and become godlike like those players. Become the strongest awakened. Create your own guild. Frowning, he looked resolutely ahead. Lin Si is sitting at the table, eating the contents of a bowl. The man shouted at him to eat slowly. Chuckling, he told him not to rush because there was more in the pot. The main character with meat in his mouth and a bowl in his hand reached for the bread and said that when he woke up, he realized that he was very hungry. Turning away, the man said that he would give him supplements now. As he helped himself to a plate, he asked if he was all alone. Lin Si lowered his eyes sadly. His hands stopped moving and he thought that when he went back in time, he realized that he was always alone. He thought that he didn't know where his parents were and that they might have been dead for a long time. He remembered walking through a snowy alley surrounded by couples and families. Lin Si thought that he didn't really care about them, though. He replied with a grim look that he was alone. The man paused for a moment and told him to come here from time to time, even though he didn't understand what this place was yet. Looking back at the black bags in the corner of the room, Lin Si noted the local surroundings. He assumed it was a slum. Not far from the city's skyscrapers are battered buildings covered with cracks. A man with a sad face added that it is also a shelter for people who cannot survive in a neighboring city. He said it was a place where the poor gathered. Lin Kui remembered that in his previous life, he could rely on a scholarship and savings from part-time work, so he rented a room in a cheap dorm nearby. The man reminded me of a game that had just been advertised on TV. He said that someone spent all their savings a while ago to get a gaming helmet and couldn't calm down because they wanted to buy it. The man looked up and said that it was his son who had passed away not long ago. He said that his son had told him that there was a new game called Sky Valley, and if he became an awakened one, he could make them happy and said that he was sure that he would make a name for himself in this game. The man said that he really wanted to help get out of here. He asked how it was possible to change reality so easily thanks to the game. He added that he was naive. Lin Si said that it was indeed possible. Hearing his words, the man glanced at him. Lin Kui rested his hand on the back of the chair and said that becoming an awakened person could change your life dramatically. He said it wasn't a normal game. Frowning, the protagonist said that his son wasn't lying, and that it wasn't an exaggeration to say that the Sky Valley was their second world in the future. Tears welled up in the man's eyes, and he remembered his son's words that he would definitely make him happy. He said that the way he talks to him about the seriousness of the game reminds him of his son. Chuckling, he thanked him. He smilingly told Lin Si that he seemed to still be studying. He offered to let him live here if he had nowhere else to go. The main character opened his mouth in surprise and thanked him. The man said that he had something for him, and it was useless to keep it, because his son was no longer there. The main character was clearing the plates from the table. The man handed him a gaming helmet. Lin Si's eyes rolled, and he realized that it was a first-generation helmet. The man said that his son no longer needs this thing that would make his dreams come true, and it will finally stop collecting dust. He asked the main character if he would let his son's dream live. Lin Si seriously told him not to worry. Frowning, he said that not only would he continue his son's dream, but he would also surpass it. He took the helmet out of his hands. He decided to start now and put the helmet on his head. The dialogue boxes say, create a character. You have chosen a name, Lin Si. Choose your race and class, human. Lin Si thought that playing as a human was more comfortable. The dialogue box describes the people as indigenous people of the valley. They have balanced physical qualities and amazing wisdom. Wisdom is a weapon that people can be proud of. Humans additionally have three wisdom points and three perception points. Each level up increases wisdom and perception by one extra point. Lin Kue, looking at the elf's images, thought that he had never really liked elven ears. The dialogue box described the elves, translated as the noblest race. They have an elegant and refined appearance, a flexible body, possess ranged and melee weapons, as well as an additional three points of dexterity and three points of charm. Each level up increases agility and charm by one extra point. The dialogue box describes orcs, a warrior race known for its strength. They have explosive power and a strong body. They can withstand a large number of attacks. They have an additional three points of strength and three points of defense, and each level up adds an additional one point of strength and defense. Lin Kue thought about who he should choose. The advantages of different races can have a certain impact on the choice of occupation. 
There are five main classes, Warrior, Mage, Archer, Thief, and Priest. Thieves has three branches of improvements, a Shadow Thief that is human and capable of covertly killing, a Thief who is an elf is good at speed and agility. If you choose an Orc, then such a Thief will be good in attacks and confrontations. Ling Kui decided to choose a person because he had played as a Shadow Thief in the past, and one shouldn't waste the past life's experience. The dialog box says, you have chosen a male person, class, thief. You have acquired basic active skills, backstabbing. You have 12 extra points, and you want to allocate them to your stats. Ling Kue thought about the fact that the first level gave 12 extra points, but in his previous life, he had entered into cooperation with recommendations. In front of him was a dialog box with stats, strength, perception, defense, agility, wisdom, charm. The main character clicked on the confirmation button. He decided that he wanted to be agile in this life so that he could level up faster. The dialogue box announced that the distribution of skills was complete and he was given clothes for human race thieves. Ling Kue, who was wearing black clothes, was shrouded in light and blue rectangles. The dialogue boxes started counting down from 5 to 1. A white city with large blue crystals and a castle. The main city of people is Kasva. The dialogue box says, Welcome to the Heavenly Valley, Lin Si. Shrouded in the blue light, the protagonist thought that he was here again. He thought about how in his previous life, he started playing a year after the game was released, and this time, he would take advantage of this opportunity. Lin Si found himself in a crowd of people. He looked around. People kept coming out of the teleport, and the crowd in front of it was noisy. Lin Si thought about how it had only been three months since the server was opened, and there were already so many people here. Opening the dialogue boxes, he decided that he needed to hurry up and make a plan. He decided to see who had the highest level right now. He opened his eyes in surprise. In the first place was Dark Scar, a level 12 warrior. Dark Scar is a player who hides his personal information. No one knows the details of his identity, he does not join any guild. At the same time, he is a person who was invited by all the guilds and is revered as the emperor of the people and the strongest player in the Heavenly Valley. Ling Kue folded his arms and said that the Dark Scar in his previous life was always at the top of the list. He added that a professional is always a professional. With a frown, the main character said that almost all the players from the past life's top are in the current top, and some legendary guilds from the past have only recently appeared. He decided that he needed to hurry. Ling Kue waved his cloak and thought that in this lifetime, he would use experience and become an invincible player that no one could match. As he approached the teleport, he thought that he would become the strongest thief with peerless speed, and he would be like a god in the flesh. Frowning, he thought that he would be the first awakened one. As he entered the light of the portal, he decided to begin his ascent. Monsters fly over the village. Ling Kue walked into the village from the portal and thought that although he had visited this village many times in his past life, every time he was here, he was surprised by the popularity of this place. Novice village in the main town of Kasva. The main character is standing on a busy street. One person is shouting about selling equipment for beginners. The second one asks if there is an automatic navigation for missions. Another says that they are teaming up to clean up monsters and asks those interested to respond. Another person asks if there is a kind-hearted person, which will show you the way. A muscular man, above whom the fourth level is visible, surrounded by people, tells the first level beginners that they all have one starting silver coin and he has weapons and equipment for the first level. He announced with a smile that these items were much better than the standard ones and they would level up much faster. He told them to hurry because they wouldn't be available again. Above his palm was a yellow dialogue box with a payment confirmation button. Lin Si glanced at the crowd. One person asks if the vendor has armor for the warrior and says it would be nice to have some more protection. Another person asks if there is a staff for the magician. Another asks if he has a priest's robe to increase his wisdom and mana. The salesman replied that he had everything and told them to go through one at a time. Ling Si thought about how in his previous life, he had also spent dozens of copper coins to buy level 1 thieves daggers, which had two more attacks than a beginner's dagger. The main character recalled how he looked at the newly acquired dagger with a glint in his eyes. Touching his forehead with two fingers, he thought that now that he thought about it, he realized how stupid he was. The seller happily announced the sale. Ling Si closed his eyes and thought that this equipment can be obtained on the third level map, and such businessmen mostly deal only with beginners whose upgrade they don't care much about, and after the third level they disappear. The main character continues to walk down the street, thinking that an early upgrade is not difficult. Village. After a player's level exceeds the fifth, they will no longer be able to enter here unless there is a special mission. Ling Si thought that it was better to hurry up and level up. He opened his eyes and saw a level one elf with pink hair asking someone to bring her along. She said she would be obedient. The guy laughed in response, saying that he would definitely take such a cute elf with him. Another level 1 guy from the crowd shouted if they could add him as well, adding that he would also be an obedient fighter. 
The elf asked them to add it if they had room and thanked them with a smile. Ling Kue crossed his arms and thought that the third and fourth level players were especially popular here, and the top level, the fifth level of the novice village, was even more like a boss. A level 5 guy wearing a wizard's hat looked menacingly at the person in front of him and said that he would transfer them to the third level for at least three coins. In the valley, players can form a group at the first level if the difference in levels within the team does not exceed the second level, so advanced players for cleaning monsters in a novice group are common. In the dialogue box of the team management panel, it says, the limit of the current team captain is three people. Players of the first level can form teams with players up to the third level, and the maximum number of players depends on the level of the captain. Frowning, the main character thought that the main reason advanced players showed up in newbie monster cleaning groups was because there were too many missions for newbies. The monster is lying on the ground, dead. Above his head is written, update. Ling Kue thought of the first level crowd queuing up to kill mobs. One person in the queue says that the update time is too long. Another says that his task is simply to kill this monster and asks him to let go. Another one says that this monster is about to upgrade. People behind us are arguing for a place in the queue. There is no fixed storyline in the valley, and countless quests are decided by your own choice. What is most important for the player is to explore the world and develop the character. Leveling up at an early stage is not difficult, the only difficulty is killing monsters, so leveling up is slow. Lin Si is standing next to a road sign. Grinning, he thought that he had a way to quickly reach the fifth level. Shopping Street Ling Si said that there was a rookie shop here. Four people are standing in front of a shop counter, discussing a cute NPC girl. Lin Si came over and asked to be allowed to pass. The purple-haired guy walked away and asked what level 1 players were doing here. A merchant with dark skin, purple hair, blue eyes and a tattoo with a bag of money on her arm asked the main character what he needed. Ling Si said hello and asked for a scroll of initial acceleration and a one-time hook claw. The dark-haired guy laughed and said, another stupid newbie. The purple-haired guy mockingly asked if he could level up easily by playing as a thief and buying an acceleration scroll. Laughing, he said that he thought he was playing at level 999 with only one dagger. He added that these two things appear to have exhausted his initial funds. The guy reached out with a sneer and said it's better to give them to him and he will take him to the next level. The merchant handed him a scroll of initial acceleration and a one-time claw hook. The dialog box described the initial acceleration scroll. Level to use, any. Item type, auxiliary. Effect, increases your movement speed by 12% for 9 seconds. Players can only activate one acceleration scroll at a time. 30 copper coins, one-time use. The dialog box described a one-time hook claw. Level to use, any. Item type, auxiliary. Effect, the hook's claw can grip the protrusion and achieve redisplacement. The length of the hook's claw is 3 meters. You can use it every 30 seconds. 60 copper coins, one-time use. A dialog box announced that items had been added to the inventory. The merchant clapped her hands with a smile and announced that it was worth 90 copper coins. She waved after the main character, wishing him well. Lin Si raised his hand without turning around and thanked him. The purple-haired guy pointed an irritated finger at him, saying that he was a fool and didn't even listen to them. The dark-haired guy mockingly told the protagonist to hurry up, calling him a level 1 fool. Ling Kue asked them how long it had taken them to reach their current level. The purple-haired guy replied irritably that he had spent 15 days to get the third level. He asked if he thought it was so easy for a newbie to kill monsters. The guy in the helmet replied that he had reached the third level in 13 days, 4 days per level. He said that his speed was not bad, because many people stay at the first level even for 10 days. Turning around, Ling Kue calmly said that he understood everything, and they would still be in the novice village in the next day or two. They looked at him in disbelief and the purple-haired guy asked irritably what he meant. The main character waved his hand and said that they would see each other in a day. The sun is setting on the village. He thought that they would soon understand. Lin Si goes to the rock and says that he remembers that it is here. Sunset over the mountains of the main city of Kasva. Sunset Peak, located in the northeast of the main city of Kasva, is magnificent and continuous. It's called Sunset Peak because the peak rushes straight up into the sky and seems to connect with the sky and earth so that even the sun doesn't touch the edge. The main character looks up, shielding his eyes from the light with his hand. Looking around, he thought that there would be fewer people here because there were fewer missions in the initial stages. Ling Kue grinned and thought that there were fewer people, so there was no chatter and he could level up comfortably. He noticed a group of people at the side. The guy with the short brown hair says he's accepted the mission too, and it seems the conversation automatically starts the quest. The guy with the elf ears replied that he had talked to an NPC named Old Man at sunset. The short-haired guy replied that it was unknown what this NPC wanted. He said the conversation triggers a 10-minute time-limited task. 
He wondered how they could reach the top of the peak in 10 minutes. The hooded guy with animal ears said that it couldn't be done in 20 minutes, let alone 10 minutes. He added that everyone's level is low right now, and the speed bonus is too low. He said that the first half of the mountain is fine and there is a road there, and there is a rift halfway up, so they need to go around the other side to continue climbing. He said that the passage will take at least 6 minutes, and if there is no road, it will be even more difficult to climb. The pink-haired elf agreed with tears in her eyes that if you didn't get around it, you would become a puddle. Waving her arms, she said that she also jumped once, thinking that there would be some hidden platform, but just fell to her death. The guys furiously shouted that this mission was disgusting, asking who allowed this beautiful girl to cry. She told them that their entire team had done this task, but failed and broke up. They told her not to worry and that they would take her to another place to level up. She agreed. Ling Kui grinned as he closed his eyes. It stands in front of the peak, with a dialogue box in front of it. He said that the access point to the mission should be here somewhere. Lin Si heard a footstep and turned around. A man in a white hoodie was asking if anyone wanted to see the view from the top of the mountain. A guy with gray hair walked past, saying it was a waste of time. He saw that the elderly man with a white beard and a white robe was the old man at sunset. The old man asked again if anyone wanted to see the view from the top of the mountain. Lin Si greeted him politely. The old man asked if he wanted to see the scenery. The main character agreed with a smile and said, just came to admire the scenery at the top of the mountain. The group of people noticed that Lin Si was talking to the old man. The elf-eared guy asked if this was the level 1 thief that just passed through. The short-haired guy asked why a level 1 thief also took on this task and if he was stupid. He said with a smirk that it was because he had heard others say that there was a special task here, so he came to take it on. He added that there is nothing to say about his level and strength and said that there really are brainless players everywhere. The elf exclaimed in displeasure that this kind of task can only be completed at a high level and instead of wasting time, it's better to fight monsters fairly and improve. She said she was sorry for her death and the time she had wasted. The elf-eared guy with a smirk suggested waiting until he looked like a fool after failing the mission. Lin Si stands with one hand on the ground, shrouded in purple light. The system notification says, request from the old man at sunset, do you accept the mission of climbing to the top? The time limit is 10 minutes, and the countdown starts after the request is accepted. The main character thought that he had all 12 points in the skill of dexterity, just for this task. He decided to try to maximize his physical agility and speed bonus this time. Frowning, he thought that this was a special mission, and in his previous life, he had tried to complete it countless times, but in the end, he gave up. He thought that if he succeeded, he would get special equipment. He slapped his hand on the dialogue box and decided that this would be his first step to success. He accepted the task. The dialogue box reported that it accepted the request. Frowning, he told the old man to wait for them to see each other at the top. The old man looked on calmly. The dialogue box indicates that the countdown has started. Lin Si rushed forward. He thought about how he was here to win. A frog-like monster is drinking water from the lake. Noticing the disturbance in the water, he glanced up and saw Lin Si moving in quick leaps. The dialogue box says that there are 9 minutes and 58 seconds left. The main character quickly climbed the rocks with jumps. The elf exclaimed that he had taken up the task. The short-haired guy chuckled. The elf-eared guy laughed and said that he was looking forward to seeing him fail the mission. The guy with the short hair said that they would soon see him fail. When he heard the exclamation, he asked what was the matter. Pointing his finger at the serpentine, the guy said that he did not run along the serpentine, but went into the forest thicket. Lin Si quickly runs into the forest thicket. He thought that the serpentine was safe and convenient, but it was also winding and difficult to pass. He reasoned that a straight path between two points is the shortest, and a path along a serpentine will be several times the distance between two points. Frowning, he thought that the reason why no one walks in the undeveloped forests is because the system randomly creates monsters in the dense forest. A big mouth grass monster. Ling Kue thought about how in his previous life, he had learned the fastest way to the top for a thief and had run this road countless times, and these big mouth grass monsters are the secret solution to quickly reach the top. Several large mouth grass monsters leaped out of the bushes. One of them lunged at the main character, opening its mouth wide. The dialogue box described big mouth grass monsters, the most common annoying little monsters in the mountain thicket. Although they don't pose much of a threat to passersby, if there are a lot of them, they will become a headache. The outline of a dagger appeared in Lin Si's hand. He ran towards the monster, activating the backstab skill. Lin Si was enveloped in yellow lightning. The dialogue box described the skill, one of the main skills of a thief. Instantly appear on the enemy's back and defeat their weak spot. Damage, deals power damage plus weapon damage when the skill is completed. 
Consumption, 30 mana. Range of action, 1 meter. Cooldown time, 20 seconds. Lin Si stabbed the dagger behind the monster's back, and an inscription appeared above the monster's head stating that it had taken 13 points of damage. The dialog box reported that the backstab was 80% complete. The main character, grinning, thought that this was the main point of his ascent. The dialog box says that there are 9 minutes and 40 seconds left. Ling Kue decided to cut down on the passing time by throwing backstabs. He was running towards the monsters coming out of the bushes. The dialogue box says that there are 9 minutes and 30 seconds left. The dialogue box says, You have caused a lot of hatred among the big mouth grass monsters. Many monsters behind the main character rushed at him in an attack. The dialogue box says that there are 9 minutes and 20 seconds left. Lin Si noticed with a smile that the backstab was ready to be used again. He stabbed the monster in the back with his dagger, shouting for the others to come out to him. Lin Si continues to stab you in the back every 20 seconds. The guy asked his group how long Lin Si could last. He said that he chose the forest thicket and so would definitely encounter many monsters along the way. The elf raised her index finger and said with a smile that she didn't think it would last a minute. The boys looked at her, fascinated. The guy in the green hood said she was very smart. Another guy said that he thought that surrounded by grass monsters, Lin Si would die in just three seconds. They laughed, calling him stupid. The dialogue box says that there are six minutes and thirty seconds left. Lin Kue grabbed a tree branch with his hand, jumping on them. He thought that it attracted a lot of grass monsters. There were a huge number of monsters below. Frowning, the protagonist thought that the next location was the Sunset Peak Rift. While jumping in the air, he thought that he must be on the other side. In front of him was a huge rift in the rock. Ling Kue landed on a cliff and thought that it would take at least 10 minutes to reach the other side of the mountain. He stands on the edge of a cliff and thinks that if he crosses the rift, the top of the mountain will be right in front of him. The dialogue box says that there are 6 minutes and 10 seconds left. Looking around, he thought that there must be a nest of grass monsters near the rift. He looked straight ahead. In front of the main character was a primitive wooden structure under which there were many grass monsters. After discovering a nest of grass monsters, he said that it was time for the claw hooks and acceleration scroll. The dialogue box says, you have activated the initial acceleration scroll. Duration, 9 seconds. Frowning, Lin Si shouted, backstab. The grass monster opened its eyes in surprise. Behind the monster, who was looking at him in disbelief, was the main character with a hook and dagger in his hands. He shouted to them to take him to the top. He stabbed the monster with his dagger. Stepping on the monster, the main character jumped up from it, stretching his hand forward. Monsters leaped up, trying to reach him. Ling Kue thought that his speed was fast enough and he would definitely be able to cross the fog. He jumps through the fog, reaching out his hand, and thinks that this stump of rock solves everything. He threw the hook forward and shouted that this distance would allow him to take off. He gritted his teeth, and the hook caught on a log sticking out of the rock and sent him flying up. As he neared the edge of the cliff, he thought it was the last step left. A grass monster was standing at the edge of the cliff. When Ling Kue saw him, he grinned, wrapped in yellow energy, and held out his dagger. The dialogue box says that there are 5 minutes and 30 seconds left. The sun sets over the sea. The dialogue box says that there are 5 minutes and 20 seconds left. The main character flew up over the rock. He looked ahead. The dialogue box says that there are 5 minutes and 17 seconds left. Lin Si landed on a rock. The dialogue box congratulated him. The dialogue box says that the mountain climbing task was completed in 4 minutes and 43 seconds. The old man said that it was unexpected that he reached the top of the mountain in less than half the time. He smiled and told him that he had dashed through the fog and reached the top, and there was a lot of courage and determination in him. Lin Si smiled and asked how he would have been able to reach the top of the mountain if he didn't have the determination to go there in this lifetime. They stand on the top of a mountain. The old man said he was an interesting young man. A gust of wind lifted the hood from his head. The main character looked at him in surprise. The old man crossed his muscular arms over his chest and said that he was able to master the power of a brilliant skill. The dialogue box says, since it took you less than five minutes to complete the quest, you have opened the secret mission of the Elder of the Mountain, a certificate of mastery. Lin Si was surprised. Glancing at the old man who was walking towards him, he thought that he didn't even think that he would be given a secret quest. The old man put his hand on his chest and said with a smile that his determination reminded him of how he was in the past. He handed him the item in his hand and told him that he was confident to the point of insanity and thought he was going to be king. Lin Kue took the item from his hand and looked at it in surprise. The dialogue box described a certificate of mastery covered in dust. Covered in dust, the certificate conceals mysterious stories and journeys. Great people have polished it with their experience, and it will finally regain its former glory. In his hand was a small metal object with folded golden wings. Ling Kue was looking down, shrouded in yellow light from below. 
The dialog box says, congratulations on opening the Master's Path secret mission. Find hints to explore the secrets behind the icon. Task progress, 0%. Frowning, he noticed that there were no specific instructions and assumed that this was a research mission. He thought that he hadn't heard of this quest in the past, so he had no idea what it was. The old man said that it was a reward only available at the peak of your career, and that he was pleased with his determination. A large purple dialogue box with images of items appeared in front of the main character. The dialogue box says, Master's suit, special equipment for the mission of climbing to the top. Basic attributes of the costume, Master's power, deals 1000% damage to all monsters of the 5th level and below. Master's body, wild monsters of the 5th level and below can only deal you 1 point of damage per attack. The name of the costume automatically disappears on the 5th level, along with the attached attributes, and cannot be worn together with other equipment. Lin Si was delighted. The dialog box asked if he wanted to equip the suit. The main character confirmed. After passing through the purple rectangle, Lin Si was wearing a white light armor. He grinned. The old man with the hood removed from his head said that his mission here was accomplished. Lin Si asked him who he was. He thought that he was obviously not simple. The old man looked at him and said that they would meet again if his resolve didn't leave him at the top. Lin Kue was surprised to hear his words. Putting his hand on his shoulder, the old man said that he would take him to the people who were standing at the foot of the mountain and they would witness his return from the top. With a single bound, they headed from the top of the mountain to the bottom of it. The elf put her hands on her waist and said with displeasure that it had been a long time and he still hadn't come down. The guy with the short hair laughed and assumed that he had already failed the task and ran around, afraid of the shame. The guy with the elf ears agreed and offered to take her to a good place to level up. The guy in the green hood noticed something and asked what it was. Something glittered in the sky. It landed in front of them, hitting the ground hard, and they asked what was going on. A guy with short hair asked if it was a monster while looking into a cloud of dust. The elf girl snuggled up to one of the guys and assumed it was a game bug. She opened her eyes in surprise, and the old man and Lin Si were standing in front of them. The main character was leaning on his hand on the ground, and the old man was standing straight with his arms crossed over his chest. They recognized him as a level 1 thief. Lin Si looked at them with a serious face. A crowd of people looks at the scattering cloud of dust. A man in the crowd asks if these two are NPCs. Another asked if he had completed the mission of climbing to the top. The elf said with displeasure that it was the same noob thief. A voice in the crowd asked how this was possible and how he did it. The elf's eyes glittered and he corrected himself, calling him little brother. Another voice in the crowd asked where he got the equipment. Ling Kue, clad in white armor, walks forward amidst a scattering cloud of dust. Someone in the crowd suggested that it was a reward for completing a mission. Another person was surprised that he received such equipment at the first level. Another person in the crowd said that he didn't expect this mission to have such equipment. Another person said that he also wants to do this. An old man and the main character stand surrounded by a crowd. Lin Kue thought that this caused a commotion. They were standing in the crater left by their landing, and he wondered how such a return could not attract attention. He scratched his head, puzzled. The old man said he would keep it now. Ling Kue thought about how he would have to deal with these people on his own and politely thanked the old man. He thought about how he could only answer as the system suggested. The old man smiled and held out a hand that was shrouded in yellow energy. Lin Si looked at him in surprise. A guy with short hair exclaimed that it was a special portal. He frowned and asked what kind of NPC this was. After all, he thought this old man was an ordinary NPC. The guy opened his eyes wide and asked if the main character was wearing any equipment from the unique quest. The elf frowned and asked what the unique quest was. The guy replied that there were three types of quests in the Sky Valley. The first one is a reward quest. Dungeons are quests that players often receive. Rewards usually include experience, currency, items, skills, or equipment. The second is an adventure quest. Players encounter unusual NPCs or special information, as well as travel to special locations. The player is rewarded with additional skills or special equipment. The third is a unique quest. When someone completes such a quest, it will disappear forever and other players will not be able to complete it. Each mode also has two forms of passing, a single quest and a team quest. In addition to the individual quest, the difficulty of which is fixed, the other two types of missions have five difficulty options, low level, medium level, high level, special level, crazy level. The bright-eyed elf said that it was no wonder the equipment on him looked really nice. Turning around, the old man told the protagonist that he hoped that they could meet again in the future if the protagonist still went on a glorious journey. Holding out his hand, Ling Kue wanted to ask about the mission of the Proof of Mastery. The old man said goodbye with a smile and entered the yellow portal. The dialog box notifies you of the quest update. The portal closed in front of Lin Si, and he thought that the old man had called him a great candidate. The dialogue box says, Path to Glory, Quest Update, What is a Great Candidate, What was the Old Man Talking About? 
What is the connection here with the ancient evidence of mastery? Find information about a great candidate to open up a new uncharted path. Task completion, 5%. Quest type, unique quest. Quest difficulty, unknown. After noticing that the difficulty was unknown, Lin Si wondered if the quest required a certain level. Closing his eyes and frowning, the protagonist decided that it was more important for him to raise his level now. The elf crept up behind him quietly. She called out to him, and Lin Si opened his eyes. He found a female elf standing right in front of him, telling him how cool he was. He asked in surprise if something had happened. She asked what kind of equipment it was and said it seemed powerful. She gave him a pleading look and asked if he could level her up. She added that he looks like a master. Ling Kua blushed, thinking that she had scared him, and noted that she was cute. The guy stomped his foot furiously, asking if she hadn't just asked them to level her up. He furiously asked if Lin Seal just completed a unique quest. The other guy cursed, pointing a finger at him furiously. The short-haired guy gritted his teeth and threatened to kill him at any moment. The elf woman shouted angrily at him, asking why he didn't complete the task himself if he had the chance. He furiously asked her why she was running from one person to another asking for a level up. Opening the interface, Ling Si said that it looked like he needed to hide his equipment and personal information so that it wouldn't cause trouble later. The dialog box says, after you hide the equipment, the effect will remain, and the costume will look like a standard one. The main character's armor turned into standard black clothing, and he said with a smile that it would be better this way. Noticing that he was leaving, the elf asked why he left without even paying attention to her. Raising his hand, Ling Kua said that, let alone her, even these guys wouldn't be able to handle the location he was going to. She asked why. The short-haired guy angrily retorted that he was a level 1 rookie with rare equipment. He offered him a one-on-one -on -one fight and threatened to beat him up so badly that his own mother wouldn't recognize him. The main character slowly turned around. Glancing at it, he asked if he really wanted to try it. The boys were stunned. The guy with the elf ears said that he was very arrogant. As Ling Kue left, he whispered that these bums and this girl were the perfect match. An enraged guy with short hair demanded that he repeat his words louder. The main character replied that he had no time to play with them. The elf thought irritably about how shameless he was, and now all she could do was walk around with these fools. She ran up to them, grinning awkwardly, and asked them to help her level up. The boy with the elf ears asked irritably if she wanted to go with him. The guy with the green hood thought that the main character is cool. The elf said that she would show them an interesting outfit and they replied that they were not evil people and she could rely on them. Map of the fifth level of the Ant Army Hollow. The map shows the recreation area, the outer ring, the zone of two minus three levels, the middle ring the zone of four levels, the inner ring the zone of the fifth level. A squad of people from level three to five fight insect-like monsters. Ant Army Hollow, middle ring. The bespectacled guy shouted to the captain that his mana was about to run out and the potion was also used up. He offered to retreat. The captain, swinging his sword, replied that they were in the middle ring, and the highest rank of ants here would not exceed the fourth level. He said they could handle it, and they would retreat after they dealt with this wave. Hitting the ants with his shield, the orc noted that they had leveled up in three days. He suggested that they try out the inner ring tomorrow, and then they would get rich from the items from there. Something green flew right in front of his face. It was an arrow that pierced right through the ant's head. The archer told him not to even think about going to the inner ring. She said that all the ants are in the inner circle of the fifth level and they will attack in groups. She asked if he thought it would be the same as the middle circle. The thief, brandishing a dagger, said that there is a rule in Sky Valley that prohibits players from entering places on maps that are higher than the player's personal level. He said that they were lucky to be able to reach the fifth level in the middle ring. He said that he had heard that the players who currently enter the inner ring are members of the fifth level elite groups of the top five guilds. All of them have level 5 equipment, and they have at least two healer magicians to restore the tank's health, which will plummet. The thief with a serious face said that everyone knows that good items fall in the inner circle, but you need to be able to deal with it. The elite teams of the top 5 guilds only went there for the sake of items. The orc raised his sword up and shouted for the others to focus on the monsters, saying that they were almost done. The archer noticed something in the other direction. She told them to take a look and asked if she was the only one who saw it. Lin Kui used his dagger to kill the approaching ants. She noticed the first level above his head. The main character cut the ant in half with a swing of his dagger. They were surprised to find that he was a level 1 thief. Lin Si's face was serious. They stared at him in surprise, not understanding how he did it or how he got here. The archer screamed, telling them to watch where he was going. Lin Si was walking towards the inner circle. When he reached the edge of the circle, the main character jumped down. His eye glowed red. There were many level 5 ants below, and the group asked if he was crazy. 15 minutes ago, the dialogue box says, You have access to the 5th level map Ant Army Hollow. Recreation area. Lin Si walks along a busy street. 
people on the street sell and buy items. Looking around, the main character thought that he was on the spot. A voice near the gate tells you to be careful, because the ant army will respawn quickly, so it will be difficult to deal with them. Another voice said don't be afraid, because this is just the outer ring and they have strong priests with them. Map of the fifth level of the ant army hollow, for players above the fifth level, the entrance is closed. Above the gate, you can see a dialogue box that says, Ant Army Hollow Outer Ring. Outer Ring, Middle Ring, Inner Ring The difficulty gradually increases. Lindsay walks forward. The ants attacks in the inner ring are a nightmare for players. The main character stands shrouded in yellow energy, and under his disguise, you can see that he is wearing white armor. He thought that for him, the owner of items from a unique quest, this is the perfect place to level up. Dialogue box, item, perfect power deals 1000% damage to monsters of the 5th level and below. Perfect body monsters of level 5 and below can only deal you 1 point of damage per attack. With a smirk, Ling Kue thought about how he would clear out the inner ring, and by the time a new group of monsters appeared, he would surely have reached level 5. He thought that since their level was higher, he would get good experience bonuses. The voice shouted that it was repeating it again. A hand grabbed the face of a level 4 guy with elf ears, the interface above his head was red in color. A girl with a sword on her back shouts not to even think about going back for lost equipment and that first you need to get a new level. She told the guy to be brave. She shouted that he already had a red name and still dared to come here. The others watched in silence. The girl's face tightened with anger and a vein swelled in her forehead. She asked if he was aware that the penalty for a red name is to drop a random piece of equipment at death. She said that they had disgraced their guild. The dialogue box says, red name, player killer. A player's name will turn red if they kill another player. Death in the presence of a red name will result in a penalty in the form of loss of experience and a random item of equipment. The duration of the red name effect depends on the severity of the crime. The text on the red dialogue box was crossed out with a large cross. The guy, crouching down, replied that before that all he had done was clean up the middle ring with the team, but he could not imagine that there would be so many ants in the inner ring. He said that the difference between the middle and inner rings was too big and it would cost him dearly. The black-haired guy sighed and told him that the difficulty of the inner ring should not be underestimated and one should be careful even as a level 5 team. He said that their entire group could have died because of his mistake. He told him that he was now a level 4 guy after losing one level so they were no longer a level 5 group. He asked if he still wanted to go back for the item he had lost. Lin C walks past them. The guy with the dark hair said they were going to die one day because of him. The protagonist paid attention to the words about the Misty Cliff Guild and remembered that it was one of the five great guilds. He thought that it looked like only the talented players from the Great Five Alliance had the strength to enter here so far. The guy sitting on the ground called Lin C angrily, calling him a level one thief and asked if he liked eavesdropping on other people's conversations. A sword blade blocked his path and the girl said she would give him some advice. She said that there was no need to go there and die and it wasn't a place for a level one like him to gain experience. Frowning, she said that if he came here thinking he was lucky enough, it would just be a waste of his time. She said that it was better for him to go to a level 1 or 2 location and raise his level. Ling Kue thought that it seemed that the people from the Misty Cliff Guild weren't bad and they were better behaved than some of them. He lowered the girl's sword with his hand and asked what if he told her that he would bring them the item they had left there and sell it. The blonde-haired guy raised an eyebrow in surprise and asked if Ling Xi's head was fine. The girl gritted her teeth in exasperation and said that she didn't have time to joke with him. She asked about him being a level 1 thief and wanting to enter the inner circle and help them get their equipment back. Lindsay folded his arms and said that he did and he needed the money. He asked where they had lost the item and if anyone else could have picked it up. The dark-haired guy replied that he should still be there because at that moment, in order to find a better position to fight the monsters, they specially chose a rock in the inner circle. The guy said that after being surrounded by ants, his 5th level flame spear staff fell out right there. He said the sun would be setting soon and there was no one else in the inner circle when they left so no one would pick him up. Gritting her teeth, the girl asked Lin Si if he was serious. The green-capped guy agreed with her with a frown and said that even if he had the invisibility potion, he still wouldn't be able to take it out. He said that the potion's effect would end before he could get in and out. The main character in front of them was already gone and it wasn't him who said that they didn't need to worry about him because he had already considered these situations. The girl furiously asked where he had gone. Ling Si walks towards the inner circle and raises his hand, telling them to rest, remember to pay him, and never leave until he returns. The girl asked if he understood human language. The blonde-haired guy asked if he was joking. The guy with dark hair asked the captain how much they should pay him. As she tucked the sword behind her back, she asked if he seriously believed that a level 1 thief would be able to return their item to them, and if his head was okay. Lin Si walks through the outer circle, surrounded by people fighting. 
One voice asked to restore his health because he almost died. Another voice shouted that he didn't have any mana. Another voice asked the mage to cover him. Ling Zi thought that there were a lot of people raising their level here. He decided to run directly to the inner circle. A dagger appeared in his hand. Frowning, he thought that he should reach the fifth level today. He ran forward. A dialogue box announced that the ants had appeared. Two level three ants appeared in front of the main character. Ling Xi cut the ants in half with a single swing of his dagger. The dialogue box says, activate perfect power, deal 1000% damage. The guy blocks the ants attacks with his sword, and the mage behind him says that his fireball is almost ready. They were surprised to find that the ant in front of them had been chopped in half. They turned around in surprise, not understanding what it was. Lin Si runs towards the level 4 ant, thinking that he has reached the middle circle. Using a backstab, the main character was in the air above the middle circle. He smiled contentedly. The orc with the sword shouted for the others to focus on the monsters and said that they were almost done. The archer pointed to the side and asked everyone to look there. She called out to see where the level 1 thief was going and said it was the inner circle. They asked if he was mad. Ling Kue jumped into the inner circle, which was filled with a lot of ants. He jumped down, where the ants immediately charged at him, dealing one point of damage each. The main character swirled in a swirl of blows with yellow energy, chopping and scattering the ants around. The dialogue box announced that it had reached the second level. Gritting his teeth, he thought about how the inner circle really gave a lot of experience. Frowning, he decided that since there was no one else here, he would take the opportunity to kill all the ants. The voice said that it was getting dark and they should go back. He added that the ants in the middle circle are almost all dead. Another voice called out to look at the inner circle. A crowd of people stood at the border of the inner circle, where the ground was littered with dead ants. The orc asked what had happened. The archer said that these corpses were all level 5 ants. A voice in the crowd said that he saw with his own eyes that he was level 1 when he came here. The blonde-haired guy exclaimed in surprise that the thief was still alive. He was surprised to say that he had cleared the inner circle by himself, gaining extra experience for having enemies that surpassed his level. The archer said that he had already raised his level from 1st to 5th. A guy in the crowd said that it hasn't been long, and he's already raised his level from 1st to 5th, and he's terrifyingly strong. Another voice in the crowd said that he was probably hiding what kind of equipment he had. Lin Si is sitting on a rock with a fire staff in his hand. He said it had to be that staff. There were many dead ants around him. Grinning, he said that he had finally reached the fifth level. The dialogue box says, since you have reached the fifth level, the effect of the excellent suit is terminated. You've lost an excellent suit. On a white pole in the recreation area, you can see a dialogue box that says, it's getting late. Players, please keep an eye on your health. Reminder, if you go to the recreation area, you can save up a bonus for your vacation. The captain called her group to follow her and said that it was getting dark and it was time to pack up and leave. She said that even they would find it difficult to fight the ants at night. The blonde-haired guy retorted that Ling Si hadn't returned yet, and there was still a possibility that he would return his staff. The girl frowned in annoyance. She grabbed his collar and said that she was warning him once again that even if their guild was ranked third, it was still one of the top guilds. Holding him by the neck, she forcefully pressed him to her chest and asked about how, omitting the fact that he had lost his equipment, he expected a level 1 novice to return the staff to him. She asked him if he was ashamed. Pale and trembling, he agreed and said he couldn't breathe. The captain released him and folded her arms across her chest, telling him to wipe the expectant look off his face. The guy with the dark hair looked at them and thought that he also wanted to lose his equipment and get such a punishment. The blonde-haired guy was holding his neck, clearing his throat, and said it was hard not to believe in him because of the look in his eyes when he said he would return the staff to them. He recalled Lin Si's calm expression. The captain protested that she thought he looked like in fools. She asked what the first level could do. People nearby were discussing Lin Si. One guy said that he hid his personal information, but he raised his level from 1st to 5th in one go. Another said that the Sky Valley Forum was exploding with comments. The bald guy said that he had never seen anything like it since the launch of this game. The guy in the green hat noticed their discussion and told the captain that something interesting was going on here. There were several topics on the forum about how Ling Si had cleared the inner circle by himself. The captain said that she had only just noticed that everyone who had returned from the inner circle was talking about it. She asked what had happened there. A guy in the crowd pointed his finger forward and said he thought it was him. The guy next to him agreed. The captain turned around, and Ling Kue was standing behind her, covered in the blood of ants. He held their staff in his hand and asked with a smile how much they were willing to offer for it. The captain was surprised to recognize him as Lin Si and was surprised that he had already reached the fifth level. The main character said that even if they don't recognize it, they should recognize this staff. The blonde-haired guy exclaimed that it was his staff, and he actually returned it. The captain asked how he had reached level 5 in one evening. Ling Kue replied that he was just clearing out the ants in the inner circle. 
he said that it gives a lot of experience because of the high level of monsters, not to mention the number of them. He added that if they had special equipment, they would also be able to. He handed the staff to the blonde-haired boy, who happily thanked him. He said that he only had three silver coins and he was giving him all of them. Frowning, the captain thought that even putting aside the question of where he got the special equipment, he still needed to have sufficient technical skill to face such a terrifying army of ants. The dialog box announced that he had received three silver coins. Lindsay said that it was a pleasure to deal with them. The blonde-haired boy was hugging his staff lovingly. The captain asked Lindsay to wait and asked if he had already joined the guild. She said that they are one of the five main guilds, Misty Cliff. A guy in the crowd said that he really wanted to ask him to add him as a friend. The captain called out to him that if he was interested, she could recommend him to the guild head so that he could pass the entry test early. Ling Kue thought about joining a guild that he couldn't even touch in his previous life, the Misty Cliff Guild. In the protagonist's previous life, it was also one of the five main guilds. When he started playing, these guilds were already full. Players were proud to be part of five large guilds. In his previous life, Lin Si had spent two years trying to reach the maximum level. After unlocking the pet system, the time it takes to level up is noticeably reduced. Thus, becoming a member of one of the top five guilds is something to be proud of. In his previous life, his only goal was to reach the maximum level, so it only took him two years. One reason for this is that unlocking the pet system significantly reduces the difficulty of leveling up. Another reason is that he completely ignored things like advanced equipment and special missions. Thus, after studying countless player manuals and finding a way to level up that was most suitable for him, Lin Si managed to reach the maximum level in a short period of time, especially because he is relatively good at games, because he can start earning money for existence only after reaching the maximum level. In the past, joining a guild was something incredible for him. With a wave of his hand, Lin Si thanked him for the offer and declined. Waving his cloak, he thought that he would definitely join the guild sooner or later, but it was up to fate to decide which one. He decided that now he needed to get the right set of equipment. The main town of Kasva, the village of beginners. People surrounded Ling Si, asking him to help them level up or join their group. The brown-haired girl asked if he needed a healer and said he could be a tank. The main character apologized and said that he didn't have time to help them. He thought about how the fifth level really made others treat him better. The guys are standing near the counter of the store. The guy in the helmet asks if they think the thief they saw earlier in the day will come here again. The purple-haired guy said he was even waiting for him to come back. He said that he was acting presumptuously, not even understanding the complexity of the heavenly valley. The guy with the dark hair said he didn't think he was coming. He asked why he would come back just to embarrass himself. Lindsay he said that they were still here and asked why they hadn't gone up a single level. The boys glanced in his direction. They were surprised to realize that Ling Si was standing in front of them and found that he had reached the fifth level. The main character said that they met again. They exclaimed that his level had risen very quickly. Lin Si walked over to the counter. The merchant asked what she could do for him this time. He replied that he wanted to sell some items. The dialogue box asked if he was sure he wanted to sell all 12 selected items. The dialogue box says, exchange successful. You have received 30 silver coins, 66 bronze coins. Ling Si thought about selling the unwanted items and preparing for the next target. He asked for 20 enhanced incendiaries and 3 simple invisibility potions. The dialog box announced that he had received 20 enhanced incendiaries and 3 simple invisibility potions. The saleswoman winked and thanked him for the purchase. She said that all the items were moved to his inventory. Ling Kue decided to buy temporary weapons from an arms dealer in the neighborhood. The gun salesman, showing off his muscles, asked if he needed help, peeking out from behind the counter. A dialogue box announced the receipt of a level 5 whitewood dagger. Ling Kue thought that the preparations were over and it was time for him to leave. The reason Ling Si is moving up to the fifth level as soon as possible is because the Heavenly Valley started three months ago, and this dungeon hasn't been opened by anyone yet. The female insect stands in the dark, surrounded by ants. In Ling Si's previous life, players discovered that there was a nest near the ant army's hollow, and it was an unmarked checkpoint, the ant queen's nest. After clearing the ant queen's nest, the level 5 dungeon will be upgraded, and the hidden dark forest dungeon will appear. This was also discovered by players 5 months after the launch of Sky Valley, and all this is required in order to get the strongest set of equipment for a thief up to the 10th level in the dark forest the Persistent Massacre set. Nearby Valley of the Ant Army Depression. Ling Kue frowned and thought that it was his turn in this life. A dialogue box announced that he had discovered the nest of the queen ant. The dungeon was filled with ants. Ling Kue thought that there were a lot of ants here, but in his previous life, after many attempts, the players found a dishonest way to quickly get past the ants. The main character drank a purple potion. The dialogue box says, simple stealth potion activated. 
the user will become invisible. The higher the enemy's perception, the easier it will be for them to detect the user. Effect duration, 9 seconds. Frowning, he decided to proceed. With quick leaps, Lindsay made his way down the rocks past the ants. Another invisibility potion appeared in the protagonist's hand. The dialogue box announced that the effect of the simple invisibility potion had ended. The ant was surprised to find that a running Lindsay had appeared in front of it. Lindsay disappeared before his eyes, and a dialogue box announced that the simple invisibility potion had been activated. The ants opened their toothy mouths angrily. The dialogue box drew attention to the fact that it attracted the hatred of a large number of ants. The dialogue box says that the effect of the simple invisibility potion has ended. The dialogue box says that the simple invisibility potion is activated. The dialogue box says that the effect of the simple invisibility potion has ended. Gritting his teeth, Ling Kue thought that this was the last potion. He runs away from a crowd of angry ants. Seeing the silhouette of the ant queen in front of him, he thought that he had almost arrived at his destination. The ant queen was a woman with green hair above her waist and below her waist a huge insect with a separate mouth. Ling Kue thought about how he had finally met her. Frowning, he noticed two ants jumping on top of him. He thought about how now he just needed to use the ant's fear of fire. He threw several Molotov cocktails in front of him. The ants were standing in front of a wall of fire, and some of them were burned in it. Ants are vulnerable to fire, so fire attacks have a damage multiplier. Lin Si was separated from the ants by a wall of fire. He thought about how even though the queen ant has a lot of health, it doesn't have any attacks, and its entire existence is to endlessly create ants to protect it. He thought that the ants were now separated by a wall of fire, and the ant queen was completely useless. Gritting her teeth, the queen called him a vile man. Holding six Molotov cocktails in his hands, Lin Si said that it was better for them to fight one-on-one. -on -one. With a sinister smile, he told her that it was her fault for being such an easy target. He told her not to blame him for being mean. Ling Kue said that the incendiary mixtures he had prepared for her would be more than enough for her. The Ant Queen frowned and cursed, the veins on her face bulging. She screamed loudly. The dialogue box congratulated the main character on killing the Ant Queen. The dialogue box says, General alert, a player whose personal information is hidden has cleaned out the nest of the Queen Ant and attracted the hatred of the insect tribe. The hidden dungeon of the fifth-level dark forest was opened, with spiral staircase and bookshelves. Someone asked if it was necessary to hold a guild meeting for something like this. The head of the council, Bai Lai, level 9, Misty Cliff Guild, straightened his tie and said that he thought they had found some hidden items or a special NPC. Frowning, he asked Dira if she had the need for such drastic measures. Dira replied that he wasn't there at the time, so he wouldn't understand. She said that this thief is really intimidating and raised his level from 1st to 5th in just a day. Frowning, she said that she thought he was very strong, and if they didn't take him into their guild first, then the other four major guilds would take him in. Level 8 Wasabi Kun asked with a smirk if she thought a mere level 5 thief would be able to increase the gap between them and the other guilds. He said it was nonsense. Deere countered by mentioning his technical skills and said that he had withheld his personal information. She said that his aura was completely different from other players. Smiling, Chana Chana, the vice captain, said that Dira obviously thinks in the best interests of the guild, so she asked for a meeting, and they need to stop putting her in a difficult position. Chana Chana told her that if this thief is as good as she says, then she should invite him to take the guild entrance test. Spreading her palms out, she said that the game hadn't started so long ago, and there were too many people willing to join the guild, and he would get his chance. Dira, scratching her head, agreed with her and said that she was overexcited because she wanted him to be in her group. Tiana Tiana said that she understood everything. Dira thought that Tiana was very beautiful and gentle, no matter what she did. She thought that it was rare to see a beautiful female beastman like her. Tiana was smiling, wearing a large wizard's hat with a red bow that revealed animal ears. They found a dialogue box with a universal alert. The dialogue box says, a player who hid his personal information has cleaned out the queen's nest and attracted the hatred of the insect tribe. The dialogue box announced that the hidden location of the fifth level dark forest was opened. Bai Lai was surprised by the hidden location of the fifth level. Wasabi Kun exclaimed in surprise that he had cleared the area alone and asked who this incredible player was. He said that according to the announcement, it was after clearing the queen ant's nest alone. He said that the player was a professional and asked what guild he was from. Tiana, frowning nervously, told them to calm down because this announcement will be received by all players and they will all run to the hidden location of the first level that has opened. She said that they should hurry there to find promising talents. Bai Lai looked at her in fascination and jumped up from his chair and said that she was right and they didn't have time to sit idly by. He shouted that it was time for them to go to the dark forest. Regardless of whether it was the Misty Cliff Guild or any other guild, even the players roaming the streets were surprised by the message. People on the street look at the dialogue boxes in front of them, wondering at the hidden location. The hooded man at the table asked the pink-haired girl if she would go to a hidden location. 
The beer guy asked in displeasure why a level 5 location only appeared now. Another guy asked him if he thought there would be special equipment or materials. A line of people lined up in front of the store. The guy said that he needed to buy potions and go to the location as soon as possible. The girl with the bow said that she wouldn't even be able to squeeze through even if it was too late. The guy pushes the guy in the red wizard hat, saying that the other guilds have been there for a long time. The guy opening the yellow portal in front of him said that opening the portal takes time. The other guy was surprised at what kind of godlike professional had cleaned out this location. Countless conversations of players were on every corner, and everyone was excited about the location that had just opened up. Dark forest, entrance to the location. Surrounded by people, a huge white crystal floated in the air. As Ling Kue was leaving the teleport, he said that he had arrived. Noticing the people, he thought that, as expected, there were already plenty of players here. He remembered that this quest was a special team task, and there would only be more and more players. The guy asked in surprise that there are no restrictions on the difference in level. The guy running after him said that it was, and told him to hurry up and follow him, because players of level 5 and below can enter, and his companions are waiting for him. Lin Si thought that as he remembered, since the dark forest is a hidden location, there should usually be special conditions or rules, but this time, the condition is to allow teams to have no limit on the level difference. The only restriction is that players above the fifth level will not be able to enter the location. The guy urged his companions to pass the lowest difficulty to quickly take out some items. Turning around, Ling Kue thought about how he had already prepared all the items and equipment for his group, and now he needed to find four people to form a group. He decided to look for people near the crystal. The dialogue box says, you have accepted the dark forest quest. Now you can use the portal to the location. He thought about how the yellow portals nearby were low difficulty. The people behind him enter the yellow portals. Someone shouted that they had discovered a gold portal of increased difficulty. The guy in the red wizard hat shouted that the final boss of increased difficulty has a mutation phase. He shouted to report it to the heads immediately. The other guy swore and said that they had lost two comrades and were almost killed. A person in the crowd asked if the increased difficulty was really that difficult. The elf-eared guy slammed his fist into the ground and cursed. He said that their equipment couldn't handle this dungeon. He said that the level 5 armor couldn't even withstand the boss' normal attacks, and its armor penetration was too strong. A guy in the crowd said that it was one of the members of the five major guilds, Celestial. He said that when the portal first opened, they ran into it without slowing down. Another guy said that not only did the five major guilds come here, but other guilds also came here. He said that some people have already passed the lower and middle difficulties, but no one has been able to pass the higher one yet. He said that there was nothing to say about special and crazy difficulties. It will be at least a week before people even try to pass them. He said that this place would soon become a place for guilds to compete with each other. The first few weeks will be full of guilds trying to break the record for completing a location, just like every other time a new location is opened. He said that soon solo players will have nothing to do. Ling Kui thought of the solo players. A guy from the crowd shouted that the representatives of the five major guilds that are responsible for finding new players had also come. He said they were watching them from the edge of the location, and they were all level 8 and 9 professionals. Chiana sits at the table, laughing. Wasabi-kun said that this time they need to find really good players. Bai Lai, looking through the telescope, said that all the good ones were taken away by other guilds last time. He thought with a crazy smile that if he found promising talents and collected enough guild contribution points, he could apply to join the second tier. He imagined Tiana admiring him. Bai Lai thought about how Tiana had always rejected him, but when he entered the second tier, she wouldn't be able to reject him. Tiana called out to Bai Lai, who was lost in his fantasies. He responded, grinning. She said that the other guilds had also come. She said that they would leave the important task of setting records for completing the location to the first and second echelons. She said with a smile that their job as the third echelon is to find good newcomers. Bai Lai said that the hidden location has attracted a lot of players, and he believes that there will be many promising talents here. Looking into the distance, Tana agreed and said that among so many players, they should definitely be found. She wondered if the thief Dara had mentioned would come here. She said she wanted to meet him. Someone was surprised at how many people there are here and said that this is the entrance to the location. The guy with short hair chuckled and said that he said he would show them something good. Another guy said that he knew a lot of players and that there might be a friend of his who would be willing to help them. The elf said that all the players want to form a group. She smiled with a wink and said she couldn't wait to raise a level or two. The boys responded by telling her to rely on them. Lin Si noticed them and said it was them again. The elf recognized him and was surprised. They jumped back from him and asked why he was here, too. Closing his eyes, the main character said that he should ask them, because this is a fifth level location. Opening one eye slightly, he said that this location required five people, and noted that they were missing one. 
The elf noticed with surprise that he was already level 5. She looked at him admiringly and said he was cool. She asked if he came here because he missed her. The short-haired guy gritted his teeth furiously, asking how he was able to reach level 5 in one day. The guy with the elf ears sighed wearily and the guy in the green hood thought that he was cool. Lindsay asked if they wanted to go through this location and said that he would help them pass it. He thought that if he was looking for other people, he would have to spend his time explaining. They exclaimed in surprise if he really wanted to help them. The guy with the elf ears said that he should know that he shouldn't rely on luck when completing locations. Lindsay asked if they wanted to go through the location or not. Gritting his teeth, the elf-eared boy asked if he was confident that he could pass it. He said he would have to pay them compensation if they were killed. Closing his eyes, the main character replied that this is not a problem, but he has one condition. He said that they should hide the information about their group for three days. The guy with the elf ears asked why they would do that and said that only a fool wouldn't want attention. Raising his index finger, Ling Kui replied that, as compensation, after completing the location, he would only take one piece of equipment and they could take everything else. The dialogue box in front of them says that the player invited them to form a team. The dialogue box asked if they want to accept or reject the invitation. The bright-eyed elf agreed without hesitation. The three guys stared at the dialogue box, unsure of what to do. They accepted. The elf thought happily that she had finally found someone to rely on to level up. The guy in the green hood thought about how he wanted to learn how to play the thief from him. The other two guys thought it was a good deal and decided to trust him for now. Ling Si called them to follow him and told them that he would choose a portal. The guy with the short hair asked if they needed to discuss strategy and if he knew exactly what he was doing. He opened his mouth in surprise. Ling Kui stood in front of the dark red portal and said that he would explain after they went inside. The short-haired guy exclaimed in surprise when he noticed the dark red portal. Petrified with surprise, they exclaimed that they had been tricked and they would go through a crazy difficulty. Lin Si grinned confidently. The dialogue box says, your team has accepted the dark forest location. Difficulty, crazy, no record. The location quest will be activated in three seconds, please get ready. The guys, petrified with surprise, said that they were deceived and they will challenge the insane complexity. The main character grinned under the red light of the portal. The dialogue box says, your team has accepted the dark forest dungeon. Difficulty, crazy, no record. The dungeon quest will be issued in three seconds, please prepare yourself. Bai Lai exclaimed in surprise as he looked through the telescope. He asked what was going on and why there were so many people there. He told Tana that she needed to see it too. Bai Lai asked if he saw the color correctly. Looking through her binoculars, Tiana asked where and what the crowd was looking at. A crowd of people gathered around something. She asked if they were looking at the portal and saw that a crowd of people had gathered around the dark red portal. Tiana said in surprise that it was a dark red portal. Bai Lai pointed his finger forward and exclaimed that it was impossible, and someone decided to challenge the insane difficulty. He shouted that the dungeon had only recently opened, but someone had the skills and courage to challenge the insane difficulty. Gritting his teeth, Bai Lai asked what kind of guild it was. Wasabi Kun asked if it could be the guild members in the first place. He said that the dark forest had only recently opened, and the only people capable of doing so were most likely their first division. The guy with the elf ears assumed that they were a group of solo players who had randomly chosen an insane difficulty. The red-cloaked armor guy said that he had seen many such groups who wanted to try their luck. Bai Lai agreed, saying that such situations are not uncommon. He asked Tiana what she thought. Tiana said it made sense. Bai Lai laughed and said that it couldn't be any other way. Tiana thought that even if it was true, they wouldn't be able to pass this dungeon. She said they should go and take a look. People in the crowd shouted in surprise that this was an insane difficulty. A man in the crowd asked if anyone had seen whose band it was and what classes and equipment they had. Another person asked if they were members of the five major guilds or just solo players who decided to try their luck. Another person said that even the members of Celestial couldn't pass the increased difficulty and they certainly wouldn't be able to with their equipment. The brown-haired guy, looking around, said that the crowd was getting bigger and this time they would embarrass themselves greatly. He told the main character that they should enter the dungeon faster, and he didn't care if it was of insane difficulty. A man in the crowd laughed and said that they were probably just solo players who had decided to go sightseeing. Ling Si closed his eyes and offered to go. A guy in the crowd exclaimed in surprise when he noticed the members of the Nebulous Guild. Tiana said there were a lot of people here. Bai Lai asked people to let them pass. The fat guy exclaimed in surprise when he noticed Bai Lai. Bai Lai frowned in displeasure and asked if there was a need for such a crowd around something so mundane. Tiana raised her eyebrows awkwardly and said they'd have to squeeze through. Bai Lai thought that solo players were annoying because he had to squeeze through this crowd. 
The fat guy said with a smile that there was no need for them to squeeze in because they had already entered the dungeon, and he had already asked around for information and found out that this group was formed from solo players. Bailai said that just like he said, they were solo players. The guy agreed and said how dare they bother the captain. With an awkward smile, the guy said that he had recently applied to join their guild. Bai Lai turned away, asked who he was in displeasure, and said that if he wanted to join the guild, he had to follow the correct procedure. The guy smiled awkwardly in agreement and asked me to put in a good word for him. Bai Lai thought discontentedly that this fat man could only dream of joining their guild. He motioned for the others to move on. The guy gritted his teeth and thought that he thought he could look down on people just because he had a bit of power. A guy with dark skin and elf ears asked if it was Bai Lai. Bai Lai turned around in displeasure and asked who it was this time. Above the dark, skinned elf's head, the tenth level could be seen, and above the girl's head next to it, the ninth. He said that they, the people from the Nebulous Guild, are always rushing to recruit people, but they never manage to accept even one person. A guy in the crowd exclaimed that it was a third-ranked guild, Wolf's Fang. Another guy exclaimed that there were now three of the five main guilds here. Bai Lai gritted his teeth in exasperation. The dark-haired guy asked if Wolf's Fang was ranked third, which Nebulous and Celestial were better. The guy with long blonde hair replied that Celestial is ranked fourth, but Nebulous is not to be underestimated, and it was created recently and he heard that their head is a very strong person. He said that the third guild, Wolf's Fang, just likes to make things difficult for Nebulous. The dark-skinned elf smirked and said that they had heard that people from Celestial had also come, so they were given the order to join in. He told Bai Lai that he didn't need to worry, and this time, they wouldn't steal newbies from under their noses. Bai Lai gritted his teeth in exasperation and clenched his fists. Tiana put her hand on his shoulder and told him to calm down with a smile, because this is not a good place to argue with them. She told him not to let others shame them. The red-haired girl pointed her finger at Tiana and said that she remembered that she was a mage from the latest monthly guild wars. Tiana asked if she remembered her. Touching her chin, the girl grinned and said that she remembered. She said she was a Bai Lai woman, adding that she had terrible taste. Laughing, she said that she wished she had killed her last time. Tiana said she didn't remember her at all. The girl frowned in annoyance and asked what she had just said. Tiana calmly turned away and said that it was difficult for her to remember people with such an ordinary face. The girl pointed furiously at Tiana and asked what she meant. Tiana called Bai Lai to go on. Bai Lai sneered maliciously as he clasped his hands behind his back. The girl shouted for her to repeat what she said again. Tiana turned around and added that not all women rely on men as much as she does all the time. She suggested that they all work hard. The girl gritted her teeth angrily and swore. The dark-skinned elf stared with fascination. Bai Lai said with a smirk that they were leaving. The girl, shaking with anger, clicked her tongue and said that she had a sharp tongue. The elf grinned and said it wasn't a problem. He said that the next monthly guild wars is still a week away, and they will just focus on killing her so that she will lose a few levels. The girl looked at him with a grim grin and said she was counting on him. Scratching his head, he said that he had heard that a portal of insane difficulty was activated by a group of solo players. The girl said that she thought they were people from some guild and they should go back and report it. He replied that there was no need to hurry, and they had better gather information about the dungeon before heading back. He said that they would just catch and ask them after they came out of the dungeon. He called her to go. Dark forest, inside the dungeon. A guy with short hair was pointing angrily at the main character, shouting if he was crazy because it was a scam. He asked if he knew what crazy complexity meant. The guy with the elf ears folded his arms and said that even the people from Celestial couldn't pass the increased difficulty. The guy in the green hood said that this dungeon is big. The elf said that she would definitely be able to level up here. The guy with the elf ears asked if he had brought them here to feed the monsters. The guy with short hair shouted that he didn't understand anything after all, and he was just lucky enough to somehow get the fifth level and now he thinks that he is an immortal. The main character stood with his back to them, Looking at the game interface in front of him, turning around, he asked if they were done complaining. He said they would attract bug monsters if they kept yelling. Ling Si added that the artificial intelligence in this game is quite advanced. A guy with short hair asked what they would do. He asked if they would get out of the dungeon and said that he should know that death takes away experience. The elf protested that they were only teaming up. She thought irritably that she was level 1, and she wasn't afraid to lose experience, she wanted experience, and no one was allowed to go out. The main character calmly said that he had already sent them items, and they would be able to get them through the group interface. He added that it was an equipment that he had chosen based on their classes, and it was better suited for this dungeon. The dialogue box reported that the items were sent. They opened the interface and the main character told them to put on items. The guy with short hair was surprised to receive Fire Scatter Arm Guard. The elf was surprised to receive Red Reverend Healing Staff. The guy with the elf ears got a robe of waning fire. The guy with green hair got blazing thief's leather armor. The dialogue box reported that the items were received. 
The guy with the elf ears said that all of these items can be worn at their level, and equipment with elemental attributes should cost at least 10 silver in the early game. The short-haired guy exclaimed in surprise that all these equipment had fire attacks. The hooded guy thought that he couldn't help but admire the main character. The elf asked in surprise where he got so much equipment. Lengs he said that after killing so many monsters, they should at least drop some equipment. He said that bugs are vulnerable to fire, and now the fire damage they will receive from the equipment will help them significantly increase their damage. The bright-eyed elf exclaimed that she couldn't wait. She yelled for everyone to put on their gear, and they agreed. The elf looked at her fire staff in awe, shouting about how good it looked. A guy with short hair looking at the fire on his wrist shouted about the power of the king. The elf-eared boy was looking at the fire on his chest with a satisfied grin. He said that even with all this gear, it's still an insane challenge. A guy with short hair shouted that he was getting prettier. The elf called out to him to transform. Ling Si with an indifferent face said to distribute strong Molotov cocktails. In front of him was a crate full of Molotov cocktails. The guy asked irritably if he was a merchant. He replied that he could only carry 60 bottles, and told everyone to take 15 bottles because they would be useful to them for the boss. The short-haired guy asked in surprise if he had a plan and what they would do with the monsters along the way. The main character replied that he would tell them what to do along the way. He thought that he had put all his stat points into dexterity in the early game, and after getting level 5, he distributed the points more evenly, and his level was exactly enough to put on this set of level 5 equipment. He clicked the confirm button on the dialog box and thought that he had specially prepared this set of equipment for the dark forest, spending a fortune on it. Surrounded by the lights, he grinned. He was wearing armor that was shrouded in flames. The green hooded guy exclaimed in surprise and asked if the most expensive equipment in Lai's shop was the fire equipment set for a level 5 thief. The main character was standing there, wearing clothes shrouded in fire, and the guy exclaimed that it was a starfire set. Ling Si said that if they want to pass the dungeon in this game, they need to learn something first. He said that each dungeon has its own characteristics. The hooded guy looked on with a serious face, the guy with elf ears grinned, the elf girl smiled confidently, and the guy with short hair frowned seriously. The main character grinned and said that where there are features, there are weaknesses, and by finding weaknesses, they can win. He said that this is why the so-called insane difficulty is not completely impassable. They went forward. The elf held up her staff, winked, and urged them to move forward. Lang Si raised his hand and urged them to be the first to pass the insane difficulty. Through observation, people discovered that the insect race in Heavenland is a race with a very strong sense of danger. So when they sense danger, they choose to hide or run away. These are words from the third volume of Heavenland Insect Observation. Rays of light shone through the foliage of trees in a forest full of fireflies. A common dark forest monster is Jagged Scythe Mantis. The elf called out to everyone to take a look. Jagged Scythe Mantis, who looked like a beautiful girl with short white hair, came out of the bushes. She exclaimed that she was cute. The main character lowered her head, telling her to lower herself. He asked her if she could see the loot in her hand. The Mantis' arm pierced through the animal's body. Leng Si asked if she wanted to, so that it would be the same with her. The Mantis ran away. The boy with the elf ears exclaimed that she had run away. The hooded guy said that insects are very vigilant. The elf said that this Mantis looked very cute. The main character said that if it was seen for even one more second, it would attract a lot of monsters. The hooded guy asked him how they could defeat the monsters, because even if their race is very fragile, their attack and speed are very high. The short-haired guy noticed in surprise that he called him boss. The hooded guy said that all monsters on insane difficulty have extra health, attack, and defense, and the insect race's attacks deal cutting damage that lowers the target's health over time, and after a few of their attacks, they will die from this damage. The main character agreed and said that they wouldn't fight all the monsters directly. He said that in the dark forest, there are circular zones connected to each other, and each circle marks a different zone. He drew three circles on the ground, above which was written boss, spider zone, moth zone, and mantis zone. Leng Si said that they usually need to clear these three zones to get to the boss. He listed the monsters that protected these zones, the mantises they had just seen, the moths, and the spiders. He imagined a brown silhouette of a moth with sharp claws and a purple silhouette of a spider with many fangs. Frowning, the protagonist added that there is another special creature a neutral monster, the weeping birds. The boys exclaimed in surprise, and the elf girl with bright eyes and a smile said that it sounded really cute. They must be expensive, she thought. The main character said that this bird is the key to completing this dungeon. He said that by using the insect race's predatory instinct and hidden path, they should easily reach the boss area. The elf imitated a bird, flapping its arms like wings and making a bird-like sound, and asked if they thought they would make such a sound. The boy with the elf ears grinned and agreed. The guy with the short hair laughed charmingly and said that they would probably be cute like her. The hooded guy said that he should write down the strategies for completing the dungeon. 
The main character looked at them with displeasure and said that he would not repeat it, so they should stop fooling around and listen. He thought that, as he thought, they were making him worry. He told them to let him know their names for easy communication. The dialogue box was filled with a request to see the player's personal information. The hooded guy chuckled awkwardly and said that his nickname was Invincible J Drama Run, and they could just call him J Run. The guy with the short hair said indifferently that he was a fan of Japanese TV shows. The name Bone Piercing No Loneliness, Heartbreaking No Sadness appeared above the guy with elf ears. With a smug smile, he told them to call him that. The main character thought it was a shameful anti-mainstream name. He said they would call it anti-mainstream. He shouted irritably that he wasn't anti-mainstream. The short-haired guy frowned and said that his nickname was Long Handsome Face, so they could call him Long Face. The elf girl winked with a smile and said that they could call her Zio Lan. She said she likes money and strong guys. The boys asked her charmingly if she was talking about them. The main character called to go to the next step to find the weeping bird. Noticing a yellow bird with big eyes, the elf asked to wait and asked if it was a weeping bird. The main character was sitting on a tree branch, grabbing a screaming bird by the paw. The nestlings in the hollow nearby were screaming. The elf pointed an angry finger at the bird. Anti-mainstream said the name didn't suit her at all. Lengxi, putting his arm around the bird that was chirping in embarrassment, told it not to be afraid and that he would give it good bugs. The elf asked why they were feeding her. The dialogue box reported that the bird was happy. The main character smiled and said that by feeding her the bugs they found on the road to show goodwill, they would get the item. The dialogue box congratulated you on getting the hidden item, Weeping Flute. It described the item, a gift from Weeping Bird in honor of friendship. It can make a pleasant chirping sound, but for some insects it is a danger signal. The elf said with a frown that she didn't think such an ugly bird would have a hidden item. Raising his palm up, the main character said that there are no useless NPCs in this game, and the only question is whether someone discovered their benefits or not. Jay Run was taking notes in a book. Longface asked if they were returning to the Mantis area. Holding a flute in his hand, the protagonist replied that with this flute, they would be able to get to the boss via a short path. He added that it would be a bit problematic. Jay Run asked how he knew these tricks and if he had any experience with this flute. Longface noticed in surprise that he called him boss again. Links he thought that he couldn't tell them that he had already cleared this dungeon countless times in his previous life. He said that before coming here, he went to the main library of the city of Casfado and read some books about insect observation, and they have information. He said that it can only be used after reading it. He said that, for example, this flute and its insect repellent effect wouldn't do anything without knowing about them. Jay Run, writing down notes, said that he could not even think that in the library you can learn such things. Anti-mainstream said he thought the library existed just for show and didn't know it could be used that way. Zio Lan yawned and said that reading books was boring. The main character opened the map and told them to open the map and take a good look. He said that the area on the side of the map is a swamp and the fox is surrounded by it. He said that normally no one would walk in the swamp. He explained that this is because he never knows this road, and you can get lost there at any time, and because the monsters there are scattered without regularity, and it is not as safe as on a normal road. Anti-mainstream asked if he meant to say that this shortcut is not safe. He asked if he was sending them to their deaths. Zio Lan drew attention to herself by swinging her staff. Ling Xi replied that Weeping Bird is a monster that specializes in hunting monsters of the insect race, and it is their natural enemy, and the flute is able to make their sound, striking terror into insects. Zio Lan happily raised the staff on her head, exclaiming that they had obtained the items and a shortcut. She urged them to move on. Looking at the swampy slush under her feet with a displeased face, she asked if this was the only way. She asked what the shortcut was. Zio Lan raised her staff and shouted in displeasure, Why are they forcing such a beautiful girl to walk through such a swamp? The anti-mainstream noticed with displeasure that his magic robe was soaked. Longface said it was hard for him to walk, as if he was dragging a huge rock behind him. Zio Lan shouted in displeasure that he was all dirty. The main character with a flute in his mouth asked if they wanted to go back and fight the monsters. Glancing at them with a frown, he said that if they didn't want to pay such a small price, they might not even think about going through the insane difficulty. He told them to be quiet and follow him because they were entering the monster zone. Zio Lan sighed and said that her dress and feet were wet. She opened her eyes wide, noticing something. There were several huge spiders in front of her. The main character told her to be calm. Anti-mainstream gave the spiders a startled look and said they had a terrifying aura. The spider opened its mouth, baring its teeth. Above his head, it was written that it was a level 5 silk spider. They exclaimed that this was to be expected from an insane difficulty. Zio Lan called out in fright that they were coming. The main character started playing the flute, and it made chirping sounds. Spider's eyes widened in alarm. They froze in place, trembling with fright. Longface said it actually worked. The anti-mainstream said they stopped moving. 
He said they seemed to be very afraid of the flu. The spiders quickly ran away. J. Run exclaimed enthusiastically. Anti-mainstream said he couldn't have imagined that these birds were so useful, and all monsters of insane difficulty are afraid of them. He said they were their natural enemies for a reason. Frowning, the protagonist told them not to relax and quickly follow him. He said that this shortcut wasn't easy, they were completely relying on this flute, and if they got lost, they would be attacked by all kinds of monsters in this dungeon. Many different monsters were perched on the branches above them. Xiaolan said it was scary and they needed to get out of here as soon as possible. Looking up, Longface said they were sitting on top. The main character said that this is the price for a short trip. Once on the ground, he said that they had arrived and the area was safe. Climbing out of the swamp, Xiaolan said that her entire body was covered in slippery mud. Long face blushed and asked if she needed help. The dialog box says, you have selected the body cleaning function. You will become clean and sparkly. Ling Xi said that everything went quite smoothly. Xiao Lan exclaimed in relief that they were finally on dry land. Long face said that even though it was a short trip, it took them half an hour. The main character asked if they thought it wasn't worth it. Long face turned around in surprise. The dialogue box says, exploration successful. You have reached the dungeon boss's portal. In front of them was a huge dark red portal. Long face exclaimed in surprise that they had already arrived at the boss portal. The main character thought that this portal evokes memories. Anti-mainstream said that all of these monsters previously were very scary. He asked if they were really going to fight a boss of insane difficulty. Long face asked in fright if he had read anything in the library like the secret of clearing a dungeon without a boss fight. Grinning, he replied that they would have to use real skills to defeat the boss. Xiao Lan looked at him in surprise. They entered a dark red portal. On the other side of the portal was a huge monster mud dragon, Lord of the Swamp. The red dialogue box says, Level 5, Sublord Grade. J Run placed the Molotov cocktails on the ground. Wiping the sweat from his face, he opened the chat. Long face in the chat asked if they could see his message. J Run asked why he was typing if he could just use voice chat. He replied that everyone was very nervous right now, and he was afraid that he would scare them if he used voice chat. He asked if everything was ready on his side. J Run replied that it was ready. Long Face was standing on a nearby cliff, putting Molotov cocktails on the ground and giving a thumbs up. J Run gave a thumbs up and said there was no problem. Long Face said in the chat that Ling Xi happens to know the terrain of the boss territory. He asked how he knew so many details. He recalled how the main character had told them that they should memorize his next words. Standing in front of the sleeping boss, he told them that they would be able to defeat the boss directly with their current level and equipment. Xiao Lan asked what they should do then. Turning around, he said that he had given them incendiary mixtures to throw at the boss when they were fighting. He explained that hitting three Molotov cocktails in a row will put a burning effect on the enemy, and Mud Dragon, Lord of the Swamp is not only weak to fire, but will also receive multiplied damage under the burning effect. Long Face frowned and asked where they would throw Molotov cocktails from, because if they got close to him, he would kill them all with tail attacks. Xiao Lan squeezed her eyes shut and said that it was too dangerous and she didn't want to do it. Long Face added that the distance from which they can throw Molotov cocktails is limited. The main character replied that they didn't need to worry about it. Frowning, he said that he had already prepared a set of positions for them. The dialog box says that he sent the map coordinates to his teammates. Looking ahead to the sleeping boss, he said that regarding the question of when to drop them, they just need to wait for his signal. J Run thoughtfully said that their boss must have quite a few friends who have already passed the lower difficulties of the dark forest, and so he probably knows all this information. He added that social connections are also one of his strengths. Long Face asked irritably if there was a need to call him boss. Xiao Lan, trembling, said that she was nervous and he said that he would give them a signal. She asked him why he hadn't submitted it yet. The anti-mainstream said that since it had already planned so much, it could only believe it. He added that if there were any problems with his instructions, they would make him pay for it. Xiao Lan exhaled hard, trying to calm down. J Run said that he said that he would lure the boss alone, and this surprised him, and he really wants to see how he will do it. He said that he should understand that the boss of insane difficulty has the rank of sub-lord. The main character was standing on a rock behind the boss, his arms outstretched. Mud Dragon was asleep. Ling Xi said with a smirk that they hadn't seen each other for a long time, and he almost forgot how many times they had fought in his past life. He thought that after reaching the fifth level, he had obtained the passive skill combo accumulation, and if his attacks were not interrupted by the enemy's attack, then he could accumulate attacks and use a special skill set of equipment with his new rush skill, like the ultimate trigger skill. Frowning, he opened his eyes wide. He leaped down, shouting for the boss to wake up and meet his death. A dagger appeared in his hand. Leaving a trail of yellow energy in his wake, he slammed down hard on the boss back. His red eyes widened in annoyance. The dialogue box reported that he had disturbed the sleep of Mud Dragon, Lord of the Swamp. 
he let out a loud growl and asked how dare he, the vile man, disturb his sleep. The main character landed on the ground and after looking at him, said that they met again. Mud Dragon swung a paw at him. It dodged his attack and jumped onto his paw. He ran up it. The main character ran along the monster's paw, leaving a trail of fire behind him. The boss looked at him in surprise, and a green liquid sprayed out of his mouth. He spat a green liquid at him, and the protagonist dodged with a single jump. He said with a grin that he knew all his tricks like the back of his hand. As he approached the monster's huge claw, he said that he knew the limits of all its skills. As he landed on the huge black claw, he looked towards the green liquid that the monster had spat at him. Grinning, he said that this distance would be enough. He used the backstab skill. He was behind the monster with a grin, holding up his dagger. An hour later, Xioland sits with his feet dangling over the cliff and asks why he still hasn't signaled them after all the time has passed. The anti-mainstream exclaimed that an entire hour had passed and had he decided to run away. Longface angrily asked what he was doing because he was out of reach of the voice clock. He said he hoped his plan hadn't failed. J Run said that this is unlikely, because in the team information, his health bar is still complete. He surmised in surprise that he still hadn't started fighting the boss, otherwise why didn't his health bar drop in so much time? They heard the main character yell at them to get ready. They saw a cloud of dust approaching. J Run asked if it was the boss. Anti-mainstream exclaimed that he really lured the boss here. Xiao Lan asked what they should do. Frowning, Ling Si shouted at them not to act too quickly and wait for him to lure the boss in the middle. As he ran away from the huge monster, he thought that they would take his life in a moment. Someone shouted to take a look at the boss health. Long Face was surprised to see that he had single-handedly lowered his health by two-thirds. He asked how he did it. J Run exclaimed enthusiastically that the boss was incredible. The main character shouted to them to get ready. As he ran away from the monster, he pointed a dagger at them and shouted at them to smash their Molotov cocktails as if they were living their last day. Long Face and Jay run through incendiary mixtures, shouting loudly. The anti-mainstream threw Molotov cocktails with a grin. Xiao Lan squeezed her eyes shut and, throwing Molotov cocktails without looking, shouted that she didn't care anymore and would just throw them all. Molotov cocktails fell on Mud Dragon, who was standing on the ground with his mouth wide open and black teeth. Bottles shattered on its body, and the monster was engulfed in flames. Jay Run shouted for him to die. Xiao Lan smiled and thought it was nice, as if she was beating this freak to death with money. The anti-mainstream crowd watched in disbelief as she violently threw Molotov cocktails, laughing angrily. Red blood spurted from the burning monster's eyes. The main character shouted to them to be careful, because he will soon enter berserk mode. He said that once the boss enters berserk mode, their Molotovs can no longer be applied to him, and this is his special skill in berserk mode. A dialogue box announced that Molotov cocktails could not detect the target. Long Face asked what they should do. He waved his dagger, shouted at them to throw Molotov cocktails at him. They asked in surprise if he was crazy, and said that even if they couldn't win, there was no need to kill themselves, and that they wouldn't kill their own teammate. They stared in surprise, and Ling Si shouted for them to throw Molotov cocktails at him. Jay Run shouted that he believed him and threw a Molotov cocktail. The main character praised him for his good work. Several Molotov cocktails fell on top of him as he stood in front of the boss, shrouded in flames. The dialogue box says, You have activated Starfire Set's special ability. For 30 seconds, you will be immune to any fire damage, and your next attack will deal fire damage, dealing five times more damage to burning targets. The main character's eyes were burning with flames, and he offered to dance in this violent flame. A crowd of people are standing at the entrance of the dungeon. One person asked about the fact that they still hadn't come out. Another person pointed out that this group of solo players had been in the dungeon for an hour and asked if it was possible that they could actually pass it. Another told him that this couldn't be the case because even Celestial, one of the five major guilds, couldn't pass the increased difficulty. Another person suggested starting with a low difficulty rather than watching the commotion. Bai Lai and Tiana are standing near the wall. A guy in the crowd said that they were probably huddled in a corner somewhere in the dungeon, trembling with fear. The other laughed and agreed, saying that they would probably be out soon, and since there were so many people here, he wanted to see them disgrace themselves. Bai Lai frowned and gritted his teeth as he asked why these solo players were still hiding in the dungeon. He assumed it was because he was afraid to go out. He thought that if Tiana hadn't been so interested in them, he would have left by now. Wasabi-kun said that staying inside the insane difficulty for so long wasn't easy, and if they entered it, staying alive for so long on the insane difficulty would be difficult even for them. Bailai asked if he thought they would succeed. As he approached Wasabi-kun, he said that he still hadn't shown him how to use the special item he found in the level 8 dungeon last time in battle. Laughing, he asked if he was talking about the power breakthrough device. Bai Lai put his hand on his shoulder and told him not to think that he didn't know. He said that even the deputy head of the guild was interested in his subject. 
Wasabi Kun replied that it was a one-time item and should only be used during important PvP. Closing his eyes, he said that he planned to use this item to raise his place in the arena. Bailai exhaled and said it was boring. He said that the arena is a place for PvP, where any player can enter, even plebeians, and from this he loses motivation to even participate in it, although the rewards become better the higher the place in the ranking. Opening his eyes, Bai Lai thought that he was most interested in Tiana. Tiana continued to stare through the binoculars. He told her that there was no need for her to be so interested. Looking through the binoculars, she replied that she was just looking. Looking at the dark red portal, she said that her intuition tells her that something is about to happen. Inside the dungeon is a dark forest. Mud Dragon stood in front of the main character, shrouded in fire, waving its paws. The dialogue box says that Mud Dragon has entered Berserk mode. Jay Run shouted to the main character that the boss had entered Berserk mode and he needed to be careful. Long Face asked if he was sure he could do it. He told him not to let himself be touched, or he would die. Ling Si thought that after entering Berserk mode, the only thing he needed to watch out for was the skill he was going to use. His eyes glowed with fire. He thought it would be over in 30 seconds. The monster swung its hand wrapped in electricity and hit the ground with red energy. Ling Si thought that it's coming. Kicking off the ground, he leaped forward, throwing Molotov cocktails. He ran forward, surrounded by Molotov cocktails falling from above. The main character looked sharply to the side. Dodging the monster's blows, he kicked the Molotov cocktail forward. He repeated this action several times. Anti-mainstream exclaimed in surprise that he was dodging a boss skill in berserk mode with so few moves, while at the same time kicking the Molotov cocktails they threw at him. Noticing his skills and techniques, he asked who he was. Jay Run asked if he was hallucinating. With his eyes shining with delight, he turned his attention to its micro-mechanics. The dialogue box said, Due to the fact that you haven't taken any damage yet, your current combo accumulation is 3659. Frowning, Ling Si thought, Now. He quickly ran forward using the Jet Rush skill. The dialogue box says, A bolting attack utilizing the user's extreme grasp of body movements and agility. With a body like water, speed is fast as lighting, thus Jet Rush. Damage, deals the player's agility damage plus weapon damage based on the perfection rate of the skill. Cost, 90 mana. Range, 3 meters. Cooldown, 60 seconds. Suitable class, warrior, thief. Mud Dragon stood shrouded in fire, and the main character ran in his direction along the cliff. He hit the Molotov cocktail in the air with a dagger and shouted, Jet Rush, Starfire's Inferno. Mud Dragon's body was covered in multiple explosions. The Molotov cocktail fell on top of the boss. The main character appeared above him, swinging his dagger. He said it was time to end it. He smashed a Molotov cocktail over the boss head with a dagger. The dialogue box says that Jet Rush finished the combo, and a total of 3660 attacks were accumulated. The monster's head was blown apart by a huge explosion. The dialogue box says, Starfire's Inferno special attack has been activated, dealing five times more damage. Zio Land stared in surprise at the fire and the monster's empty health bar. The dialogue box reported that their team had defeated the Mud Dragon boss, Lord of the Swamp. She wondered what he had said. Ling Si asked her if she had studied novice healing. She replied that she had studied it. He said that he would give her the novice debuff disperse skill book, and she needed to learn it. Turning around, he said that he would leave the rest to her. The main character called out to Zio Lin. Long Face shouted at her to use Disperse. Jay Run shouted use healing. The anti-mainstream shouted at her to hurry up. Frowning, she obeyed. Dialogue boxes announced the use of the novice debuff Disperse and novice heal skills. Red energy glowed under the protagonist's feet. His health was close to zero, fire dealt him 24 damage, and healing restored 30 health. The dialogue box reported that 30 seconds of fire damage immunity had ended. Gritting his teeth, he said that he was lucky that her disperse and treatment were on time. They looked at the fallen monster in surprise, and the main character said that this style of fighting on the verge of life and death is still hard for him. The monster lay in front of them, splashing green liquid on the ground. The people near the dark red portal say that they still haven't come out, and it's already been a long time. The voice asked what they were doing there for so long. Another voice urged us to get out of here, because it's a waste of time. The guy smiled and told them to get out of here and said they didn't need any more information because they'd been waiting too long. The other guy thoughtfully said that the group of solo players must have been completely wiped out and they had nothing to figure out. The red-haired girl told the dark-furred beastman that this group of solo players was very good at stalling for time. The beastman laughed and told her to be patient, and one day they would still come out of there. 
Opening his eye a crack, he said with a smile that their task was to have them confirm something of insane difficulty. The dialogue box congratulated the group with hidden information on completing the Dark Forest Dungeon on insane difficulty. The crowd exclaimed in surprise when they noticed the dialogue box. The dialogue box reported that they were the first to complete the Dark Forest Dungeon on insane difficulty. The guy in green clothes exclaimed in surprise that there was even a notification about the first pass. A girl in a maid's outfit exclaimed in surprise that they had actually passed it. The guy in the helmet asked who they were and if they were from the guild that ranked first. The guy with the animal ears exclaimed in surprise that it was impossible. The dialogue box displayed the record of the first passage of insane difficulty by a team with hidden information. Bai Lai, looking at the dialogue box, said that they actually passed it. Surprised, he asked how they did it, and even more surprised, he turned his attention to Tiana. She walked forward with a frown and thought that she should find out who was commanding this group. Frowning, she thought she should meet him. People were shouting to look here because they were out. The main character came out of a dark red portal. They came out of the portal, and the crowd shouted that they were solo players who had passed an insane difficulty. A guy in the crowd, pointing his index finger in surprise, exclaimed that it was them. A voice in the crowd asked which guild they were from, shouting that they were very cool. The guy in the helmet exclaimed that they were incredible, because even the people from Celestial couldn't pass the increased difficulty. Another person asked what kind of equipment it was. The other guy said that their information is hidden and he can't view it. The anti-mainstream asked in surprise if they became famous so easily. Zio Lan, looking around, said that there were a lot of people here. A guy in the crowd with bright eyes asked if they, the people who managed to pass the insane difficulty, had any secrets that they could share. Longface smiled awkwardly and said that was why they surrounded them. Someone in the crowd said that this girl was also good. Zio Lan chuckled and said that she was just a simple healer. She thought that she couldn't have imagined that this would happen to her, and she likes that everyone is paying attention to her. Responding to the crowd, Jay Run said that he was just following the boss commands, and there's nothing to admire here. Ling Si, calmly closing his eyes, thought that as expected, they were immediately surrounded, and he did the right thing by asking them to hide their information. He called them to go, saying that it was inconvenient to talk here. He said that he still needed to explain how they would split the rewards for the first dungeon pass and what they would do next. Jay Run obeyed with a smile. Zio Lan said displeased that she wanted to show off a little more. The voice asked them if they had joined the guild. People in the crowd noticed that they were members of the Wolf's Fang Guild. The guild guy said that apart from the equipment set, there's nothing special about them. He said that they must have heard of the Wolf's Fang Guild ranked third among the top five guilds. He said that he is a vice captain of the third division. The main character thought that they still had the same presumptuous attitude. He thought that in his previous life, their guild was also in third place, but their arrogance was even worse than the guild in first place and they used their guild's name to take over the monster spawn sites everywhere. Frowning, he thought that solo players who didn't obey them became their target in PvP and all they could do was suffer in silence. Ling Si thought that he had suffered a lot at their hands in his past life. Anti-mainstream, noting that it was one of the top five guilds, asked if they were going to recruit them. Longface replied that they didn't have the skills to join any of the five major guilds. Vice Captain said that they are most likely not members of any of the five major guilds because they hid their information. He said they had good skills and asked who their captain was. They said that their captain was Ling Si, pointing their finger at him. Approaching him, the guy said that he could not have imagined that the thief would be the leader of the team. He asked if he had joined the guild. The main character calmly told his group that the server would close in two hours and they had to go. The guild guy frowned in annoyance and said that he was talking to him. Anti-mainstream awkwardly poked him on the shoulder, pointing his finger forward and said that the vice captain of the Wolf's Fang Guild was talking to him. The red-haired girl irritably shouted that even if he was a guild member in the first place, he shouldn't be so presumptuous because they were still a guild in the third place and he should at least answer them whether he was a guild member or not. The boy gritted his teeth. The anti-mainstream said fearfully that they were angry. The girl said that if they haven't joined the guild yet, they should consider it an honor to be invited to join. Frowning, the guild guy smirked and said that if they hadn't joined the guild yet, then he, as the third division's vice captain, would provide them with special treatment and maybe they could join their subguild first. Ling Si passed by, asking who they were, and said he wasn't interested. The guild boy and girl opened their mouths in surprise. The main character's team exclaimed in surprise that he declined the offer. Shaking with anger and cursing, the guild guy said that he was tired of him. A weapon started to appear in his hand, and he offered him a duel if he thought he was that good. He shouted for him to accept the challenge. A guy in the crowd shouted that they needed to get away from them. Another guy said that Wolf's Fang's vice captain was completely out of control. The girl next to him said that they would watch from a distance because they didn't want to be dragged into it. The anti-mainstream startled man shouted that this was bad because his opponent was a member of Wolf's Fang. 
The guy from their guild, pointing at the main character with his weapon, shouted for him to accept the challenge. The dialogue box said if he wanted to accept a request for an immediate duel from a stranger. Longface told the others to be careful and that they would step back a bit. Anti-mainstream asked if the main character had any grudge against the Wolf's Fang Guild. Lynx he closed his eyes and said that he didn't have time for this. Frowning, the guild guy said that if he didn't accept, it wasn't a problem. He said with a grim face that even if he got a red name here, no one would do anything to him. With his hand outstretched, he used the exploding fireball skill. The dialogue box says, you were attacked by a player. You can protect yourself. Killing an attacker in self-defense won't get you a red name. The main character dodged the fireball by standing to the side. He glanced at it, frowning. Lynx he jumped forward with a swing of his dagger, and the guild guy jumped back in surprise. He asked if he wanted to die. Jumping back, he wondered what kind of reaction speed it was. Frowning, he thought that he had dodged his exploding fireball by moving so little. Tiana shouted, intercepting thorny vines. Plant roots appeared between the main character and the guy from the guild. Ling Si looked away in surprise. Tiana was standing next to him, holding a pen and a piece of paper in her hand. The red-haired girl gritted her teeth in annoyance and said that she was from the Nebulous Guild. Tiana glanced at Ling Si and thought that her instincts told her that he was the person Dira was talking about. The red-haired girl shouted furiously, asking why she was interfering. Stepping forward, Tiana called out that he was a friend of the Nebulous Guild. She asked if they were going to create a conflict between the guilds by introducing the Wolf's Fang Guild. The guild guy gritted his teeth and said that they were their sworn enemies. A vein in the red-haired girl's face swelled with anger. A blade appeared in her hand, and she said that it was time for her to stop meddling in their affairs, otherwise they would get rid of her too. The guy shouted at her to put the gun away. Surprised, the girl obeyed. He shouted that it meant that she was going to protect this guy on behalf of the Nebulous Guild. He said with a vicious expression that they would fight to their last breath in monthly guild war next week. Tiana frowned and said that they would meet again in the guild war. The guild guy turned around and told the red-haired girl to leave. She asked if they were really going to leave just like that. She asked why, because they could have just gotten rid of them. The guy replied that it wouldn't be a problem if this thief didn't belong to any of the other four major guilds. But now that Nebulous was protecting him, would she be able to take responsibility for starting a war between the guilds? He said that if the higher-ups heard about it, even he wouldn't be able to get away with it. Grinning madly, he told Tiana to wait until they met at the guild war. He laughed angrily and said he would have a good time with her. Ling Si thanked Tiana. Jay Run asked if he was okay. The main character replied that he was fine. Jay Run replied that it was good. Wong Face said in surprise that they almost started fighting. Xiao Lan said it was scary. Tiana turned to the main character and asked if they were members of a guild. She said that being the first to pass the insane difficulty, there was no way they wouldn't show everyone their guild, because it was one of the many ways to achieve glory for the guild. She approached him and added that any normal guild wouldn't provoke the people from Wolf's Fang, and they have the guts. Tiana said that even as a professional, nothing good would happen to a solo player if they became an enemy of the five major guilds. She said with a smile that if she didn't help them, it would be difficult for him to resolve this situation unless he owed her a debt. The protagonist thought that she was right, and no matter how strong a person might be, it was nothing compared to a guild. Xiao Lan exclaimed with burning eyes that she had a rival. She exclaimed how dare she come and try to steal her strong guys. The main character asked what her intentions were. Tiana chuckled. Pointing her index finger at the main character, she said that she needed his help. The square was full of people and yellow portals. Tiana told Ling Si that if he joined their guild, Nebulous, for a short period of time and participated in the next monthly guild wars, she would either repay him with generous rewards or give him whatever equipment or materials she could get her hands on. She asked what she thought. Frowning, she thought that his skills were something to pay attention to and she could use him in the future. She thought that the first thing she should do was get him to join the Nebulous guild and then try to get him to stay in it. Ling Si folded his arms and refused. Tiana said in surprise that there was no need to refuse her so bluntly. The main character said that he doesn't plan to join the guild anytime soon, even for a while, and the restrictions from joining the guild will take away a lot of freedom from him. Tiana reached out her hand worriedly and said that if he was worried about restrictions, then as the division's vice captain, she would try to give him as few restrictions as she could. She said that she only needed his help to some extent in the monthly guild war. She asked him if he was happy with it. The main character looked at her and said that he didn't think her guild needed help. He added that he was just a level 5 thief. Tiana looked at him in surprise. She said they needed his skills, and Nebulous and Wolf's Fang were always enemies due to conflicts between them in the early game for the advantage. She said that at first everything was normal, and any guild in the development stage would come into at least some conflicts with others. Frowning, she said that up until now, the conflicts were getting bigger along with the guild's growth. She said that as he had seen just now, she had met some of the most problematic members of the Wolf's Fang guild. 
Tiana added that because she had just come to his defense, they would most likely target her in the next monthly guild war. Giving him a pitiful look, she begged him if he could protect her from being killed and forced to lose levels in the next monthly guild war. She thought she should make him stay. Ling Si calmly told her to just not participate. She said she couldn't, and thought it was a very cold answer. She wondered if he hadn't been moved at all. Tiana said that participating in the monthly guild wars is a way to get a large amount of guild honor points, and it has its own challenges. She opened her eyes in surprise, and a dialogue box appeared in front of her saying that a stranger had sent her a friend request. Turning away, the main character said that from the beginning he would add her as a friend and think about it. He thought that she most likely helped him because she wanted to get some benefits from him, but only caused herself more trouble in the process. After glancing at her, he said that he would give his answer before the Guild War. Tiana happily agreed and thought it was a success. Waving after him, she asked him to give her answer as soon as possible, because even though she would recommend him, he would still need to go through the normal entry process. The main character frowned and said that it was a chore and they would talk about it when the time came. She shouted that he would definitely be able to easily complete the entrance task. She said with a smile that she would wait for his answer. The dialog box next to it says that the friend request was accepted. The dialog box says, Player's Character Information. Player, Ling C. Class, Thief. Level, 5. Equipment, Starfire Set. Player's is personal information, age, 17. When she noticed his age, she thought he was 6 years younger than her. The information disappeared behind the message that the information was hidden, and Tiana exclaimed that he was fast. With a smile, she raised an eyebrow and thought how unkind he was to hide information even from his friends. Bai Lai was looking at her from around the corner. Frowning furiously, he cursed. The dialog box reported that information has been set to private. Lang Si thought it best not to disclose any information. Jay Run said with a smile that he was back. Long Face, with a smirk, asked what he was talking about with the nebulous beauty and if it was something he couldn't tell them. Anti-mainstream asked with a smirk if she really liked their cold boyfriend. Xiao Lan clenched her teeth angrily. The main character frowned and told them to stop talking nonsense, otherwise he wouldn't give them any equipment. Long Face and Anti-Mainstream, laughing awkwardly, said they were just joking. Ling Si said that the equipment he needs only drops from the insane difficulty of the Dark Forest, and the chance of dropping items in dungeons is high at the moment they are opened, and this time they were lucky. He said that he will keep the cheap assassin's equipment set arm guard, and they can divide the remaining items and coins among themselves equally. He thought that this set of equipment would provide the greatest agility bonus that a thief player below level 10 could get, and it would make life easier for him for a while. Anti-mainstream, with a flash of his eyes, exclaimed that this is a lot of material. Xiao Lan, laughing, shouted that she was rich. The main character thought that he could only wear it after the sixth level, and he needed to hurry up and get the rest of the items from the set as soon as possible. Jay Run asked in surprise that he was giving away the rest of the name, and even without considering the coins, the items are quite valuable. He offered to divide them equally. The anti-mainstream exclaimed in surprise. Lengths he said that he didn't need everything else. He added that he made changes to the experience distribution, lowering their proportion to stay at level 5, and they most likely raised their level. Xiao Lan exclaimed that she had reached the second level. Long Face and anti-mainstream said they had reached the fourth level. Jay Run exclaimed that he had reached the third level. The main character said that before he reaches the sixth level, they need to go through the dungeon several times so that he gets all the equipment from the set he needs. They exclaimed in surprise, and the main character said that he was quitting the game first, and they would meet here tomorrow. The team agreed. Jay Run said that he can still learn assassin skills and boss tricks. Another said that if he continued to help them, he would become rich. Another man laughed and said he accepted the gift. The latter said that they would be waiting for him here tomorrow, and he had better not be late. The main character agreed. 7 o'clock in the morning, Ling Si got up from the bed, removing the game helmet from his head. He thought that his current life was going smoothly. Heavenland's scientific helmet can allow players to have a good time playing the game without affecting real life or game progress. The main character greeted the old man and offered to help him clean up. The old man replied that he was up early. Over the next three days, they continuously challenged the insane complexity of the Dark Forest, and finally, on the third day before quitting the game, the main character collected the rest of the items from the cheap assassin's equipment set greaves, boots, and a headdress. The main character said goodbye to the noisy group. Jay Run said goodbye to him. Xiao Lan, her hand outstretched with tears in her eyes and on her knees, asked how he could leave them like this. The main character, saying goodbye to them, smiled and said that they would meet again. Frowning, the protagonist decided to move on to his next goal. Tenth level location, Castle of the Singing Moon. Behind the castle, surrounded by roses, was a large waterfall. Lengxi said that this thing should still be here. 
He dropped down from the cliff in a few leaps. The sixth level is visible above his head, and he thought he should be more careful. In front of him was a level 10 corpse seeking evil spirit. Looking at him, the protagonist thought that they had a difference of four levels. Watching it from the bushes, he thought he could handle one, but he might attract a whole horde. Frowning, he thought that with the extra agility and perception from the equipment set, he should be able to avoid them using the terrain. He thought that his goal wasn't to challenge the level 10 singing moon castle boss. Many monsters walk on the ground. The main character thought that for this he still does not have enough strength. He jumped down with a few jumps on the rocks and thought that he needed a skill book and waterfall, invisibility of the evil spirit. When he landed, he exclaimed in surprise. There were two fallen monsters on the ground in front of him, and he wondered why the remains of evil spirits were lying here. Frowning, he wondered if there was already a level 10 player here. Lang Si thought that in this game, it's worth a little distraction, and countless people start to catch up. The water in the waterfall falls down. The main character jumped forward from the cliff. When he landed in front of the chest with two blue lights, he thought that he had arrived at the place. The main character said that, as expected, he was still here. A cursed chest without a lock is lying on the rock. Standing in front of it, Ling Si thought that after opening it, he would put a debuff on it. The dialog box says, you have discovered a cursed chest without a lock. It looks like this chest isn't locked, but the person who opens it will be punished with a curse. Do you want to open it? Touching the cloth on the chest, he thought that compared to the skill he could get, it was definitely worth it and he should get it. The dialogue box says, the chest is open. You have received a minus 60% debuff that will be applied to all your stats. The curse will last for 6 hours. The effect will be activated immediately. A black aura poured out from the opening of the chest. The dialog box says, because of the curse chest without a lock, all your stats have been lowered by 60%. Time until the end of the curse, 5 hours 59 minutes. A black aura enveloped the protagonist, who frowned as he picked up a book that glowed purple and said that he had received it. Grinning nervously with black eyes, he thought that the skill books took time to learn, so he needed to find a safe place. The voice shouted that he had said that there would be an fool who would open the chest. The main character opened his mouth in surprise and turned around. In front of him were three people of the 10th and 11th levels. The guy in the hat told the captain that he was a genius, thinking of waiting for some fool to open a chest and get a curse to steal the skill book from him. Frowning, Ling Si gritted his teeth. The water in the waterfall fell noisily down. The guy laughed and shouted that they had been waiting for a fool like him for days. The guy with the elf ears said to let him see what's inside the chest, since it's worth such a strong debuff. The main character thought that he was careless and didn't think about the fact that someone could ambush on such a map, and now he has the invisibility of an evil spirit. Frowning, he thought that if it hadn't been for the curse, he was sure he could have stood up to them. The main character thought that now his stats are lowered by 60%, and this will be problematic, given that the opponents have two tenth levels and one eleventh. The captain told him that he had to be skilled enough to come to this location at the sixth level. Lang Si wondered if he should give them the book to ensure his survival. Under the captain's health bar, it was written that he was from the Wolf's Fang Guild. Grinning, he said that he was originally prepared for a team fight, but he didn't expect a single person to be up against him. He told him to be obedient and hand over the item. The main character thought it was the people from Wolf's Fang again. He thought that given the characters of the members of this guild that he had seen, even if he gave them the book, they would still kill him. Frowning, he said, who would have thought that the mighty Wolf's Fang Guild would steal things from solo players? He asked what if he didn't want to give it up. A dagger appeared in his hand. The dialog box reported that the item was stowed away in the backpack. The beast-eared guy grinned and said that he didn't think he would be so stubborn even after finding out that they were members of the Wolf's Fang Guild. Drawing an arrow in his bow, he told him to die. Frowning, Ling Si used a backstab. The dialog box reported that he had attacked the player, and now he can defend himself justifiably. When he was behind the beast-eared guy, he thought that whoever attacked first would gain an advantage. He swung the dagger. The captain with a huge sword with a grin blocked his strike with a dauntless block. Gritting his teeth, the protagonist thought that his stats were too low, and even the speed of his skill slowed down noticeably. The sharp-eared guy laughed viciously at how dare he decide to attack them first. He laughed. He swung his sword and knocked the main character back, dealing 30 damage. They used a locked-on shot and a yellow arrow shot towards Ling Si. He thought they were cornering him and told himself to calm down and think. He wondered if there were any items that could help him in this situation. Hearing that someone used a backstab, the main character opened his eyes in surprise. The guy in the hat swung the blade behind him, dealing 120 damage. The captain ran to meet him and shouted that they would die faster if they gave the item to them. Swinging his sword using Greatsword's punishment, he shouted for him to die and hand over the item. Blood gushed out of the protagonist's chest. The elf-eared guy grinned darkly and said that he would silence him with the vein cutter and then he wouldn't be able to fight. 
gritting his teeth, Ling Xi thought that he couldn't afford to be hit by the silence casting skill. The guy behind him was standing with his bowstring drawn. The main character used Jet Rush. The guy with the bow exclaimed that he was coming to him to make himself a simple target. He shouted that he was calling death himself. The guy fired a bow. The main character used a backstab before the arrow hit him in the torso. It hit the archer in the back, dealing him 50 damage. He was surprised to think that he could fight like this, even after his stats were lowered by 60%. He wondered how strong he would be without the curse. The guy in the hat, frowning and gritting his teeth, said that he used his skill activation spells to dodge their skills and attacks. He said they were very precise micro-movements, and he wouldn't have been able to do it if he'd been even a millisecond late. The guy said that even he couldn't do it, and asked who he was. The captain asked why they were standing and shouted at them to attack. The man in the hat obeyed, and the archer cursed as he clutched his back. He gave the command to surround him and not let him leave. The main character was standing in a scattering cloud of dust. A basic war smoke bomb appeared in his hand, and he thought it was the only thing he could do right now. The dialogue box says that basic war smoke has been activated, and all players within its range will temporarily lose their sight and cannot be targeted. Duration, 3 seconds. The boys shielded themselves from the smoke. He shouted that it was a small trick. Swinging his blue energy sword, he used AoE Disperse. The main character used a one-time grappling hook and, grabbing it, flew out of a cloud of smoke. The captain shouted that he was using grappling hook to escape. He ordered them to shoot him. The archer fired a bow using locked on shot. A yellow arrow shot towards the main character's back. The arrow pierced his chest and gritting his teeth, he thought that he would remember Wolf's Fang. His hand loosened and he let go of the rope. The main character fell into a waterfall. The guy in the hat shouted that he had fallen into a waterfall. The captain swore and said they didn't get the item. The archer said that if he fell from such a height, he would surely die with his remaining health. The captain, looking at the splashing water, said that they would meet again and then he would be out of luck. Waves of water hit the stone shore. The main character's hand appeared out of the water. He climbed out onto the stone bank. Frowning, he thought that it was lucky that he had spent a lot of money on instant recovery potion before coming here, otherwise, he would have died right after falling into the waterfall. Frowning, he said that he didn't want to have anything to do with Wolf's Fang, but it was their own fault for angering him. There's a plate of pink cake on the table full of papers. The dialogue box reported that a friend was calling. Tiana answered the call, asking who was calling her. She opened her eyes in surprise when she heard the main character's name. She exclaimed happily, adjusting her glasses, that he had finally called her and she had been waiting for him for several days. Ling Xi told her to help him organize the entrance test and he accepts her offer. She took off her glasses in surprise. Tiana jumped up, agreed, and asked when he would be free. She said she would arrange a test for him right away. He said, right now, nebulous examination area. The stone stage was surrounded by trees. A man in the crowd asked if the entrance test hadn't ended recently. Another person said that he heard that Vice Captain Tian especially arranged it for one person, and he came here after seeing a message in the guild channel. The guy laughed and asked if it was some strong rich kid. The other guy said he wasn't sure, but Tiana wasn't the kind of person who would treat rich people differently. Tiana said they had arrived. The main character asked why there were so many people here. Tiana replied that they were very curious about him because he was the first person to pass the entrance test alone. The guys in the crowd looked at him and said that he looked ordinary. Frowning, Ling Xi thought, why are there so many people here, and they'd better go level up. Exhaling, he said that he was surrounded by an annoying crowd again. Tiana said that, compared to the crowd that had gathered after he had passed the insane difficulty, this crowd was small and he should still try to get used to it. She thought that she was right, and it really was him. Looking at the main character, Dira exclaimed that it was him, and she couldn't have thought that he would be the first to pass the insane difficulty of the Dark Forest. She asked how she was able to convince him to join, after all, she had already offered him, but he refused. She said that he was special, and since he decided to take part in the challenge, she should definitely make him stay. Tiana thought with a frown that she was right, and having such a talent around would definitely help her achieve her ultimate goal. Wasabi-kun said they were here. Tiana told the protagonist that he could easily pass this test. Bai Lai said with a smirk that he was the thief that Tiana was talking about non-stop, and he passed the insane challenge. He said it was interesting. Tiana said it was the captain of their third division, Bai Lai. She said that the members of the third division behind him are in charge of the Nebulous Guild's entrance test. She said that he needed to hold out for 10 minutes against the guild member in charge of the challenge to pass. A guy in green clothes waved his hand, asking to choose it. Tiana told the main character to choose his opponent. Grinning, Bai Lai asked her to wait. He suggested that the main character let him be his opponent on the trial. Tiana said in surprise that there was no need for him to fight, since this was just a normal test. 
Bai Lai said that since Tiana had recommended him convincingly, and even arranged the entrance test specifically for him, then he, as the division captain, should also take responsibility. He thought that if he had the courage to accept the challenge, he would humiliate him. He thought resentfully how much he was laughing at making Tiana talk about herself nonstop. She said they were three levels apart, and that was a bad idea. Ling Xi said he was fine with that. Tiana turned to look at him in surprise. Frowning, the protagonist said that he didn't care if it was him or someone else. He said hurry up and get started. Tiana whispered worriedly to him that he was a division captain and three levels above him. She asked him why he had accepted his offer. The main character replied that this is not a problem. He thought that he wanted this boring ordeal to be over as soon as possible. Bai Lai, trembling with anger, asked why they were whispering and standing so close to each other. He said if he wanted to start, follow him. He thought that he would definitely humiliate him in front of Tiana. Bai Lai said that the test field is located in the forest area. Tiana called out to Ling Si. She put a bracelet on his arm and told him to wear it. He asked me what it was. Tiana replied that it was an evaluation device that every guild has. She explained that evaluation device will issue a primary score based on the player's current level, stats, equipment, and how they played in the past. She said that it also constantly updates the score during the test, making it easier to determine a person's skills, and by wearing it, they will be able to see their score. Tiana said that according to the rules of the Nebulous Guild, a person who scored less than 100 points would become a member of the 3rd Division. A person with a score between 100 and 150 would enter the 2nd Division, and a person who received more than 150 points would become a member of the 1st Division. The main character interrupted her and said that all his stats were lowered by 60% due to the curse. He suggested that this should affect the assessment. She asked in surprise what he said and how he was going to fight. She asked how long it would last. The main character pointed to the curse icon and said that it would last about 10 minutes. He said that everything was fine, and since this was a normal test, there shouldn't be any problems. The main character went ahead and said that he wanted to finish the challenge as soon as possible in order to continue raising his level. Covering her face with her hand, Tana said that Bai Lai's score was 92 points. Looking at the arena, a man in the crowd shouted that the test was starting. A girl in the crowd exclaimed that Bai Lai himself was going to fight. A guy in the crowd exclaimed that it would be interesting. Tiana and Wasabi Kun watched with a serious face. Bai Lai said that the time limit is 10 minutes and to be honest with everyone, he won't feel sorry for it. He told him to accept the challenge. The main character agreed and said that it would be better if he used his full strength because he is a thief and Bai Lai is an archer and his classes counters his. The dialogue box reported that he had accepted the invitation to the guild entry test. Bai Lai smirked and asked if he thought he was an ordinary archer. A bow appeared in his hand, and he said that he would pay for such jokes. An ice bow appeared in his hand. Ling Xi thought that it looked like he was an agility-type archer with an ice-slowing bow. Frowning, he thought that for a player close to his level, he would be quite a difficult opponent. Bai Lai used rapid fire, moving quickly and shooting ice arrows at him. The main character, while dodging the attacks, thought that he immediately started using strong attacks. He blocked two ice arrows with his dagger. Bai Lai smirked and said that if all he could do was block, then he wouldn't let him pass the test. He shot an ice arrow, shouted, pierced through. He used the detonating icicle skill. The main character raised his dagger with a frown. The ice arrow approaches the blade of the dagger. When it hit it, it exploded with blue energy. The main character gritted his teeth, and the arrow exploded in a big blue explosion. Frowning, he thought it was creating an icy explosion. The attack dealt him 120 damage. The guy raised his hand up and shouted that Bai Lai was very pushy today, and it looked like the newcomer would have to suffer. Another guy exclaimed that he felt like he wouldn't pass the test. Tiana thought worriedly that he needed to hold on for those 10 minutes. The screen in front of her read 85. Tiana looked at the screen in surprise. Noticing the 85 points, she wondered if he had mentioned that he was under a curse that lowered all of his stats by 60%. Looking at him, she thought that his score was still very high. She thought that he probably had about six minutes left before the curse was lifted. The main character stood frowning. He grinned slightly. Rushing forward and swinging the dagger wrapped in a purple aura, Ling Si grinned viciously. Tiana wondered what his score would be in perfect shape. Bai Lai put three ice arrows in the bow. He fired, and the main character dodged with quick sideways movements. Bai Lai chuckled and asked if he was trying to get closer with such clumsy skills. He shouted that he was still a little weak and he would turn him into a honeycomb. Frowning, the protagonist wondered what was wrong with this guy because the hostility on his face was obvious. He used a backstab and ended up behind Bai Lai. As he swung the dagger, he thought that this debuff was hindering him a lot because even the time to use a backstab was slowed down. Bai Lai dodged with a smirk and said that he was waiting for him to use a backstab. 
there was a blue explosion. Bai Lai used blinding counter and a cloud of smoke rose in front of the main character. The dialogue box says, blinding counter makes all your attacks for the next two seconds ineffective and limits your vision to one meter. Frowning, Ling Xi noticed that it was a blinding skill. Frowning, he saw a smoke screen in front of him and thought that he couldn't see anything but this fog. Bai Lai shot out four ice arrows. A stream of ice arrows hit the protagonist, and he thought with gritted teeth that he wouldn't be able to dodge the arrows this time. Bai Lai, releasing the bowstring, laughed viciously. Arrows hit the main character, dealing 30 damage each, and Bai Lai used frost crystal detonation. People in the stands admired Bai Lai, praising his combo. Tiana thought with a frown, she told him not to accept this challenge. Wasabi Kun asked her about the main character's current debuff. Opening her eyes in surprise, she asked how he knew. He replied that, under normal circumstances, a stab in the back would be used faster, and as a thief, he should know at least that much. She replied that he was right, and he was currently under a curse that lowered his stats by 60%. Wasabi Kun thought that he had been fighting under a debuff all this time. He said it was interesting. Bai Lai said there were seven minutes left until the end of the test. He asked if he was going to give up. He added that he didn't fight very well. The main character said it was more like he was taking out his anger on him. The smile disappeared from Bai Lai's face. He shouted that he was talking nonsense. The main character frowned and thought that if he stretched it out a little longer, he could hold out for seven minutes. While shooting at the fleeing Ling Si, Bai Lai asked where he was going. Clucking his tongue, he ran after him and asked if he thought hiding in the woods would help him. He shouted at him not to even try to escape. The guy in the stands asked if he was going to fight in the woods and if the thief thought he could beat him on another terrain. Another guy exclaimed that then they wouldn't be able to see anything. Tiana and Wasabi Kun ran after them. Wasabi Kun asked her if she knew how long this debuff would last. Tiana replied that it should end soon. He said that Bai Lai might be in danger. Bai Lai runs through the forest and shouts at the protagonist to stop hiding. He shouted that he had already told him not to think that he was an ordinary archer. He shouted that he could beat him even in the forest. The main character said that he had no reason to lure him here other than to save him from embarrassing himself in front of the rest of the guild members. Bai Lai stopped and drew his bowstring. He asked if he was going to run away again. He shouted that there was only one minute left until the end of the test and then they would see who was the fool. He said that if he begged for it, he would consider letting it pass. The effect of the curse ended and the main character, grinning, said that he would no longer run. The dialogue box says, the curse has ended. The debuff that reduces stats by 60% has been removed. Ling Si, dagger in hand, said that it was more than enough for one minute to make him think again about whether he was worthy to join their guild. Bai Lai, pulling the bowstring with an ice arrow, chuckled and said that, he looks cool now. Tiana exclaimed that evaluation device is responding, and they are nearby. The screen in front of her read, 130. She thought that the main character's values were still going up. She was surprised to see that his points had reached 140 and were still rising. She called out that they were here. The main character's attacks deal Bai Lai damage. He used Jet Rush and dealt 60 damage to it by hitting it with a dagger. Bai Lai flew backwards. He was surprised to think about how good his control and mechanics were, even though he was weak before. Wasabi Kun cursed. Bai Lai cursed and asked if he had pretended before. He asked if he was looking down on him. Pulling the string of the ice arrow bow, he shouted at him not to blame him for accidentally killing him. A dialogue box announced that the test mode was cancelled. Tiana shouted for Bai Lai to stop. Bai Lai shot an ice arrow and shouted for the main character to die. He used locked shot, detonating icicle. The main character ran towards the ice arrow, swinging his dagger. He grinned and used a backstab. Once behind Bai Lai, he swung his dagger. Bai Lai smirked and asked if he was going to try again. He asked if he still hadn't realized that this skill didn't work on him. He tried to use blinding counter, but Ling Si interrupted him, saying that it was too slow. With a swing of his dagger, he slapped Bai Lai on the back. The dialogue box reported that the skill was interrupted. Bai Lai thought about how he did it and how his speed seemed to have multiplied. Turning around in fright, he thought that he was a full three levels higher. The main character forcefully kicked him in the back, pushing Bai Lai away. The impact sent him flying. Ling Si asked him what he was talking about earlier. Pointing his dagger at him, he asked who would kill whom now. Bai Lai gritted his teeth. The thrown dagger hit the dagger in the protagonist's hand. He glanced to the side and Wasabi Kun told him to put the dagger away. He said that killing him would not increase his score in the trial. The main character asked if this was the case. Grinning, he asked why he couldn't fight with both of them then. Wasabi Kun told the protagonist that killing Bai Lai would not improve his test score. Ling Si asked if this was the case. Frowning, dagger in hand, he asked why he shouldn't fight both of them. Bai Lai asked if he wanted to fight both of them at the same time. As he got to his feet, he cursed and shouted at him to stop acting so presumptuous. He said he could handle it alone. 
Wasabi Kun frowned, thinking that he had beaten Bai Lai so badly and that he was interested in this thief's skills. A dagger appeared in his hand and he said that he wanted to see if he had the skill to handle it. Bai Lai turned around and asked if he had hurt him. He shouted that he said he could handle it alone. Wasabi Kun told him that he could beat him and he feels like a thief. Bai Lai gritted his teeth. Wasabi Kun said that he has a threatening aura and from the fact that he's completely calm, it's clear that he hasn't fought at full strength yet. Kiana worriedly said that this was enough for the test and asked Wasabi Kun and Bai Lai to calm down. Wasabi Kun replied that they would know when to stop. Bai Lai gritted his teeth and thought that he had humiliated him in front of Tiana. He agreed with a wicked grin and said that they would know when to stop. He thought that he would definitely trample on it. An ice bow and arrow appeared in his hands and he shouted to Wasabi Kun that he wanted to use this move. Wasabi Kun gritted his teeth and wondered if he had lost his mind just to maintain his reputation. Bai Lai soared into the air on top of the main character's head and shouted for him to die. He shot an ice arrow with a sinister face and shouted that it was his strongest shot. It used an absolute zero arrow array. A stream of ice arrows shot down over Ling Si. The arrows stabbed into the ground around him, forming an icy circle around the protagonist. The dialog box says, Absolute zero arrow array, an AoE attack exclusive to archers that can damage both enemies and allies. The arrow array will be formed after 1.5 seconds, dealing the damage of ice arrows to every player inside it. Damage, deals 60 magic damage per second for up to 5 seconds. Cost, 120 mana. Range, 9 meters. Cooldown, 180 seconds. Tiana was surprised to think that this was an absolute zero arrow array, and once the array was formed, Ling Si would be in danger. Bai Lai shouted at Wasabi Kun to stop the protagonist from getting out of there. He shouted that there was only one second left and told him to put him down now, not giving him a chance. Wasabi Kun stood in a fighting stance, looking at Ling Si, and thought that he wanted to see what he would do when facing two opponents whose level was higher than his. He used a lethargy backstab and, once behind the main character, hit him with a dagger. Frowning, Wasabi Kun apologized. Tiana exclaimed in fright and thought that Wasabi Kun, as one of the main people, is considered the best thief in the third division, and his movements and skills are better than the movements and skills of the thieves in the second division. With a worried frown, she thought that, after all, Ling Si was too presumptuous. Bai Lai grinned, complimented Wasabi Kun on her work, and shouted for him to leave the area of effect of the skill as soon as possible. Wasabi Kun said something was wrong. He thought that he felt as if he had stabbed cotton wool. Opening his eyes wide in surprise, he said that something was wrong. Ling Si turned around, revealing a skeleton with a dark purple aura coming from its mouth and eye sockets. Wasabi Kun was put in fear and shouted that he had been tricked. The dialogue box reported that the fear state was applied to him and he would lose control of his body for two seconds. Wasabi Kun froze in place, trembling with fright. Tiana shouted that a ray will be formed soon. Bai Lai cursed. Wasabi Kun, wrapped in ice, thought it was too late, the ice was covering his body and he couldn't move. He screamed in pain, and the ice magic dealt him 60 points of damage each. They shouted that Wasabi Kun was trapped inside a ray. Bai Lai cursed and asked where the thief had gone. He tensed as he heard the protagonist's voice behind him saying that he was glad that he had learned this skill before coming here. Behind him, Ling Si stood with a dagger in his hand and told him to make sure that before using a skill like Absolute Zero Arrow Array, he did not forget to fix the opponent in one place. Bai Lai asked fearfully when he had made it. The main character asked if he had to explain it to him. He thought that when they were about to attack him, he used evil spirit's invisibility just in case, and they attacked the evil spirit that he created to replace himself. The dialogue box says, evil spirit's invisibility creates the player's evil spirit and gives the real body invisibility. Opponents who get close to the evil spirit will fall under the fear state for two seconds. The real body will be invisible for three seconds. Special effect, the next attack after invisibility deals 300% critical damage, including skill damage. Cost, 96 mana. Cooldown, 300 seconds. Tiana was surprised to think that this skill was very cool. She ran up to them and asked the main character to let go of Bai Lai for now. She told Bai Lai that, after he showed his skills, he had to pass the test. Wasabi Kun shouted that the trial wasn't over yet. The dialog box indicates that the absolute zero arrow array skill action is over. He was standing in a cloud of dust. When Bai Lai noticed Wasabi Kun, he saw the item he had obtained from the dungeon. Wasabi Kun, who was wrapped in a red aura, said with a frown that he was going to use this item in the arena to raise his ranking, but he would think it was more worth the challenge. Frowning, he said, 15 seconds. The dialogue box says, power breakthrough device, a single-use item dropped from a dungeon. Level requirement, none. Effect, increases all stats by 90%, item not stackable. Cooldown for using the item again, 3 days in real life. Pointing at Ling Si with his dagger, he told him to show him his real strength. The main character said with a grin that he seemed to be interested in him. 
Bai Lai glanced at him with a frown. Lang Xi took the dagger hilt forward and stabbed Bai Lai in the neck. Tiana called out to Bai Lai, who had fallen to the ground. The main character told her not to worry because he just knocked him out with a critical hit from the skill. He told her to take it to the side. He thought about how he missed giving his all just to show them who was better. He thought that it was the same in his previous life. The main character frowned and thought that he was falling and rising endlessly, gradually getting stronger. The main character now has a golden insignia. Tiana was standing next to Bai Lai, who was sitting on the ground, wrapped in green roots from her spell. She opened her mouth in surprise. Noticing that the Ling Si strength value on the screen was starting to skyrocket, she asked what was wrong with the measuring device and the score. She wondered what was going on. The main character, standing in front of Wasabi Kun, agreed to 15 seconds with a grin. The main character thought about his past life, about his past self, which was difficult, but he still kept in a place full of strong people, putting all his faith and honor into battles, fighting for glory. He thought that he was fighting, putting everything on the line to prove who was the strongest of all, and this feeling allowed him to move forward. The main character and Wasabi Kun are standing opposite each other. Ling Si thought that today, at this moment, the opponent opposite him reminded him of this feeling. Standing upright in the dissipating cloud of dust, he thought that those indescribable hot emotions inside him had been reawakened once again, and it seemed like they were awakening something else. Tiana stared at the rising numbers in surprise. Wasabi Kun said with a frown that his eyes made him even more convinced that using the power breakthrough device was the right choice. He told him not to dare hold back and let him feel his full strength. Ling Si, frowning, held out his dagger and said that he would do so because he hadn't been so excited in a long time. Wasabi Kun rushed forward, saying, 15 seconds. They ran towards each other, and Wasabi Kun shouted for them to end this. They slammed their daggers together, gritting their teeth. Wasabi Kun swung his weapon. The main character jumped back and held out his dagger. Wasabi Kun thought that this thief Ling Si was very fast. Ling Si glanced at him with a serious face. Wasabi Kun was about to use a backstab, but he was interrupted by the protagonist's hand coming towards his face. He was surprised to find that he was faster than he thought. The main character hit Wasabi Kun in the torso. The dialogue box reported that the backstab skill was interrupted. Jumping back, Wasabi Kun wondered if he was crazy for attacking him like this. Ling Si frowned seriously. Wasabi Kun grinned and thought that at such a close distance, he definitely wouldn't be able to react in time. He used a backstab. Xiao Lan said that she missed the time when Ling Si took them along to level up. She and her group were sitting at a table with food, and she said with a smile that it was only thanks to Ling Si that they were able to sell all these materials and get a lot of money. She said that if it hadn't happened, they wouldn't have been able to have such a banquet full of food with bonuses and buffs. Long Face asked irritably if they hadn't leveled up fast enough even without his help. Xiao Lan said that they were able to level up quickly on their own thanks to the items they obtained in that dungeon. Anti-mainstream asked Jay Run what he was looking at all this time. He replied that these were notes he made while they were traveling together with Ling Si, and they were just things he learned from him. Xiao Lan asked if they could make him as strong as him. He laughed awkwardly and said he hoped so. Jay Run asked if they remembered the main character's movements when they defeated the Mud Dragon in the Mad Level Dungeon. He said that he wasn't sure at the time, but now that he compares it with a lot of information that he was able to find, he is sure. He said his game mechanics, controls, and moves are top time state. Xiao Lan exclaimed that the name sounded like it was full of philosophy. Long Face asked her what she was thinking. He said he had also heard rumors about top time. He said that this word means the moment when a person reaches a state of complete immersion with their game character, and once they reach this state, they can use incredibly fast micro mechanics and reaction speed. J Run said that the term appeared in old online games and is still used today. He said that this is a feeling that all professionals want to achieve, and it is not an exaggeration to say that it can only be discovered, not found. Long Face said it was just a rumor. Frowning, he said that if Ling Si was truly a person capable of mastering top time, then he would be able to achieve incredible feats. The main character hit Wasabi Kun with a dagger, interrupting his skill. The dialogue box announced that the backstab skill was aborted. Gritting his teeth, Wasabi Kun thought that this was not possible. He wondered how he was able to react so quickly, after all, he had even upgraded his stats with the power breakthrough device. Frowning, he thought he couldn't believe it. He used clone execution, and there were three Wasabi Kun in front of the main character. Wasabi Kun was surprised to see Ling Si's fist approaching in front of him. The main character hit him in the face, interrupting the use of the skill. Wasabi Kun thought it was impossible. He wondered why his reaction speed was so fast. Wasabi Kun used quick attack, but it interrupted his skill. He thought that in front of him, all his movements were useless. He used Vital Stab, but that skill was also interrupted. Wasabi Kun pushed the main character's dagger into his body and said that he wouldn't let him pull it out. 
He said he couldn't do anything without his weapon. Frowning, he shouted that he would make him pay with his blood, but he didn't finish. With a wave of his hand, the protagonist grabbed Wasabi Kun's hand. Frowning, he jumped behind him and placed his foot on his back. He was standing behind him, twisting his arm back and forth. Links, he said it was over. Wasabi Kun's dagger was in front of him, stuck in the ground. The dialogue box reported that he was disarmed. Wasabi Kun opened his mouth in surprise. The dialogue box described the disarmed state, when your weapon is taken away or broken in battle, any attacks and skills will lose weapon damage bonuses. Tiana's eyes widened and her mouth dropped open. Wasabi Kun said that he lost, and the main character won. He said with a smirk that he was strong, and the main character let go of his hand. Wasabi Kun said that Tiana was right about him, and he passed the test. Leng Si said that now that he had finished the test, he was leaving. Tiana had told him not to forget about the monthly guild wars and he had to come to the meeting. The main character replied that he would return the day after tomorrow. Tiana thought that she had finally managed to get it. Wasabi Kun asked her where Bai Lai was. She said that he seemed very shaken up by what had happened and left without saying a word. Wasabi Kun closed his eyes and told him to let him rest for a while. He said he had lost his mind. He asked what the final ranking of Ling Si was. Tiana said, 86. After being silent for a while, Wasabi Kun laughed and said that Bai Lai's final score was 92 points, he had 90 points, and Ling Si had 86 points. He laughed and said it was very interesting. He praised Tiana for her good work and said that it was time for her to return as well. Tiana thought that she still didn't know if the device was broken or if she had accepted a monster into the guild. Wasabi Kun said that they still needed to discuss the monthly guild war. Tiana agreed and followed him. Final score of Ling Si, 993. The sun was shining brightly over the desert. Boundless Desert. Level 7 Map. The main character stands surrounded by wolves, one of which is red in color. He waved his hand. The red wolf growled loudly. The gray wolves leaped and charged at Ling Si. The main character swung a dagger and, using throat slasher, cut the throat of the wolves. Standing in front of the red wolf, he said that now it was just him. Using Shadow Flash Blink, he appeared in front of the Red Wolf, swinging his dagger. He hit him on the back of the head from behind. Red Wolf lost consciousness. Frowning, Ling Si used Flow and Bone Breaker. A stream of purple and yellow energy surrounded the wolf, dealing damage to it. The protagonist exhaled, and the dagger in his hand disappeared. He thought that he had spent a lot of time trying out new skills and only leveled up once, killing monsters for two days. Looking at the dialogue box, he thought that the efficiency of completing such tasks is not enough, and he still needs a group. The dialogue box reported that he had completed the wolf slaughter task. Frowning, he thought that the higher the level, the harder it would be for him to level up, and the current efficiency was no good. He thought that there was a limit to what he could do alone. The dialogue box reported a call from a friend. Ling Si answered the call. Tiana furiously asked where he was and why he hadn't responded to her message. She shouted that the monthly guild war was about to start, and he needed to quickly come to them to prepare for it. Closing one eye, the main character said that he was completing a task and therefore did not see her message. She told him to come quickly because only he didn't come. Lang Si said that he understood and would come soon. Several people are standing near the large stone doors. A guy with long blonde hair raised his hand and shouted that he was here. The main character goes to meet them together with Tiana. Dira said she was happy to meet him again and welcomed him to Nebulus. The main character replied, likewise. Tiana said it was Dira and they seemed to have seen each other before. The main character asked the guy with long blonde hair if he was saving his staff. He shouted that he could even equip it. Tiana said that Dira and her group are people she trusts a lot, and they are also members of their group in this guild war. She said that there was a limit on how many people could join the guild war, but they were free to form groups of anyone they wanted against other guilds. Dira told her not to worry, and this time she wouldn't let anyone hurt her. Tiana said with a smile that they would do their best together. The main character thought with a grin that Tiana could seduce both men and women. He said it was his first time participating in a guild war. He asked if there was anything he needed to know about. Tiana turned around, exclaiming that she had completely forgotten, and said that she would explain the rules of the monthly guild wars. She said that the monthly guild war is a monthly competition where guilds compete against each other. Each guild will send a certain number of participants, and their glory score will depend on how many people they kill. That is, between the time the door opens and closes, the more kills a guild makes, the higher its rank will be. The guild with the highest score will be able to increase its ranking, so the monthly guild war is an important way for guilds to show their strength. Ling Si asked if it would be an easy victory for guilds that are already strong, such as the five major guilds. Tiana replied that they can't do anything about it, because the five major guilds have already shown their strength, but there is still one way, and the players call it the way of survival. Usually, other guilds don't take the initiative to provoke the five main guilds, 
and they fight against guilds of the same level or weaker. This is how they maintain and raise the ranking of their guilds. Tiana added that the five major guilds wouldn't be so cowardly as to attack people weaker than them. Frowning, the protagonist replied that this is how the weak live. He said he understood, and there was something he needed to talk to Tana about in private. The main character called her to follow him. Dira asked in surprise what secrets they might have and why they couldn't talk about it here. The dark-haired guy said with a grin to Dira that it looked like she had a strong opponent. Tiana asked him in surprise that he wanted to start a band later. Ling Si replied that the group would still belong to Nebulus, but would not be part of any division, and it would be the main one in that group. Tiana looked at him in surprise. The main character said that he would choose the participants independently, and they could pass the test after they joined the guild. He asked her what she thought. Tiana wondered if that meant she would be playing the role of manager. She said it had never happened before. She thought that he wanted to create a strong group, and if she was in charge of it, then perhaps this group could bring her unexpected results. Tiana asked if he had any contestants in mind. The main character replied that he came up with this idea only today. He said thoughtfully that even though there were a lot of talented people in this game, getting them to join wouldn't be easy. Tiana replied that since he had joined their guild, she would do everything in her power to help him, because that was the promise they made. She said with a smile that as a vice captain of the third division, she would help him with this idea. Frowning, she said that he should promise her that he wouldn't betray her. Ling Si laughed and told her not to worry because he wasn't that kind of person. He noticed the noise. A guy with blonde hair and a shield on his back shouted that he would not be a burden to them and asked to be accepted into his group. He shouted that he would try harder and he would definitely take the most damage. The guy in the helmet exhaled, said that they should beg him, and asked to let them go. The short-haired guy frowned and said that the other groups had already rejected him and he shouldn't join the guild war. He said that with his skills, he would be abused by other players. Ruko pleaded and shouted that he had tried very hard for the chance to join the guild war this month. He asked them to let him join them. He shouted that if he couldn't join the team, he would lose his qualifications to join the monthly guild war. The main character asked if Nebulus accepts small children. Tiana said that he is a child who dreams of becoming a great tank warrior. She said that he had participated in the guild challenge many times, and later, after seeing that he has a lot of perseverance, she allowed him to join the guild to help him gain experience. She said his name was Ruko Zong. The main character opened his mouth in surprise. Grabbing Tiana by the shoulders, he asked her his name. Tiana replied that his name was Ruko Zong. She wondered why he was so excited. Leng Si, frowning in surprise, thought that he remembered this name, and he was one of the six divine shields in his previous life, nicknamed Sacred Mountain Ruko. He wondered in surprise if this little beastman was really him. The guy in the helmet told Ruko that it wasn't that he didn't want to help him, but that his presence would drag down the entire team. He said that all the groups he participated in in the past guild events were ranked last. The short-haired guy said with a frown that the guild war was about to start. He said to ignore it because they don't have time. He said that in reality, not everything can be done with hard work. Ruko was crying through gritted teeth. The guy told him that he needed to understand the difference in skill between him and the others and asked him not to drag them down again. Hearing the main character's voice, Ruko opened his eyes in surprise. The main character said that he doesn't have an opinion on what they just said, but he thinks that this hard work will make things much more interesting. He asked Ruko with a smile if he agreed. A guy with short hair exclaimed that it was a newbie. He asked since when he was allowed to pry into their affairs. Holding out his hand, Ling Si asked Ruko if he wanted to join his group. He was standing in front of it, kneeling on one knee. Ruko looked at him in surprise. This invitation was the beginning of a highly respected legendary band in Heavenland, Shadow. The doors opened, and a voice shouted that a horn had sounded. The voice announced that the guild war was about to begin. Dira with her group, Ling Si, Ruko, Tiana, and the other guild members walked forward with a serious frown. Two masked men were standing next to the gong. On the head of one of them was a red flame, the other a purple one. Limitless sacred ruins, a huge battlefield where guild wars take place, a space that reeks of blood. A place where each guild can challenge each other without rules, kills, glory score, or guild reputation. Only rank matters here. As soon as all the doors open, the members of each guild will come, waiting for the battle drum signal. The people rang the gong, and the guild war began. Several people jumped down from the cliff. The main character and people from his guild are running on the ground. Ruko said that this time the limitless sacred ruins landscape is a canyon. Dira shouted to everyone that they should avoid fighting. They obeyed. Ruko said that the members of the other guilds were already spread out on the map. Ling Si said that it seems most people's strategy is to find a safe zone first. He told them that they would also look for a safe area first. Tiana thought that she hoped she was right to let Ling Si be the leader of their group. Frowning, she thought that even though she wanted him to protect her, she also wanted to see his abilities. At the foot of the cliff, Wasabi-kun struck the guy with a swing of his dagger. He said he got the last one sorted out. 
The guy with the short hair said that, as he expected, everything went smoothly because he is with Wasabi Kun and Bai Lai. The boy with the elf ears laughed and agreed, saying that the three of them were lucky to have met them. Bai Lai agreed with a grim face. Wasabi Kun thought that he was still in that state, and if he was still concerned about that battle with Ling Si, then his skills might stop improving. Frowning, he thought that he was looking forward to fighting Ling Si once more, and he would be able to improve himself a little more. The guy asked Bai Lai why he was so insistent on coming to this place. He said he thought he was organizing a place for them and other groups to get together. Osabi Kun glanced at Bai Lai and thought that he didn't know he had a plan. He wondered why he insisted on coming to this place. Bai Lai grinned darkly, and Wasabi Kun thought that something was wrong. A purple light shrouded them, and Wasabi Kun realized that it was magic. The guy shouted that he couldn't move. He asked if it was ambush. Wasabi Kun heard laughter from above. The man on the cliff with the scythe in his hand said that they really were ambushed. He said that they were trapped by his bind skill. A beastman from the Wolf's Fang Guild praised Bai Lai with a malicious grin and said that by sacrificing three companions, he had passed the test. Wasabi Kun asked Bai Lai what that meant. The beastman gave a command, and the red-haired girl rushed forward. Shouts rang out. He said that now he should provide them with this woman's location, and then he could join the Wolf's Fang Guild. Bai Lai agreed. Wasabi Kun shouted out if he was going to betray the guild in them. The red-haired girl chuckled and said that it was better for him to keep quiet because it was his turn to die. She grinned and swung her dagger at Wasabi Kun. Bai Lai frowned and shouted for them to wait. He said that this person is a friend of his and he wants him to join Wolf's Fang as well. The beastman said that he didn't tell them that he was going to bring another person, but agreed. He said they would spare his life. Bai Lai, with a dark frown, told Wasabi Kun not to blame him because he just can't let things continue like this. He said that in this guild war, he made Ling Si and Tiana pay for what they did. Wasabi Kun exclaimed that he had betrayed Nebulus and even told them Tiana's location in exchange for joining Wolf's Fang. He frowned and cursed, calling it trash. Bai Lai angrily shouted that if he couldn't get it, then no one would get it. He shouted that this cheating couple could die together. Turning to Wasabi Kun, he said that he should understand him. He suggests that he join Wolf's Fang together. The beastman laughed and said it was an interesting farce. The dialogue box reported an incoming voice call. A dialogue box appeared in front of the beastman, and he asked if they were able to find them from the location he sent them. The voice said they'd found them. The red-haired girl smiled viciously and told them to start torturing them as soon as possible. She said that they would catch up with her as soon as she was reborn, and told her not to feel sorry for them. The beastman put her hand on Bai Lai's shoulder and told him not to worry, because he had sent five agility-type thieves from the third division of Wolf's Fang, and they should definitely be enough to deal with this woman. He said that because he told them their location, they were able to find Tiana. Bai Lai remained silent. A voice shouted that they should let him finish. The beastman asked what he wanted to say with a smirk. The voice said the situation was bad. The beastman tensed. The voice said it didn't warn them about Tiana having a security guard. The beastman asked what he was talking about. The guy replied that he was hiding while talking to him through a voice call. He said it was a thief with white hair, and he was terrifying. The beastman furiously asked why he needed to hide to call them, and what was going on there. The guy turned around in fright and said it was too loud. He said that in just three minutes, four of their group were killed by this thief, and only he was left. The beastman opened his mouth in surprise. Wasabi Kun thought it was Ling Si. The red-haired girl said with a nervous grin that one thief couldn't kill four. Wasabi Kun frowned, thinking that he was leaving Tiana's safety to him. The guy chuckled nervously as he told the beastman that his teammates hadn't revived yet. He asked if he could back out for now. A voice behind him said he was here. The boy's eyes widened in alarm. He turned around, and the voice asked if he could talk to his vice-captain. In front of him stood the main character with a sinister smile. Ten minutes ago, Dira asked why they were running so far, and if he had a specific place he wanted to go. The blonde-haired guy agreed, panting, and added that they looked like they were scared. Ruko turned around and said with a smile that if anyone had to, he would be at the front to take all the damage so that they could attack from behind. The blonde-haired guy told him to stop bluffing, and with such weak equipment, he should just hide behind when the moment comes. Ruko said with a smile that he didn't want to. The blonde-haired guy said he didn't understand why he asked Ruko to join their group. Tiana asked Ling Si if he had a plan. He replied that he didn't have a plan and just wanted to shake off some bugs. Tiana asked in surprise if someone was following them. Stopping, the main character grabbed Ruko's face. The guy in the knitted hat asked why they had suddenly stopped. Frowning, Ling Si said that these guys were like sticky gum, and he couldn't get rid of them no matter how hard he tried. Tiana shouted for everyone to prepare for battle. Ruko asked in surprise where the enemies were. The third division of Wolf's Fang, 
a group of five assassins. Several heads emerged from the water. One of them said he didn't expect them to notice their presence. Another said that someone in their group should have a high perception. The guy said that they are underwater with instant conceal activated, so most likely they haven't discovered their location yet. Another guy said that with the tracker that Vice Captain gave them, they wouldn't lose them for sure, and as long as they didn't know where they were, they wouldn't be able to do anything to them. The dialog box described instant conceal, the ability to hide yourself in an environment, a common hidden skill. The guy asked if there really were any enemies here, because he couldn't see anyone. Tiana assumed that they were using a concealing skill. Ruko asked what they should do. The main character used the Great Eagle Eye. The dialog box described Great Eagle Eye, eyes as sharp as an eagle's, detects all hidden units within a certain radius, increases awareness for 5 seconds and gives you an increased chance to see through the enemy's skill. He said he found them and they're in the water. The guy in the water said they were found. Another said that this thief has a visual skill that allows him to see through hiding skills. Frowning, the guy said that their overall levels weren't too high and they would deal with the low levels first. He gave the command and they jumped out of the water. A dagger appeared in the protagonist's hand and he told the others to stay put and be on guard in case there was another ambush. Tiana shouted at him to be careful. The guy laughed and said that a level 7 thief was going to fight them alone. He told one of them to go with him. He shouted to the rest of his team to cut the mage's throat, avoiding the warriors. Deera shouted that it was a group of assassins from the 3rd Division of Wolf's Fang. She said they were assassins who specialized in high DPS attacks. Ruko placed a shield on the ground and told them not to be afraid. He said that in that case, they would have to pass him first. Two assassins running towards the main character used a backstab and faint attack. After stabbing with their daggers, they found that they had cut open the fake Ling Si. One of them asked where he was. The fake protagonist's face turned into a skull, casting fear on the assassins. They stopped in their tracks, screaming. One of the assassins asked what was going on with their boss. The bald guy called out to the boss and the main character appeared behind him. He said that he should not be distracted from the battle. He punched him in the back, kicking the other two. Ling Si used flow. Moving quickly between the three assassins, he stabbed them with his dagger. They fell to the ground, and Ruko exclaimed in delight. The main character said that the health of each of them is lowered to one-third, and he will need their help to clean them up. They agreed with sinister smiles. Dira asked the assassin about being a DPS killer. A scream broke out. The dialogue box announced that the fear effect has ended. The guy noticed that it was over. Another guy shouted at him not to just stand there and they need to work together to get rid of this thief. Ling Si appeared in front of them, shrouded in a dark purple aura. They exclaimed that he was here. The assassin shouted in fright that his attacks were too strong and fast for him to react to. The main character used Shadow Flash Blink, hitting the assassin in the back of the head and applying a faint effect on him. The assassin said as he fell that he wasn't human. The main character grinned and said that the next combo would be Bone Breaker. He dealt the assassin multiple hits, dealing 120 critical damage. The other assassin, looking at his fallen comrade, thought that they weren't even on the same level. Looking at Ling Si's back, he fearfully thought that he could only run away. He told his vice captain that his teammates hadn't revived yet. He asked if he could back out. The main character, standing behind him, asked to be allowed to talk to his vice captain. The assassin agreed. He asked if it was Vice Captain Wolfsfang of the 3rd Division. He told him to listen carefully. The beastman's face tightened, and the veins on it bulged. The assassin screamed for help. The main character told him to wash his neck and wait for them to arrive, because they would be coming soon and he would be next. The beastman gritted his teeth and bulged his eyes in anger. Clenching his fist, he addressed Bai Lai. He furiously asked who it was. Standing at the foot of the cliff, he asked if he was saying that it was a thief who had passed the insane difficulty of the dark forest last time. Bai Lai said that's right. Cursing, the beastman slammed his scythe into the ground. He laughed with a mad smile and said that as long as they were enemies, fate would bring them together. He said that he didn't think Nebulus would actually accept him into their guild. Bai Lai said with a grim face that it was Tiana's idea and had nothing to do with him. The beastman laughed and said that he was tired of living, since he dared to threaten him. The girl asked what they would do with Wasabi-kun. The beastman told Bai Lai that his friend didn't seem to share his opinion. Wasabi-kun raised his hand and said that there was no need for them to worry about him. Swinging his hand, he grabbed Bai Lai by the collar and said that as his longtime partner, he was very ashamed. Frowning, he said that the other people in the team would most likely spread rumors about his betrayal after they respond. The veins on his face bulged, and Wasabi-kun said that he was leaving this month's guild war, and from now on, Bai Lai's problems would have nothing to do with him. Calling him a traitor, he said that they would be enemies the next time they met. The dialog box says, you are currently not in a battle state, are you sure you want to leave the monthly guild war? Warning, leaving the guild war for no reason will be penalized with reduced player experience. Bai Lai gritted his teeth. 
Osabi Kun told him when he left that he was on his own now. The beastman said with a smirk that he didn't know what was good for him, so he gave him a chance to join Wolf's Fang, and he threw it away just like that. Saying it was stupid and they should stop wasting their time here, he encouraged them to move to other areas. Bai Lai noticed a dialogue box that appeared in front of him. It reported that Tiana had removed him from her friend's list. Noticing this, he said that it looked like everything that had happened here had already surfaced. Chuckling, the beastman told him that he would be Nebulous's enemy from now on. The red-haired girl said with a smirk that betraying the guild meant that they would pursue him. She said he was lucky to have joined them. Frowning, Bai Lai thought that he would take revenge. The red-haired girl said that they didn't need Tiana's coordinates anymore because they said they would come to them on their own. The beastman laughed and said that he would wait. The main character told the assassin to tell him the coordinates of his vice-captain. The guy fearfully refused and told him not to even think about getting the vice-captain's location from him. He said that as a member of Wolf's Fang, he would die and become a ghost of Wolf's Fang, but he would never betray his guild. Ling Si said with a smirk that he was a kind guy. With a sinister smile, he said that he must have killed a few people on the way here because he had a red name, and he would probably drop a couple of items if he killed him right now, and he would definitely lose some of the experience he had worked so hard for. The boy looked at him in horror. The main character said that he really felt sorry for him and wanted to let him go. The guy dropped to his knees and said, 86.93.325. He said the vice captain's coordinates are in the west, and they're heading east right now. He promised that these coordinates were correct. The main character thanked him. He said that he would now generously send him out of the guild war. The boy tensed in surprise. He asked if he had said he would let him go. Ling Si asked with a smirk if he didn't know that cheating was a normal occurrence in war. He added that he said he only wanted to do so. The guy swore and screamed. Tiana stands on the edge of the cliff. Frowning, she thought that she didn't expect Bai Lai to betray them, and it was all because of that fight. Looking to the side, Tiana thought about what the situation was with Wasabi Kun, and after Bai Lai's betrayal, the 3rd Nebulous Division should be reorganized. She thought she should take this opportunity. Dira called out to her and asked if she had seen the guild's message. Tiana replied that she had already received the message about Bai Lai's betrayal. Dira furiously asked why this had happened. She said she didn't expect him to stab them in the back. Tiana, coming up to them, suggested that we talk about it later. She asked how Ling Si was doing. Ruko pointed to the side and said that he was here. They were shocked to see the main character in front of them, who stepped on the face of a guy with foam coming out of his mouth. He said they were just in time, and he had just recently obtained the coordinates of their vice captain by politely asking this guy. Ruko laughed nervously at the words about being polite. Tiana, drawing a branch on the ground, said that according to the coordinates the main character received, if they really go east, it means that they will meet up with other wolf's fang groups. She said that as far as she knows, most of the wolf's fang groups are in the east, and only a small part of them are in the west, which will make it easier for them to increase their glory score at the last moment by attacking from all directions. Ruko enthusiastically said that Tiana even knows about the other guild's plans. Dira had told him that it was no secret that the members of large groups were distributed over the map area during a guild war. She said he could guess roughly where they were if he used his brain. She said that the only thing that matters during a guild war is killing, and in order to get a high glory score, you need to kill, thus increasing it. Dira said it was a simple strategy to raise their score at the last moment. Ruko scratched his head, puzzled. Laughing awkwardly, he shouted that he knew about it and just wanted to raise the morale of their group. The main character asked Tiana if she had any plan. Closing one eye, she said that if they could make it through the battle in the central area, they would be able to cut them off halfway. The main character asked about the central zone. She replied that the central zone is a place that is connected to the teleports of all four sides. The guilds there are very chaotic, and fights happen often, which makes it easier to interfere with their plan. She added that even if reinforcements arrive, they won't be able to help them right away. Ling Si thought about the fact that the guilds there are chaotic, and fights often occur. He asked about the fact that they can hide information about their guilds during the guild war. Tiana replied that it was true, but no one does that, and if you do that, then all the kills you get will not be counted in the result. The main character replied that this is not a problem. He said with a grin that he had an interesting plan. The dialogue box described a hidden mask, unlike hiding player information through system settings, a hidden mask is a mask that every player has. It will hide the user's appearance. You can't use it under specific circumstances. Ling Si said that it's all settled then. He called me to go. Someone asked where. The main character, applying a mask to his face, said, to the central zone. The central guild war zone. This is the central area of the battlefield, where dust rages all over the area. Lots of people are fighting each other all over the central zone. Like raging dust, this is where the most intense battles take place. A man in armor with a beard shouted that this was their mortal enemy. He ordered an attack. A guy with elf ears called out to him that he was a chatterbox. 
he asked if he had forgotten that half of them had been killed by them in the last guild war. He urged his guild members to beat them up like last time. They ran towards each other. Feet appeared on the rock. The guy shouted to his captain that someone was there. Shielding himself from the flames with his shield, he asked if the enemies had launched a sneak attack at them from behind. The guy stiffly said that he didn't look like one of them because he was wearing a mask. In front of him stood Ling Si with a dagger in his hand, wearing a mask. The captain assumed it was a clown. The main character looked at them with a serious face under the mask of a clown. He stabbed the captain in the back with a dagger, and the captain shouted for a sneak attack. Ling Si pushed the captain away. The boy with the elf ears asked in surprise what was going on. The main character kicked him in the chest. Cursing, the armored man asked which guild was interfering in their fight. The main character replied that he was a member of the Wolf's Fang Guild. The guy with the elf ears fell to the ground and asked why a guild from the five main guilds interfered in the battles of other guilds. He asked if they thought the guild war was their home. The guy with the bow shouted at him to be a man and take off his mask to show them his identity. Ling Si asked if they thought they were in a position to ask for information about Wolf's Fang. Turning around, he said that he was giving them 30 seconds to run away because Wolf's Fang would come here to kill everyone. Disappeared in a cloud of red dust, he told them not to blame him for not warning them. The guy exclaimed that he was gone. The armored man gritted his teeth and asked if they thought they could do whatever they wanted while wearing this mask. He said they had gone too far. Another guy in the crowd asked why he was wearing a mask and told them about their plan. The guy with the elf ears shouted that there was nothing strange about it, because Wolf's Fang's reputation had always been bad. The armored man asked the people if they had seen the masked thief from Wolf's Fang. Other people said they'd seen it, too. The bald guy said angrily that he suddenly appeared and slapped him. A guy with a white patch on his forehead shouted in frustration that he ran away after giving him a thousand years of death. The beastman said furiously, not only did he sneak attack him, he also called him a coward. The elf-eared girl said sheepishly that she thought he had touched her from behind. Another person shouted about what a disgraceful person he was. They shouted with one voice that they would make Wolf's Fang pay for what they had done. Dira said that they had teamed up against Wolf's Fang in such a short time. Ruko admiringly said that Ling Si is very cool and was able to fool so many people alone. The blonde-haired guy irritably shouted at him to lie back down, because they would be noticed. Tiana thought with a slight smile that she didn't expect Ling Si to use such tricks, but only he is able to escape safely after provoking so many people. 20 minutes ago, the main character said that the central area would be full of players, and since they were here, he would put on a show for them. He said that when the people from Wolf's Fang came there, they would give them a big surprise, and they just needed to relax and watch the spectacle. Tiana frowned as she thought about the surprise he would give them in the central area. The armored guy exclaimed when he noticed Wolf's Fang. The beastman said that, as expected, there are a lot of players in the central area. The guy in the wizard's hat shouted angrily that they really had come, and it looked like they were being seriously underestimated. The beastman grinned nervously and asked why there were so many people happy to see them. The girl with red hair told him that there was something wrong with them. A guy with short brown hair raised his fist and asked if they were going to kill everyone. The beastman grabbed his weapon, shouted to wait, and said that he was the vice captain of the third division of Wolf's Fang. A man in the crowd shouted that they already knew that. Vice Captain used multiple flame bursts to hit the guy with the sword from the crowd. He asked why they suddenly attacked them. He was surprised to see something behind the angry crowd. Behind the people, there was a masked Ling Si, and the Vice Captain realized that something was coming. He tensely thought that he had a bad feeling, similar to the fear of being targeted by an unknown monster in the dark. When he heard the scream, he turned around. Ling Si used critical backstab, cutting the guy's throat with a dagger. He said it was the first one. The vice captain exclaimed that it was a sneak attack. He ordered everyone to be on their guard. The guy fell to the ground, and the girl with red hair asked who did it. She said she hadn't noticed at all. Turning to the vice captain, she asked if it was Ling Si. She shouted that he was attacking their teammates with low health. The vice captain replied that he hadn't seen his face, only a clown mask. He shouted at everyone not to panic and use gravitational pressure. The dialog box described gravitational pressure, using the player as a core, creates a gravity field with a radius of 3 meters, and enemies trapped inside it will be subjected to triple the force of gravity, reducing their movement speed and skill usage by half. He shouted for everyone to come inside. Gritting his teeth, he said that this thief wouldn't be able to do anything to them inside this circle. The red-haired girl said that he wouldn't dare go inside, and they would make him pay what he deserved for going against them. The vice captain started talking about what would happen when he went inside, but stopped. He noticed a hand behind the red-haired girl who asked what was wrong. Grabbing her face, the main character said that she was the second one. The vice captain looked ahead, startled. The girl screamed for help. The vice captain thought that they wouldn't be able to spot him anyway due to his speed. The girl held out her hand and called out to the vice captain. 
He thought about how he was still so fast even though his speed had been reduced by half. The girl screamed for help again. People walk on the ground strewn with bodies. Someone shouted to hurry up. The girl in the wizard's hat pointed ahead and said that it looked like a fight had broken out with the people from Wolf's Fang. Another man shouted that they would help them too. The guy with the sword and shield shouted that he would take revenge for the slap. Tiana and her team run in the opposite direction. Tiana told them to avoid the crowds and that this was the border of the central zone, and therefore there would be fewer people here. She said the coordinates should be here somewhere. Dira asked about the fact that Ling Si said he wanted to surprise her. Tiana agreed and said it should be here somewhere. Ruko said he was looking forward to it. He said there was no one here, not even the main character. He asked if it could be the wrong place. Tiana said that this should be the right place for them, and decided to write to the main character. Ruko exclaimed in surprise that there was a huge sandstorm in front of them, and someone was coming. Dira shouted for everyone to prepare for battle. Ruko called out to wait. The main character was standing in front of them with a girl from Wolf's Fang on his shoulder. Her mouth was taped shut and she was trying to shout something. Ruko exclaimed that it was Ling Si. Tiana exclaimed that this was the surprise he was talking about. The main character removed the tape from the girl's mouth. She swore and demanded to let her go. Putting it on the ground, the main character said that it was for Tiana and that, as far as he remembers, this girl provoked her. The girl was shouting angrily at Tiana for daring to use such a dirty method. She demanded to let her go, otherwise it would end badly for them. She shouted at them to wait until their group in the east arrived and then they would make her pay for what they had done. Dira said that she didn't even know that a person could be kidnapped. The guy with the blonde hair said she was noisy and he should tape her mouth back up. Tiana asked to untie the girl. The girl asked with a smirk if she was scared. She said that if she let her go, she would promise that in this guild war, Wolf's Fang wouldn't kill her like last time. Tiana shouted at her that she was wrong. The girl's mouth dropped open in surprise. Surrounded by yellow magic and roots, she said that she wasn't afraid, but was just thinking about what skill to use to deal with a stupid woman like her. She stared at it, frowning. The girl swore as she swung the dagger and shouted at her to be quiet. The roots rushed to meet her. Tiana used a vine lock and the roots wrapped around her. Tiana held up the book and said that since she still wanted to fight, she wouldn't show pity to her opponent, much less her. She frowned. The girl shouted that she would remember this as the roots and vines dragged her underground. A girl's arm was sticking out of the ground and she started to disappear. Tiana thanked the main character for the gift and said that now she owes him. Ruko exclaimed enthusiastically about how strong Ling Si and Tiana were. The main character said that before returning to the central zone, he needs to borrow someone. Tiana asked whose help he needed and if it would be dangerous for him to return to the central zone. The main character replied that he would not be in danger as long as he was helped by this person. Dira thought that she would finally be able to show her strength. The blonde-haired guy thought he was probably talking about her and his explosive fire magic. A guy with dark hair, showing off his biceps, said that he has experience in group fights. Ruko chuckled and asked who he was talking about. Lang Si told him that he needed his help. The group exclaimed in surprise, and Ruko opened his mouth in surprise. Turning around, he asked again. The main character answered in the affirmative, holding out his fist with a smile. Tears appeared in Ruko's eyes, and he slammed his fist down. He agreed and told me to rely on him. The beastman asked if anyone had seen the thief. With a flick of his side, he said it was the last one. He added that he was tired of them. The guy shouted to him that the girl's information says that she was killed. The vice captain exclaimed in surprise. Gritting his teeth and shaking with anger, he said to quickly gather all the groups and not give this thief a single chance. The guy asked that he wanted to gather all the groups for the sake of one thief. He said that the third division would be a laughing stock. Remembering the red-haired girl, the vice captain replied angrily that he didn't care. He said to bring them here and surround the entire area. He said they would definitely find this thief. The vice captain thought that Ling Si would die a cruel death for daring to touch his woman. The guy retorted that they had just been attacked and didn't have much health left. He asked why they didn't retreat and join up with the other groups, then report back to them. The vice captain pointed at him with his index finger and shouted at him to do as he said. Bai Lai, who was hiding behind a corner, thought with a grin that it didn't seem like he was that good after all. He thought with a wicked smile that he couldn't wait to have his throat cut, and that would make things much easier for him. Ruko used a flying shield. The dialogue box describes flying shield, a skill available only to warriors. A solid shield attack that stops the opponent's movement for a second. After blocking the attack, the vice president furiously asked if it was those pesky insects again. Ruko caught his shield with a grin. The vice president cursed and asked if he wanted to die. Startled, he noticed that the guy behind him shouted. The main character hit him from the front with a dagger. He said it was the third one, piercing his chest. He told the vice president that he was next. The vice president said that he was too naive, 
and the other wolf's fang groups would arrive in a few minutes. He said that since he had come to him on his own, he wouldn't have to look for him. Holding a scythe wrapped in yellow energy, he said that he would burn it to ashes. He used Raging Flame Dance and said that it was his strongest fire spell, and now he wouldn't be able to escape anywhere. He shouted with a malicious smile that this was revenge for his woman. The main character asked if this is what a man in a relationship looks like. Leng Si, looking menacingly at him, said that he didn't think that he, as a mage, would be so stupid as to use spells in front of a thief who is much faster than him. He asked what he was thinking. Approaching his face, he said that he should join her. The main character used Bone Breaker, and a lot of punches hit the vice president. When he landed, he insulted them. Ruko exclaimed that they had won. The vice president fell on his face to the ground. The main character replied that they hadn't won yet, because Wolf's Fang would definitely send a large group to chase after him. He called him to follow him and said that he wanted to confirm something. Bai Lai told the vice president that he now knows the feeling of having his woman taken from under his nose. He said that they can't lose this guild war, and as a former captain of the Nebulous Third Division, he has a lot of experience in guild wars. He told him to trust him, and all he had to do was temporarily put him in charge of all the troops. The vice president, disappearing, agreed because he was capable, and told him to show him what he was capable of. He told him to contact other groups and tell them to kill this thief and his group. Bai Lai said with a crazy smile that he would do so. A dialogue box announced that he had been promoted to temporary vice captain of the Wolf's Fang 3rd Division. The main character and Ruko run between the rocks. Ruko, noticing another Wolf's Fang guild group, used a flying shield. The shield hit the guy and he fell. He shouted at the Wolf's Fang guild members to not even think about running away. The main character hit the guy in the back. The guy with the elf ears asked what they should do because the vice captain wasn't there. Ruko laughed and shouted that his and Ling Si's teamwork was perfect, and they were like sword and shield, yin and yang, heaven and earth. He asked if they had seen his shield bounce skill. He said it was an AoE skill that slows down the opponent's speed. He tried to remember the name of the main character's flow skill, said that the name doesn't matter, and all he's trying to say is that it's really nice to see all these people with low health die before they have time to react. Ling Si said that the skill is called flow. Ruko agreed and shouted that this skill looks really cool. He asked if the warrior could learn it and if he could teach him the thing he made in the dust. He shouted that learning it would be cool and he was using his shield, throwing the opponent into the dust. Ruko asked if he chose this mask himself or if he got a random one because his mask is a frog. He said it was ugly and he was wondering if he could change it. The main character closed his eyes and thought that he was very talkative and wouldn't have to worry about feeling lonely along the way. Turning around, he thought that he had brought it with him to confirm something. Before the guild war started, Ruko asked if he would really let him join their group. He exclaimed that he was very glad. He said he didn't even know him and asked why he had allowed him to join his group. He asked what his evil intentions were. After correcting himself, he asked if there was anything he needed to do to join the group. Ruko shouted that all the groups he had joined before were not suitable for him, as if their tempo didn't match his. He shouted that when a man fights, he has a rhythm. The main character told him to relax and listen to it. Ruko, noticing that he called him by his full name, said that he could call him Little Ruko. He asked what he wanted to tell him. Leng Si said that he had heard that he wanted to become the strongest shield warrior. He asked if it was true. Ruko smiled and said that it was true. He said that he wanted to stand in front of his team, proudly holding his head and chest straight, and rushing forward, taking all the damage for his team. He asked if he thought it was cool. Ruko said that he wants it even in his dreams. He asked if he had seen a shield warrior in the first place guild who was nicknamed Heavenland's number one shield. He yelled out that he wanted to be just like him and saw one of his group battle videos. She said that he was very cool taking damage from 10 thieves. Leng Si exhaled and thought that it had started again. He said he wanted to ask you something. Ruko came to his senses and turned his attention to him. The main character asked if he had any special attributes or skills. Ruko thought about it. Leng Si thought that this guy's name was the same as the so-called Sacred Mountain Ruko, one of Heavenland's six divine shields in his previous life. He thought that if he really was Sacred Mountain Ruko, then he must have some special attributes or skills. Ruko asked if being an introvert counted. He said he didn't think so, and kept thinking. The main character wondered if it was too early, and maybe he didn't have any special attributes or skills yet. Ruko said he's not sure if this counts, and he doesn't know what the benefits are. The main character asked him that he didn't know what the use of it was. He asked if it was a skill. Ruko replied that it was a blessing. He said it was a blessing called bravery. The main character asked about the blessing and thought that the legend he had heard about in his previous life was true. 
In the game Heavenland, there are countless unknown special skills, equipment, and additional attributes. Any player has a chance to get a mysterious reward from the task in the game by conquering this place. Leng Si smirked and thought that if the blessing Ruko was talking about was really one of them, then it could really be Sacred Mountain Ruko. Ruko said that he got a strange task on the third level, and after completing it, he got this thing called bravery, but he doesn't know how to use it. The main character asked if this blessing has a description. Ruko replied that he would look at it now. The dialogue box says, Blessing bravery. Be fearless and stand tall like a mountain that pierces the clouds. Ruko called out to Ling Si. He shouted that there were many people ahead. The guy asked if it was the thief. Folding his arms across his chest, the elf-eared guy said that he never thought that he would have the guts to use such pathetic tricks to defame their guild's name and even kill the vice-captain. He said it was information that the temporary vice-captain had given them. Ling Si thought that he didn't expect to meet the trio here. Someone told the main character that they met again. He noticed the voice. Standing in front of him was Bai Lai, who asked with a smirk if he remembered him. The main character noticed that he had become a temporary vice-captain. Bai Lai said that he told him that he would take revenge. Ruko asked what they should do. He said there were a lot of them. The main character told him to calm down. He asked if he wanted to feel even better than he had recently. Ruko hesitantly said that he wanted to, but there are too many enemies here. Ling Si told him to relax because he was already prepared for an intense fight with them. Ruko asked why, and if they weren't throwing away their lives. The main character replied that he wanted to confirm the benefits of his blessing. He said that if they succeeded, it would be worth it even if they died. Ruko asked about the benefits of his blessing. Tiana's voice came out of the dialogue box and she shouted for them to wait there. Ling Si asked where they were. A guy nearby shouted at the others to run away as he ran and said that the wolf's fang people were pressing them down again with their numerical advantage. Tiana said they weren't far away. Glancing at the red dust cloud, they noticed Tiana and the rest of the group running towards them. The main character asked why they came. Ruko was crying, happy that they had come and saying that there were too many enemies here. Dira told him to stop crying. Tiana replied that she had received a message that a large group from Wolfsfang was going towards the central area and thought that they had surrounded them. The main character asked if he had told them to stay put. Tiana interrupted him and said that he was their captain in this guild war. Frowning, she asked if he wanted them to ignore the lives of their teammates. Ling Si looked at her in surprise after hearing about her teammates. He thought that he had leveled up alone in his previous life and had long forgotten the warm feeling from that word. Closing his eyes, he smiled and said that they should prepare because it would be a difficult battle. Bai Lai told Tiana that she was still protecting this thief. She noticed his voice, and the protagonist turned around. They recognized Bai Lai in front of them. He said with a frown that, after all, they had no choice but to become enemies. Tiana shouted at him that he had betrayed Nebulus. Dira, cursing, said that he really became a wolf's fang dog. Bai Lai replied that they can say whatever they want because all he is interested in is revenge. He pointed his hand forward, and a crowd of people charged. He shouted at them not to let Nebulus look down on them. Dira ordered everyone to prepare for battle. Fire projectiles hit the ice barrier. Dira shouted to Tiana about the danger from behind, hitting the fireball with her sword. She yelled at her to keep a close eye on the situation behind her and said that she would hold them up in front. Tiana agreed and said that she would cast a magical flower shield on her. The guy with the white wizard hat told them that they should just give up peacefully because he didn't want others to say that he was ruthless towards women. The beastmen agreed and invited them to join Wolf's Fang. Fire shells are flying in the air. Dira shouted at them to be quiet and called them cowards, frowning. She swung her sword to deflect the fire shells, and the guy shouted that they couldn't kill her right away because she had a shield. Dira asked them with a crazy smile that they were going to kill her instantly. After hitting the ground, she used great sword's punishment and asked who they thought they were. The energy from the sword struck the beastman, and he coughed up blood. The guy in the wizard hat shouted that she was an attack-type warrior. Tiana praised Duru and said that she would take over this side and the magic attacks wouldn't be able to harm them for a while. Several guys appeared above Tiana, and one of them asked if they had forgotten about the thieves' physical attacks. He used a joint backstab. Ruko used shield leap. Once between the thief and the surprised Tiana, he shouted at them not to even think about injuring his companions. Ruko frowned. The guy swore at him and urged him to kill him. The main character jumped up behind him and asked if he thought it was a little rude to bully a girl and a child. The boy's eyes widened in fright and his mouth opened. The main character swung the dagger and used air slice. It hit three opponents, dealing them critical damage. Dira called out that they were finally here. She said there were too many enemies and she wouldn't be able to hold them all for long. The blonde-haired guy asked if they were okay. Tiana said they were able to fight. The blonde-haired guy shouted that their attacks were too strong and he had used almost all of his recovery potions. Tiana shouted for everyone to come to her and used mid-rank magic shield, vine cage. They were under a green magic dome. 
Ruko exclaimed enthusiastically that Tana knows mid-rank spells. Dira said that she also knows a high-rank destructive spell, and she just can't use it in this situation. The blonde-haired guy let out a sigh of relief and said that with this, they would be able to take a break and not worry about magic attacks. The main character said that mid-rank magic shield is not bad. The dark-haired guy said that when the enemy arrived, they would either have to figure out how to break through their ranks or escape. The blonde-haired guy replied that with Ling Si, they would be able to brag about it for the rest of their lives if they could somehow get out. The main character noticed something. An ice arrow pierced through the shield, and Tiana's eyes widened in shock. An arrow went through the shoulder of a guy with blonde hair, and she said he was shot. He slowly started to close his eyes. A guy with dark hair shouted to heal him. Someone shouted no. Placing a hand on Bai Lai's shoulder, the guy praised him. He said that he didn't expect their combined attack to produce such an explosive attack. Bai Lai thanked the division captain for his trust. He said with a serious face that he was very familiar with Tana's magic shield, and normal spells would take a long time to break it. But his shield breaker arrow, together with a strong shot from an ally, could easily destroy it. The vein on his face bulged and he thought that he would definitely make Ling Si and Tiana die here today, and no one would leave here alive. Dira asked what they should do, because the enemy was advancing. The guy with dark hair used healing magic on the guy with blonde hair. Tiana shouted for everyone to hold their formation and draw out time for the healers. A guy wearing a white wizard's hat shouted that the magic shield was broken. He said that their skills were most likely on cooldown, and they should use this opportunity to attack. Ruko shouted that they were coming. The main character called out to him. Ruko responded. Lang Si took off his mask and said that he needed him to do something. He said that he would go kill someone, and he should stay here and protect their comrades. Ruko stuttered and said that he couldn't, there were too many enemies here and he couldn't do it without him. Lang Si said that if he wanted to become the strongest shield he dreamed of, then he needed to be brave and stand in front of his allies. He told him to show them his bravery. The main character rushed forward with a dagger in his hand. Dira asked about the fact that he was running towards the enemy alone. Tiana said it looked like it. The guy with dark hair said that he jokes about them even before he dies, leaving Ruko to protect them. Ruko thought about how he is a coward who only knows how to cry when he is afraid. Someone shouted to be careful, because the enemies use a rain of arrows and long-range magic attacks. Ruko, surrounded by flying arrows and magic projectiles, wondered where he could get this courage from. Someone said they were dead and there were too many attacks. Dira, fending off the magic projectiles with her sword, shouted hold the formation. Tiana covered herself with a blue shield and said that the enemies were planning to exhaust them with ranged attacks. The guy with the bow asked Ruko what he was doing. He shouted for him to quickly hide behind. Ruko, putting down the shield on the ground, thought that he was afraid. Tiana asked Ling Si if he could hear her. She shouted that they were being attacked with ranged attacks, and they wouldn't be able to hold out for long. Ruko's head shows that he has little health. He thought that he didn't want to lose his allies. Frowning with tears in his eyes, he raised his head. The dialogue box above his head reads, Be fearless and stand tall like a mountain that pierces the clouds. Ruko screamed, shrouded in yellow energy. The dialogue box reported that the bravery blessing had been awakened. The voice shouted for everyone to change their target and ignore the other nebulous members. He shouted to attack the giant beast that appeared out of nowhere. Ruko turned into a giant monster with huge hands. The main character turned around, noticing a huge cloud of dust. Smiling, he thought that he was right. He thought that he had to force it into a dead end to activate the blessing. Ling Si thought he had hit the jackpot. He thought that Ruko was indeed one of the six divine shields from his previous life, Sacred Mountain, Ruko Zong. Bai Lai asked in surprise what it was. The guy in the wizard's hat asked if it was a player and where the thing came from. The guy in the white hat asked if this boss-like thing was a member of the Nebulous Guild. A guy with long hair asked Bai Lai what it was. Bai Lai replied in shock that he couldn't tell them even if they asked because he had never seen this person in Nebulous. Dira, standing behind the huge Ruko, asked if it was Ruko. He stamped his foot on the ground and clenched his hands into fists. Ruko smiled ominously. Hitting the ground, he used destructive field. One of the opponents shouted to leave the area quickly. The hooded guy tried to say something, but he cried out in pain as the yellow energy enveloped him. The guy said that this zone would slow down their speed. Another guy reported to the captain that their formation was broken. He shouted that he was too strong and asked if they should retreat. Bai Lai told them not to panic. He asked if they had forgotten all the bosses they had fought that were bigger than anything. He asked why they were afraid of him because he was slightly bigger than normal players. The guy with the elf ears on the back gritted his teeth. He shouted that this thing was most likely an opponent who had a special skill or something. He shouted that they should keep attacking, and the others would cover them with ranged attacks. The guy obeyed. While shooting the ice bow, Bailai said that no matter how big he was, he would die here today. Dira shouted that a new war of ranged attacks was coming. 
The guy with the bow said that he couldn't handle it with his health level. The guy with the dark hair said that he had mana left and couldn't use a group healing spell. Dira said that they would have to dodge them with their skills. An ice arrow flew towards Ruko. He raised his hand, and a column of yellow energy shot up. Dira and Tiana noticed this and realized that it was a buff. Tiana noticed the effect above her head and exclaimed that their physical and magical defenses had been raised by 50%. Ruko slammed his huge hand on the ground. Raising his hand, he looked ahead with a frown and used a meteorite grenade. He threw a huge rock at the opponents. Bai Lai and the others looked on in surprise. The guy with the elf ears asked why they were just standing still as he ran away. He shouted at them to dodge. A rock hit the ground and they fell off the cliff. The guy with the elf ears shouted at them to pass on the order, kite the enemies and attack them instead of just standing still. Bai Lai asked irritably after noticing the area attack, what is this thing? He shouted that his plans were ruined because of him. His eyes widened in surprise when the main character appeared behind him. His eyes bulged in anger, and he thought it was a familiar feeling. Opening his mouth in surprise, he realized that this was Ling Si. The main character plunged a dagger into his chest. He frowned calmly. The guy in the white hat shouted Bai Lai to reorganize the formation. He shouted that they needed one ranged attacker and three shield warriors in each group. He asked if he could hear him. Bai Lai shouted let him go. The guy looked away in surprise. The main character used flow and ran forward without removing the dagger from Bai Lai's chest. Bai Lai cursed at him. He pushed the guy in front of him forward with it. After throwing them down, the main character said goodbye to them and said that he hoped they would have a good time in hell. The guy with the elf ears asked why the formation hadn't been formed yet. He asked where everyone was and called out by a lie. A vein in his face bulged, and he asked if they were dead, demanding to know. Lang Si appeared next to him and he said that he was right and they were dead. The guy gritted his teeth and said that he didn't seem to be able to wait for his death by attacking him like this. With a swing of his sword, he struck the ground. He told him to die with a grin. The main character behind him asked him about how he still didn't recognize him. He used evil spirits and visibility. The fake Ling Si's face turned into a terrifying monster face. The main character asked the guy if he remembered the skill book he picked up. He said that the skill he got from it is called evil spirits and visibility. The guy exclaimed in surprise that he was the guy who received the curse. The main character smirked and said in his ear that today he would let him enjoy the fear of this skill. He mockingly bid him farewell and used shadow flash blink. The boy shouted, his eyes bulging. Tiana asked Ling Si where he was. She told him to quickly retreat because there were a lot of people from Wolf's Fang approaching them. The main character agreed and said that he would join them later. He suggested that we step back for now. With the help of Ruko's defense, they were able to retreat from the enemy's attacks. And in the meantime, with Ruko's protection and the help of others, Tiana managed to buy enough time to cast the Sky Piercer High Wound spell, thus allowing the group to successfully retreat to safety. The battles that occurred in the monthly guild war and that mysterious figure with a huge body became a topic of discussion among everyone once the monthly guild war was over. Even though Nebulus is still ranked 5th in the guild ranking, their group took the first place, beating the second place by getting twice as many points. However, right after the monthly guild war ended, every player in the game received a message from the system at the same moment. The dialogue box reads, Public Announcement, Congratulations to a level 15 Dark Lions player for becoming the first Heavenland player to successfully switch professions and become the first awakened with a high 99% chance of awakening. The main character and his group were hit with beer mugs. Dira emptied her mug, spilling the beer. Exhaling hard, she shouted that this was the right thing to do. Tiana smiled and told her to drink more slowly, because this game has an intoxicating system. The blonde-haired guy laughed and patted Ruko's head and told him that he shouldn't drink because he was still a child. Ruko frowned and said it was power juice. Tiana placed her hand on her chest and smiled as she thanked everyone for participating in this monthly guild war. She said that if it wasn't for them, they would never have been able to win. Tiana added that Ruko helped them a lot when he protected everyone during the retreat. Ruko, embarrassed, replied that it was nothing. Dira poked him with her shoulder and told him not to be shy, because without his protection from the front, they wouldn't be able to successfully retreat. The blonde-haired guy, stroking his head, agreed and said that he didn't think that he had been hiding the transformation skill all this time. Ruko said in confusion that he should have done something. He told them to stop. Dira reached out to Tiana and said that they should also thank Tiana for constantly giving them shields and using a high-rank spell at the end. Dira snuggled up to her, and Tiana said she was just doing what a maid should do. The other members of the group blushed, and the blonde-haired guy covered Ruko's eyes and told him that he shouldn't see this. Tiana said that the one who contributed the most to their victory was Ling Si. They smiled. Dira, embarrassed, said that she had to admit that he was cool. 
placing her hand on her forehead, she sighed and said that he was too strong, and even knew what orders to give in such a difficult situation. The blonde-haired guy, with his hands clasped in front of him, said that the best part was how he killed the enemies at the very end, especially how after getting shot, Ling Si went on a rampage to get revenge for him. The group members waved their hands and told him to calm down, because he definitely wasn't doing this for him. Tiana thought with a smile that he was indeed a mysterious person. She thought that she wasn't sure how he knew about Ruko's power, but she was sure that he had his own way. Tiana thought that it was because of him that this inconspicuous group was able to take first place in the Guild War. Blushing, she thought that he had completely exceeded her expectations. Looking at her reflection in the mug, she wondered if she could dare to set her goals even higher than before. A voice called out to Tiana. She asked if Ling Si would be celebrating with them. She added that she had a lot to say to him. Ruko replied that he would be with them because he said he had some business to do and left right after the Guild War ended. Tiana asked if it was because of that announcement about the first player to successfully switch professions and the first one to awaken. Ruko repeated her question. Tiana replied thoughtfully that she wasn't sure either. She said the announcement was a topic of discussion at Heavenland. Tiana said she wasn't sure if it was because of him or not. A frog in the forest jumped into the river. Lang Si dipped his hands into the river. He began to wash them, sticking the dagger into the ground beside him. Behind him was a mountain of monster bodies. The main character looked down at his hands. Frowning, he cursed and slammed his hand into the water. He thought that Dark Lions was too fast, and he didn't think that he would be able to reach level 15 so quickly, and he was once again the first player in this life to become an awakened with a high 99% chance of awakening. Grinning, Lang Si said that he lived up to his reputation as the best Heavenland player. He said he was too lazy. Taking the dagger in his hand, he said that he couldn't relax anymore. Waving the dagger, the main character said that he should be able to keep up the level, because the professionals from his previous life had most likely already started to level up as well. Frowning, he said that in this world, only levels and skills matter. He thought that he definitely needed to create a strong group, and so far the only member in his group is Ruko. The main character thought that clearing dungeons that are higher than his level and setting records with the group were the fastest ways to level up. Exhaling, he told himself to calm down. Lang Si said that he shouldn't rush and break his rhythm just because of dark lines. He said that right now, he needed to train Ruko to increase the level up speed, as well as find a new member to join the group. The main character noticed movement in the grass. He thought that this was a very remote place, and he couldn't have imagined that someone would show up here right before he was about to log out of the game. Going ahead, he decided to take a look. He peeked out from behind the tree. He said that if it wasn't for his high level of attentiveness, he would most likely have lost track of him by now. Ling Si thought that it looked like his level was also good, and judging from the footprints, he came alone. As he pushed the grass in front of him, he wondered what this man was doing in the rural area. He assumed it was a special quest. The main character was moving through the tall grass towards the cave. As he came out of the cave, he thought that he had found him, and that he was indeed alone. When he noticed the chest, he was surprised that there was a chest here. The main character thought that it wasn't surprising that he had come to such a faraway place, because he had come here for the chest. Touching his head, he thought that he should leave here, and he followed him out of curiosity. He decided that he shouldn't bother him. His eyes widened in surprise. Above the man's head was written his nickname Dark Lines. With a nervous grin, Ling Si said that it was indeed him, the best player in Heavenland. He said that he didn't expect to meet the untouchable Dark Lines here. He said that in his previous life, he could only dream of seeing it, but in this life, he wouldn't lose to anyone. The main character said after noticing that he was level 15, that he was curious to know how big the difference between them would be if he fought him at full strength. He exclaimed that this was a rare opportunity and he definitely had to fight him. Frowning, he said that he would approach him after he opened the chest. Noticing that the person in front of him had disappeared, he asked in surprise where he had gone. He said he was distracted for a few seconds and he was already gone. Dark Lines crouched behind him and asked why he was watching him from this cave. Lang Si turned around in surprise. Adjusting his hat, Dark Lions said that he sees in him the intent to kill. He asked if he was going to challenge him. The main character, after apologizing, replied that he was wrong, and he just followed up on their curiosity. He added that he didn't know he was Dark Lions until now. Dark Lions chuckled as he scratched his head and said that he thought another person was going to sneak attack him. Ling Si put his hand on his chest and said that his name was Ling Si and he was a level 7 thief. Dark Lines waved his hand and said that there was no need for an introduction because he wasn't interested. He said that he was being challenged by too many people every day, and it was already giving him a headache. He said that if he wanted to challenge him, he'd better forget about it. The main character looked at him in surprise. Dark Lines got to his feet and told him that since he didn't have any evil intentions, he could go. As he walked through the grass, he said that he was going to open his chest and that he should go level up or something. Ling Si asked what if he still wanted to challenge him. 
Dark Lions turned around with a serious face. He asked if he had told him to forget about it. The main character interrupted him and told him not to underestimate him just because there was an 8 level difference between them. He asked me to accept his challenge. Dark Lions paused with a serious face. Ling Si looked at him with a frown. Dark Lions agreed. A small bird with large round eyes was perched on a tree branch. The main character and Dark Lions were standing in the grass opposite each other. Stretching his neck, Dark Lions said that only this time. The main character agreed, grabbing a dagger. He thought that even though he was eight levels below him, he might be able to defeat him if he used the method he used to kill Mud Dragon, Lord of the Swaps, combo accumulation. He thought that if he couldn't match it with his stats and strength, then he should just use his skills. Frowning, he thought that since his profession was a warrior, he would have to be prepared that he was using provocation skills like War Cry. Dark Lines asked if they were getting started. Ling Si ran forward and thought that he needed to get used to the sequences of his attacks using the thief's adaptability. As he approached Dark Lions, he thought that he needed to find its weak point. Ling Si frowned seriously. He ran in circles around Dark Lions. He thought that he needed to be faster. Dark Lions calmly follows his movements with a frown. Ling Si thought that now was his chance. He charged at him. He appeared behind him, brandishing a dagger. Britting his teeth, he said that he got him. Dark Lions grabbed the main character by the throat. Using ceiling strike and skill interrupt critical, he slammed his head into the ground. Blood gushed out of the protagonist's mouth. After letting him go, Dark Lions said that he wasn't bad. He asked if he was a top-time player. He added that he was still too weak. Dark Lions said that among everyone who challenged him, there were many people who were stronger than him, but they were still all the same a waste of his time. Ling Si looked at him in surprise. Sitting on his knees, he was surprised to think that he had lost. Exhaling, Dark Lions asked why people challenge him every day and he can't avoid them no matter how hard he tries. He said it looked like he would have to hide his information completely. As he left, he waved his hand and said that the winner was decided and he should stop bothering him. The main character gritted his teeth and thought that he was too strong. Clutching the grass in his hand, he wondered how he could lose. Recalling Dark Lion's words about them all wasting his time, Ling Si gritted his teeth in displeasure. The insignia shone with a bright light. As he got to his feet, he said it was a hopeless feeling to be looked down on by others. The insignia started to shake. Dark Lions turned around in surprise. The main character got to his feet, shrouded in yellow energy, and said that he didn't like it. Wiping his face, he said that their fight wasn't over yet. Dark Lions looked at him in surprise. The main character, clutching the dagger in his hand, said that he was still alive. Dark Lions quickly pulled Ling Si and was right in front of him. Grabbing him by the collar, he asked if he had the item. The main character asked what he was talking about. Dark Lions looked at him in silence. The main character looked back at him with a frown. Laughing, Dark Lions said that he was still only a candidate and hadn't awakened yet. Ling Si asked in surprise if he was talking about dust-laden proof of the glorious. He asked if he knew about dust-laden proof of the glorious. He wondered if it was possible that he had also received this task. He thought it was impossible because it was a unique mission. Touching his chin, Dark Lions said that he has dust-laden proof of the glorious, and it looks like there's more than one. Putting a hand on his shoulder, he told him that since he was still a candidate, he should investigate it on his own. He said that there are many unimaginable things in this world. Dark Lion said with a smile that he would remember his name. The main character asked about their battle. Dark Lion said that there is no point in continuing it because he does not have a single chance of winning. Turning around, he said that they would probably meet again one day when he was strong enough. Dark Lion said that he hopes that the next time they meet, it will live up to his expectations. He said goodbye. The main character thought about his expectations. Frowning, he thought that he would definitely win next time. Looking ahead, he thought that he would definitely win. Turning around from the departing Dark Lions, he thought that as expected, he was strong. But in this life, he had the confidence to become stronger than him. Looking resolutely ahead, he thought that he would definitely take the title of best player in Heavenland away from him. After he left the game, the main character came up with a plan. Ling Si stands in the shower, wiping her head with a towel. The bald man, drying himself with a towel, asked why he was pretending to be cool. He shouted that it was a public bathhouse. The main character thought that he should strictly plan how he will raise his level and the group that he will create. These two things are his most important tasks at the moment. Ling Si stands with a grocery bag in his hands. The girl at the cash register called out to him that he had paid for them. She asked if he thought he could leave without paying, just because he was handsome. She shouted that she would call the police if he didn't pay. The main character thought that if he started clearing dungeons with Ruko in the early game, then he still needed time to investigate something. The main character puts rice in a pot full of rice. The old man said awkwardly that he thought there was too much rice. Frowning, Ling Si thought that he needed to research dust-laden proof of the glorious. He wondered what kind of secret he was hiding, even if Dark Lions was surprised when he found out. 
he decided that he needed to find out more about it. He continued to pour in the rice with rapid movements. The old man said with tears on his face that he couldn't afford more rice. He begged him to stop adding it, and said that Uncle Ewan from above would be angry if he saw it. The main character has decided that he can waste more time, and he needs to increase the speed with which he raises the level. He put the game helmet on his head. Frowning, he thought it was time to start the full gear plan. The main town is Casfado. The main character is standing next to a fountain. When he heard the voice, he turned around. Ruko was shouting at him that he was here. He said that he met allies who didn't accept him into their team last time. He exclaimed that he didn't expect that they didn't know that their group scored the highest score in the monthly guild war, and they didn't believe him when he told them that that giant was him. Ruko said that he was angry and they didn't even know who Ling Si was. He said that because he focused on the guild war right after he joined the guild, the guild members never saw his face or heard his name. He said that he argued with them for a long time, telling them that he was in the same group as Tiana, but they didn't believe him and he is very angry. He asked if he could hear him. Ling Si folded his arms across his chest, closed his eyes, and thought that it was hard not to hear him. Ruko asked where they were going. He asked if they were going to level up or if he was going to teach him something new. The main character replied that they were waiting for one more person. Ruko asked if it was Tiana. He exclaimed that if they went to level up the three of them, they would be unstoppable. Ling Si replied that it wasn't her and he would understand when he saw it. He thought that he would hold on to the partnership with Tiana for a while. He remembered Tiana telling him that he had finally arrived and the banquet was already over. Lang Si replied that he wasn't used to such events. She replied that everything was fine and she told them that he had things to do and that was why he couldn't come. Tiana said with a smile that she still hadn't thanked him for what happened in this month's guild war. The main character, folding his arms, replied that he found an ally thanks to this and they got what they needed so there is no need to thank him. He said that now that the guild war was over there was something he wanted to discuss with her about the guild. Tiana asked worriedly if he was thinking of leaving the guild. She said that she knew that according to their promise, the main character was supposed to join the guild temporarily, but she promised to give him simplified conditions and he was going to start a group. The main character interrupted her and said that it was the opposite. He said that he would need the guild's efficient resources, so he wouldn't be leaving Nebulous just yet. He said that from now on, he would be in their custody and he had his own plans. Tiana exhaled and said she was scared. She told him to leave it to her. Tiana said that the result of this monthly guild war would definitely attract people from above, but she would settle everything so he didn't need to worry about it. She asked him what he planned to do next. Ling Si asked if she had any contact with this red-skinned thief. He told her to share it with him. She exclaimed in surprise that he needed Wasabi Kun. Wasabi Kun folded his arms and said that he was here. He asked the protagonist about the fact that the person he said he would bring with him was this shrimp. Ruko retorted that he wasn't a shrimp. Ling Si said it was a pleasure to meet him. Ruko whispered that he remembered this red thief and he was in charge of the third division. The main character whispered to him that before they could find any strong allies, they needed to step over the line slightly. He whispered that he was now the vice captain of the third division and he needed his status to help him with something. Wasabi Kun grinned and told the protagonist not to fool around because with his skills, he could easily take the position of division vice captain for himself. The protagonist recalled Tiana working hard at a desk full of papers. He said he wasn't interested. He asked him, since Bai Lai was no longer around, if this was a good opportunity for Tiana to be promoted to division captain. He added that she was very busy when he saw her, so he came to see him. Wasabi Kun clicked his tongue and said in displeasure that he meant that he had nothing to do. He said that if it wasn't for Tiana, he would never have done such a thing, even under the threat of death. He said they were almost there. Ruko asked if other people would come. The main character replied that they were allies for the dungeon they would go to this time. Wasabi Kun said that the third division didn't have a single person suitable for the dungeon they were going to go to, so Ling Si asked him to ask for help from the members of the second division. He said that, whether it was skills or level, they had these things better than the third division members, and he had a hard time convincing them to accept the request. Ling Si asked if he had chosen their levels and skills as per his request. Wasabi Kun replied in the affirmative and said that he contacted him last night and had to contact his friends even after he logged off. He said it took him forever to finally find people who fit his request. Glancing at him, he warned that he wasn't responsible for their behavior. Wasabi Kun said that the members of the second division are very proud people, so it's normal for them to look down on the members of the second division. He said that if it wasn't for his status as a vice captain, he wouldn't have been able to get them to agree. Trembling, Wasabi Kun added that all the people he needed were the best members of the second division, so he had to pay money to get them to agree. He said that he was going to use this money for his divinity. The main character apologized and said that he would return the money to him. Wasabi Kun told him not to worry about it, 
but to figure out how to deal with them first. A voice called out to Wasabi-kun, asking if the other teammates he was talking about were these two. A level 10 guy with long purple hair stood with his arms crossed in displeasure. A level 9 guy with elven ears and green hair said with a smirk that they looked weak. Ryuko looked up. The voice displeased asked if they should take this shrimp with them. A level 9 girl with long white hair said that this dungeon is not something that a member of the 3rd division can pass. She told them not to waste her time. Ruko painted, and the main character exhaled. He said with a smile that it was a pleasure to meet them, and he was the captain of the group. Passersby stared at them until someone exclaimed that it must be a joke. The purple-haired guy asked Wasabi-kun if his friend was a fool. He asked about the fact that a level 7 thief would be their captain. The white-haired girl said to give them at least a captain who can give orders. She exclaimed that their captain was a level 7 minnow, and asked how they could clear the dungeon with such a team. Wasabi-kun told them not to complain to him, and if they have any problems, contact him. He pointed his finger at the main character. The white-haired girl said thoughtfully that the three of them were able to pass the increased difficulty of the Broken Buddha dungeon with the help of other people from the second division. She said that as far as she could remember, the third division was only able to pass the average difficulty of the dungeon. She said that she recommends Dark Cliff as a level 10 group captain because it's much safer that way. The green-haired guy agreed and said that there was no better choice among those present for the role of captain than Dark Cliff. Above the head of the guy with purple hair was written his nickname Dark Cliff. He said with a smile that he would try. The main character interrupted him and said that if he could pass the insane difficulty of the dungeon for them, then he wouldn't have any objections to being the captain. Dark Cliff exclaimed in surprise. Wasabi-kun turned around in surprise. Walking up to him, he asked him in a whisper if he was sure and if he was trying to waste the money he got from selling his magazines. He said that the difficulty of this dungeon is not the same as that of the Dark Forest dungeon, and it is a level 10 dungeon. He whispered that he thought he was going to go through the increased difficulty. He asked if he thought the crazy complexity was too much. Dark Cliff laughed and said that he thought about what gives him the confidence to be a band captain. He said that he doesn't even have basic knowledge about this game. He asked if he even knew what he was talking about. The white-haired girl said irritably that the insane difficulty of this dungeon is something that even the first division has trouble clearing. She told him to stop joking. Dark Cliff said he didn't think he was an ignorant thief. A guy in armor appeared behind him and shouted at him that he looked happy. He asked if he also came here to go through the dungeon. Turning around in surprise, Dark Cliff exclaimed that it was Hammer Bro. He asked me what he was doing here. A guy in shiny gold armor raised his hand and said with a smile that he was helping his friends pass the dungeon. Ruko said admiringly that his body is covered in golden armor, which only falls in dungeons of special difficulty. He exclaimed that he envied him. The white-haired girl exclaimed that this was the captain's perfect standard. Links he thought that although his level wasn't very high, his golden armor was good enough. Wasabi-kun said it was a hammer from the first division of the Celestial Guild. The main character said that he heard that the relationship between Nebulous and Celestial is pretty good. Wasabi-kun said that this is generally true, and as the fourth best guild in the game, Celestial has always maintained a neutral relationship with other guilds. He said the warrior's name was Hammer. He said that although he is not the strongest in the first division of the Celestial Guild, due to his sociable nature, he has good connections with people, and he has friends of some big guilds. He said that he had heard that even the guild master of Celestial, unrivaled Blue Cloud, was on good terms with him. Wasabi-kun said that if you looked at him differently, he was quite an impressive person. Ling Si, looking at him, thought that connecting with other people was also a power whether it was a game or reality. Looking away, he thought that he now understood that, having overcome the obstacles in his previous life alone, he didn't know how he did it. Hammer asked about the insane difficulty. Dark Cliff pointed his thumb at the main character. Hammer approached him and asked if he was going to clear the insane difficulty of the 10th level dungeon, Broken Buddha. The main character said it was true. The guy in the hat said it was a shame for Nebulous. He apologized to the Hammer for having to watch this. Hammer asked him what his name was and if he had a specific way to do it. The main character introduced himself and started to talk about his method for completing the dungeon, but Hammer interrupted him, asking that he was Ling Si. He asked if he was the same Ling Si from Nebulous who participated in this monthly guild war. Ling Si replied that it was true. Dark Cliff asked Hammer if he knew who it was. The girl with the white hair said she had heard the name somewhere. Hammer asked about the fact that he didn't know Ling Si from his own guild. He exclaimed that he was the captain of the group that won first place in the guild war this month. Dark Cliff scratched his head and said that they didn't participate in the guild war, so they didn't know about it, because they were clearing dungeons at the same time. Hammer, circling around the main character, said that not only did he help his group take first place in the guild war, but it was rumored that he also led his allies and killed the vice-captain of the 3rd Division Wolf's Fang. 
he exclaimed that they even managed to successfully retreat after being surrounded by their opponents. Ling Xi thought that this was to be expected from a social butterfly. Hammer told him that he was a beast, and his guild members have been discussing him ever since the monthly guild war ended. Ruko said he had a good eye and started talking about how impressive Ling Xi was. The main character put his hand over his mouth and said that he was just lucky. Hammer pointed a finger at himself and said that he seemed confident in completing the insane difficulty of this dungeon. He offered to take him along and let him get some of the glory. He said that he could even help them by taking some of the damage. He asked him to give it a chance. Ling Xi, with an awkward smile, agreed because it would help them pass the dungeon faster. Ruko tried to argue that he would take all the damage himself. Dark Cliff asked if he was that strong. He said it was possible that he was being dragged along by his teammates. The white-haired girl said that if he was really trustworthy, as he said earlier, then the group would be safer with him as the captain. The green-haired guy said that since Hammer doesn't have a problem with it, then we should stop worrying about it too. The main character, standing at the red portal, urged not to waste any more time in vain. People around us were surprised to say that this is a portal to insane complexity. A dialogue box announced that their group had entered a broken Buddha dungeon of insane difficulty. Leng Si thought that if they passed the insane difficulty of the dungeon and met a specific condition, he would get a petrification ring. Broken Buddha, crazy difficulty. A tall building rose above the ground. Someone asked if there really is such a thing as a petrification ring. The main character replied that in this dungeon, he only needs it and they can share the rest of the rewards among themselves. The green-haired guy asked if he was sure he was real. He said he'd never heard of it. Dark Cliff told him to stop listening to false rumors and the whole group might end up being killed because of them. Ling Xi said that they would know if it was real or not when they saw it, but for now, they needed to be on their guard because there were a lot of monsters in this place. There were many desiccated blind monks standing in front of them. On the other side were deaf monks. The white-haired girl said that there was little difference between the blind and deaf monsters here and the ones on the higher difficulty. Hammer told them to be careful, because their artificial intelligence and appearance are significantly different and they should not be underestimated. The main character told them to be quiet because there are more of them here. Looking around, the white-haired girl asked about what was bigger. Above the monster's head is written, level 10, elite. On the ground in front of them, a silent monk sat in a lotus position. Ruko told the main character that all the monsters here are scary. He suggested that he go to another dungeon because he doesn't want to have nightmares. Ling Xi told him to calm down because they aren't as difficult to defeat as he thinks. He added that it has an important role to play. He handed him the item. Ruko asked if it was a one-time grappling hook. Each held a grappling hook in their hands. The girl asked why they needed it. Hammer excitedly asked when the show would start. The main character told Ruko that he had already given it to the others. He listened to him and stammered that he wasn't afraid and was just worried that others would be scared. Chuckling, he said that he wouldn't have a problem with it. The girl told him to look at what was next to him. Ruko looked away in fright. He screamed in fright when he saw the bug. The hammer said it was too loud. He told me to shut his mouth. The blind monks reacted to the sound. Dark Cliff asked what they would do next. He asked if they were going to break through the crowd. He said that monsters on insane difficulty had very high stats, and if they were hit, they wouldn't last long. Leng Si replied that they use a different method. Holding up the grappling hook, he said with a grin that they would use the grouping method. Someone asked if he really trusted this Leng Si. Dark Cliff, looking at the grappling hook in his hand, said that since Hammer decided to trust him, he would follow his decision. The white-haired girl said that she just asked the other guild members about Leng Si, and it seems that he really stood out in this monthly guild war. She said she wasn't sure about the details, but if the rumors were true, then he probably wasn't bad. Dark Cliff said he hoped so. He said he didn't want to waste his time, and if they lost their experience because of him, he wouldn't forgive him. Looking down, the girl said that she was curious as to why he put them in such a strange place. She said she even gave them a hook to get there. On the cliff behind is Squad D, DPS Squad 3 Mages. The girl asked him what he was planning. In front of them in the bushes is Squad C, Blocking Squad Ruko, Hammer. Hammer said they're a blocking squad, and he's excited. He said that he was wondering what kind of plan Ling Si was up to. Ruko was looking at him with a frown and thought about how his golden shield looked cool. He said that he could handle them all by himself and it was best not to disturb him. Looking at the golden shield, Ruko thought that it made him look weak in Ling Si's eyes. He thought that he would protect him from the monsters. He imagined covering Ling Si in the hammer with his shield. Ling Si praises Ruko with a thumbs up. Hammer fell to the ground with tears on his face, saying that in the end, they still had to rely on Ruko. Chuckling, Ruko thought that maybe Ling Si would even praise him. Hammer gave him a thumbs up smile and invited him to work together to create an unforgettable memory. Ruko irritably shouted about how he didn't need his memories and he wasn't a child. 
Hammer agreed with a smile. Wasabi-kun looked at them with a smile. Ryuko shouted at him to call him a warrior instead of a child. Wasabi-kun thought he was cute. Wasabi-kun was sitting on a bamboo trunk, being a squad bee, pulling squad. Hammer agreed and called him the warrior child. Grinning, Wasabi-kun thought that Ling Si had chosen an interesting ally, and he was looking forward to seeing his plan. He recalled how Ling Si had told them that they should just wait for him to return to the location he assigned them to. He said he shared the coordinates with them and told them not to go anywhere without his orders. Wasabi-kun asked about Ling Si. When he left, he said that he would bait the monsters and they would have to wait for him to return. Ling Si was a squad A, lure and control group. Hammer asked him in surprise that he was going to bait the monsters alone. He asked if he needed the warrior's help. The main character replied that there was no need. Hammer asked when they would use Hook. He asked how they would help him from their seats and what the strategy was. Dark Cliff said that this strange grouping method is too simple. He asked if he was sure it would work. The main character, leaving, said that if he told them the strategy now, it would not be interesting. Raising his hand, he told them to just wait for him to come back. Wasabi-kun wondered if they were too scattered, since they would be instantly killed if they had to fight a large group of monsters. He thought that this was a newly formed group, and there was no chemistry between the allies. The group looked forward in surprise, and the main character from the dialogue boxes in front of them shouted at them to get ready. Wasabi-kun said they were coming. Opening his eyes in surprise, he exclaimed that they were blind and deaf monks. Before them was a crowd of blind and deaf monks. Wasabi-kun asked if there were too many of them. A crowd of monsters ran after Ling Si. Ruko exclaimed that they were coming. He shouted to Hammer, stammering that it was best not to disturb him. Hammer, holding up a golden shield, exclaimed that there were so many of them, and it was exciting. The main character ordered Squad D to prepare to use a slow spell or any other control spell in advance. The white-haired girl agreed in surprise. Dark Cliff exclaimed that he had lured a lot of monsters. He asked if he was going to kill them. Ling Si ordered Squad C to put up their shields at the location he pointed out to them and block the exit. Hammer shouted that he was ready. Ruko obeyed. They stood with their shields out in front of the monsters. A crossbow appeared on Wasabi-kun's hands. The main character ordered him to prepare his crossbow. Wasabi-kun, standing on the bamboo trunk, said that he was ready. Ling Si dodged the monk's attacks. The green-haired guy asked how he managed to lure such a huge group of monsters by himself. The white-haired girl said that wasn't the main question. She asked him how he managed to come back unharmed after luring so many monsters with him. She added that even a small mistake would cause the monsters to hit him. Dark Cliff gritted his teeth and said that he was probably just lucky. The main character ordered Squad D to use a slow spell that has a three-second cast time on the designated spot. Dark Cliff shouted that he would go first. He held out his palm and staff, and the blue magic moved forward. A guy with green hair shouted that he was next. Blue magic covered the ground under the monk's feet. Dark Cliff shouted that a magic circle had been formed. There was a large blue magic circle under the monster's feet. Dark Cliff shouted that he had finished using his spell. He told someone to continue it. The green-haired guy agreed. Grinning, Ling Si said that their timing was perfect. He ordered Squad B to shoot the monsters in front after entering the magic circle to avoid losing their hostility towards them. Wasabi Kun asked if he was sure it wouldn't make the monsters spread out. He started talking about what would happen if he got them on his side. The main character shouted at him to just do what he said, and he would take care of the rest. He was standing in front of a deaf monk. The main character ordered him to start shooting, and Wasabi-kun pushed off from the bamboo trunk. While jumping on the bamboo trunks, Wasabi-kun started shooting at the monsters with a crossbow. The arrow hit the deaf monk's head, and he turned to face Wasabi-kun. Above his head, it was written that he had attracted his hostility. Ling Si said to lure them back to the magic circle. Wasabi-kun agreed and jumped into the magic circle. The main character stabbed the monster in the back with a dagger and told him to be a good boy and stop running away. Hammer said that thieves are very strong, noting their movements and skills. He thought that by taking advantage of the territory to gather the monsters in one place, using attack strategy, defense, and deceleration spells, they had lured a large number of monsters, gathering them in a pile and making it difficult for them to use their attacks. He was surprised to think that, in addition to this, their movements were incredibly agile, and, at the same time, he was able to find a place in order to accurately lure all the monsters back that Friend Thief had attracted while dodging all of their attacks. Glancing to the side, he thought that even so, he was still able to give orders to other allies. Hammer wondered how he could do so many things at once. Looking at Ling Si fighting the monsters, he thought that even the thieves from the first division weren't that perfect. He thought that it was impossible to do so many things at once, and he should write it down. The main character ordered Squad C to use their shields to block the monsters. He told them that if they saw one of them approaching below Squad C without hostility, block them and push them back into the circle. Hammer stood with his shield out and clicked on the dialogue box. Ruko obeyed and rushed forward. 
Hitting the monk with his shield, he told him not to even think about going through their defenses. Ling Xi ordered Squad D to use the elimination type spell as soon as they finished using the slow spell. The white-haired girl, looking at her staff, said that he could use another spell because her mana was almost gone and her legs were weak. The green-haired guy shouted to let him do it. Hammer sent Dark Cliff a chat message asking him to record Ling Xi on video because there are too many monsters here and he can't do it. Dark Cliff looked at the message in surprise. Hammer told him that he should show it to Guildmaster, Blue Cloud. Dark Cliff pressed the record button. The dialog box reported that it had started recording to video. In the magic circle, electricity enveloped the monsters. The main character is standing among monsters shrouded in electricity. Dark Cliff said it didn't have a single miss. He shouted that it was the first time he had hit so many monsters with a single skill. The white-haired girl said that her mana had recovered, and now it was her turn. Ling Xi waved his dagger and said, Monsters aren't attracted to mages. He asked Squad C if they had any problems. Ryuko, holding the monsters back with his shield, said that there was no problem. Hammer, smiling nervously, told him not to give up. He said that if they went through them, they would attack the mages from above. Ryuko gritted his teeth and said that he knew it himself. He told him not to hold him back. He said that there were a lot of monsters, and they might not be able to stand it if they attacked them all at once. The main character used Air Slice, Throat Slasher and chopped off the monster's heads. He shouted at Squad D to continue using elimination-type spells. A white-haired girl surrounded by flames shouted that she had just finished using it. The guy with the green hair said it was his turn. The monsters looked down at the ball of fire falling on them from above. The girl used flame field, and the explosion of fire scattered the monks, enveloping them in flames. Wasabi Kun thought that it looked like he was underestimating Ling Xi's skills. He thought that he would properly pull down the monsters and even use the slightest gaps to make his way through the crowd, and even attack and give orders at the same time. Hammer told Ruko that he would delay the monsters for him. He told him to get some rest. The green-haired guy called out to the next mage. The white-haired girl said that she was still recovering mana. Dark Cliff said it would do it. Wasabi Kun thought that his skills were constantly helping him earn the trust of his teammates, and because of Ling Si, things were going smoothly in the newly formed team. He thought that he never thought that a dungeon of insane difficulty would become so easy. While pulling out the dagger from the monster, the main character said that this is the end of the first wave. He said that there would be two more waves, and as long as he lured the monsters, the mages could recover their mana. Wasabi Kun thought it was all thanks to his strategy. Ling Si said it will continue with the same strategy. Everyone agreed. Colosseum Dungeon, Increased Difficulty The First Division of the Celestial Guild A voice from behind shouted for the people fighting the monster to move back a bit. He used the depriving arrow, and several yellow arrows stabbed into the ground around the monster. Yellow energy enveloped the monster, and its weapons and armor began to disappear. The guy with the sword exclaimed that the monster's equipment was gone. The monster in front of them was naked, covering himself with his hands. The guy shouted that this was their chance. He ordered them to kill him. The voice said that it looked like the skill's range was still not long enough. Holding a bow in his hand, a man with long black hair and beard said that it hadn't taken off his cloak. I could see the 15th level above his head. This is unrivaled Blue Cloud, Celestial's guild master. The man came up behind him and asked what strange skill he had used this time. Behind him was a level 15 guy with elven ears and long white hair, Fallen Whale, Celestial's vice guild master. Blue Cloud exclaimed that he was here. He said that he was just testing the range of his skill. He asked if he was done with his business. Fallen Whale replied that it wasn't a problem for the members of the first division, but it still took time to clean up. He added that there was probably a big gap between them and the top two guilds. Blue Cloud asked if there were any movements from the Nebulous and Wolf's Fang guilds. He replied that everything is still the same and there are constant conflicts between them. A huge armored monster appeared behind them. Fallen Whale said with its eyes closed that it looks like higher-ups on both sides are about to take action. The monster swung its weapon. It hit the ground hard and Fallen Whale jumped out of the way. He slashed out with his sword, and the armor broke before the monster's eyes. Blood spurted out from the monster's eye, and a bright blue light began to glow where the armor had broken. Fallen Whale used Iteration Pierce, and the blue energy made several large through holes in the monster's body. Fallen Whale said that he heard that both of these guilds were quite active in this monthly guild war. He said that he never thought that a single group of seven people from Nebulus would be able to wipe out virtually everyone from the Wolf's Fang group in a guild war. With a small smile, he said that he was willing to bet that Wolf's Fang wouldn't just let it go. Blue Cloud, while shooting a yellow arrow from his bow, said that every member of Wolf's Fang, including their guild master, has nothing but evil intentions in mind. He said that nothing good comes out of bothering them. He used Annihilation Arrow, and a huge stream of yellow energy headed towards the two armored monsters. There was an explosion in the sky, and Blue Cloud said he was willing to bet that there would be another big conflict between Nebulous and Wolf's Fang within a month.
He said that when the time comes, both sides will again demand that they take sides. He added that it was a chore. Fallen Whale laughed and said that he was, as usual, an expert at avoiding such things. Blue Cloud glanced at the dialogue box in front of him. He asked why Hammer was texting him at such a time, and if he knew that he was currently in the process of clearing the dungeon. On the dialogue box was a video with Ling Si and the message, I'm currently clearing the insane difficulty of the Broken Buddha dungeon with my friends from Nebulous, and I've discovered this thief. Blue Cloud asked in surprise about the insane difficulty and the thief from Nebulous. Fallen Whale asked what had happened. Blue Cloud told him to take a look. Hammer was asking if Blue Cloud had ever seen such a strong thief in any of the guilds before. Blue Cloud said thoughtfully about the insane complexity. The guy asked him what they should do next. Another guy said that the next wave of gladiators was coming. Blue Cloud asked Hammer what they were doing now. Hammer replied that they were currently watching him single-handedly fight an elite monster of insane dungeon difficulty, the Silent Monk, the Blind Monk, beauty that has yet to be seen, the Deaf Monk, stories that have yet to be heard, the Silent Monk, regrets that are yet to be told. Ling Si stood in front of the Silent Monk. A red light flashed in the eyes of the monk with his mouth sewn shut. The dialogue box reported that he had attracted the attention of an elite Silent Monk. The main character struck with a dagger, and the monk blocked the blow with a hand that had yellow writing on it. With a swing of the dagger, the main character was behind the monk. The group stared at his battle in surprise. Hammer wondered why he hadn't heard the name Ling Si before. He thought that with such skills, it wouldn't cost him anything to join a top guild. Blue Cloud asked Hammer in the chat if he was sure that he was fighting the silent monk alone. Hammer replied that he was recording their battle, and he would understand when he saw it. Blue Cloud asked about fighting him without a plan. He asked what about the boss, Broken Buddha, which will be released later. The main character ran forward, frowning. Hammer replied that he had a plan. He remembered Ruko asking with a smirk where that elite monster, the silent monk, was. He said he was following him. Wasabi-kun said that he was here, pointing his finger to the side. Someone asked if they could use the same method against him. Another person said they still have grappling hooks. He asked them where to go. The main character said that the field of view of elite monsters is different from ordinary monsters. He said they wouldn't have a safe place to attack. Ruko asked what they should do and if he should transform. The others were puzzled to think that he had watched too much Ultraman. Lang Si replied that there was no need and he would do it himself. He asked him in surprise that he would do it himself. The main character replied that they would not be able to keep up with his speed. A dagger appeared in his hand, and he thought that with his current damage, killing the silent monk wouldn't take him too long. He said it would probably take about 10 minutes. Dark Cliff asked in surprise if he was sure it was possible. The white-haired girl said that the last time they challenged this dungeon, the mage's attacks had no effect on it. She said that in the end, it took the melee attackers about 20 minutes to kill him, and they even lost a tank. She added that this time it's an insane challenge. Ling Si replied that it was because they fought him wrongly. He asked if they could see the beads around the silent monk's neck. He said that once they destroyed them, the magic attacks would start working on him. Hammer asked in surprise if there was such a thing, and how he knew it. The guy with the green hair said he'd never heard of it. Ling Si said he read about it in the Heavenland Library. Closing his eyes, he said that he had the combo accumulation skill, so there was no need to worry about the lack of damage. He thought that he couldn't tell them that a professional player in his previous life had found out. Wasabi-kun told him to be careful even though he was confident of winning. The main character told him not to worry. Kicking off the ground, he leapt towards the silent monk. Using a backstab, Ling Si hit the monk from behind. The monk slowly turned his head. The main character landed in front of him, shrouded in electricity. Frowning, he thought about how his memories of his attack patterns from his previous life were becoming clearer. The main character hit the monk from behind, breaking one of the beads on his neck. The monk turned around angrily. He opened his sewn-up mouth. Ling Si thought that, after going through this dungeon hundreds of times in his past life, his body was moving by itself, dodging all of its attacks. Closing his eyes, he thought that he felt like he could beat him even with his eyes closed. Wasabi Kun folded his arms and said that Ling Si was using the monster's blind spot to launch attacks. Hammer said in surprise that it was moving around the monk like flowing water. He said he was the smartest thief he'd ever seen. He imagined a huge snake behind the main character leaping at the monk to attack. Hammer thought that his nimble movements and speed were like a huge venomous snake that had wrapped itself around the monk. Wasabi said it was top time. He said that it seems that Ling Si is also one of the players who mastered top time, and this explains his micro-movements. Ruko said that it is, and Ling Si is very strong. Smiling, he thought that he would definitely go all out and stand next to him as his strongest shield. They imagined a huge cobra behind the monk, who was looking around in confusion. The main character ordered Squad D to use the elimination-type spell and help him with his final attack. Ruko asked if they had heard. He shouted that the beads were destroyed. 
the girl agreed, holding out her staff. Mages used flame wheel, earth spike and thunder serpent simultaneously. The main character continued to run around the monk, dealing him attacks. Wasabi Kun and Hammer exclaimed in surprise that Lang Xi was holding the monk in one place with his movements and attacks. Frowning, the protagonist thought, now, he used evil spirits and visibility, and the monk was chained in one place, looking at the purple spirit. The main character shouted at him to try out his ultimate skill. He used Shadow Blink, hitting the flame-shrouded monk with triple damage. The dialog box says, Combo Accumulation, 639. Ultimate Skill, Shadow Blink. The main character calmly looks ahead. The dialog box reported that the elite monster Silent Monk had been killed. Hammer said in surprise that he was too strong. Looking up, he saw lightning and said he was coming. He shouted that the broken Buddha boss had appeared. In front of them was a four-armed broken Buddha surrounded by lightning. Colosseum Dungeon, Increased Difficulty, Recreation Area of the Dungeon. Blue Cloud, sitting on the floor, said that he was surprised that the Silent Monk beads could be destroyed to get rid of the ineffectiveness of magic attacks. He said that it seems this Ling Xi knows a lot. He asked Fallen Whale if he could fight and give orders at the same time in a dungeon of insane difficulty. After being silent for a while, Fallen Whale said that their guild's first division was only able to pass the Broken Buddha special difficulty but it took them almost an hour. He said that when fighting the elite monster Silent Monk, they had to rely on a few tanks to delay it so that the physical attackers could slowly kill it, and at that time, they were only in the special difficulty of the dungeon. He suggested that he not talk about how Ling Si knew about the beads. He said that even if it was known to everyone, he still wouldn't be able to kill the Silent Monk alone, and if there was even a single mistake in his movements, the elite monster would immediately kill him. Blue Cloud asked what his answer was after all these words. Fallen Whale, closed his eyes, replied that he couldn't. Rising, Blue Cloud agreed. He said that even though one of his reasons is the skill of his class, the main reason is top time. He asked if he too had noticed that Ling Si had mastered top time. Blue Cloud said that the people who have mastered it are usually well known. Fallen Whale asked why, with his skills, he was still only in the third division. He asked me what he was planning. Blue Cloud said that, regardless of whether he can pass the dungeon or not, they need to contact him. He said it would be best if they could get him on their side. Fallen Whale started asking him something. Blue Cloud gave him a thumbs up with a smile and told him to let Hammer invite him to go to a new dungeon with them next time. He asked what he thought. Fallen Whale said nothing. Lightning thundered in the sky. A hard life will lead to a broken life. The main character and his groups fight with Broken Buddha. Above the boss's head, you can see that he has little health left. Only in your imagination can you find a life filled with happiness. Broken Buddha struck the ground with his staff, shrouded in purple and yellow energies. He asked why not worship him and forget all about it. His eyes glowed red. The white-haired girl asked what was going on and why their magic attacks were ineffective against him. She said that everything is completely different from the increased difficulty. The green-haired guy asked if this was a new attribute added specifically for the insane difficulty. Dark Cliff said that the boss has a third of its health left. The girl with white hair asked what they should do now that Broken Buddha has become stronger. The main character told them not to worry because there is a solution to this. The guy with the green hair asked him to tell them as soon as possible. Ling Xi asked if they could see the four hands on the boss back. Frowning, he said that all of his basic attacking skills were from these hands, and if they cut them off, they would also strip him of his basic attacking skills. But asked in surprise if he was talking about break. He asked if he was going to break specific parts of a boss of insane difficulty. Broken Buddha stood in front of them, holding a staff wrapped in yellow energy with both hands. Hammer said that it was enough for them to kill him slowly, and asked if he had forgotten that it was an insane difficulty. He said that being able to pass an insane difficulty is already amazing. The main character replied that he had already told the mages to aim directly at those four hands. He said with a grin that it was his turn. Rushing forward, Ling Si called for Ruko to follow. He exclaimed in surprise. The main character said that he needed his power now. He ordered the mages to keep attacking and not worry about them attracting the boss's attention because he would delay it for them. Ruko frowned and agreed. Running forward, he thought that Ling Si had trusted him, and he needed to try not to disappoint him. The main character shouted at Wasabi Kun that he had to hold the boss in place. Wasabi Kun agreed and shouted at him to be careful because he was in an enhanced state. Wasabi Kun, looking at his hand, thought in surprise that they were dealing with a broken Buddha of insane difficulty and no one had yet seen what skills he had in this state. Broken Buddha raised two hands that held red and green energy. His other two hands held blue and yellow energy. Hammer exclaimed in surprise when he saw the four seals. He asked if Broken Buddha of insane difficulty could use four skills at the same time. He exclaimed that it was too strong. Broken Buddha said he was stupid to stand up to him alone. He shot four spells forward, 
They rushed towards the main character, who was in the air above the monster. Magic enveloped the main character. He used evil spirits and visibility, and his face turned into a skull. Broken Buddha blocked the dark purple energy of the main character's skill with a yellow magic barrier with writing, and told the evil spirits to leave. The main character was behind the monster, and he said that these were stupid actions. Broken Buddha held out his hand, shrouded in electricity. He grabbed the main character. Ling Xi grinned and said that this distance was enough for him, and it was time for him to do his thing. He used Throat Slasher, and blue energy enveloped them. He commanded Ruko to show his strength. Standing on the shield, he obeyed. Pushing off from it, he jumped up. Hammer asked if he was sending this child to his death. Dark Cliff asked him what he was thinking, because the boss would kill this shrimp in no time. Ruko flew forward, swinging his fist. Wasabi-kun wondered if it was possible that Ruko also had secrets that no one else knew about. Ruko thought that he had come to help Ling Si. Broken Buddha, swinging his fist, asked if he dared to compete with him in strength. Ruko frowned and hit Broken Buddha with his fist, shrouded in yellow energy. It started to increase. Hammer asked in surprise what it was and if it was his skill. He exclaimed that it had increased. A huge Ruko stood in front of Broken Buddha, touching him with his fists. Broken Buddha exclaimed about how terrifying his power was. Ruko clenched his fist with his other hand and punched the boss. The main character shouted at him about the place he sent him. As he ran away, he shouted at him to lure him there. Ruko agreed. The white-haired girl exclaimed in surprise that he was able to push away the broken Buddha of insane difficulty with pure strength. Dark Cliff said in surprise that it must be a joke. Ruko held up his hands, shrouded in yellow energy. After hitting the ground, he used the protective Lionheart shield. The dialog box showed, Protective Lionheart Shield, an exclusive skill of the blessing of bravery, transforms the user's vigor and bravery into reinforced shoulder shields that are able to inflict impact damage to enemies in the area, causing them to be stunned for 0, 5 seconds. C-O-O-L-D-O-W-N, 30 minutes. Additional attributes, physical defense plus 9 for 30 seconds. Special effects, the user is able to combine the shoulder shields into Fearless Lionheart Shield, which can last for 60 seconds. Ryuko looked ahead with a frown. Turning to face Broken Buddha, he swung his shields. A huge yellow cloud of dust rose. Wasabi-kun realized that this was Ruko's secret. He said that it was no wonder Ling Si wanted to bring him to the dungeon. He said he was intimidating. A cloud of dust dispersed around Broken Buddha and Ruko. Broken Buddha's eyes flashed red, and he said that he was being presumptuous. Broken Buddha hit the shield. He swung the hand with the writing wrapped in yellow energy. Ruko stood in front of him, shields folded in front of him, shrouded in yellow energy. By combining the shields, he can use the fearless Lionheart shield. Another huge yellow cloud of dust rose. In the dissipating cloud of dust in front of Ruko, Broken Buddha staggered. He looked at him with red eyes. Ruko extended a huge hand towards his face. He hit Broken Buddha hard, causing it to fly off, and shouted to the main character that it was coming. Before flying towards Broken Buddha to the edge of the cliff ran the main character. Hammer, noticing the cliff, cursed and said that they can't let Broken Buddha fall off the cliff before they defeat him, otherwise he will leave the battle and be reborn again. He asked if their teamwork hadn't worked. Ling Xi stands with his back to the falling monster and says that everything is going as planned. Using a backstab, he hit Broken Buddha in the back. He asked him if he wasn't going to hell, then who would go there? He told him with a smirk that he hoped he would enjoy himself in the abyss. The main character moved along the back of Broken Buddha, dealing him damage with numerous attacks. Using a single-use grappling hook, he flew back to the cliff and said that they were done here and they wouldn't have to waste time trying to get rid of the body. Above the fallen Broken Buddha is written, Critical Kill. The main character turned around in surprise when he heard the laughter. Broken Buddha laughed and said that he was no different from him, and they both had broken souls. Looking at him with his red eyes, he said that they were falling into a bottomless pit. The main character climbed up the cliff, and Broken Buddha laughed out loud. Looking back, Ling Si thought about his words about broken souls. The dialogue box says, The team you're in has successfully killed the Broken Buddha. Congratulations on clearing the insanity difficulty of the dungeon Broken Buddha. There is now a new record for the dungeon. The main character thought about what these words meant. Hammer exclaimed enthusiastically that he couldn't believe it, and it was very exciting. A guy in a wizard's hat, passing by, asked if this is the team that passed the crazy difficulty of Broken Buddha. Hammer exclaimed that he thought the main character had miscalculated when he saw the boss falling off the cliff, but he didn't expect everything to go according to his plan. Lang Si replied that he was just lucky. A man in the crowd exclaimed that this was a new record. Another guy in the crowd asked if they were from the guild in the first place. He exclaimed that they were very strong. Ling Si thought that this was actually a strategy pro from his previous life, and the only difference was that Ruko alone had to play the role of several tanks. He said that although nothing drops from the boss of this dungeon, the rewards for completing the dungeon are quite generous. 
he said that apart from the purification ring, they can share all the rewards among themselves. Wasabi Kun said that Ling Si and Ruko even got to level up. He said he would forgive them, given the generous rewards. Looking at the dialogue box, he said it wasn't bad. The main character said that the system distributes experience points between participants based on their contribution to the dungeon, so it's only natural that he and Ruko got a lot more experience than them. Ruko exhaled wearily and said that there wasn't a single item suitable for him. Someone exclaimed about getting Sorrowful Staff, which gives 12 extra points of magic damage and even has an extra skill. Ruko looked away in frustration. The white-haired girl happily raised her new staff above her. Ruko thought about being envious. The main character told him not to worry, because he would help him level up later and then there would be a lot of equipment for him. Ruko exclaimed in surprise. He said that then he would need to get at least a gold piece or something much cooler than the hammer. He added that he now feels like he's figured out how to activate his transformation, and he'll show him when he takes it to level up. He said that he knew that Lang Si would let him fight the boss in this dungeon, and he wasn't afraid at all. The main character agreed indifferently. Ruko said that the moment the boss fist hit his fist, he already knew that he would win. He asked if he had seen his fearless Lionheart shield at the end. He exclaimed that this was his exclusive skill after transformation, and he wasn't sure if there were any other skills yet. Hammer called out to Ling Si, and he turned around. He said that their guild master, unrivaled Blue Cloud, wanted to meet him. He asked if he would accept the invitation for his sake. Celestial Guild Headquarters The main character found himself in front of a white castle surrounded by a wall and small stone houses. A guy passing by said that he would have to sell the equipment he received yesterday. The other told him that there was no need for that, and all he had to do when fighting against an archer was just get as close to him as possible. The brown-haired man said that if they prepared a few more potions, they would have more supplies than any other team in their guild's group event today. Hammer asked him what he thought. He said that their guild has the busiest headquarters in the game. Ling Si replied that he never thought that he would visit Celestial's headquarters before visiting Nebula's headquarters. Hammer replied that he must be joking. He said that with his skills, headquarters should give him tasks on a daily basis. The main character replied that he was just a thief from the third division, and headquarters wouldn't pay much attention to him. Hammer said he was too modest. He asked if he was trying not to draw attention to himself on purpose. He said he wanted to thank him for agreeing to his request. He said that if he needed his help in the future, all he had to do was ask and he would come to the rescue right away. Ling Si replied that it wasn't a problem, and the more friends he had, the more help he would have. He added that, especially if it's someone with the status of a Celestial's guildmaster. Hammer laughed and said he liked his bluntness. The main character thought about how Celestial's guildmaster, unrivaled Blue Cloud, was one of the names that shook Heavenland in his past life, and he was nicknamed the First Brute Archer. He thought that he couldn't have thought that he would take the initiative to meet him now, and this world is truly unpredictable. He thought that the people who had once been out of his reach were now closer than ever. The main character noticed green smoke. He thought it was the smell of potions. The person with the green smoke source in his hand said that they sell potions that restore mana and health. Ling Si asked if they had started training alchemists. Hammer asked who would do that. He said they just let mages hawk some goods. The main character thought that, indeed, in his previous life, alchemists only became useful half a year after the game was launched. He thought that this was a class that mages might specialize in, and there might not be anyone who discovered it at the moment. The main character realized something and raised his eyebrows in surprise. He wondered how he could have forgotten about it. Ling Si remembered that there were some alchemists who created potions with incredible effects that became very popular in the market, and thus they made a fortune for themselves. He thought maybe he should start training his alchemist. The protagonist raised an eyebrow, thinking that if he remembered correctly, the alchemist who dominated almost the entire market in Heavenland was known as Alchemist Emperor Vankathus. He thought that right now, he should still be a novice mage. Hammer called out to Ling Si. Ling Si, grinning darkly, was thinking that if he could train him properly to become his personal alchemist, he wouldn't have to think about money in the future and he should do it right after he was done with the business here. Hammer asked what was happening to him. Fallen Whale, who was behind the main character, said with a smile that Ling Si seemed to be in a good mood today. He asked what his impression of Celestial was. Ling Si rolled his eyes in surprise. Hammer asked him why he had come. Hammer introduced him to Ling Si as Celestial's vice guildmaster, Fallen Whale. The main character, turning awkwardly, said that he was pleased to meet you. A passerby greeted Fallen Whale, who was standing with his hands clasped behind his back. Fallen Whale told Hammer that he would be the guide for Ling Si from now on. He thanked him for his hard work and said that he could rest. Agreed and said that he would not interfere with him. As he left, he waved and offered Ling Si a drink when he was free. Fallen Whale called the main character to follow him. Blue Cloud welcomed him to Celestial. Fallen Whale said it was their guildmaster. Blue Cloud held out his hand to the protagonist with a smile. 
Ling Si thanked him for the invitation and asked what Guildmaster Blue Cloud wanted to talk to him about. Shaking his hand, he thought he was a strength-based archer. Laughing, Blue Cloud said that he was incredible because he was able to control the battle on his own in a dungeon of insane difficulty. He said he'd get straight to the point. Blue Cloud said that he wanted to become friends with Ling Si and invited him to go through the dungeon with him. The main character thought that he exuded an aura different from the rest, as expected from the guildmaster of the fourth best guild in Heavenland. Blue Cloud said that he must have heard about the new level 15 dungeon, Disastrous Graveyard. He replied that he had heard about it, and at the moment the best record in it is increased difficulty. He said that as far as he could remember, the cleanup time was approximately 2 hours. Fallen Whale said it was 1 hour, 56 minutes, and 39 seconds. He said that the record was set by the guild in first place, and since then, there have been no records of anyone completing a dungeon at a higher difficulty. He added that this is, after all, a new dungeon. Blue Cloud asked with a smile if Ling Si had confidence that they would be able to pass the insane difficulty of the dungeon. Fallen Whale looked at him in silence. He thought that the insane difficulty of Disastrous Graveyard was much harder than the insane difficulty of Broken Buddha. He wondered if Blue Cloud was going to use this opportunity to find out this thief's abilities, or if he thought that this thief had hidden his real abilities based on his performance in Broken Buddha. Leng Si asked with a serious face if Blue Cloud wanted to be the first to pass the insane difficulty of this dungeon. He replied that it was so. The main character replied with a grin that it wasn't a problem, but it wouldn't be cheap. Laughing, Blue Cloud noted his directness. He said that, as expected, he was a straightforward guy. He said that the team's composition, classes, items, and equipment needed would be chosen by Ling Si, and he would be the team leader. He said that he and Fallen Whale would also join, and if they successfully completed the dungeon, Ling Si would determine the distribution of rewards. The main character agreed with a smile. He said that he already had a plan, but the disastrous graveyard dungeon has a level requirement, and it hasn't reached the required level yet. He said it would take him a few more days. Blue Cloud replied that this was not a problem. Fallen Whale thought that they had already decided everything like this. Blue Cloud said to add him as a friend, and he can text him as soon as he's done. The main character said that there was something he needed to puzzle Blue Cloud about. He asked me what it was. Ling Si said that he needed several skill books, and he would have to spend a lot of time if he decided to search for them on his own. He added that, of course, he would buy them from him for a reasonable price. Blue Cloud replied that if he needed skill books, he could give them to him as a gift. The main character replied with a smile that then he would not hold back. He said that he needed a quick stab, a skill for thieves, berserk slice, and a skill for removing debuffs, disaster's gift. Fallen Whale thoughtfully said that quick stab and berserk slice wouldn't be a problem, but it would take them some time to find disaster's gift because his the rarity is higher and the chance of it falling out is correspondingly lower. He said that he would order the guild members to find him and that shouldn't be a problem. He said that if everything went according to plan, it would probably take three days, and he would order someone to deliver them to Ling Si once they collected them all. Blue Cloud, which is less and less expected of Fallen Whale, and it's capable as ever. He noted that he managed to solve all this in such a short time. Fallen Whale replied that it was nothing. The main character thanked them and said that he had one more question for the two of them. Blue Cloud told him to ask his question. Ling Si asked why they hadn't become awakened yet if both of them had already reached the 15th level. He said that with their skills, becoming an awakened should be easy. Blue Cloud held up his palm and said that Ling Si might not know this, but even though it's not difficult for them, the specialization trial will also determine the level of chance of a person's awakening. He said that, for example, Dark Lines, who managed to successfully awaken with a 99% chance of awakening, is one of the few terrifying people in this game. Frowning with a serious face, Blue Cloud said that the chance of awakening not only increases the player's chance of becoming awakened, but it will also decide how strong they will be after awakening. Fallen Whale said with a frown that they were still studying and observing if there were ways to increase their chance of awakening. The main character replied that he understood. He thought that the job specialization task was actually a test to determine the chance of a player waking up. He thought that he knew that the chance of awakening would also decide the player's strength after awakening, just didn't know that there would be people who would look for ways to increase their chance of awakening. Ling Si thought that it wasn't impossible to find out something if someone like the guildmaster of one of the major guilds used their powers. He thought that it was no wonder that so many strong awakened players had slowly appeared in his past life. Grinning slightly, he thought it was interesting. Turning around, Ling Si said that he wouldn't delay them then, and he also had his own business to attend to. He said he'd contact them when he was done. Blue Cloud said with a smile that he was a strong guy. He said that they radiate an aura that is unique to the strong. Looking at the main character's back, he said that it was as if he was sure that everything would definitely work out for him, and he would always continue to move forward. Fallen Whale said with a grin that he was also looking forward to their next meeting. 
he added that it wasn't because he was curious to see how he would lead the team into the dungeon. He said that he would like to fight him after he finished leveling up. Greyfall Street Lots of people walked down the street full of stalls. One person asked about the fact that the potion costs one silver coin. Another man laughed and said that it was equivalent to a robbery. The man was holding a bottle of blue potion inside. The dark-haired guy said with a smirk that he had heard from a friend that there was a fool here who sold expensive potions. He said he thought it was a lie, but it turned out to be true. The man replied that if he didn't want them, he could leave. A little girl with blue hair was holding a potion basket in her hand. Above her head, you can see that her name is Vankafis and she has a third level. The guy laughed at her name and said that she was probably an old man in real life. Twirling the blue potion in his hand, he said it was a strange and old-fashioned name. He said with a smirk that all the potions she made were very expensive. The guy asked with a grin if she came to Heavenland to be a clown. Vankafis, frowning, shouted that he was an old man himself and all his family were old men. Turning around, she told them to leave because she had her own things to do. She asked, cursing, why they were complaining when they'd never even tried them. The guy asked irritably what she meant by the fact that he had never tried them. He shouted that his friend had bought her potion a few days ago, and he thought that since it was worth one silver coin, it must be incredible. Folding his arms across his chest, he said that it ended up being a normal potion, but with a random attribute. He grudgingly said that a random attribute might even be a debuff, and she was digging a hole for others. The guys behind him laughed. Vankafis said that this means that it works, and it did not deceive anyone. The guy in the wizard's hat shouted that she was just a crook. The dark-haired guy shouted in exasperation that he was here today to avenge his friend and he would destroy her shop. Vankafis held up her index finger with a smirk and said they could try if they wanted. She said that all the customers who tried to do this were captured by the guards. She told him to turn around. Behind them was the huge NPC Silver Patrol Guard. The guy in the magic hat told the guy with the dark hair that she was right, and if they deliberately destroyed something, they would be captured by the city guards and put in custody. The guy told them to go. The guy in the wizard's hat said he had a way to make sure the guards didn't catch them. The guy with the dark hair asked about the method. The guy in the wizard's hat with a wicked grin told him that as long as they didn't do it intentionally, but by accident, it wouldn't be a problem. The dark-haired guy agreed and told him to push him. After turning the table over, he said that it accidentally fell and they accidentally turned the table over. The other guy, laughing angrily, apologized. Vankafis shouted about her potions. The potions lay broken on the floor. The guys, leaving, told Vankafis that they were very sorry, and they did not do it on purpose. A man in the crowd said it looked like the fraudster's store had been destroyed. Another person said that players have been having horrors lately, trying to cheat them out of their money. Vankafis, noticing the man behind, turned around. Lengsi said thoughtfully about the fact that these potions give a random attribute. Picking up a blue potion from the ground, he said that if this guy received a buff from him, his behavior would be significantly different. After looking at it, he said that one silver coin per bottle was really too expensive. He handed the potion to her, and she thanked him. Vankafis looked down and said that the price was so high because it took her a lot of energy and time to create these potions, and it was much more expensive to create them than normal potions. Looking at the blue potion in her hand, she said that, for some reason, her chance of successfully creating a normal potion was zero. Vankafis said that she doesn't like fighting and only knows how to make potions, so she has no choice. Ling Si thought that he had never seen Alchemist Emperor Vankafis in person in his past life, and thought from the name that it was an old man. Frowning, he thought that after learning about her success rate of creating a normal potion being zero, he was sure that she was an alchemist emperor from his previous life because all the potions she created had strong additional attributes. Vankafis was putting potions in a drawer. The main character thought that this was how she got this nickname, which caused all the guilds in the game to argue among themselves about inviting her to become their guild's super alchemist. The main character asked her while holding two potions in his hands if she had joined the guild. Vankafis said that she would never want to take in a mage who couldn't even be sure of the effects of the potions she was making. She thanked him for his help and said that he could put the potions here. Lengsi he guessed that, if he wasn't mistaken, she had some special skill or attribute. He explained that he was referring to a skill or attribute that normal players don't have. Vankafis's eyes widened in surprise. Turning to the protagonist, she asked how he knew that she had a special attribute. Ryuko, standing behind Tiana, said that he sent the old monk flying with a single punch. He asked her if she could imagine it. He said that he then chased after the monk and Ling Si was as cool as ever. He said that he always stands in a steep place, getting ready, and then he grabbed the monk's head. 
he continued to talk excitedly about his adventures. The man behind the counter told Tiana that her dessert was ready. Tiana thought with a smile that the desserts at Heavenland were delicious. She told Ruko that she had already heard about it, and he was as strong as ever. Ruko chuckled and told her that he would become even stronger in the future. She said that Ellings he told them to wait for him here. She asked what was going on. Ruko replied that his location is very close. Lengs he said he was here. Ruko turned around when he noticed him. Tiana asked in surprise what the little girl was doing. The main character said it was Vankafas, a magician. Vankafas, standing behind him, said it was a pleasure to meet them. Ruko told her that she has a strange name and it sounds like an old man's name. She said irritably that he was an old man himself and she had a reason for using that name. Tiana approached the main character and asked if this was the new ally that he wrote to her about in his message. Ling Si replied that it was her. Tiana asked in surprise why all the allies he finds are small children. She said that Ruko has a transformation skill, and she can understand that, but does this little girl also have a transformation skill? She added that she was only on the third level. Tiana asked if he was interested in children. She said she'd call the police. Ling Si asked what she was talking about. He said that he called her here because he wanted her to help him raise her level to fifth. He said that after she reached the fifth level, he would help her level up by himself and that would puzzle her. Ruko asked Vankafis what was in the bag she was carrying. She said it was none of his business. Ling Si said that her level is too low and it will interfere with her potion making efficiency, so she will need to raise her level first. Ruko agreed and said that as long as she didn't level up, Ling Si should take him along to raise his level. The main character said that then everything is decided. He thanked Tiana for her help. Tiana closed her eyes and said that they would contact him if anything happened. Ruko excitedly urged them to go level up. Vankafis grabbed Ling Si by the hem of her clothes and asked him to wait. She asked if what he said was true and if it could really happen. Vankafis asked if she could really become the best alchemist in the game. Ling Si replied that it was true. He told her with a smile that she would definitely become the best alchemist in the game. He told her to believe him. The dialog box reported that the teleport was activated. Ruko asked the protagonist if the girl with the big sword was really strong. He replied that she was really strong, even though her specialty wasn't strength or martial skills. Ling Si said that she is the same as him, and she told him that she is also a person with a blessing pithy blessing. The main character said that this is a strong blessing for creating potions. Ruko said with a smirk that although he didn't quite understand, since he could help Ling Si, he was fine with it. He asked where they would raise his level. The main character replied that they would go to the capital of magicians, the magic city of the metropolis of Herdians. He said with a smile that they would stay there for a few days and raise the level to level 12. The metropolis of Herdians is a city full of red and white colors, a paradise for fire and ice magicians. Here you can see mages in robes of various colors flying in the sky on their magic staffs. Staff gliding technique, a movement skill that can only be used by mages, available only in Metropolis of Herdians, and therefore it is one of the sites unique to this city. In this magical city, mages are divided into camps, one of the fire element, and the other of the ice element. They wear red and white magic robes, respectively. The dialogue box says, Mission Song of Fire and Ice. The Song of Fire and Ice mission is a team mission that is usually accepted only by mages. Now the main character's key is to quickly level up. Ryuko, who is wearing a white robe, told Ling Si, who is wearing a red robe, that they will need at least one mage in the team to help them on this mission, because they are not mages. The main character replied that he knew this, and Song of Fire and Ice is also known as a mission exclusive to mages. He said that players can create teams and choose which camp they want to join, fire or ice. He said that once the number of players on both sides is equal, players can attack the opposite camp based on the side they choose to join. The main character said that experience and rewards will be obtained after the opposing team is destroyed, however, both camps are mostly made up of NPCs. He said that, in simple terms, they were just taking part in a battle between NPCs. Ruko said that his friend, a high-level mage, was accepting this mission, and after creating a team and choosing a side, they would need to wait for the system to pick them a group with the same number of players to start the mission. He said there were only two of them, and they were in different groups, and it would take forever for them to wait for the other players. Ling Si asked him who said they would wait for other players. After looking at it, he said that there was no limit to the minimum number of players needed in this mission. He said that as far as he knows, there was no player who tried to join the mission alone. He asked what he thought would happen if they accepted the mission themselves, being on opposite sides. Ruko guessed that they would be attacked by a lot of NPC mages. The main character replied that this was not the case, and because the requirement is for both sides to have the same number of players, the system will put the two of them together in the same match. He said with a smile that this way they would be able to carry out an almost illegal plan. Ruko repeated the words about the illegal plan with bright eyes. He thought that the peerless confidence that Ling Si exuded was too cool. 
He wondered if this was the secret to becoming strong. Holding out his hands to him, he said that he didn't really understand, but it sounded like it would be very cool. He urged him to start because he couldn't wait any longer. Lang Xi said that since they had already chosen their camps, they just needed to go and accept the mission. He said he would explain the details to him later. He asked if he had brought the instrument he had given him. Ruko said he took it with him. Someone pushed past him. The main character turned around. Ruko waved his fist in displeasure and shouted that he had bumped into him. A girl with white hair and red clothes walked past them. Ling Xi frowned and thought that he had seen this girl somewhere. Ruko furiously asked if her parents had taught her manners. The main character told him to forget about it, and she probably didn't see him. Turning around, the girl called him foul-mouthed kid. A staff appeared in her hand. The main character shouted to be careful. Ruko asked her what she was doing. Ling Xi glanced to the side. A stone wall appeared between him and Ruko. Ruko asked what was going on. He gritted his teeth as he noticed the incoming attack. The girl hit him in the body. The dialogue box says, you were attacked by a player. You are now allowed to defend yourself. Ruko flew into the wall. The girl asked who he thought didn't know manners. The twelfth level was visible above her head. She said, swinging her staff, that a foul-mouthed kid like him should be disciplined by violence. Ruko's hand was shrouded in yellow energy. The girl looked ahead in surprise. Yellow energy flashed in front of her. Jumping back, she wondered what was happening to him. She saw that his body had grown larger. She wondered if it was a special ability. Ling Si, standing behind her, noticing her battle mage staff, said that battle mages are rare. He told her to calm down because he didn't want to offend her. He added that the punch she had just given him was punishment enough. She thought about it when he was behind her. The main character told Ruko to calm down. He clicked his tongue in displeasure, gritting his teeth and frowning. It has shrunk. Ling Si asked if she would mind being blacklisted if she decided to attack someone in the city. He said the guards would be here soon. The girl, leaving, said that she was already going to leave this city, so she doesn't care. Ling Si stood silently with his back to her. When he turned around, he thought of the short-haired battle mage girl. Ruko pointed at her with his index finger and asked how she could attack someone like that. He said that if he said something wrong, she could just tell him about it. He added that it was painful. The girl looked at him. The silver patrol guards appeared in front of her and Ruko told her not to even think about running away because the guards were already here. The girl stood up on her staff. She flew into the air, flying past the guards. She said she had to go. Ruko angrily shouted if she thinks she's great because she knows how to use the staff gliding technique. He said that he didn't care that she was level 12 and demanded that she go down. He called her a stupid woman. The girl looked down. Lang Si thought that he remembered who she was. He thought that in his previous life, she was a famous professional. She flew away. The main character told Ruko that a chatty language brings problems. He told him to go and that they would level up first. Ruko said that he was very angry. The main character thought that she was met with a bad ending. He added, what a pity. The dialogue box says, the mission, Song of Fire and Ice, has begun. Help your allies attack the opponent's camp within the stipulated time. Kill as many enemies as possible to receive more rewards. The main character walked forward surrounded by flames. He looked ahead. The dialogue box says, the number of participants on both sides, two players. Please wait for the gate to open at your camp's gathering point. Ruko went forward surrounded by ice. The dialogue box announced that the time limit is 30 minutes, and the battle begins. He stared ahead, frowning. This is a classic invading type map mission, Magical Canyon. It was originally a mission exclusively for mage players to fight each other, but because of the lack of participants, they have now been replaced with NPCs. However, the number of NPCs mages are still quite large, and they are all mages whose levels are not low. Ryuko ran forward. He recalled Ling Xia's words that they didn't need to destroy the enemies, they only needed to touch them. Ruko smirked and said that he didn't know there was such a way to complete this mission. Chuckling, he said that he needed to enjoy it while he had the chance. He added that Ling Xia is just too amazing. He called out to the main character, who stabbed the red-cloaked man in the back. Ling Xi, moving quickly between the opponents, thought that in this mission, if the NPC they hit died, they would still gain experience, and all the NPCs that could only be killed by the mage's magic spells would give them even more experience, because the more participants there were in this mission, the fewer they would be share of experience. Frowning, he thought that the frenemy cooperation he was doing with Ruko would allow them to turn the battlefield into an experience field. The main character ran to the bridge and looked away. Ruko was running towards him along with the mages dressed in white robes behind him. While running past him, Ling Xi reminded him to drink potions if there was any trouble. He agreed. The main character is said to be a bridge on which both sides meet each other. He shouted at him to jump and said they would switch places. They used single-use grappling hooks. The main character told him to keep pulling the NPCs. Ruko shouted to the opponents to give him experience and help him level up. 
Lengsi, standing on a snow-covered rock, thought that normally players who participate in this mission would stage an invasion of the enemy's camp. But according to this method, they would simultaneously lure NPCs into the enemy's camp and get more rewards by destroying as many of them as possible. He thought that no one had discovered this method yet. The main character is standing behind a rock not far from the magician in a white robe. He thought about it. That I heard about this method from an old player in my previous life, and in a few days they will release a patch for this mission, adding a requirement for the minimum number of players. Grinning, he thought that once this patch was released, they wouldn't be able to use this method anymore. He thought it was really against the rules, so until the patch came out, he would use this chance to level up to the max. Ling Si used Throat Slasher, hitting opponents with a dagger. The dialogue box reported that he had attracted the hatred of an ice mage. The main character frowned. He used a backstab and ended up behind the white-robed robot mages. He threw many punches, and a cloud of snow rose from the ground. The main character thought that since this is a team mission, NPCs' health and attack are very high, but since they are all mages, it takes them longer to complete their attacks, and he can use this time to close the distance between them, so it's not so difficult for him to move between a large number of them. NPC mages. Looking ahead, he thought that the only problem was that they could use long-range spells. Many icy snowflakes from the ice mages' staffs rushed towards the main character's back. He used evil spirits and visibility, and his face turned into an evil spirit grimace as soon as the attacks reached his body. He thought that he could use this skill to dodge their attacks. On the ground in front of the main character, mages in white robes were running in different directions. He thought that he had 10 minutes left, and that should be enough. The dialogue box reported that it attracted a large amount of hate. Ling Si with a serious face thought about how many magicians Ruko was able to lure in. He thought that all he had to do was wait for him in the center of the bridge. A huge Ruko wrapped in flames shouted at him that he couldn't hold them back any longer. He said he used all his speed and health potions and they almost killed him. The main character thought that preparing enough potions for him was the right decision. He thought that, as expected, if it wasn't for his blessing, he would have already died. After running past Ryuko, he told him not to lose speed and run back to his camp. He said all he had to do was sit back and enjoy the show. Ryuko obeyed. The main character thought that they would take advantage of this moment and bring the NPCs they lured with them to a place where their paths would cross. After jumping over the crowd of fire mages, he thought that they would now jump into the crowd of NPCs belonging to the side they had chosen, and the hatred towards them would immediately be redirected to the NPCs of the opposite sides. The shrunken Ruko jumped into the crowd of ice mages. Ling Si thought that a chaotic battle between NPC mages would now begin. Ice and fire mages shot each other with ice and fire spells. As the magical spells clash, thousands of rays of light made out of magical particles cover the entire sky like fireworks. Right now, an unprecedented and exciting battle between mages is taking place on this bridge. Countless mages are disappearing in the fierce exchange of spells, being reduced to experience, equipment or tools. The silhouettes of the main character and Ruko were surrounded by inscriptions about gaining experience. The main character thought that he and Ruko would gain a huge amount of experience from this, which would flow into their bodies from the battlefield like small galaxies of stars. In this plan that's based around exploiting the bug in the game's mission, a cheat like leveling speed is becoming real right at this moment. The dialogue box says, time is up. The song of fire and ice will be chanted once again next time. The following dialogue box says, score tabulation. Number of fire type mages killed, 136. Number of ice type mages killed, 161. Congratulations to the players on the fire type camp for becoming the winners of this song of fire and ice. An extra 10 silver coins have been rewarded. The main character asked Ruko if he was finished. He said not yet, because there were too many things here. Above his head, it can be seen that he has reached the 8th level. Raising an eyebrow, he said that even though he was glad that he had raised his level, cleaning the battlefield was exhausting. Ling Si said that each of them had killed more than a hundred NPC mages. With his head, it can be seen that he has reached the ninth level. He said with a smile that there would definitely be a lot of items here. He said that the number of slots in their inventory is limited. The main character called to pick up only items that can be sold for a good price. Ruko closed one eye and said that this mission can only be completed once a day, but leveling up once a day isn't too bad. The main character told him that if they wanted to level up once a day, they would need to lure more and more NPCs every day. Ruko asked in surprise if that meant they would need a lot of potions to stay alive. Turning around, Ling Si told him not to forget that it was very difficult to level up in this game. He said that the higher one's level, the harder it will be to raise it, because it will take much more experience than before. The dialogue box informed him that he had received three items from Falling Whale. It asked if he would accept them. The dialogue box displayed three books. The main character clicked on the accept button. He thought with a smile that the people from Celestial were quite effective. 
The dialogue box reported receiving items. Frowning, he thought that he was thus one step closer to reaching the 15th level and completing his preparations for the awakening mission. Waving his hand, he called for Ruko to go. He said they would sell the equipment they just received. Ruko asked me to wait for him. The main character walks forward with a confident expression on his face and thinks that he is looking forward to seeing what his chance of awakening in this life will be. Above the rocks was a bright blue sky, slowly turning pink. City of Magic, exit point from the Song of Fire and Ice mission. The brown-haired guy asked why there was suddenly a minimum entry requirement for the Song of Fire and Ice mission. Another guy said with a smile that he also found it strange when he saw it. He laughed and asked who would enter the camp alone. The guy agreed and said it was a weird patch. He said that going against the opponent's camp alone should be a joke. He asked who would want to be killed. Another guy, beaming, said that the game probably just wanted to make the rules clearer. Ling Si and Ruko emerged from the blue portal. Level 12 is visible above the main character's head. Level 11 is visible above Ruko's head. The pink-haired girl told the gray-haired girl that it was them, and it was the strange couple she had just told her about. The girl replied that the guy looks a little cute. The pink-haired girl said that she had been on this mission for the past few days, so she recognized them. She said that they were attacked by a Blackleaf player before they started the mission. She said the two of them always went out at the same time, but it was always just the two of them. The girl said that players from both camps usually come out when the mission ends. The gray-haired girl asked if it was possible that each of them had joined the camp alone. The pink-haired girl said it was impossible. She asked if the NPCs would mob them then. The girl said she remembers that they weren't level 11 and 12 when they entered. The other girl said nothing. Ling Si suggested that Ruko needed quite a bit of experience to reach level 12. Ling Si smiled and told him to go back to the guild after he finished selling equipment and help Vankafis level up. He told him to see if he could get level 12 while he was doing it. Ruko asked Ling Si if he was busy with other things. He replied that he would need to meet someone. Ruko recalled the face of Vankafis and thought that they had finally finished leveling up and even got a lot of good equipment that would make them rich. He thought that helping level 3 Vankafis level up would be very boring and time-consuming. The main character told him not to even think about spending the money they earned. He told him to save them for now. He told him to be a good boy and help Chana and Vankafis. Ruko, laughing awkwardly, said that he would not spend the money and would now go to help them. He thought that he had seen right through it. Entering the blue portal, Ruko waved and told him to call him if he had any interesting missions. Smiling slightly, Ling Si raised his hand in response and thought that their days of speed leveling were finally over, and it was terribly boring. Clad in white and purple armor, he thought that he was able to get the entire set of plows protection after all this grinding. He thought it was just in time for the level 15 dungeon disastrous graveyard, which he would go to with the people from Celestial. He thought that level 12 was the minimum level requirement to enter this dungeon. Smiling slightly, Ling Si thought that he needed to change his weapon now. He remembered one of the famous sayings in Heavenland, all the equipment you have before you wake up is trash. He thought that there was still one good place where he could get a decent weapon. PvP Players Arena Above the head of the little old man in the red hood is written, NPC Ticket Seller. He handed a piece of paper to the protagonist and said that a one-time ticket costs one silver coin. Ling Si thought that PvP Players Arena is a huge arena with many battlegrounds. He thought that here, different players of different classes were fighting each other, and the arena was broadcasting the battles to the public live. Players can challenge each other either via matching or invitation, and the winner will receive equipment for their class. The protagonist thought that in his past life, many professionals took advantage of this arena to get rich with the rewards they earned. He thought that the rewards in the arena usually have attributes that are better than the items that are sold outside, and if he wants to get a level 12 dagger, then he will have to win against a level 12 player six times in a row and get a better score for each fight, as he thought that if he got any grade lower than S, the rewards would be random. Ling Si thought that this teleport would teleport him to the arena battlefield, but before that, he needed to choose his opponent. A voice behind asked Ling Si what he was doing here. A girl in red clothes with white hair asked if he was going to avenge his foul-mouthed brother. The main character, recognizing her, asked why she was here. Above her head was written that her name is Tilly's. She said she came here often. The main character thought that she was on the list of arena names. The dialogue box said, Tilly's, level 12, mage. Battle record, 16 wins, 3 losses. Tilly's told him that even though he had withheld his information, she remembered him, and he was pretty good back then. A staff appeared in her hand and she told him to play around with her. The yellow robot announced a battle between Tilly's and the player with hidden information. 
He said that the battle would continue until one of them fell, surrendered, or fell from the arena. Lang Si and Tillies were facing each other. A guy in the crowd, looking at the screen, asked about a newbie challenging Tillies. He said that it looked like he had taken the initiative to challenge. The man with the green hat said that there must be something wrong with his eyes, and Tillies has recently become the dark horse of the level 12 arena. The guy said that judging from his appearance, he was most likely a thief, and he even hid his information. He asked if he was trying to sound mysterious. Frowning, he said that he probably thinks he has an advantage because Tillies is a mage, but he probably doesn't know that she is a battle mage. He said that a battle mage's attacks are just as aggressive as a warrior's, and they have high attack and defense stats. He said this guy was already dead. The yellow robot told Tillies that 97% of viewers support her. Lang Si said with a smile that she seems to have quite a few fans. Tillies remained silent and thought that she should watch out for this thief's movements and finish this quickly. A voice announced the start of the battle. Tillies ran towards Lang Si. The guy watching their battle raised his fist and told Tillies to destroy this thief. The man in the green hat said that movement and skill are the whole point of battle mages. He exclaimed that the Tilly's starting stance was incredible. Tilly's used Flame Serpent's dance. The fire snakes charged forward. The main character ran back and stopped at the edge of the arena. The guy in the green hat laughed and said that he was a weakling because the battle had just started and he was already running away. The guy with the black patch on his forehead said that once Tilly's gets the initiative, victory is already in her hands. Tilly's and Ling Si were facing each other. Tilly's was surprised to think that she was able to drive him to the edge of the arena so easily. She leaped forward, swinging the staff wrapped in purple energy, and thought that now he had nowhere to run. She used battle staff's thrust and hit the ground. The shockwave from her staff shot forward in a straight line. A guy in the crowd shouted that hitting this skill casts a stun effect, and that thief is already dead. Looking ahead, Tilly's thought it wouldn't be that easy. The main character used evil spirits and visibility, and Ling Si turned into an evil spirit in front of her. Tilly's thought it was evil spirits and visibility, and it's in the back. The main character was behind her, swinging a dagger. She used seal, and a yellow magic circle appeared under her feet. The dialogue box reported that it had nullified the fear effect caused by evil spirits and visibility. Striking her staff, she told the protagonist to try it. Ling Si said that her reflexes weren't bad. He used a backstab and ended up behind her. Tillies was surprised to see his micro skill and wondered if he was really capable of such a split-second response. The main character said with a smirk that a battle mage is still a mage, and some of these mage attacks take longer. He used quick stab and told her that she couldn't block it. The dialogue box is described by quick stab, a thief-exclusive skill, an evolved version of backstab. Player turns into a shadow, then teleports behind the enemy and attacks instantly. Causes blind status effect for 0.5 seconds. C-O-O-L-D-O-W-N, 300 seconds. Tillies was blindfolded, and she cursed inwardly. A guy in the crowd asked in surprise what was going on. He exclaimed that it hadn't even been two seconds. Tillies started to fall from the arena, and Lynx he asked so what if she was a battle mage. The voice announced that Tillies had been pushed out of the battlefield. A guy in the crowd exclaimed in surprise that Tillies was defeated so quickly. Another guy said that she wasn't beaten and he heard that she lost because she was pushed off the battlefield. He exclaimed how Tillies could have made such a mistake. The guy in the green hat exhaled and said that he knew he was a big fan of hers, but he didn't have to protect her so much. Tillies on the screen was sitting on the ground, having fallen out of the battlefield. She thought with a grim face that she had lost. She looked ahead grimly. Tillies thought that he was constantly changing his position making it hard for her to know where he was, and managed to push her off the battlefield with his terrifying speed. Frowning, she thought that she was too careless. Lang Si stuck his hands in his pockets and said that it looked like he had won. He said goodbye to Tillies with a smile. On the dialogue box above the yellow robot's head, next to the main character's portrait, there was an S rating. He announced that the winner was decided, and his score, S Tillies told him to wait. The yellow robot shouted that Tillies had sent another invitation to fight. The dialogue box indicated that the opponent wanted to fight again. Tillies returned to the battlefield. The voice announced that Tillies wants to fight again. The main character calmly looked back. The dialogue box had a choice, accept or reject. A guy with a black patch on his forehead clenched his fist and shouted that he supported Tillies. The other guy agreed and said that she was just being careless last time, and this time, she would definitely defeat this presumptuous thief. Waving her staff, Tillies said that she recognized that she had lost this round. Putting her staff on her shoulder, she said that she refused to accept it calmly. Frowning, she demanded to fight again. Smiling slightly, Ling Si thought that although she was stubborn and spoke rudely, he liked the look in her eyes. He said he was taking it. The voice announced that the battle was starting again. Numerous purple and yellow energy strikes were taking place in the arena. The main character used a stab in the back, 
being behind Tilly's. She gritted her teeth. After blocking his attack with a blow from her staff, she thought that she couldn't let him lure her to the edge of the arena again. She thought that she couldn't match his agility, so she needed to find his weaknesses. Hitting the ground with her staff, Tilly's thought it was her turn to restrict his movements this time. Surrounded by red energy, she used rippling body restriction arts. The dialogue box described ripping body restriction arts, a battle-type restriction skill. Enemies that come in contact with the ripples will be forcefully held in position. Causes the restrict effect for one second. C-O-O-L-D-O-W-N, 360 seconds. The main character was surrounded by red energy. The dialogue box says, you are affected by the restrict status effect. The effect will last for one second. Tilly said that this time he will not have enough time to dodge, even if he dispels this effect instantly. She swung her staff. A stream of red energy rushed towards Ling Si. The dialogue box reported that the restrict status was applied to it, and the effect will last for another second. Tilly's opened her mouth in surprise. The main character used Disaster's Gift to dodge her attack. Tilly's was surprised to think that he had a Disaster's Gift. The dialogue box said, Disaster's Gift, after receiving any controlling effect, using this skill will return the effect back to the opponent while removing the effect on the user. After activating Disaster's Gift, in the next 12 seconds, any control skill used on the user will be reflected back to the opponent. Effect depends on the control skill used by the opponent. This will only work on one opponent. C-O-O-L-D-O-W-N, 600 seconds. Pushing off from the ground, the main character kicked Tilly's into the air. She landed on the edge of the arena. The dialogue box indicates that the restrict effect has ended. Frowning, she gritted her teeth. Noticing Ling Si who happened to be right next to her, she opened her mouth in surprise. He told her with a grin that she was back at the edge of the arena. He pushed her out of the arena with a smile. The yellow robot exclaimed that Tilly's had been thrown off the battlefield. He shouted that the winner was decided and the battle was over with an S-score. A guy in the crowd said in surprise that she had lost again. Another guy frowned and said that she was pushed to the edge of the arena with a simple kick and then even pushed off the battlefield. He exclaimed that this thief was too strong. Tilly's cursed while looking up at Elling C. Frowning and gritting her teeth, she demanded to fight again. The main character agreed with a grin. The dialogue box indicated that the opponent wanted to fight again. The next dialogue box reported that the winner had been decided, the battle was over with the S. Tilly's score demanding to fight again. The dialogue box indicated that the opponent wanted to fight again. The next dialogue box reported that the winner had been decided, the battle was over with S. Tilly's rating again demanding to fight again. Half an hour passed. A guy in the crowd asked if this was their sixth match in a row. The guy in the green hat said it was true, and this thief won every one of them. He said that this thief is very strong, and he thought Tilly's was invincible among level 12 players. Tilly's frowned as she stood surrounded by an orange magic barrier. Above her head, it could be seen that she didn't have many health points left. Ling Si was throwing dagger strikes at the barrier. Above his head, it can be seen that he has slightly less than half health. He thought that after these few matches, her stance and reaction speed were much better. Frowning, he thought that she was constantly getting better with each match, and even her micro-movements. The main character started using quick stab, but Tilly's interrupted him by running forward. She swung her staff and told him not to even think about blinding her. Ling Si, while dodging her attacks, thought that he was starting to see a bit of top time in her micro-movements. He looked away in surprise. After hitting Ling Si with her staff, she used Orphinx's clone. Raising her staff, she used Raging Candle. Shrouded in flames, she shouted that she would finish him off with this skill. There was a fiery explosion. Tilly stands surrounded by raging flames. The main character, standing behind her, told her that she had a pretty fast casting speed, but she forgot to limit his skills. He used Evil Spirit's invisibility, and the huge purple face of the evil spirit appeared in the flames. The fire dissipated, and above Tilly's and the main character was the purple face of an evil spirit. Tilly's said that she can't beat him now and admits defeat. The purple face in front of them dissipated. The dialogue box reported that evil spirit's invisibility was cancelled. The yellow robot announced that the winner was determined, and one of the parties gave up. He shouted that the battle was over with an A grade. The main character said that he only got an A, and if he got an S grade here, it would be his sixth S grade in a row. He said in frustration that he wouldn't get his dagger. Tilly's, coming out of the yellow portal, told him to keep dreaming if he was going to get six S grades in a row against her. The main character remained silent. She told him that her S rating win streak was also interrupted by him, and she would have to win six more matches with an S rating to get the reward she wants. Without turning around, Ling Si raised his hand and indifferently said that then both of them should try harder. Tilly's irritably told him not to act like it had nothing to do with him. She suggested that he add each other as friends. Ling Si raised an eyebrow. Tilly's told him not to misunderstand her because she only adds him to her friend list because it will make it easier for them to fight again next time. 
The main character agreed and thought that he didn't expect to have to deal with her in this lifetime. He thought it best not to say anything about what would happen to her in the future. He remembered Tilly's standing among the dead bodies. He thought that even if he told her now, she would think he was crazy. Turning around, Tilly's told him that one day they would meet again. The main character thought that maybe she shouldn't have gone through all this. As she left, she said that she would definitely beat him next time. Looking after her, Lynx he thought that he hoped that she would become stronger than she was in his past life. He looked down gloomily and wondered how he could care about the fates of others if he wasn't strong enough himself. In order to get the dagger, he started to go through six more matches, but due to battles with Tilly's, he became a popular level 12 contestant. This attracted many professionals to challenge him, and he easily defeated them, getting six winning matches in a row with an S rating without any problems. In the end, he got a terrifying streak of 39 wins because of those who wanted to fight him. This inevitably became a popular topic of discussion on the Heavenland Forum, Nebula's third division's meeting room. Tiana shouted that this battle strategy was indeed very effective, but it was too dangerous. She asked Ruko what Lynx he taught him. After exclaiming that he had charged into the crowd of monsters alone, she asked what if there had been an accident. She angrily shouted that even though it was a low-level dungeon, they still needed to use teamwork. Ruko replied that he just wanted to be brave and confident like Lynx C. Wasabi-kun told him with a smirk that she was right and he needed to be more obedient. Ruko angrily shouted at him that he was the one who told him to repeat Lynx C's battle style. Tiana glared at Wasabi-kun. Wasabi-kun said he didn't know what he was talking about. He told Tiana that he was at the back all the time and attacked the monsters from a long distance. Vankafis smiled awkwardly and told Tiana that they only did it so that she could level up faster, and there was no need to get mad at them. Above her head, it could be seen that she had reached the fifth level. Raising her index finger, she said that it was thanks to them that she was able to reach the fifth level, and she had never dared to dream of such a level raising speed. Tiana, with a puzzled hand on her forehead, said that Ling Si had entrusted them to her and she should be responsible for them all. She said that if they died and lost experience, she didn't know how Ling Si would explain it. She said they gave her a headache. When she saw the voice, she opened her eyes and looked away. Ling Si said it's quite lively here. They saw him, and he asked, peeking around the door, what they were all doing here. Tiana exclaimed that he had finally arrived. She told him that he had no idea how tired she'd been these past few days. He told Vankafis that it looked like her level up speed was pretty good, and she managed to reach level 5 so quickly. Ruko asked him if there was any fun mission they could complete. Ling Si told him to calm down. Vankafis asked when she would be able to make potions. She said she was ready for it. The main character said with a smile that this is why he came here. With a sinister glint in his eyes, he said that since he had already reached the fifth level, then they could proceed with his plan. He grinned ominously, frowning, he turned to Vankafis. The main character asked if she wanted him to help her create a business empire. Everyone present noticed his words in surprise. Vankafis was surprised to ask about the business empire. Casfado's commercial leasing street. Ling Si and Vankafis stand in front of the house in the form of a large tree. She asked in surprise about the fact that this place now belongs to her. The main character replied that he spent some money to rent it for three months. With a smile, he told her to go inside and look at her new workplace. Vankafis was surprised to ask about the fact that he had rented a place for her for three months on this expensive street. She hesitantly asked how much it cost. Opening the door, he invited her to go inside first. Vankafis was enthusiastically looking around the interior of the room. Ling Si said that it was still dirty and untidy, so she would have to make do with what she had. Vankafis exclaimed in delight that it was full of alchemy books, and it even had a complete set of alchemists' tools. With a twinkle in her eye, she said that this place was perfect and not dirty at all. Ling Si said that, in simple words, from now on, this would be her workplace for creating potions. He said that the reason he wanted her to reach level 5 first was because he wanted her to reach the required level in order to make more types of potions. He said that he sent her some scrolls with potion recipes that are most popular in the market. He told her to learn them first. The main character said that her task is to successfully make 10 pieces of each potion with additional positive effects every day. He started talking about what he needed more. Vankafis, not listening to him, said admiringly that she had never seen such instruments. She ran around the room excitedly, admiring its contents. She asked if it was a distillation kit. Ling Si asked her to calm down first. Vankafis said that her chances of success in creating potions are not very high, and she is afraid that she will waste a lot of materials. The main character smilingly told her not to worry about it and just try hard, and he had already prepared 30 portions of the materials needed for each potion. He told her to just focus on making potions. Vankafis asked him if he believed in her that much. She said that the materials needed for a normal potion cost at least 90 copper coins. 
She started counting and said that one gold coin is equal to a hundred silver coins, one silver coin is equal to a hundred copper coins, and he spent almost three gold coins on materials alone. Counting on her fingers, she exclaimed worriedly that she had never seen so much money in her life. Bankafis asked if he was afraid that he would lose everything. Ling Si told her not to worry, he is well aware of the situation. He said she should know that her pithy blessing is worth much more than that, and their goal is to monopolize the market in the future. He said that with her as the core, they would create a huge business empire. The protagonist exclaimed that a few gold coins were nothing compared to their large-scale plans for the future. He said that they would let her train more alchemists and build a chain of stores in every corner of Heavenland, and then they would become the richest people in the game. With sparkling eyes, Ling Si said that he even came up with a name for their stores, Alchemia Realm. Folding her arms over her head, Bankafis shouted that she wouldn't let him down. With bright eyes, she told him to look in on her sometime later and she would definitely complete the assignment. The main character wished her luck with a grin. He thought that now that he was done talking, he should go back to check the result after a while. Looking at his wallet, he thought that he had actually spent almost all of his money on it this time and he now had less than three gold coins left. He hoped that she would succeed, otherwise he had invested a lot of money for nothing. The dialogue box reported that he had received a message from a friend. Ling Si thought it was just in time. Blue Cloud asked in the chat if everything was ready. The main character answered in the affirmative and said that he would come back tomorrow. Grinning, he thought that he would use this chance to profit from the guys from Celestial. Celestial's headquarters. The guard at the gate greeted the main character. A passerby said it was him, the thief from Nebulus. He said that he had heard that Blue Cloud was going to let him be the team leader on this expedition. Another person said he didn't think it was true. He asked how a mere Nebulous guild member could command Blue Cloud and the others. The man told Blue Cloud that he had brought the right person. Blue Cloud exclaimed that he had come. Blue Cloud released the person who brought Ling Si. He told the main character that they would talk inside. Blue Cloud said he didn't expect it to go up to level 12 in just a few days. He said that his level up speed might be on par with some big names from other guilds. Closing his eyes, he replied that he just spent a few days leveling up with a friend, relying on an unconventional battle strategy. He said it was exhausting. Blue Cloud chuckled and repeated the words about unconventional combat strategy. He said that Ling Si is really modest. He said he was impressed that he was able to raise the level so quickly in unconventional ways. Ling Si said that on the way here, he noticed that many of his guild members had strong opinions about him. Blue Cloud replied that they were all core members of the first division, so it was only natural for them to worry when they found out that he would be commanding the group. He told him not to take it personally. He added that with his skills, he would have nothing to worry about. The protagonist thought that he must have intentionally let the information spread so that he would feel the pressure right after entering this place. He thought that if he wasn't confident in his skills, he would have given himself away. Ling Si, looking at Blue Cloud's back, thought that he was rude on the outside, but deliberate and meticulous on the inside. He thought that Guild Master of Celestial, unrivaled Blue Cloud, the person also known as the number one brute archer, was not an ordinary person as expected. Blue Cloud smiled broadly and said that he almost forgot. He said that Whale insists on fighting him. He said he tried to talk him out of it, but he wouldn't listen. Ling Si calmly thought that he was testing it. Blue Cloud told Whale that it was back. He asked if he wanted to fight Ling Si. He said he brought him here. Whale greeted Ling Si. Closing the book in his hand, he smilingly told Blue Cloud that he had exaggerated his words and there was no need for a battle. He said that he just wanted to learn more about Ling Si so that it would be easier for them to work together. The main character said that he understood. He asked how he wanted to do it. Whale asked if he knew about Monster Battling Simulator. Repeating the name, Ling Si said that he had heard of it, and it is a kind of simulator that allows players to fight various monsters. He said that it is usually used to practice strategy or understand the boss attack sequence. He said that it was very expensive, and therefore it was a luxury that only guilds could afford. Standing next to the iron door, Whale said that behind this door is a monster battling simulator belonging to their guild. He said that he would like each of the two of them to spin around a small monster for 10 minutes. He explained that, after 10 minutes, he would be able to better understand it based on his results. Ling Si asked about the fact that he would be circling around the monster for 10 minutes. He asked what kind of monster it was. Whale replied that it was a level 15 battle mammoth. Closing his eyes and smiling slightly, the protagonist thought that the battle mammoth was indeed a small monster. He agreed. Whale said he was opening the door. The door swung open and Whale told Blue Cloud that they would start. Blue Cloud agreed and told them to get started. The guy in the magic hat in the crowd said that this thief took it very simply. Another guy said with a grin that he would definitely like it there. Blue Cloud watched them leave behind the closing door with a grin. Nine minutes later, the girl in the white magic hat asked how long Whale was going to check on this thief. 
The armored guy hissed at her to be quiet and said this wasn't a test and he just wanted to get to know him better. He asked her if she had heard what he had said. Ling Si is standing in front of a huge battle mammoth. A guy with dark skin and white hair said that a level 15 battle mammoth has a lot of health and a lot of OE skills. He said that whale most likely asked this thief to hang around the battle mammoth because he wanted to see how well he would do against such a huge and problematic monster. He added with a worried face that perhaps in addition to watching this thief, he also wanted to compare himself to him. He said that he had heard that this thief had once led a group and passed the insane difficulty of the broken Buddha dungeon. The girl in the white magic hat asked what was so incredible about it. She said that although Whale is a warrior in class, he actually plays as a swordsman. She said that even though a swordsman's health isn't as high as a warrior's, they have higher attack and agility stats, along with excellent micro-movements. She asked how this thief from Nebulus could compare to him. The guy with the white hair laughed, agreed, and said that Whale probably overestimated him, and most likely he was even better than him. Laughing, he assumed that this thief had overestimated himself. Blue Cloud stood nearby with his eyes closed. Someone exclaimed that ten minutes had passed and the door was opening. The guy in the wizard's hat exclaimed that they were coming out. In front of him were Whale with a gloomy face and Ling Si, who can't be seen in the shadows. A man in the crowd, noticing that Whale was in full health, said that the winner was clear. Another person agreed and said that Whale couldn't possibly lose. The armored guy asked what the situation inside was. Glancing at the battle mammoth inside, he exclaimed that the mammoth had already lost half of its health. He exclaimed that he expected nothing less from Whale, and he was able to come out unscathed after the battle with the battle mammoth. He looked at Ling Si in surprise. He exclaimed in surprise, he should be unharmed. Above the main character's head, you can see that he has full health. The white-haired guy nervously said that he wasn't bad, and he didn't expect him to come out unscathed either. He shouted for them to wait and left. A battle mammoth with full health was sitting on the ground, breathing heavily. There are tears in his eyes. The guy shouted that the battle mammoth that fought Ling Si didn't lose a drop of health. He laughed and shouted that this thief seemed to be too afraid to approach him. The guy said that no matter how you look at it, the winner is obviously Whale. The girl in the white wizard's hat looked at Whale with fascination and said that it was very cool. The guy in armor put his hand on the main character's shoulder and asked if he thought Whale was incredible. He said that he wasn't bad either since he managed to come out unscathed. The main character thanked him indifferently. Blue Cloud called out to Whale. He said nothing, his face grim. Blue Cloud said that he lost. The guys in the crowd exclaimed in surprise. Whale, with a slight smile, said that when he was fighting the battle mammoth, he used his sword to push the mammoth away, interrupting its attack, and then dodged its AoE damage with his skills. He said that, because he was too focused on Taka, he boringly let his teeth tear the edge of his cloak. Whale said that he also watched Elling C in the process, and from start to finish, he didn't even draw his weapon. He said that he managed to dodge all of the mammoth's attacks just by moving and using the mammoth's blind spots to avoid his skills by area. He said that he constantly circled around the mammoth with the slightest gap between them. Whale said that this mammoth was played with so cruelly that it didn't even have the time or space to use its skills. He said it was definitely top time, no doubt about it. Whale concluded that Ling Si is very strong. The main character stood with a straight face, hands in his pockets. Blue Cloud, flashing his teeth in a smile, said, good. Putting his hand on the main character's shoulder, he said that he didn't expect anything less from Ling Si. He urged not to waste any more time. The main character glanced at the hand that Blue Cloud had placed on his shoulder. Blue Cloud said that they would now place the burden of being the team leader on Ling Si. Glancing at his face, he urged him to immediately prepare for the insane difficulty of the Disastrous Graveyard Dungeon. Disastrous Graveyard, a dungeon preparation area. Ling Si stepped out of the blue portal. The stone path in front of him was littered with skulls and bones and was surrounded by blue lights. As he plunged his sword into the ground, he exclaimed that this dungeon was really too difficult. Bending over the ground, he said that there were only three floors, and they couldn't get past the second floor, let alone the last. Another guy asked if they would just have to give up. The guy asked if he had any other suggestions. The blue hooded guy said in frustration that the difficulty of this new dungeon is really very high, and even the guild in the first place was only able to pass the special difficulty. He said that it happened quite recently. He offered to see if anyone had shared better strategies for completing it on the forum. The girl behind him, looking at the dialog box, said that the problem wasn't what strategy to use, but rather that the design of this dungeon was inadequate. She said that there are three floors of graveyards in this dungeon, and the so-called turn of tides effect means that killed monsters will be resurrected after a certain period of time. She said that once they killed the first monster, they needed to go all out and kill all the monsters as quickly as possible. The guy sitting on the ground agreed and said that, including this attempt, 
They had been overwhelmed by waves of corpses five times already. He said that they couldn't hold out against them, and it looked like only the big guilds would be able to pass this dungeon for now. He looked away in surprise. He was surprised to see Celestial's guild master, unrivaled Blue Cloud, and Vice Grand Master, Whale. Next to them was Ling Si. A guy with pointy ears and a red hat asked if Celestial was going to set a new record. He exclaimed that both their guild master and vice guild master had come. The guy in blue clothes told me to quickly take photos and post them on the forum. He said that the theme name should be Celestial's guild master and vice guild master personally came to challenge Disastrous Graveyard. He said that this will definitely be a topic for discussion. The guy asked in surprise who the thief was. Noticing that he was marked as a team leader, he asked if he was from Celestial and if he could really command Guildmaster and Vice Guildmaster. The guy asked who he was. He exclaimed that he had never even seen it. The main character ran his hand through his hair. The white-haired girl asked if the thief leading the team was from their nebulous guild. She called out to Dark Cliff to take a look and asked if it was Ling Si. Dark Cliff frowned and asked why he was going to the dungeon with Celestial. He exclaimed that he was also together with Celestial's Guildmaster and Vice Guildmaster. He asked if he had received an invitation after the Broken Buddha dungeon last time. Dark Cliff said they'd better tell management about it, and maybe they need to know about it. Blue Cloud chuckled and told the protagonist that he seemed to have attracted a lot of attention. Lengs he asked if he was the one who insisted on being the team leader. He said he should have known this was going to happen. Whale said he likes to make jokes and doesn't need to pay attention to him. The main character thought that he was clearly pushing him into the limelight. He thought that there should definitely be people from Nebulous here, and most likely, his intention is to let news of their collaboration get out, and then observe his behavior regarding his relationship with the Nebulous Guild. He thought that, however, it wouldn't affect him much, since he wasn't violating the interests of the Nebulous Guild, and they had nothing to say to him. Blue Cloud told the protagonist that the maximum number of participants in this dungeon is nine people. He asked if he was sure they wouldn't have any problems with the class set in their team. The main character replied that with a 3x3 strategy, their tank positions and DPS are guaranteed. He said that Blue Cloud and Whale are very strong DPS positions, so there shouldn't be any problems. Whale said with a smile that Ling Si is the only thief in their team. He asked if he was familiar with the disastrous graveyard dungeon. Ling Si grinned and said that, of course, he knew. He said he was the only thief they'd need. Waving his hand, Blue Cloud laughed and said that he was very domineering. Slapping him on the back, he said that he liked making friends like him. He said that if that was the case, then he would leave it to him. Turning around, the main character thought that it hurt, and whether he did it on purpose. Standing in front of the red portal, he said that if they were ready, he would activate the teleport. Laughing, Blue Cloud told him to activate it. A man in the crowd pointed and exclaimed that the portal was red and they were going into an insane difficulty. Another person asked about someone activating insane difficulty. He asked if they were from Celestial. Another person shouted that the guild in first place only managed to pass the special difficulty. He asked how Celestial could have the confidence to challenge an insane amount of difficulty. The dialog box says, you have accepted the insane difficulty of the disastrous graveyard dungeon. Will you enter the dungeon? The game started counting down from 5. The dialog box reported that the dungeon has started, the current difficulty is insane, and no high scores have been set. Lang Si and his group found themselves in front of a huge gravestone in the cemetery. The dialog box wished you luck and told you to watch out for corpses. Blue Cloud looked up at the sky and said that the air was refreshing. The dialog box says, Disastrous Graveyard, Floor 1. Mission, Annihilate All Skeletal Soldiers. You may begin attacking in 10 seconds. Because of the turn of tides effect, killed skeletal soldiers will revive after 9 seconds. Completion conditions, keep the graveyard free of skeletal soldiers for 6 seconds to unlock the teleporter for the next floor. Blue lights hovered over the gravestones in the cemetery. A skeletal hand emerged from the ground of one of the graves. The dialog box indicated that there were 5 seconds left. The cemetery was filled with skeletons crawling out of their graves. The guy with the shield said that the resurrection time is 30 seconds in low difficulty, 25 seconds in medium difficulty, 20 seconds in high difficulty, and 15 seconds in special difficulty. He said he didn't expect it to be an insane 9 seconds in total. The other guy with the shield said that this is expected from an insane difficulty. He asked Blue Cloud what position they would take. He said that the skeleton soldiers are growing in numbers. Blue Cloud said not to ask him because their leader is Ling Si. The guy with white hair, noticing that the main character had disappeared, asked in surprise where he was. He exclaimed that he had already gone ahead. The dialog box says that there are zero seconds left. Ling Si ran forward to meet the skeletons. Brandishing his dagger, he began to fight the skeletons. The guy asked what he was trying to do and what they should do. Blue Cloud held out his bow. Whale said that the resurrection time is 9 seconds and they need to hold the monster free floor for 6 seconds. He said that Ling Si's intentions were already very clear. 
he said that he uses a rush attack. The main character, moving quickly between the skeletons, hit them with a dagger. Whale thought that the strategy with a high chance of success for the first floor of the disastrous graveyard dungeon was to use rush. He thought that, on top of that, he should attract the enemies as quickly as possible and gather the scattered skeleton warriors together. He thought that even though it was a rush attack, there were quite a lot of skeletons here, and even when put together, they took up quite a large area. He thought that judging from the class distribution in their team, if there were too many identical skills that overlapped with Rush within its range, an overkill would occur, which would cause a few skeleton warriors to survive, and Rush would lose its impact. Ling Si frowned as he looked ahead. Blue Cloud, with a grin, told the protagonist that he would like to see him complete this Rush alone. Using evil spirits and visibility, Ling Si and his clone scattered in two directions, surrounded by skeletons. He thought that he should attack the opponent right after he became invisible, otherwise he might not only hide, but also lose the attraction of hatred. The main character hit the skeleton from behind, running past it. He thought that, at the same time, until the clone was attacked and disappeared, he should control its movements, form a pattern within the map's restrictions, and attack even more monsters. A guy with white hair pointed at his face and told everyone to look at the map. He said that most of the monsters are attracted to him. Ling Si shouted at the mage to use restriction art and make sure that he covered the entire wave of skeletons. Purple magic enveloped the skeletons around him, and they froze in place, trembling. The main character thought it was restriction arts. Shouting that they were restricted, he said that now it was time to attack. He ordered to split into three teams with equal damage, and the team that lacks damage should join him in this wave. Frowning, he grinned. Blue Cloud with a smirk told the six to split into two groups with equal damage, and each team would take on one wave. He told Whale to join him to help Ling Si with this wave. Everyone obeyed. Blue Cloud thought with a smile that he first took advantage of the thief's micro-movements and distracted the first wave of monsters, then used the cloning skill to lure the other two waves, breaking the huge numbers of skeleton soldiers into three equal parts, and then coordinated with them to attack at the same time, thus turning the situation around. Rush attack. Opening his eyes excitedly, he thought that he had perfectly avoided the possibility of failure that he had imagined. The main character shouted use your skills. Blue Cloud mentally praised Ling Si for playing well. The skeletons looked at the approaching protagonist and the mage's spells, trembling. A huge cloud of dust rose. The dialogue box congratulated that the cemetery was cleared of skeleton soldiers within three seconds, and the condition was met. The next dialogue box reported that the teleport to the second floor had been activated. Disastrous Graveyard, Dungeon Preparation Area A person in the crowd said that the record set by the guild in first place on the special difficulty was 1 hour, 56 minutes and 39 seconds. He asked about the fact that no one should have a way to break this record for a while. Another person asked if they were all gathered here to see how this team from Celestial had just entered a dungeon of insane difficulty. Standing not far from the red portal, the dark-haired guy said that the guild head of Celestial, Blue Cloud, was personally participating. He assumed that they had already discovered some method. The guy with the gray hair agreed and said that they had already attracted a lot of attention. He said that there are already people on the Heavenland forum who are constantly posting updates about it. Looking at the red portal, he said that if they really passed the dungeon, they would set the very first record on insane difficulty, and it would definitely be a big sensation. There were many stone structures in front of the main character and his group. The dialogue box says, Welcome to the second floor of the disastrous graveyard. You will soon face the terrifying defenses of the twelve witches. In front of them stood a witch with a bell in one hand and a lamp with a blue flame in the other. Skeletons rose from the ground in front of her. Dialogue box, due to the effect of the disaster, any one of the witches will revive all slain witch companions within six seconds. They will summon a colossal skeletal soldier every other minute. Lang Si and his group were standing in front of the skeletons rising from the ground. The dialogue box says, Mission, annihilate the twelve palace witches. You may begin attacking in 10 seconds. Completion condition, keep the graveyard free of any undead beings for 9 seconds to unlock the teleporter for the next floor. Blue Cloud smirked and said that they didn't have a bad figure, but it looked like they would cause them problems. He said that enemies respawn in 6 seconds, and the witches will be able to revive all the defeated witches. He said that this insane difficulty really pushes the difficulty to the max. The dialogue box says that there are 5 seconds left. Blue Cloud and the main character said that if they need to make sure that there are no undead creatures on the floor for 9 seconds, then they only need to destroy everything within 3 seconds of the resurrection time. The dialogue box reported that 0 seconds remained. Ling Xi smirked and said that witches can't leave the sacrificial altar and resurrect skeleton soldiers. He suggested that Blue Cloud and Whale kill the skeletons together to warm up. Blue Cloud offered to compete to see who could kill the most skeleton soldiers. Whale grinned and said there's nothing else for it. 
he told the three tanky to protect the three mages and deal as much damage to the skeletons as possible. He reminded them to pay attention to the distance of hate. They obeyed. Twenty minutes later, Blue Cloud shouted, offering to arrange a piercing rainstorm. Using the torrent arrow shower, he shot a yellow arrow up. A rain of yellow arrows rained down on the crowd of skeletons. Looking around, Blue Cloud smiled. The white-haired guy exclaimed that this rain of arrows had killed a lot of monsters, and Blue Cloud was really amazing. He noticed something in surprise. After stabbing several skeletons with his sword, Whale praised him for a good shot. He frowned. Swinging his sword in front of him, he asked how it could rain without wind. He used Savage Sword's breath and shot out blue energy from swinging his sword. Several blue lights shot towards him. When he saw them coming, he cut them open with a slash of his sword. He lowered himself to the ground. The witch in front of him was standing with a blue flame over her hand. He thought that at an insane difficulty, attacks would reduce the strength of the sword. Frowning, he thought it was annoying. The dialogue box says, weapon deterioration, 46%. The witches held out their hands, firing blue magic. Blue Cloud, who was shooting yellow arrows from his bow, laughed and said that it looked like they would have to spend a lot of materials to repair their weapons after leaving this dungeon. The shield guy standing behind the white barrier told him that they were really incredibly strong. Whale cut the blue lights with his sword. Blue Cloud said with a smile that they weren't the only ones who were strong. He said that the main character not only dodged all the witch's attacks, but also got rid of all the skeletons. He said that although thieves have an advantage in speed, his attack power isn't weak at all. Ling Si, standing surrounded by fallen skeletons. The guy with the white hair said that his efficiency was terrifying. Whale looked ahead in silence, his face grim. The guy exclaimed that all the skeletons had been destroyed. The main character told Blue Cloud that now physical damage will be more useful. He said that now they need to destroy everything within three seconds. He asked about the fact that he should have enough skills with physical area damage. Ling Si said that if they weren't enough, the three mages should prepare to spam with their skills. He said that even though witches have high magic defense, it will be enough to make up for the missing part of the damage. Blue Cloud replied that there would be no problems. He noticed that without the skeleton soldiers, the witches' attacks would become more violent. He asked how he was going to wear them down. The main character thought that the set of equipment that he had worked hard to earn while going through the Song of Fire and Ice dungeon with Ruko would finally be able to prove himself in action. He thought that although the active skill of this set of equipment could only be used once, it was worth using in this dungeon. He kicked off the ground and leaped forward. His clothes had changed to white and purple. The dialogue box says, You have activated the Big Dipper's protection set's one-off active effect, magic immunity. The guy with the white hair asked if he wanted to die. He asked if he knew that after all the skeletons were killed, the attacks of the twelve witches would become stronger in terms of both strength and frequency. He said it wouldn't be surprising if he was torn to pieces after rushing in like that. Blue Cloud grinned. Whale, raising an eyebrow, said he was wearing Big Dipper's protection set. He explained that this is a superior grade set with magic immunity that only drops in the Song of Fire and Ice Dungeon, which is only accessible to mages. He said that he was well prepared, and it seemed that every move was part of his calculations. The main character runs between the witches. He thought that the power and frequency of the twelve witches' attacks were now enhanced, and other than him, there was no way other melee players could get any closer, and the damage from the mages' attacks was practically negligible. The witches attacked Ling Si with blue magic that dealt zero damage. Ling Si thought that this floor was created with intent for Vex players, but now they have the physical attacks of Blue Cloud, that terrifying brute archer. The main character, frowning, thought that all this is not a problem at all. He used backstab, mob slash and throat slasher, thinking that magic attacks won't do them any damage, but physical attacks are what they, the glass cannons, fear the most. Grinning, he thought that he had taken care of dealing damage, and it was time to lower their health level. He used Shadow Flash Blink and hit the witch in the back, putting a faint effect on her. The dialogue box reported that the magic immunity effect has three seconds left. The voice ordered an attack. Blue Cloud said with a grin that he had been waiting for it for a long time. He used Death Grafter and shot a purple arrow. The dialogue box described Death Grafter, an archer exclusive superior grade skill. Inflicts extremely high pierce damage and is able to pierce through all enemies. If the attack kills the enemy, the player's bow and arrow will automatically graft the attack onto the next nearest enemy. If the attack is unable to kill the enemy, the grafting attack will automatically cease. The purple arrow pierced through the witches one by one. The white-haired guy looked at it in surprise and asked if it was lightning. Noticing this skill, the main character opened his eyes in surprise. Looking at the burst of purple energy, he was surprised to think that he had managed to wipe out a third of the witch's health from an insane difficulty. The dialogue box congratulated that the graveyard was free of undead for 9 seconds, and the condition was met. Ling Si thought that this was the power of the unrivaled blue cloud, 
who was nicknamed number one brute archer in his previous life. A dialog box announced that the teleport to the third floor had been activated, and the final wave of corpses and horror was coming. The voice asked how long that team from Celestial had already been there. A girl with light brown hair, holding an orange can of drink in her hand, answered which is about 45 minutes. She assumed they were still fighting on the first floor. She said that even though the guild head and the vice guild head were with them, it definitely wouldn't be easy. The brown-haired guy said that there were a lot of people here who just came to watch. He said that there had never been so many people here since the opening of the dungeon. The dark-haired guy replied that it went without saying, and some of them specially came to see the guild head and the vice head of the celestial guild. He said that some people had come to be the first to hear the news, and regardless of whether Celestial could successfully pass the dungeon, those people might also ask them about the situation after they came out. The brown-haired guy replied that Celestial's challenge to disastrous graveyard on an insane difficulty level had long been a hot topic of discussion. He said that now they can only wait and see if they can win. The main character and his group emerged from a red portal in the shape of a skull. The dialogue box says, Welcome to Disastrous Graveyard's final floor, floor 3. You will soon face the terrible anger of the boss, Wailing Ghoul. In front of them was a staircase spiraling downwards. Dialogue box, due to the effect of the disaster, dead skeletal soldiers will revive after 12 seconds every time Wailing Ghoul's HP decreases by 30%, it will summon an elite necromancer to the battlefield. Wailing Ghoul can revive all dead skeletal soldiers within a 5 meter radius every 10 seconds. The main character was looking ahead with a serious face. At the bottom of the stairs stood a large skeleton in black robes, shrouded in purple flames. In one hand, he held a human skull. The dialogue box says, when Wailing Ghoul has only 30% of his HP left, all the undead of floors 1 and 2 will revive and re-enter the battlefield via the teleporters. Purple flames radiated from the monster's mouth and empty eye sockets. The dialogue box says, Completion condition, give it your all and vanquish the boss, Wailing Ghoul. Bring an end to this terrifying disaster. A person from the Ling Si group said that there was a terrifying wind coming from inside. Blue Cloud said with a smirk that the boss of this dungeon was right below them. He asked about their meeting again. He said that this time, they would have to withstand the attacks of these skeletons by clearing a path and going down, and the resurrected skeletons they killed would also continue advancing with each wave. Blue Cloud recalled how he and his group fought with skeletons while going down the stairs. He said that the last time they challenged the increased difficulty of the dungeon, they had great difficulty getting to the boss, but they had to deal with both the resurrected soldiers behind them and the boss terrifying magic damage in the end. Whale said that then, unexpectedly, after they had lowered the boss health by 30% with great difficulty, his first summon went off. He said that they didn't expect the elite necromancer to keep summoning skeletons, and by then, they were no longer able to even touch the edge of the boss clothing. The white-haired guy exclaimed in fright that it was too difficult. Whale said there was nothing but an absorbing sense of helplessness from drowning in waves of corpses. He turned around when he heard the protagonist's voice. Ling Si offered to let him be the one to distract the skeletons along the way. The white-haired guy exclaimed in surprise that he was going to do it alone. Blue Cloud laughed and said that he was waiting for him to say it. With a big smile, he said that if he could use his top-time moves and lure all the skeletons down on his own, then he would help him and lure the boss up. Putting his hand on his shoulder, he said that they would separate the boss and the monsters, and then they would have a better chance of winning. The main character thought that the method he was talking about was a strategy for completing this dungeon from his previous life. He thought that it looked like he had planned to do this from the beginning, and he had underestimated him. The main character replied that he had also thought about it, but their coordination is very important. He said that if he lured all the skeletons to the lower area where the boss was, and something went wrong with his coordination, he would drown in a wave of corpses in less than three seconds. Blue Cloud folded his arms and asked if he doubted his abilities. Ling Si replied with a smile that his strength was unquestionable. He said he would take action without slowing down. The girl in the white wizard's hat exclaimed in surprise that he had disappeared. The white-haired guy exclaimed in surprise that he actually went alone. Whale asked Blue Cloud if he could do it alone. He said that the number of skeletons on this spiral staircase is no joke. He asked if he should help him. Blue Cloud replied with a grin that there was no need. He asked if he had forgotten about the video that Hammer showed them, which showed the battle of Ling Si when they passed Broken Buddha. He added that based on their work together up to this point, he believes his true strength is much greater. He suggested that we just observe his actions. Ling Si jumped down the spiral staircase. The crowd of skeletons below looked up at him, reaching out their bony hands. The main character was jumping down a ladder full of skeletons. A huge shadow loomed over the skeleton's face, and it looked straight ahead. Ling Si stabbed the skeleton's skull with the dagger, shattering it. He thought that he couldn't stop, because with so many skeletons, once he stopped, it would all be over. Kicking off the skeleton's skull with his foot, 
He thought that he should find the space for his next step in advance, the place where he should strike next, as well as the best route. The main character jumped forward, and there was a crowd of skeletons behind him. The white-haired guy said in surprise that it was beyond his comprehension, and he actually managed to lure all the monsters along the way alone. The dark-haired guy replied that his micro-movements and physical movements were as smooth as water. Whale started saying something about his movement. Blue Cloud asked him if he noticed it too. With a smirk and a frown, he said that his movement was constantly getting better. Lang Si jumped and thought that it was very quiet here. Frowning, he thought he could hear his own heartbeat. Looking at the skeletons, he wondered if he was used to it. The protagonist noticed that the movements of these skeletons were much slower than before. Grinning, he thought that his top time was much stronger than before. He jumped into the crowd of skeletons. The spiral staircase was empty. One person in the group noted that the skeletons at the top of the stairs had all gone down. Another said that this is a prime example of how to lure monsters to the side. Whale, looking down, said that the number one guild posted videos of them going through the increased difficulty, and for the sake of strategy, he watched them many times. He said that clearing this floor relies solely on terrifying damage and defense values, and at the moment, the only players who have this much damage are this guild. Blue Cloud, holding a yellow magic arrow in his hand, replied with a smirk that it didn't mean that the insane difficulty had to be completed in the same way. Holding out his bow, he said that they had to be ahead of everyone else to set the record for insane difficulty. Ling Si landed on the ground and thought that he had arrived at the lower floor. There was a crowd of skeletons around him. Standing on the ground, he looked around. Frowning, he thought that he had finally met Wailing Ghoul. The monster held up a skull that was emitting purple magic, and above its head was a large purple magic circle with a picture of a skull in the middle. The skeletons surrounding him were trembling. Ling Si gave Blue Cloud the command to attack with a smirk. Blue Cloud drew a huge yellow magic arrow in his bow with a grin. The main character was standing in front of the dungeon boss, surrounded by skeletons. Tiana, who was throwing papers around, exclaimed in surprise that Ling Si and the guild leader of Celestial had entered the dungeon together. Tiana asked Wasabi if he was sure, and if he was right. Wasabi exhaled and said that as the captain of the third division, she knew less and less about the world outside. He said that this is already the hottest topic for discussion on the game's forum, and even the vice guild head is participating. Looking at the dialog box, he added that their goal was obviously to set a record on the insane difficulty of the disastrous graveyard dungeon. Diana asked how Ling Si got to know Blue Cloud. She added that he wasn't the head of a small or medium-sized guild. Frowning tensely, she said that Blue Cloud guild head is in fourth place, Celestial. Tiana thought about how such an important person could shake up the entire game with a single sneeze, and even the head of their guild treated him with respect. She thought about how the relationship between the five major guilds was particularly sensitive right now, and the situation was tense. She thought that if the rumors of Ling Si and Blue Cloud's close acquaintance got out, it might cause misunderstandings. Ruko said that this is still Ling Si, and he has his own reasons for doing so. He said that he can't be understood by ordinary logic, and he believes that he belongs with people of this level. Wasabi said that his words made sense, and Ling Si's actions were always incomprehensible. He told Tiana to sit down and rest for a while. He closed one eye and smiled as he asked if she still thought that Ling Si was the same as normal players. Tiana paused for a moment and thought that he was right, and from the moment they met until now, Ling Si's actions couldn't be understood by ordinary logic. She spoke thoughtfully about the record on the insane difficulty of Disastrous Graveyard. She asked Wasabi if he thought they could pass it. She added that this is still the newest dungeon. Ryuko, still chewing, told her to relax. Tossing up a stick from his food, he said that it definitely wouldn't be a problem, and with Ling Si, they would definitely be able to handle it. He said they just had to wait for a system alert. Yellow energy rushed towards them from a spiral staircase, at the bottom of which the main character was standing, surrounded by skeletons. Ling Si frowned, illuminated by the yellow energy. The yellow arrow hit the boss's body, and it dropped the skull from its hand. The purple magic circle above it dissipated, and a dialog box reported that Wailing Ghoul's spell casting has been interrupted. Blue Cloud Zia told him to go to him. The monster was crouched a little and turned around viciously. The dialogue box reported that it had attracted the hatred of Wailing Ghoul. The monster took a high leap to the top of the spiral staircase. The main character grinned and thought that Blue Cloud had attracted the boss's hatred. Glancing to the side, he thought that now he needed to contain them here on the lower level. In front of him was a crowd of skeletons. Blue Cloud shouted that the boss was coming. He shouted for everyone to get ready. A boss shrouded in purple energy appeared in front of them. Whale ordered the tanks to raise their shields and protect the mages. They obeyed. Blue Cloud, shooting yellow magic arrows from the bow that, until Ling Si came, damaged mages better not embarrass them. Yellow arrow and fire magic shot towards the monster. Blue energy began to gather in the boss mouth. He used Terror Whale, firing many blue magic projectiles forward. 
Whale leaped forward, frowning. He dispelled the blue magic in front of him with his sword and approached the monster. The boss used Mournful Spirit's howl, releasing a stream of purple energy from its mouth, pushing the whale away. The dialogue box reported that the fear effect was applied to it. Trembling, he noticed that it was an area-wide fear effect. He thought that Wailing Ghoul had more skills on insane difficulty. Whale was using Sacred Aura, and the dialogue box reported that it had been cleared of all negative effects. He shouted that the boss's skills were on cooldown, and now was the time. The boss was hit by yellow arrows and fire spells. Blue Cloud said that when the boss lost 30% of its health, they would need to abort its first summon. Whale agreed. A voice from the dialogue box asked the main character how he was doing. Ling Si, while fighting the skeleton, replied that he was fine. He told them to wait for him to come up. As he hopped up, he thought that he was using a backstab to head straight up towards the second level, and he needed to keep the skeleton's hatred at bay. Using Shadow Flash Blink, he hit the skeleton in the air in the back and thought that he needed to collect them in one place. Grinning, he thought it might be a good time. Using Quick Stab, he stabbed the skeleton in the back. He used Evil Spirit's invisibility, and the invisible links he headed in the opposite direction. Climbing the railing of the spiral staircase, he thought that this way he would be able to reach the third level in the shortest amount of time, and the hatred would be transferred to his clone. The dialogue box reported that the skeleton hatred was removed from it. Smiling, he thought that all they had left was fear. The purple protagonist descended into the crowd of skeletons. Links he grinned as he hopped up. Underneath was the huge purple face of an evil spirit. The white-haired guy shouted to Blue Cloud that they would soon reach the 30% mark and the boss would start summoning. A cloud of blue gas came out of Wailing Ghoul's mouth, and Blue Cloud shouted at Whale to move away because it's corrosive air. Whale frowned and gritted his teeth, thinking that he hadn't expected the first summon on insane difficulty to come along with an attack like corrosive air. The dialogue box says, You have been corroded. Your body is being ravaged by a deadly poison. You may detoxify the poison with an antidote potion. The monster used Necromancer's summons, and a huge skull appeared from the purple magic circle above it. Whale shouted that they had miscalculated, and he was afraid that they would not make it in time. The dialogue box reported that it was detoxified. Blue Cloud looked up in surprise. Behind Whale and Ghoul, the main character appeared swinging a dagger, and Blue Cloud shouted that they would make it in time. A cloud of dust swirled across the ground. The white-haired guy looked forward in surprise. Ling Si hit Whale and Ghoul in the back, and the guy exclaimed that the boss's skill was interrupted. Blue Cloud laughed and said that if he was even a little bit slower, he wouldn't have spared him. The main character, standing on the monster's shoulder, told the others to attack to help him divert the boss's hatred from him. Frowning, he told the boss that it was their turn to hunt him. He jumped off his shoulder, and Whale commanded the mages to continue dealing damage and pay attention to the distance between them and the boss. He told the tanks to pay attention to the boss skills hitting the area. Everyone obeyed. Lynx he told Blue Cloud and Whale to surround and kite the boss along with it. Blue Cloud agreed and told them, as two melee fighters, to be careful because getting even a light hit would be very painful. Whale told him that it was better for his damage to keep up with theirs. Wailing Ghoul noticed the approaching yellow energy. Whale used Wheel of Light, hitting the boss with yellow energy from the swing of his sword. Looking at Ling Si, he wondered if he wasn't affected by their attacks or if he was coordinating with them while they attacked. Looking at the protagonist who swung the dagger in the air, he thought that his movements were even stronger than when he was competing with them. He thought that his top time had improved again during this time in the dungeon, and the speed of his progress was frightening. Ling Si looked ahead with a serious face. Whale thought that someone capable of such an expression couldn't possibly be an ordinary person. He was surprised to think that he had the qualities to be the main support of the first division. However, he remained in the third division of the Nebulous Guild. Frowning, he thought that he might be planning something else. Blue Cloud said it coordinates well with them. Whale agreed and asked if it didn't seem very strange for Ling Si to remain in the third division despite his abilities. Blue Cloud, laughing, replied that everyone has their own secrets, and he is not interested in why he stays in the third division, and he is only interested in him as a person. While shooting a yellow magic arrow from his bow, he said that if he joined them, then together with him and Whale, they would be like a tiger that grew wings. The yellow energy hit the boss in the chest, and Ling Si noticed that he had 60% health left, and the second summoning would start soon. When he heard the voice, he turned around. Blue Cloud shouted at him that they would work together to interrupt him. Wailing Ghoul let out a loud sound, the sound wave of which repelled its opponents. The main character replied to Blue Cloud that during the second summoning, small monsters will appear, which he will leave to him. He said that he and Whale would be responsible for interrupting it. He said that they also need to pay attention to the boss sonic attack, which he will soon use, and which can cause a mental shock debuff. The monster knocked them back with a sonic attack. 
Blue Cloud asked if it was possible that Ling Xi had been to this dungeon before, and how did he have such a clear knowledge of the details? The main character replied with a smirk that his friend had heard his friend from Guild Number One talking about it. He said he paid him some money to ask around. Blue Cloud replied that it has a fairly broad network. The main character thought that his friend's friend was a convenient excuse. A voice shouted that the skeletons had been summoned. A purple stream of energy rushed towards the skeletons and smashed through one of their heads. The crowd of skeletons was enveloped in purple electricity. Blue Whale said with a grin to leave the skeletons to him. He told the main character to go help Whale interrupt the boss. Ling Si, running behind him, thought about how he had instantly destroyed the entire wave of skeletons that had just been summoned. Frowning, he thought about its strength and how it really was a number one brute archer. Wailing Ghoul raised a bone arm above him, and above him was a large purple magic circle with a skull image in the middle. Whale used glorious light, and a stream of yellow energy rushed towards the boss. The boss blocked it with a purple barrier arm, which shattered under the attack. Whale shouted about the boss being restrained. He ordered an attack. Ling Si used quick stab and hit the boss with a dagger, giving it a blindness effect. The dialog box says, Wailing Ghoul has been affected with blind, the summoning skill has been interrupted. The main character shout out to increase the damage. The mages raised their staffs. The boss's health level dropped noticeably, and he was surrounded by blue flames. A face of blue flame towered over him. The dialogue box says, Disaster strikes, when Wailing Ghoul has only 30% of his HP left, all the undead of floors 1 and 2 will revive and re-enter the battlefield via the teleporters. Many skeletons and witches emerged from the portal. A guy with white hair shouted that the revived enemies from the first and second floors were coming. He added that they worked so hard to lower the boss health to 10%. The dark-haired guy said that he had heard that even the number one guild here was pretty well beaten, and the waves of dead were like a flood that couldn't be dealt with. A girl wearing a white wizard's hat shouted that she had used up all the mana potions. The guy with the white hair asked how they would manage to break through them. Blue Cloud asked Ling Si how he planned to deal with the resurrected skeletons and witches. The main character replied that there was no way to deal with them. Blue Cloud exclaimed in surprise that this wasn't the time for jokes. Lang Si replied with a serious face that he wasn't joking. He said they didn't need to be dealt with. Blue Cloud asked what he meant by that. The main character took a fighting stance and said that he had the stacked attacks ability, and from the third floor onwards, his attacks were never interrupted once. Next to his dagger was written, Stacked Attacks, 2412. Blue Cloud smiled and said that he understood now. He shouted for everyone to do their best to coordinate with Ling Si. Blue Cloud shouted for the tanks to block the waves of undead and protect the mages behind them while they attacked. He shouted at the mages to use their remaining mana to cast their strongest spells. Wailing Ghoul was surrounded by a purple magic barrier. Thrusting their bow forward, they shouted for them to break through the boss magic shield. The explosion hit the Wailing Ghoul, shattering its magic barrier. Blue Cloud told the main character that they were counting on him. Kicking off from the ground, Ling Si leapt forward and frowned as he thought that he would give him a taste of the damage from nearly 3,000 stacked attacks. A man in the crowd asked how much time had already passed. Another replied that someone had been monitoring the time, and one hour and 33 minutes had passed. Another person said they haven't been out for so long. He asked if it was possible that they would pass it. The guy said that if they did pass it, they would break the guild's number one record. He added that this is a record of insane difficulty, which greatly surpasses the guild's number one record, which was set on increased difficulty. The armored man said that Celestial must have made this move in order to show off their strength, since the guild head and the vice head of the guild went into action. The portal says, disastrous graveyard record, to be updated. He said that their challenge of insane difficulty has already caught the attention of many players, and if they pull it off, it will be a public success for Celestial. The main character landed with a dagger in his hand. A public announcement appeared above the record label. The dialogue box congratulated the team from the Celestial Guild. The crowd standing around the red portal noticed the dialogue box. The dialogue box lists the group members. Ling Si stood frowning. Blue Cloud and Whale stood surrounded by disappearing skeletons. The dialogue box listed Little Ab, usernames are hard to remember, Fire Carifer's Sight of Future, Stone Moon Philosopher, Onuel. Wailing Ghoul was cut in half. The skeletons around him began to disappear. The dialogue box says, they have cleared the dungeon, disastrous graveyard, and insanity difficulty, setting the first record for clearing insanity. The main character stood surrounded by purple energy. He thought that because this race happened under the name of the Celestial Guild, the record belongs to Celestial, and he can't hide his name. Frown, he think that even though the remuneration is quite ample, man fears fame, and after the news get out, it's inevitable that trouble will come knocking again. Blue Cloud laughed behind him and praised him for his good work. 
He told them that the record for insane difficulty was theirs. The white-haired guy exclaimed happily, smiling. Blue Whale said that if Lynx he hadn't lured the monsters down on his own, interrupted all three summonings, especially with his last strike, there was no way they would have been able to pass the insane difficulty. Lynx he replied that this is the result of everyone's efforts. Whale replied that he didn't have to be modest. The guy with the white hair agreed and shouted that his performance was just incredible. Holding up his fist, he said that they could post training videos with their movements. The main character replied that he was able to do this thanks to the excellent coordination of each of them. Blue Cloud looked at the huge dialogue box in front of him with a smile and said that the dungeon rewards had appeared, and as expected, there were a lot of equipment here. He told Ling Si that he would get the largest share. The main character closed his eyes and thought that the money that can be obtained in the dungeon is not something to look forward to, because one person can only get 50 silver at most. A girl in a white mage outfit exclaimed that she wanted this mage outfit. The other guy replied that there were three mages on their team and she would have to draw lots. Lang Si thought that if the experience was distributed according to the contribution to completing the dungeon, then he should get quite a lot. Surrounded by the yellow bill, he opened his mouth in surprise. Above his head, you can see that he has gained level 13. He thought that he had gained a level and a half, which wasn't bad. The mage girl noticed that he had raised his level. Blue Cloud chuckled and said that the contribution points for completing Ling Si are quite high. He said that news of it had most likely already spread everywhere. He called Ling Si back to headquarters. As he entered the red portal, he laughed, said that they had made a great profit here, and suggested that they come here again. He suggested that Ling Si go along with them. Blue Whale is sitting at a long table, and Whale and the main character are standing side by side. Whale told the main character that they would no longer thank him with words for the record in the dungeon. He said it was a remuneration that they had agreed on earlier. The dialogue box reported that the main character had received three gold coins from Whale. Lang Si thanked them. Blue Cloud asked him what he planned to do next. The main character replied with a smile that he would be returning to Nebulous and he needed to keep leveling up. He happily thought about how only the top five guilds could afford money like three gold. He thought that he could even afford to ask for twice as much next time. Blue Cloud sat there with a grim face. Whale frowned gravely. They looked at each other. Whale asked Ling Si what he thought of their guild. The protagonist paused for a moment and replied that their guild, ranked fourth among the five main guilds, was obviously very strong, not even to mention Blue Cloud and Whale. The main character mentally guessed what he was thinking. Whale said with a smile that he was very happy that Ling Si had such a high opinion of Celestial, and their collaboration had also brought them great pleasure. He said that if they didn't have an adorable thief like Ling Si with them, this mission wouldn't have been successful. He said he would tell you straight away. Whale said that he was extremely admired for his talent and strength, and he was wondering if Ling Si wanted to join the Celestial Guild. The main character, without turning around, raised his hand and, apologizing, reminded that he said that this was a one-time collaboration and he currently has no intentions to change the guild. Whale stiffened and told him that even though Celestial wasn't ranked first, they also had strict entry requirements and he was extremely sincere in his invitation to join their guild and he would be able to enjoy the best privileges. Ling Si thanked him for the invitation with a smile and said that just as he said, he had no intentions of changing the guild just yet. Whale said that if he wanted to join them, he would give him his position as the vice head of the guild. He asked what he thought. Ling Si frowned and thought that if this was his past life, then in this situation, he could agree without hesitation. But in this life, his goal is much higher than that and he won't let things like this drag him down. The main character apologized and said that this is not what he wants. Blue Cloud told Whale that this is enough. He said they wouldn't force him. Lang Si thanked him for his understanding and said that he was leaving. Blue Cloud rose from his seat. Folding his arms across his chest, he said with a smile that he would not accompany him. The main character waved his hand and said that it was a pleasure to meet them. Blue Cloud and Whale stood with their backs to each other with grim expressions. Whale started talking about what if this person couldn't become one of them. Blue Cloud laughed. He said with a big smile that it meant it wasn't meant to be. Whale asked about the Wolf's Fang Guild's request for an alliance. Blue Cloud replied that it can resolve such issues on its own and it doesn't need to ask him about them. Whale frowned and said nothing. Blue Cloud thought that their next encounter with Ling Si would be his enemies. Raising the white cup of tea, the man asked in surprise that there was such a person in their guild. A girl in dark red clothes with dark hair and blue eyes said that she also received news from the captain of the first division. Above her head, you can see that her name is Coco Lai, she is level 15, and she is the vice head of the Nebulous Guild. She said that he helped Blue Cloud of the Celestial Guild set the first record on the insane difficulty of the disastrous graveyard dungeon. She added that this thief named Ling Si seemed to have achieved outstanding results in the last monthly guild war. Raising the cup to his face, 
The man asked about what she said, that this thief was from their 3rd Division. Coco Lai replied that he was a subordinate of the new 3rd Division captain, Tiana. The man put the cup down on its saucer. He has lilac short hair, green eyes and glasses. Above his head, you can see that his name is Hart Stillwaters, he is level 15, and he is the head of the Nebulous Guild. Sitting on the throne with his legs crossed, he told her to tell them both to come to him. A guy with dark hair in the crowd said it was that thief, and he saw him come in here. A man with short blonde hair said that he had heard that he worked together with Blue Cloud. He added that he was also their captain, and he couldn't have imagined that such a person would turn out to be a person from their third division. Ruko told Ling Si that he had become very famous, and on the way here, he kept hearing others discussing him. Pointing his thumb at the door, he said that he made a big mistake by not taking it with him. He exclaimed that he had become even stronger again. Ruko said that now when they go through the dungeons together with Tiana, he can take all the damage on his own, and now he has a deeper understanding of his transformation. He said there's something called one becomes unrecognizable after some days apart. The main character indifferently agreed with his story. Tiana told him that he made a big fuss this time, and didn't even think about hiding his name. Exhaling, she added that he couldn't hide it. Standing next to the window where there was a crowd of people, she told him to look at the situation outside. She said that a lot of the guild members had come to see what was happening. Tiana asked if it bothered him. Smiling slightly, Ling Si said that there was nothing he could do about the fact that the result of completing the dungeon had to be assigned to the guild, and the names couldn't be hidden. He added that the deal was worth it. He said he was still going to raise his pay next time. The main character said that these people will disperse after some time, and there is no need to worry about them. Tiana repeated his last words angrily. Pointing her finger at him, she shouted that he was just running away from responsibility and he didn't even know how many private messages she had received today. She said that they were all asking about what her division had this guy named Ling Si, whether she could introduce them to him, and also that they wanted to ask a few questions about Ling Si. She exclaimed that it was very annoying as long as he kept things simple and could just turn off the sound of message notifications. Smiling, the main character opened one eye and said that he understood. Raising one eyebrow, Tiana asked how he even met Blue Cloud from Celestial. She reminded him that if he contacted people of this status, problems would follow. The main character started to answer, but a dialogue box appeared in front of Tiana and she asked to wait, asking what it might be at such a moment. The dialogue box says, Management Chat Group. Wasabi opened the door and called out to Tiana. He asked if she had seen the message in Nebulous Management Chat Group. The main character looked at him in silence, and Ruko asked him questioningly. Frowning, Wasabi said that the guild head of Stillwaters wants to meet Tiana and Ling Si right now. Tiana looked at him with a dark frown. The sun was shining over the pillared arches. Ling Si said that, unexpectedly, their guild's headquarters are quite good, and even more luxurious than Celestial's. Tiana repeated softly that they were doomed. The main character told her to calm down and that even if they want to find their fault in some cases, he will take all the responsibility on himself, and this does not concern her. Tiana paled and replied that since he was a member of her third division, she should be responsible for him. Frowning, she added that she had indeed given him a free hand, and now that there were problems, she couldn't put all the responsibility on him. Ling Si silently glanced at her. Tiana narrowed her eyes and said that he should know that being able to create a large guild in Heavenland was an incredible achievement, and it was difficult for even small guilds to achieve a stable position due to the close competition. She added that as guilds get bigger, their economic reserves will also grow, and relationships based on benefits become more complex. Standing in front of the tall wooden door, she asked if he could imagine how rich the guild heads would have to be to become one of the top five guilds in the game. Tiana said that with their strength, if they wanted to find out a player's real-life identity and background, they could easily do so. Knocking on the door, she whispered to the protagonist that if they provoked them, they could easily crush them. A voice outside the door said to enter. Tiana and Ling Si walked through the door. The main character in his mind suggested that Tiana is so afraid because she has some problems with her family in real life, and she is afraid that they will affect it. Tiana announced that they were here. Lowering his gaze, Ling Si signed that he hadn't considered this and might have caused her trouble, and in that case, he should clear things up. Looking up, he could see Coco Lai and Stillwaters standing next to the bookshelves above. Coco Lai said that the guild head is upstairs. The Stillwaters looked down at them, and Coco Lai said they called them here because they had some questions for them. Stillwaters was sitting at a table with a book in his hands. Coco Lai, who was standing next to him, asked Tiana if, as the captain of the third division, she had something to say. Tiana and Ling Si were standing at the opposite end of the table. Tiana, addressing the guild heads, said that this person was Ling Si. Ling Si interrupted her and suggested that we get straight to the point. He said that they wanted to ask questions of him, so there was no reason for them to drag Tiana into this. Stillwaters continued to stare at the book. Coco Lai said with a smirk that it was interesting. 
the main character said with a serious face that he knew they wanted to talk about collaborating with the Celestial Guild in a dungeon of insane difficulty. Chiana called out worriedly. Lang Si said that, in short, he needed money, and it happened that he had a few ideas about this dungeon, so he helped them complete the dungeon in exchange for a fee. Coco Lai asked if he knew that the person he was collaborating with was the head of Celestial's guild, Blue Cloud. The main character replied with a serious face that he would serve anyone who paid him, and even if the number one guild leader came to see him, he would accept the offer. He added that their guild doesn't have a rule that prohibits its members from accepting jobs. Coco Lai asked how he got to know Blue Cloud, and how he knew how to pass the insane difficulty of the dungeon. Lang Si replied that they were introduced by a friend, and his ideas for going through the insane difficulty of the dungeon are all based on the information he gathered. Angered, Coco Lai asked why he had withheld his personal information. The main character calmly replied that he did it to protect his privacy and it's just a habit of his. Coco Lai slammed the table and asked how he, as a member of the Nebulous Guild, dared to offer to help others with a similar record, which concerns the guild's reputation, in exchange for money. Stopping her with a hand gesture, Stillwaters asked what was wrong with that. He said that since ancient times, those who are more capable get more, and this issue does not tolerate criticism. Coco Lai looked at him with a frown. Stillwaters said it wasn't hard to see that Ling Si was a capable person. Still looking at his book, he said that he had only called them to understand the situation, and that there was no need to discuss the matter further. He said with a slight smile that that was all. He told Tiana to stay because he had something else to discuss with her. Tiana obeyed. The main character said that he had one request, and he would leave after he voiced it. Stillwaters said they were listening to him. Lang Si said that he could achieve great things for the guild, and he needed special permission. He said that he wants to create an official independent team. He thought that even though he needed the guild's support in terms of resources, he had better not involve Tiana in this. Tiana stood there, her mouth hanging open in surprise. Stillwaters agreed. After closing the book, he said that he wanted to see the results within a month. He asked if that would suit him. Ling Si, with his hands in the pockets of his feet, guessed that he must have some demand. Stillwaters replied that if within one month the team he creates manages to get into the top 10 once in the list of best teams, then he will allow his independent team to gain permanent status. After being silent for a while, Tiana exclaimed worriedly about the best team list. Coco Lai grinned and said it was a good idea. She asked if he knew what the best team list was. The main character replied that he knew. When he left, he said that they would meet again in a month. They were all silent, watching him go. Tiana thought worriedly that the list of top teams was updated every week and was mostly occupied by professionals. Any team can enter the leaderboard by submitting an application, and the place that the team will occupy will be determined by the system according to the dungeons that they have completed this week. Each dungeon completed during this week will be given a score, which depends on the difficulty of the dungeon and the score for completing it. Tiana thought that, in fact, he would be up against countless other teams in the leaderboard, and moreover, the top 10 positions were always occupied by the top 5 guilds. Frowning, she thought that she couldn't have thought that the guild head wanted Ling Si's independent team to enter the top 10 in the leaderboard. She thought that it was almost impossible, and Ling Si should know how hard it is, and the guild head definitely makes things harder for him. Coco Lai frowned and asked if this guy really knew what a leaderboard was. Stillwaters turned to Tiana. Tiana worriedly said that Ling Si didn't want to cross him. Ignoring her words, he said that he had heard that Ling Si was specially accepted into the guild by her. He asked if it was true. Tiana replied that it was true, and then she wanted to accept Ling Si into the guild. Stillwaters asked if this meant that it was she who asked him, and not the other way around. She looked at him in surprise and after being silent for a while, said that it was true and it was she who asked Ling Si. Opening the book, Stillwaters said it was now free to go. He said that the third division was an important source of new members for the guild and he would count on it in the future. Chan bowed, obeyed, and said she was leaving. She closed the door behind her and Coco Lai asked Stillwaters that he had asked this question in order to convince Lai Ling Si that he was a spy. Without looking up from his book, he replied that it was true. Coco Lai, agreeing, said that if he had approached Tiana first, he might have had third-party intentions. She added that she had to admit that she didn't expect him to accept his demand so easily. Flipping through the pages of the book, Stillwaters said that a confident guy like him would definitely accept his demand. Looking at the book, he said that he was just curious about who he would take on his team. The main character entered the room that Ruko and Wasabi were in. When Ruko noticed him, he asked if they were making things difficult for him. Ling Si replied that he was fine. Wasabi asked if he was okay. Holding an orange tin can in his hand, he assumed that the guild leader wanted to know more about his background. Folding his arms across his chest, the main character replied that he did, and he also allowed him to create his own team, and if he could enter the top 10 in the team leaderboard, then he would make his team permanent. Wasabi asked in surprise about the top 10 in team leaderboard. 
Ruko raised his fist and suggested that he not waste any more time and start trying to break into the top 10. Wasabi nervously thought that if Ling Si wanted to create a team, he would do everything in his power to help him. He thought that he couldn't deny that Ling Si was constantly deleting it. Grinning, Wasabi thought that perhaps someone like him, who is able to make the impossible possible and constantly strives to become stronger, is someone who is more worthy of his pursuit. He thought that if necessary, he would even be willing to give up his position as vice-captain. The door opened and Ruko, seeing Tana, said that they had already heard everything from Ling Si. The main character asked if the guildmaster had detained her because he wanted to ask about him. Tiana walked past him and asked Ling Si to let her ask him a question. Ruko and Wasabi exclaimed in surprise. Turning around, she asked with a grim face if independence would really be better for him. The main character paused for a moment. He said that he was different from her and there was nothing holding him back. He said that he wanted to become independent because he was afraid that his detached nature would become a burden to her, giving her unnecessary problems and responsibilities. Tiana remained silent for a moment. Frowning, she said that she couldn't deny that she was afraid of the guild's influence, but the reason she was able to achieve what she had now was because of his help as well. She shouted that if he ever needed her, she would definitely help him. Her eyes widened in surprise. Tiana was silent with a surprised face. Ling Si glanced at her, slightly embarrassed. Ruko flashed a big smile and said it was great. Raising his fist, he shouted for them to become independent and achieve great things. The main character told him to calm down because they need to find four more people on the team to apply to team leaderboard and they still need to find more people on the team. Smiling, Wasabi said that when the time comes, they can complete all the crazy difficulty dungeons they've completed before and that should definitely help them with their team scores. Ruko, smiling, agreed and said that there are many dungeons with no set records, which are much easier than the crazy difficulty dungeons they passed. Wasabi said that they can also collect a set of equipment with high damage first, and this will also greatly help them surpass their dungeon records. The main character told Wasabi that he couldn't join the team because his skills weren't up to standard. Wasabi's face froze in surprise. Laughing, he assumed he was talking about his level. He said that it was fine and he would be able to raise it with Ruko. Ling Si with a grim face said that it wasn't about his level, but his skills that weren't very compatible. He said that at the moment, even Ruko can beat him, and they can't let that happen. The main character added that their team already has a thief, and they don't need two people with the same class yet. Wasabi looked downcast and said he understood. Ling Si told him that he hoped he understood that this wasn't about their friendship. As he left, Wasabi said he knew. Tiana, looking at them worriedly, wondered if Ling Si was being a little too tactless. After opening the door in front of him, Wasabi said that he wanted to fight the new team members after Ling Si found them. Turning around, he asked for one chance. He closed the door behind him. Tiana asked the main character where he would go now. Ling Si said he had to move out because he didn't have much time. Putting his hands in his pants pockets, he said that he needed to find an archer to join their team. The puddle reflected the nighttime forest. The man in the shoe stepped in a puddle, splashing water. Several people are running through the forest. One of them suggested splitting up. Another asked if he was able to find its location. He said he couldn't. Gritting his teeth, he said that since he was planning to challenge Dark Wolf's workshop, they would make sure that he wouldn't be lonely. A guy with white hair was running behind him. The gunshot grazed his head, and his eyes widened in surprise. The guy fell to the ground, and the others turned around. Another shot hit the other guy in the head. The boy swore as he ran away. The full moon was shining in the night sky. After hiding, he thought that he would probably be able to find it for a while, and he just needed to wait for the reinforcements from workshop to arrive. He wondered where he was attacking them from. A man placed a sniper rifle on a tree. A bird flew by, and the guy, noticing it, turned around in surprise. He tensed, noticing something. The shot hit him in the head and he fell to the ground. A rifle flashed in the tree. The dark-haired guy with the rifle straightened up. Above his head, it could be seen that his name was Pure Dark Feather and he was level 14. Looking down, he said, good game. The moon was shining over the city street. The girl, looking at a guy walking down the street with a rifle, exclaimed that he was a hot weapon type player. She said it was a rare archer profession with hot weapon. She said that besides the fact that their equipment has higher damage, it is very difficult to get it. The guy with dark hair asked if the heavy sniper rifle on his back was called a celestial falcon. He said that if he remembered correctly, the chance of it falling out was extremely low, and it could only be obtained in a higher difficulty dungeon. He said they were lucky to have seen this weapon live. The door to the tavern opened. A voice greeted the hooded man. He asked for a dark beer. The girl at the steam counter agreed, pouring beer into a beer glass. The guy sat down at the bar, flipping a gold coin. The girl handed him a dark beer. The girl served soda to another man, and he thanked her. The main character, standing next to the guy, said, Heavy sniper rifle Celestial Falcon, Black Hood, tall and thin, likes to drink dark beer. 
He said that if his friend hadn't seen him enter this bar, he would never have been able to find his silhouette. The boy looked at him. Ling Si called it pure dark feather. The guy said nothing. The main character thought that, just like the rumors say, he is an unsociable lone wolf and the only taunt he uses against his opponents is GG. He didn't let himself be seen twice, he thought. Ling Si closed his eyes and apologized for interrupting him and said that he wanted to discuss working together with him. He thought that in his previous life, this unsociable guy had become the number one ranged hot weapon in Heavenland. The main character thought that he was a great sniper and later even took first place in the professional assassin leaderboard. Because his opponents cannot detect where he is during the battle, and those who found out, he already shot through the heads. Holding a glass of soda, Ling Si told him that he wanted to invite him to join his team to participate in the team leaderboard. After shooting the glass in the main character's hand, the guy told him to get behind. Smoke was coming from the muzzle of the revolver in his hand. Ling Si said that it seems like he really doesn't like this form of communication. Letting go of the glass shards, he told him not to misunderstand him, and he's not one of the superstar seekers. He said that he just felt that he was very suitable to be on the same team as him. Turning around, he said that if he wanted to discuss it with him, he could meet him at the dungeon entrance of Ancient Machinery Cave tomorrow afternoon. With a small smile, he added that he was sure he would change his mind when he came. After remembering, the main character told him that if he wanted to upgrade his weapon, they could help him get the Shadow Killer Heavy Sniper Rifle. He thought that even in his previous life, everyone knew that Pure Dark Feather was a big fan of hot weapons, so he prepared himself before coming here. He smugly thought that Shadow Killer was currently one of the best sniper rifles in the game, and he definitely wouldn't be able to refuse his offer. Pure Dark Feather looked at him in silence. He said he was looking forward to seeing him tomorrow. The dialogue box informed Tom that he was out of the game and they were looking forward to his next login. Exhaling, Ling Si got up from the bed and said that every time he logs out of the game, he feels this tearing pain. There was an envelope on the table next to the bed. The main character opened it and, taking out a paper from it, realized that it was a school admission letter. He was surprised to think that he hadn't expected the old man to be serious when he talked about it during the meeting. The main character recalled how an old man told him that at his age, he still had to get a compulsory education and he would need to go to school to know more. He said he would help him apply to the school for free. Scratching his head, Ling Si thought that school seemed to start next month and he was afraid of upsetting the old man if he didn't go. Looking around, he asked where the old man was. The man loudly asked if he knew how much his son owed them. He said he understood that he was dead and asked what would happen to the money he owed them. A man in a red shirt was showing the old man a piece of paper. The old man apologized, holding a bag of groceries in his hand, and said that he really didn't know. The man said it was a paper signed by his son. He asked if he understood the situation now. The old man said, startled, that he understood. The main character ran outside and asked what they were doing. Frowning and clenching his fist, he demanded to let the old man go. The man furiously asked who he was to talk to him like that. The old man called out to Ling Si in a weak voice, and the man asked if he was the old man's grandson. The main character replied that he was his grandfather. The man grinned and asked if his grandson had come here to help his grandfather pay off his debts. The old man shouted worriedly that this was not so, he was not his grandson, and it was none of his business. The man pushed the old man away and shouted that he didn't care if he was his grandson or not, and today he would pay them back the million that his grandson owed them. He said that if he couldn't, he would go with them and they would find out how much the old man's body parts were worth. Lang Si shouted to the man. The old man dropped the grocery bag on the ground. The main character stared gloomily ahead, standing behind the old man. The man stared back nervously. Lang Si thought that he needed to calm down and he wasn't in the game right now and this man could easily kill him. He thought that if he had been an awakened one, things would have been different. The main character frowned and said that even if he killed them, they still didn't have one million right now. He said that if they gave them more time, they might be able to collect it. The man clenched his fists and paused for a moment. He agreed and said it wouldn't do them any good if they didn't get the money. He said that he was giving them two months and that should be enough for them to raise the required amount. The man pointed his index finger at them with a grim grin and said that they should give him a million and a half and no less. The old man asked in surprise why the amount had increased to one and a half million. The man turned around and said that he was giving them two months to raise the money and of course he had to add a percentage. He asked if it wasn't fair. He added that he is a very reasonable person. The man said that he didn't have time for nonsense and he needed to visit two more clients and they would see each other in two months. He told them not to even think about moving because they could still find them whenever they wanted. The old man looked at him in horror. Lengs he put his hand on the shoulder of the trembling old man and asked if he was okay and if he needed to go to the hospital. The old man was muttering about how they couldn't find a million and a half in two months. The main character thought that one million is not a small amount. He asked the old man if he knew what his son had spent that million on. 
The old man said he didn't know, and he never told him. Lang Xi told him to go inside first and leave the money problem to him. The old man turned around in surprise and asked if he had a solution. The main character thought that this is the real world, and there are always a lot of unexpected problems that suddenly arise. He answered in the affirmative with a serious face. Lang Xi thought that he seemed to need to speed up. He thought that only level 15 players who had successfully awakened could activate the currency link function between the two worlds. Frowning, he thought that meant it was time for him to move forward with his plan. The next day, Lang Xi thought that having a fixed team was incredibly important to him at the moment. He thought that this not only provided him with a quick level up, but also played an important role in making his plans for the future a reality. He decided to put together a team one step at a time and become stronger. Ancient Machinery Cave Dungeon Lobby Ruko, noticing the main character, exclaimed that he had come. He said that he was very excited when he received his message yesterday, and he can finally go to the dungeon with him again. Folding his arms, he looked away and said that he was unlucky today and saw the demon as soon as he came. Ling Xi interrupted him and said that it looked like they had already met each other. He asked Ruko to let him introduce him and said it was Tilly's, a battle mage. He explained that they had met before, and she would join them in this dungeon. Tilly's folded her arms and asked why he was so late. She said that she only came because he said that she would be able to fight a pro. She asked when she said she would go to the dungeon with them. Ruko asked in surprise about her going to the dungeon with them. Ling Xi told her that he hadn't lied to her, and that person just hadn't come yet. He asked if she could help them with the dungeon. Tilly's replied that she didn't mind entering the dungeon if she could fight someone skilled. Ruko grudgingly asked why she was going with them. A guy nearby said that it looked like these two were his teammates. The main character, noticing that he was here, said that it was true and it was his teammates. Ruko asked in surprise, since when was there a person there? Pure Dark Feather said that he is only interested in the Shadow Killer sniper rifle and he hopes that he is a man of his word. Lang Xi replied that this weapon can only drop when special conditions are met. He said that when it comes to completing the dungeon, he is very confident in their abilities, and if he has doubts, he can trust their abilities on his own. Tilly's frowned and thoughtfully repeated the words about testing their abilities. Pure Dark Feather pointed a finger forward. Ruko exclaimed in surprise when he noticed that he was pointing at him. Placing his hands on his waist, he shot a glance at Tilly's with a smirk and said that he had a good eye and he should know that he was very strong. Tilly's irritably asked why he chose a stupid child and if he looked down on her. Pure Dark Feather said that how much water a wooden bucket can hold depends on the length of its shortest plank. Tilly's agreed with a smile. Ruko couldn't understand the meaning of his words, asking why they needed water. Ling Xi suggested that we have a small duel while no one is here. Ruko and Pure Dark Feather were standing opposite each other. The main character and Tilly's looked at them from the side. Ruko asked if he was going to use this sniper rifle. He said it was rare to see a person using a firearm. He said that he remembers that this equipment is very hard to get, so very few people decide to use it, but it really looks cool. Laughing, Ruko asked if his rifle didn't hit the ground when he sat down with it on his back. Pure Dark Feather looked at him irritably. Ruko called for a start by holding up his shield. He said that he wanted to try fighting against a sniper rifle. The sniper rifle on Pure Dark Weather's back started to disappear. The dialog box reported a change of weapon. He said he wouldn't have to use it. Ruko was surprised to see Pure Dark Feather's movements. Ling Si and Tilly's watched them with interest. Two pistols appeared in Pure Dark Feather's hands, and he suggested that they start. The dialogue box reported a successful weapon change. The main character thought that he didn't expect him to use double pistols, and all he knows is that he is the best at using sniper rifles. He thought that he had to admit that dual pistols would allow for more agility in such a short-range fight than a sniper rifle. Pure Dark Feather slowly walked towards Ruko with two pistols in his hands. Tilly's frowned and said that this wouldn't do, and she had to fight this guy with a firearm. She said it would be a rewarding experience for her. Ruko, noticing the twin pistols, said he thought he was using his sniper rifle. After using flying shield, he threw his shield at him. Pushing off from the ground, Pure Dark Feather slid across the ground under the shield flying at him. Ruko said that he has a pretty strong back. Jumping on Pure Dark Feather, Ruko grabbed his shield. Shielding himself from the shots with his shield, he said with a grin that he didn't hit it. Tilly said she didn't expect this little guy to be so agile. The main character agreed with a grin that he was getting better and he didn't even notice. Using shield bash, Ruko hit the ground hard and pure dark feather jumped out of the way. Tilly said that, compared to this guy, Ruko's agility is still not enough. The main character agreed and said that this is not a big problem. Pure dark feather started firing his pistols. Ruko shielded himself from the shots with his shield. Rushing forward, pure dark feather hit the ground and Ruko dodged by jumping up. Thrusting his shield forward, he told him to enjoy a shield slap to the face. Jumping forward, Pure Dark Feather said that he was caught. 
Using metallic dance, he kicked the shield, causing Ruko to let go of his shield. Pure Dark Feather started firing his pistols as he got to his feet. The shots hit Ruko all over the body. Frowning, he thought that his attacks were tightly packed. He held out his hand, but was surprised to see a foot approaching. The impact created a large cloud of dust around Ruko. Standing with his back to him, Pure Dark Feather said, GG. Tilly said that Ruko's strength might be on par with the guys with guns, but unfortunately, his weaknesses were exposed after the guy with guns attacked him. She said it looked like the battle was over. Lengxi said he didn't think so. Eyes that glowed red were visible in the dust cloud. Pure Dark Feather turned around in surprise. The huge Ruko swung a paw while standing in the scattered cloud of dust. Pure Dark Feather wondered what it was. Jumping back, he started shooting at Ruko. Ruko stood with his hands outstretched, taking his shots. His hand moved closer to the Pure Dark Feather. Grabbing it in his hand, he lifted it off the ground. A dialogue box informed Pure Dark Feather that it had lost its ability to move. He gritted his teeth. Ruko said that he advises him to get out his heavy sniper rifle, otherwise he really won't have a chance to win against him. The main character thought that even though Dark Feather would become a number one long-ranged firearms wielder in the future and possess immeasurable power, he should not underestimate the incredible potential of Ruko. Tilly's exclaimed that she wanted to fight Ruko as well. Grinning, Ling Si thought that this was someone who was and would be one of the six divine shields in the future, Sacred Mountain Ruko. As he approached them, he asked if he wanted to fight again using his sniper rifle. Pure Dark Feather replied that there was no need. He suggested that we proceed with the dungeon. The main character suggested that he add each other as friends so that he would add him as a temporary team member. The dialogue box says that he has formed a team. Ling Si said that their goal for this dungeon is simple. He said that they will get a Shadow Killer sniper rifle and at the same time break the record on the special difficulty of the Ancient Machinery Cave dungeon. He said that the minimum required players for this dungeon is exactly four people, but that won't be a problem and all they have to do is follow his plan. Ruko asked why they didn't go for the insane difficulty. The main character replied that this is because the rewards are different there. He said that if they pass the insane difficulty of the Ancient Machinery Cave dungeon, Provided that all participants have more than half health, then the reward will be Brass Shadow Killer Claymore, which is designed for warriors, and Brass Shadow Killer Sniper Rifle, also known as the Shadow Killer Sniper Rifle, requires them to pass a special one. Difficulty of the dungeon, taking less than 45 minutes to complete. Tilly's asked if it was possible. She reminded that the current record on special difficulty is 1 hour and 27 minutes. She said that they would have to complete the dungeon faster than the record by 42 minutes, which is almost twice as fast as the record. The main character replied that there would be no problems with this. He decided to start preparing to enter the dungeon. Looking at the purple portal in front of them, Pure Dark Feather asked Ling Si how long it would take them to complete this dungeon according to his plans. The main character smiled slightly. He said it would take them 20 minutes. Inside the ancient machinery cave dungeon, the main character's group was standing in a room full of pipes. Ruko pulled the web that the spider was sitting in. The spider ran away, and Ruko exclaimed about how agile it was. Tilly's asked if he was exaggerating too much when he talked about 20 minutes. Ling Si replied that he wasn't exaggerating because they would use a different method. He said that from now on, they will use a strategy that is radically different from the typical one. The main character said that they probably already know that there are three mini-locations inside the ancient machinery cave dungeon that they will need to go through. He said that each mini-location is a floor of a cave, which will eventually lead them to the last floor, the ancient humble great bridge, and there they will have to defeat the mechanical griffin Kayla. Pure Dark Feather agreed and said that he had teamed up with other people before, hoping to get the Shadow Killer sniper rifle, and in his opinion, their speed was already quite high, but due to the fact that mechanical enemies have a high resistance to physical damage, fighting them took a long time. A lot of time. He said that it ended up taking them two hours to complete the dungeon, which is very different from the 45-minute requirement. Tilly's asked how they were going to clean up this route. She asked if he would do it with rush attack or if he had any other ideas. The main character, while climbing the hill, said that even a rush attack would take too long and the method they would use was quite resourceful and they would use the map to their advantage. Turning around, he said that they wouldn't need to kill any enemies. Tilly's asked in surprise. The main character replied that that was why he said they would use the map to their advantage. He said that the Ancient Machinery Cave map is different from other dungeon maps because the map of this dungeon is completely preloaded. He explained that, in simple terms, they don't need to go through things like gates, which require waiting for the map to load when they go through to the next floor. Ruko exclaimed that he understood, and it's a seamless map. He said that they can freely walk around the entire map, and they don't have to wait for parts of the map to load. 
Ling Xi said he was right, and while Heavenland has long managed to make the entire game seamless open world, in order to create different gaming experiences, some maps are seamless maps, while some need to be downloaded. Pure Dark Feather stared at his back in silence. He shouted irritably that he had no idea what they were talking about. He demanded to know what they needed to do, not waste time. The main character, holding a torch in his hand, said that it is better to give a simple explanation of the rationale so that they all have an understanding of what is happening when they act. He thought that he didn't expect a professional like Pure Dark Feather to have absolutely no knowledge of the game's mechanics. He told them to look around. The main character said that to create a sense of mystery on this map, there are a lot of holes on the walls, on the floor and on the ceiling. Tilly said that this makes her somewhat uncomfortable. Ruko said in surprise that he wasn't bothered at all. Langsi said that she would have to fight this feeling because they would be entering these holes. Tilly stiffened in surprise. Pure Dark Feather asked in surprise about entering the holes. Ruko exclaimed that it sounds like fun. He asked the main character if they were using the holes to avoid opponents, and if so, how they were going to enter the next floor. Ling Xi said that they probably don't know that all the thousands of holes here are connected like threads in a spider's web, and one can never know for sure where they will lead. He said that there might be a mechanical enemy hiding in the darkness at the end of the hole, or there might be a dead end, or it might lead to an entrance to another path. He said that no one knows where the holes will lead, except no. Tilly stared intently at the main character. Ling Xi said that he knew that among these tens of thousands of holes, there was a certain path that would lead them directly to the lower floor. The main character and his group were walking through a cramped tunnel. The main character thought that in his previous life, it took countless players' research to find out, and in the end, it became a cheat of this dungeon, because everyone could avoid all enemies with this shortcut, and the dungeon lost its meaning. Frowning, he thought that this shortcut was fixed by a patch after the version update, however, in this life, he is the only one who knows about it. He thought that if he tried to sell this information to others, he would surely be able to make a lot of money, but it was better not to let such shortcuts be discovered by the world so early. Tilly's, looking around, thought that it was a dark, narrow cave that hid unknown wiggly creatures inside. She worried that she was going to die. Seeing a glint in the darkness, she gave a startled cry. She pointed her finger in the direction of the glitter, and the protagonist asked what was wrong. Ruko with a grin told her to calm down, because it's just a small mole that is found everywhere. A small, harmless rodent was sitting in a hole in the cave. Blushing, Tilly's gritted her teeth. Ling Si, looking at her, thought that he had never thought that the usually calm and cool Tilly's could have such a frantic side. Tilly's had a mole sitting on her shoulder, and she irritably asked Ruko what he was laughing at. Ruko continued to laugh while looking at her. The main character thought of cocky-looking pure dark feather walking behind them. Smiling, he thought it was an interesting day. He said there were three forks in front of them and they would go left. He told everyone to hurry up. In the dark, many toothy monsters were watching the main character's path. The main character motioned for them to be quiet. They continued to move through the cave with the holes. Tilly's looked around anxiously. Ruko looked at the spider crawling on the wall with a smile. Ling Si said they came, and it's right down this tunnel. He told everyone to jump in. Ruko, after jumping into the hole, said that he would go first. The main character and Tilly's jumped down after him. Ling Si told Ruko that he knows he's excited for them to come here, but he needs to calm down because it's dangerous. Ruko sat up and said in surprise that they actually made it. Ling Si and Tilly's fell to the ground, sending up two clouds of dust. Pure Dark Feather fell after them. Tilly's exhaled and said that they were finally out of this narrow space. The main character, raising an eyebrow, replied that he came, but there is one but. Ruko turned around. Ling Si said that it was better for her to get off him before she started complaining. Blushing, Tilly's noticed that she was sitting on the main character's back. Ruko laughed as he looked at them. Tilly's asked with a frown where they were. She added that she is confused after all these tunnels. The main character, shaking himself off, began to talk. Pure Dark Feather interrupted him and said that they went horizontally 16 times, but changed their positions vertically 12 times and most likely this is the lower floor. He said it wasn't just the lower floor, and to his surprise, they came straight to the last boss. Ling Si turned around and thought that he didn't expect anything less from Pure Dark Feather and its spatial awareness is simply terrifying. He thought that he was able to figure out their location even after going through all these tunnels. Pure Dark Feather, coming to the edge of the bridge, said that he recognized this underground river and this is the humble river which is located on the lower floor of the dungeon. He said that he didn't expect that he actually knew a shortcut that would lead them directly to the lower floor. Below them was a tumultuous river. Looking to the side, Pure Dark Feather said that judging from the building nearby, there should be a boss lair above them. Humble Mechanical Guardian, Subterraneous Kayla, the ancient humble Great Bridge. A purple griffin in steel armor was sleeping with its eyes closed. Its clawed feet rested on a pillar. Ruko glanced at the griffon from behind the pillar. Frowning, he said it looked bad. 
humble mechanical guardian, Subterraneous Kayla was sleeping on the bridge. It had orange wings. While hanging from the bridge, Ruko told Ling Si that this boss is too strong and looks incredibly strong and impenetrable. The main character replied that they wouldn't need to fight this thing directly. Tilly said 12 minutes had passed and the 20 minutes he was talking about were 8 minutes away. Taking the staff in her hands, she told him to stop wasting time and tell her his plan because she was ready. The main character turned around. Closing his eyes, he told her he didn't need her help yet. Tilly's asked irritably. The main character told Pure Dark Feather that only he can perfectly complete the first stage of the plan. Tilly's asked irritably why only he could do this. A rifle appeared on Pure Dark Feather's back, and he assumed that from where he had led them, his target was there. A purple tail hung from the top of the bridge. He said that his target is the griffin's tail. The main character replied that this is true, and that heavy sniper rifles definitely have enough range to do this. He told him to use his sniper rifle to shoot from a safe distance. Ling Si said that just one shot is enough and the boss will become hostile and turn aggro on them, however it won't be able to attack them and will go back. Pure Dark Feather picked up the rifle and said he didn't know how he came up with it, but he would go and see if it really worked. Ling Si said to trust him. He told everyone to take their places and remember to use single attack skills as often as possible. He explained that the tail is the boss weak point, and the higher the damage, the better. Pure Dark Feather took aim with a sniper rifle. The dialogue box reported that the weapon had been changed to an explosive bomb. Ruko asked what the three of them should do, and if they would really just stand there and do nothing. The main character replied that this was true, and they were only here to meet the requirement for the number of participants. He told him not to worry, because they would all have important roles in the next dungeons. Tilly said irritably that it was a waste of her time. Pure Dark Feather asked if he could attack. Ling Si replied affirmatively with a smile. Pure Dark Feather fired a sniper rifle. The shot went straight for the griffin's tail. When the bullet hit its target, there were many explosions near the griffon, and it woke up with a loud sound as it spread its wings. Ling Si said that he had been shot and was about to fly straight to them. The griffin flew up in the air, and the main character said that he was coming. Grinning, he said that this lion eagle monster wouldn't be able to find a target to attack because they were hiding under the bridge, and it would soon return to the same place where it was. The griffon looked around in disbelief as it hovered over the bridge. Pure Dark Feather noticed something, and Ling Si asked if something is wrong. Pure Dark Feather grinned down the rifle scope. He started shooting profusely at the griffon and said that he would take advantage of the moment when the griffon returns to its location to deal more damage. He added that he wished swift ammunition did a lot of damage. The main character thought that he was not bad and caught the rhythm of subterraneous Kayla very quickly. Ruko scratched his head and said that he suddenly felt sorry for this boss. Tilly's called him an ignorant little kid. Ruko frowned and asked irritably who she was calling a child. She asked if he had passed through this dungeon before. She said subterraneous Kayla is usually a nightmare for glass cannons like mages and archers, and she never expected Ling Si's shady tactics to actually work. The main character, laughing, agreed and said that Subterraneous Kayla is especially hostile against ranged attacks, and at the same time specializes in aiming at players from afar and using attacks with sound waves. He said that mages and archers can't deal high damage to him due to all these circumstances. Elling C said that once Kayla targeted them, they wouldn't even have time to escape, and a player with a weapon like the Pure Dark Feather Sniper Rifle would be targeted before they finished preparing. Pure Dark Feather thought that the last time he went through this dungeon, he didn't even get a chance to pull out his rifle, and he had to deal damage with his twin pistols, and they had to rely on melee attacks to lower the boss's health little by little. He thought that he would never have guessed such a strategy, using the environment to make the boss move so that it could confidently deal ranged damage. He thought that the fact that this Ling Si was able to come up with such a method was interesting. The main character was calmly looking ahead. He thought that if he wasn't mistaken, Pure Dark Feather fired 4 times per minute, which meant that in 8 minutes, he would deal 30 odd shots and he would also deal extra damage when he understood Subterraneous Kayla's rhythm on his own. Ruko mockingly said that the boss had turned around again and he wouldn't be able to find them. The main character thought that the damage of a heavy sniper rifle was initially very high, and if you take into account the fact that the tail is a weak point of the boss and high additional damage is obtained, then they should not have any problems. Ling Si noticed that Pure Dark Feather ran in front of him and said that this was the right place. Ling Si and Ruko asked in surprise what he was doing. Pure Dark Feather lay down on the floor, peeking out from under the bridge from below. Looking through the scope of his rifle, he replied that he was saving time. He shot at the griffin's tail, and the main character exclaimed that he had hit the tail. 
Pure Darkfeather said that it wasn't a big deal, and while dealing extra damage, he noticed that the time it took for the boss to turn around and leave the bridge on the way back was enough for him to take another shot, and he thought he could take another shot and shoot twice at a time to save time. Ling Xi thought in surprise that he managed to take advantage of the few seconds that required the boss to leave the bridge to fire again. Ruko said it sounds very impressive. Pure Darkfeather said that there is a 0.3 second gap after the swift ammunition is fired. The main character, frowning, thought that he had an incredible judgment because he was able to understand this and execute it perfectly after one shot. He thought that he had never heard anything like this even in his previous life and everyone always fired one shot at a time. He thought that he didn't expect Pure Darkfeather to be able to use focus shot in the short amount of time after using swift ammunition and as expected of Pure Darkfeather, its control of timing and keen sense of perception are impressive. Ruko noticed that the boss was coming back again. After Pure Dark Feather realized that he was about to fire two shots at a time, the estimated time of 20 minutes was reduced by 4 minutes. Pure Dark Feather, holding a sniper rifle in his hand, said, GG. Ling Si and his group were standing near the fallen griffin. As a result, they completed the special difficulty of the ancient machinery cave dungeon in just 16 minutes. Pure Dark Feather was able to get the equipment he wanted, the Shadow Killer Sniper Rifle. The main character thought that setting a new record for completing a special difficulty dungeon wouldn't attract much attention, and their first collaboration would end peacefully, but even he didn't expect that their almost superhuman dungeon speed would fuel a terrifying discussion on the game's forum. There were topics of discussion on the forum, how did they clear the dungeon in 16 minutes? Which team is this? Did they use a cheat? Soon after, countless teams of all levels began to challenge their small team of four. The afternoon sun shone over the city with its stone buildings. Darkfeather asked why he should put away his heavy sniper rifle. Ling Si replied that it attracted too much attention. Darkfeather, the main character, Tillys and Ruko are walking down the street. Ruko said with a grin that just looking at his stupid sniper rifle was enough for anyone with vision to know at a glance that they were the hotly debated team that had completed the dungeon in 16 minutes. Darkfeather corrected him by saying that his rifle is called Shadow Killer. Ling Si said he has a habit of hiding his information, and each of them in the team should hide their information in their next operations from now on. He told them to trust him because revealing their information would only cause endless problems. He also suggested that they try to draw as little attention to themselves as possible when they are outside. He added, better safe than sorry. Tilly said she was fine with it, but according to the protagonist's promises, she joined because his suggestions sounded interesting and challenging. She said that if she got bored, she could leave whenever she wanted. The main character told her that if she gets bored, she is free to do as she wants. He thought that as long as there was a challenge, Tilly's would stay with them, but he didn't expect Darkfeather to just choose to stay with them. He recalled how Darkfeather had told him that he was a solo player and wasn't joining teams on a permanent basis, however, to repay Shadow Killer, he would be joining them for a while. He warned that if he suddenly leaves the team one day, do not be too surprised, because he has his own plans. Ling Si thought that, in any case, their team at the moment matches what he was hoping for, so this is a great start. Ruko told the main character that there are many teams here that are already fully equipped. He replied that it went without saying because it was the road leading to the team leaderboard registration lobby. He said that teams without the appropriate ability level will not apply for permission to participate in the team leaderboard. Tilly's said that, in addition, all the teams they can see here came from guilds or workshops of considered standing. She said that's why team leaderboard is also called signboard. She explained that being ranked on the leaderboard is a direct way to show the strength of your guild or workshop. Glancing to the side, she said that the higher a place was, the stronger their guild or workshop was, and it became an important way to advertise. Ruko rubbed his chin thoughtfully and said that then it was no wonder that when he looked at this leaderboard last time, the teams in the top 10 were basically all from the five major guilds. He said that the competition for such free advertising is quite severe. Tilly's concluded that Leng Si's goal of getting into the top 10 in team leaderboard is quite difficult because it will have to compete with five major guilds. The main character calmly told her not to worry. Looking ahead, he said that he wouldn't have any problems with them instead. In front of them was a magnificent huge building entrance, above which a dialogue box says, Welcome to the lobby to register for team leaderboard. The main character called them to go inside. Ruko called out to him. He asked if he had come up with a name for their team. The main character paused for a moment. He calmly replied that he hadn't thought about it and suggested naming it randomly because it didn't matter. Ruko exclaimed that this wouldn't do. Grinning, he held up his index finger and said that he didn't know that, as the saying goes, picking a good name will make you a winner for life. He exclaimed that they should give their team a grand name. Ruko said he thought about it all the time. He said that their team is constantly hiding their information, and they are as mysterious as shadows, while others only know that they exist and don't know exactly who they are or what they are. Ling Si glanced at him. 
Ruko suggested naming their team Shadows. He asked if they liked it. The main character thought of this title in surprise. Someone said it sounded a little silly. Ruko asked in frustration if they didn't like it. Ling Si smiled. He suggested naming the team Shadow. Ruko looked at the main character in surprise. Ling Si said that this name is simple, clean, and also retains the meaning that Ruko wanted to express. Entering the building, the main character suggests calling their team Shadow. Ruko jumped up and down happily. Dark Feather and Tilly's calmly watched the main character go. After applying for permission to join Team Leaderboard, the four of them started setting new records in dungeons that would benefit them. The main character's group fights a huge stone monster in Dungeon Heart of Dust, Insanity Difficulty. Even when they couldn't speed through some of the crazy difficulty dungeons due to the restrictions on their team composition, they also tried their best to speed through these special difficulty dungeons and set new records. The main character's team crosses a rope bridge over a precipice while Ling Si fights monsters chasing them in Dungeon Secret Treasure of the Solitary Cliff, a special difficulty. Completing the dungeons themselves wasn't difficult, and what they paid the most attention to was completing them at the best possible possible speed to save time. While leaving themselves plenty of space to follow up, they were also making calculations. Since the team leaderboard is updated once a week, they only have four chances to get into the top 10. In theory, they should make sure to squeeze into the top 10 at least once. Over time, Shadow started setting a lot of new records. Since they had made their detailed information private, the players only knew that there was a team called Shadow that was setting new records one by one at an alarming rate. Even though they had yet to make it to the top 10, it was an undeniable fact that they had left their mark in the form of top records on one dungeon after another. The main character thought that something he never expected had happened, and this type of special fame became something that people with bad intentions started fighting among themselves for. The guy with the animal ears grinned viciously. Tilly's asked about what he says, that there are people who pretend to be them. Ruko replied that he also heard about it from Tiana from their guild. Placing his hands on his waist, he frowned and asked if she knew how famous they, Shadow, were at the moment. He said that so many imposters appeared because they were so famous. Ruko added accusingly that they were a bunch of guys with nothing to do. While jumping down from the tree, Ling Si told him that he was paying attention to the wrong things, and all the fuss going on in the world was for the sake of benefit and profit. Dark Feather said that they are most likely doing this in order to claim the records they have set for themselves. The main character said that an anonymous popular team has considerable commercial value, and regardless of what collaborations are made, as soon as these imposters make a deal with their victims, they will be able to appropriate all sorts of privileges. Looking at the game interface not far from the disappearing monster, he said that it was the last one. The main character offered to distribute the rewards for passing and prepare for the next dungeon. The dialogue box says, The Annoying Mountain Ape Completed. Congratulations on setting the Insanity Difficulties new record. 24 minutes 35 seconds. Dungeon Lobby. Ruko excitedly shouted about them going to the next dungeon. Tilly said that the next dungeon would be much easier and suggested that we go straight there. Ling Si, standing next to the huge crystal, said to wait and hand in the dungeon quest first. Noticing the cry of people running, Ling Si and Ruko turned around. A few people appeared next to them, looking like the main character's team, but worse. Ruko said in surprise that they are slightly similar to them, and their team composition is identical to that of their team. The main character frowned, and the person said that he didn't expect that right after they chased away a bunch of imposters, another one would appear. Ruko asked in surprise about it being another team with an identical team lineup. In front of them was a thief who looked like Ling Si, a battle mage wearing the same clothes as Tilly's, a sniper archer with a sniper rifle on his back, and a warrior with the same shield as Ruko. The shield warrior said that today the real shadow would teach them, the imposters, a lesson. In front of the protagonist's team was a team of imposters, a beastman with white hair who looked like Ling Si, a guy with gray hair wearing glasses wearing red clothes like Tilly's, a plump guy with a rifle on his back, and a big guy with thick eyebrows with a shield like Ruko. The white-haired guy told them that right before they came, they chased away another team that pretended to be them, Shadow. He said he knew they were famous, but it was too much to pretend to be. Ling Si looked at them with a serious face. A person in the crowd asked if it was just another bunch of imposter Shadow team that had just arrived. He said they had the same equipment. Another person said that Shadow has been noticeably prominent lately, and because they've been hiding their information all along, many people have started pretending to be them. The white-haired guy was looking at Team Ling Si with an evil grin. A person in the crowd said that recently, this team, whose leader is a beastman thief, suddenly appeared and claimed that they were the real Shadow and even started attacking many imposters. Another person exclaimed that he had seen all the fights of the thief beastman team and whenever they saw someone who said they were Shadow, they would just attack them. He said that now many people have recognized them as the real Shadow. The white-haired guy said that judging by their specialties and equipment, there was nothing else to discuss here. 
He shouted that they were imposters. The Ling C team looked back at them calmly. The guy, nervous, asked them that, judging by how pale they were, they must be very scared of being exposed. He thought that the four of them were holding their faces well, and they were happy. He wondered if they really thought they were real. He thought that they should also practice their facial expressions when they got back. Ling Si exhaled. Turning around, he called for his team to leave, because they didn't need to waste their time on this small matter. A guy with white hair pointed at the main character and shouted at him. Tilly's, with an exasperated grin, said it was the first time she had ever seen someone pretending to be her. Dark Feather was shaking beside her. Tilly's glanced at him. Thinking of the smug grin of the fat guy pretending to be Dark Feather, Dark Feather furiously asked why such a pig was pretending to be him. A gun appeared in his hand. The protagonist awkwardly called out to them and told them that there was no need for them to attract unnecessary attention. The guy with the white hair asked what they were whispering about. He asked them that not only did they not agree to leave quietly, but they were also provoking them. The guy thought that since they were doing the same thing, then their acting skills should be better because they were people who specialized in beating up imposters. The main character asked them about what they say they are shadow. The guy asked if he was blind, if there was any need to ask, and if there was anyone here who didn't know them. He said he would beat them up, the imposters. Ling Si asked, if so, how was he going to defeat them, the fakes? The guy replied that the rules are the same as usual, one against one between two teams. He said that if they were real shadow, they must have some skills. He said that they had never been defeated by a fake team like them before. Ling Si agreed with a smile. The guy with the white hair wondered why they were so cooperative. The guy with the blonde hair suggested that they start if they agreed. Standing in front of Ling Si, he said with a smirk that the strongest one would win and the winner of their duel would be the side with the most wins in three rounds. The guy asked who they would send to fight in the first round. Ruko volunteered first. The blonde-haired guy looked at Ruko in surprise. Ruko said that it should be a duel between the owners of the same specialty and only so it will be interesting. The guy with the blonde hair said that then let it be a duel between the same specialties. Drawing a stick on the ground, he said that the rules were simple and they could only fight inside this circle and the winner would be decided in five minutes. He said that if he was pushed out of the circle, it would be considered a defeat. The guy asked if they were happy with it. Ruko replied that it wasn't a problem and he was going after it. Leng Si said that he wouldn't demand anything and all he had to do was beat up this guy. Dark Feather told him to kill him. Ruko agreed and said that he would transform and flatten it. The main character said that he was forbidden to transform. He thought that Ruko's dueling skills were quite serious and if he transformed, then there was no question of any competition because his appearance after the transformation attracted too much attention. Ruko said in frustration that it wasn't interesting. The guy with the shield shouted to him that the match was starting. The dark-haired guy started announcing the match by raising his hand in the air. On the head of a guy with blonde hair, you can see that he has level 12. With a smirk, he asked Ruko, even though it's a duel, to let him give him some advice. The dark-haired guy pointed his hand forward and announced the start of the duel. Above Ruko's head, you can see that he is level 11. With a smirk, he told the opponent to attack him because he had become much stronger than he was before. The guy told him to wait. Ruko's eyes widened in surprise. The guy, blushing and smiling, said that they should first shake hands as a sign of respect for each other. He held out his hand. Ruko hesitantly agreed and said that this is the first time he sees a person who wants to shake hands before a duel. Grabbing Ruko's hand, the guy said that such an etiquette is still necessary. His face twisted into a wicked smile. Using shield bash, the guy swung the shield with an evil smile. He hit Ruko with his shield, and he flew backwards. Tilly scowled and swore at the boy. Ruko gritted his teeth as he landed and said that he cheated on him. He frowned, a vein bulging on his face, and said it was interesting. The guy told him that he lost because he was out of the circle. Ruko was surprised to see that he was standing outside the circle. He called out to him that he said he wanted to shake hands to wait for him not to expect a punch. Grinning maliciously, the guy said that, as expected from a fake, he doesn't use his head at all. He said that all means are good in war. The guy said he was the winner of the first dream, and rules are rules. He asked if he was going to deny his defeat in front of such a crowd of spectators. Ruko cursed. Ling Si watched with a frown. Tilly's, standing next to Ruko, told him to forget about it. She said she'd go next. A staff appeared in her hand, and she said to move on to the next match. She told their battle maids to come forward. Ruko, looking at her from behind, told her to avenge him and beat him beyond recognition. Dark Feather clicked his tongue and said that she was one step faster than him. A guy in the crowd asked why this battle mage girl looked so familiar. A guy with gray hair, adjusting his glasses, said he was coming. He said that he did not expect that his opponent would be a girl and promised that he would spare her. 
He raised his eyebrows. Tilly's asked for mercy while standing in front of him. Frowning, she told him to keep the word. A guy in the crowd exclaimed in surprise, asking about the fact that it was Tilly's from the arena. Another person replied that he also thought he was imagining it at first, but it was really Tilly's. The girl said she thought she would never join a team. The guy replied that he had even heard rumors that she was a member of the big workshop, but he wasn't sure if that was true or not. He urged her to enjoy the show first and said that he had heard that she was fighting Shadow, a team that has been very popular lately. Ling Si thought that they still attracted a crowd in the end. He thought that this incident with the imposters was a good cover for their identities. The Tilly's staff was shrouded in yellow energy. The guy with the gray hair asked her why she was so angry. With a smirk, he told her not to be so serious. He offered to treat her to desserts at the new dessert shop on Commercial Street after all this. Tilly's frowned at him. The guy gritted his teeth in exasperation and wondered if she really considered herself real. He thought that he had already given her a chance to save himself from disgrace, but now he would beat her until she begged for mercy. His staff was shrouded in pink energy. They were facing each other, and the man announced the start of the duel. The guy told her not to blame him for holding back. Chuckling, he said that he didn't want to hit the woman either. Grinning, he told her to try not to be too surprised by his skills since he was a shadow member after all. Using the thorn lock, he called out to her to feel his passionate, spiked embrace. Thorny vines emerged from the ground. They headed towards Tilly's. She stood motionless as the vines surrounded her. The guy said that now she is surrounded by his spikes and will not be able to move. Tilly stood quietly among the surrounding vines. Frowning, she looked ahead. Ruko asked in surprise why she allowed herself to be enveloped and if she would be okay. Ling Si told him not to worry and asked if he thought he was the kind of person who would calmly allow himself to be beaten up. Grinning, he thought that, compared to the time when he fought Tilly's, she had become much stronger. He thought that instead of attacking the opponent head-on like before, he had learned to observe his opponent's attacks. He thought she was going to let this jerk be cocky for a few more seconds. The bespectacled guy grinned smugly. He shouted at her to just give up. A man in the crowd asked if the fight was over. Another person asked why it was so weak and if it was Tilly's. Tilly's was completely surrounded by vines. A person in the crowd said he was saying that Tilly's couldn't suddenly just join a team with other people and they just look alike. A man in the crowd shouted that smoke was coming from the top of the vines. Smoke drifted between the vines. A burst of yellow energy scattered the vines, tearing them apart. The bespectacled guy opened his mouth in surprise. A stream of yellow energy in the shape of a snake's mouth shot out from the vines. The dialogue box informed the guy that his skill has been broken. Snake walked towards the bespectacled guy. Covering his face with his hands, he asked fearfully how this was possible. Raising a cloud of dust, the yellow energy hit the guy and he screamed. Above his head, it could be seen that he had just over half of his health left. Tilly said that a person once told her that a battle mage is still a mage. Looking at the opponent with a frown, she asked if he had forgotten about the strengths and weaknesses between the different magic elements. A guy in the crowd exclaimed in surprise that the tree was vulnerable to fire, and this girl used this elemental weakness and instantly freed herself from the opponent's skill. Another guy exclaimed that her attack was smooth and clean. Tilly's dealt the guy a lot of blows with her staff. His glasses shattered, and it could be seen above his head that he had very little health left. The guy fell to the ground behind Tilly's. Frowning and gritting his teeth, he thought that he was too careless and he didn't think that she would have such a reception. He thought that he had made a fool of himself this time. As he rose to his feet, he thought that he needed to restore his honor with the next attack. The guy leapt to attack Tilly's, swinging his staff. Tilly's calmly looked back. She jumped out of the way of the guy's attack and he hit the ground. Frowning, he thought that he couldn't keep up with her speed without his glasses. A guy with white hair asked why he was spacing out. He shouted that she is above him. Tilly's used the fiery dance rising phoenix over the guy, and yellow energy shot out from five directions away from her, forming the silhouette of a phoenix. She hit the guy with yellow energy, and there was an explosion. The dialogue box reported that the winner had been determined and the duel was over. A person in the crowd shouted that she was really Tilly's from the arena because fire attacks are her specialty. He said that although she had withheld her information, they were too much alike. Another person admired how cool this girl was. Tilly said it was time for the next match. She told the guys it was their turn. Ling Si said that while it was cool, it wasn't too showy for the last attack. Ruko exclaimed that it was very cool, especially the last attack. Dark Feather said, GG, Tilly said that she didn't care and now the score is 1-1 and there is only one last match left. She told them they'd better not lose it. The white-haired guy thought in fright that he didn't expect them to be such strong opponents, and they only had one match left to decide who would be the winner. A fat guy was helping a guy in red clothes leave. A man in the crowd asked if they were also imposters. Another person said that they thought they were real, but after such tricks and the level of abilities, they don't seem like they are real. He offered to watch the last match before deciding. 
The white-haired guy thought that he was the only one who could take part in the last match, because he couldn't just leave it to the fat guy they randomly picked up to fill the role of an archer with a firearm. Gritting his teeth, he thought that he should end this match as soon as possible and get out of here, and if he won it, they could still regain their identity. He thought that if they dragged this out any longer, everyone would only be more suspicious of them. Stepping forward, he said it was interesting, and he didn't expect them to take advantage of their teammates' carelessness and win the match. With a chuckle, he said that the score was now even, and they had the last match left. Pointing forward with his finger, he shouted to the main character that he was talking to him. Pointing his finger at him, he called him a thief who was afraid to speak all this time. He shouted for him to come here. Ling Si calmly stared back at him. A man in the crowd asked someone if he was sure. He said he was sure. Jay Run bounced up and down behind the crowd. Long Face said that he heard that the popular group Shadow is fighting imposters here right now. Jay Run said he saw a video that a friend of his sent to him. A man in the crowd shouted stop pushing. Jay Run called out with a smile that the thief over there is lingering. The main character stood with his hands in his pants pockets. Xiao Lan, looking through the crowd, asked if it was really Ling Si. She exclaimed that they hadn't seen each other for a long time, and she wondered if he remembered her. Anti-mainstream asked with a bitter grin how such a godlike person could remember them. Xiao Lan frowned when the white-haired guy told Ling Si that he had been following him closely, and he was the first one who wanted to leave when they challenged them. He said that the fact that they dare to pretend to be them, Shadow, when they don't even have skills, is just ridiculous. With a malicious grin, the guy told him not to worry, because it's just an immediate solo, and even if he died in battle, he would immediately be reborn. He thought that if he had the skills, he wouldn't be afraid to fight them, and he was probably the weakest in their team. He decided that he would win the last match with style and not fail the mission that Workshop gave him. Ling Si and the imposter stood opposite each other. A voice announced the start of the battle. A dagger appeared in the imposter's hand, and he told the protagonist to attack him. Looking at Ling Si standing still, he exclaimed in surprise. A man in the crowd asked if the thief was too scared and why he wasn't moving. The main character stood with his eyes closed. The imposter laughed and asked if he was so scared that he couldn't move. A round object appeared in his hand and he asked if he knew how to play as a thief. Throwing the object on the ground, he shouted with a grin that he would teach it. A cloud of smoke appeared under his feet. Ruko exclaimed in surprise that it was a smoke bomb. The battlefield was hidden in a purple cloud of smoke. Ruko gritted his teeth and said that they wouldn't be able to see anything now, and he wanted to see Ling Si beat up this thief. A guy in the crowd said they couldn't see anything and asked which of the two was stronger. Xiao Lan covered her mouth with her hand, surrounded by smoke. The dark-haired guy said that according to his observations of this group up to this point, they've fought more than a dozen imposters, and this beastman hasn't lost a single match, and he's quite strong. He added that judging from his dagger, he probably plays as a dominant thief, so his attack stats are also high, and compared to other thieves, he has an advantage. Jay Run frowned and wondered if Ling Si could handle it. The guy with the dark hair said it was all idle talk because they couldn't see anything because of the smoke. The imposter stood with a dagger in his hands, surrounded by smoke, and used shadow substitution. Frowning, he thought that by using this 10-second smoke to confuse the opponent, he could use shadow substitution to detect the enemy's location, and then win the fight by using heavy backstab. He thought wryly that this combination had never failed him. The dialog box described shadow substitution, a thief exclusive skill. The user's body can be further hidden in a smoky environment, while being able to sense the location of the enemy in the smoke. Finding that Ling Si didn't budge, he wondered if he was a fool. He decided that he had to give it the final blow before the smoke cleared. The imposter decided to bypass it from the side. Once behind the main character, he wondered if he was still dreaming. Swinging the dagger with a vicious grin, he mentally told him to prepare for death. Ling Si instantly appeared behind the imposter, and he exclaimed in surprise. The dialogue box described great eagle eyes, eyes as sharp as an eagle's. The user can detect all hidden units within a certain range. Awareness is increased for 5 seconds, giving the user a higher chance of seeing through the enemy's moves. The protagonist's eye glowed yellow, and he told the imposter that he knew where it was long before he found it. The guy exclaimed in surprise that it was a fake. Leng Si in front of him started to disappear, and his face turned into the face of an evil spirit. Xiao Lan raised an eyebrow and asked what was going on. Jay Run told her to calm down because the smoke bomb would last about 10 seconds. He looked ahead in surprise. A dialogue box that appeared in front of everyone in the crowd reads, The winner has been decided for the match you are currently spectating. End of duel. Jay Run shouted in surprise that it was fast. He asked who had won. The blonde-haired guy laughed and said it was definitely a win for them. He said that he had never lost using this combination. He continued to laugh as the smoke cleared. Ling Si asked if this was the case. The guy opened one eye. Someone shouted that the smoke was disappearing. He asked in surprise what was going on. 
The imposter was lying on the ground, unconscious, foaming at the mouth. In front of the blonde-haired guy, Ling Si stood with a calm face. The guy asked in surprise how it was possible that they lost. One person in the crowd asked what had happened. Another shouted about how strong he was. Ryuko shouted that the final result was them winning by a score of 2 to 1. The main character told them to go because there were too many people here. He said that they would go to another dungeon. Ryuko agreed. A guy in the crowd exclaimed that that guy only lasted 10 seconds. The main character's group started to leave. Ryuko smilingly told the protagonist that he really wanted to see him beat him. He asked if he had helped avenge him by giving him a good beating. Ling Si replied that he did so. Dark Feather said that he was still angry. J Rub offered to approach him and say hello. Zio Lan with bright eyes agreed and said that they could ask him to help them level up again. Long Face said there was no point in helping them, and they were doing well on their own. A blonde-haired guy was leaning over the unconscious guy, asking what had happened in the smoke. A man in the crowd said that they were also imposters. Another replied that they were shameless and even tried to pretend to be real and fight imposters. Another person asked if this team is now the real shadow. He replied that it was, and they could ask them to help them pass the dungeons. The white-haired guy said that this thief is incredibly strong, and he calculated everything so much that he didn't even see his dagger. He recalled how the main character had given him many quick punches in the face. The guy said that, thus, he was badly beaten, and he could not even hit back. The fat guy said that he had heard that the battle mage from the team was Tilly's, who was famous for fighting in the arena before. He asked if they could be the real shadow. The boys looked at him in surprise. The white-haired guy asked angrily why he had only said this now. He said that he could have saved him from disgrace. The fat guy replied that he had just found out about it. The blonde-haired guy said with a frown that it looked like they would have to inform some people about it. Xiao Lan was smiling as she hurried her companions, urging them to go meet Ling Si. Wolf's Fang headquarters, the guy turned to the vice head of the guild. A guy with dark hair pulled back asked what was wrong. The guy said that out of all the workshops they were affiliated with, they were contacted by one that has something to report. Turning around, he asked what he was talking about. The guy said it was about a strategy for how to deal with the recently popular shadow team. He asked if he remembered. I remembered that the vice head of the guild said that this was a team that was moving up the team leaderboard. The guy said that because they were setting new records like crazy, many of their guild's records were broken. He said that if they left it at that, Team Shadow appearing out of nowhere would jeopardize their position on the team leaderboard. The vice head of the guild thought that, they bribed a few workshops to pretend to be Shadow, to smear their name and put them in a bad light, and then slowly exhaust and destroy them. He thought that there were countless examples of such strategies, and there was nothing strange about it. He told the guy to continue with his report. The guy said that they reported that the battle mage in Shadow is most likely a player named Tilly's. The vice head of the guild replied that knowing her name made everything easier. He said to pass on his instructions. He ordered the thieves who specialize in assassinations to hide their guild information, target this team, and lower them back to level 0. Above the head of the vice guild leader, you can see that his name is Depraved Squirrel, and he is level 15. His fingernails are painted black, he has black earrings in his ears, and bags under his eyes. Nebulous's conference room. Stillwaters said that's what they would do. He ordered the members of the first division to quickly assign the first records of several new dungeons. Coco Lai said she would pass on the order immediately. Stillwaters told her to go and asked what was wrong. He said with a smile that she looked distracted. He asked who made cheerful vice guildmaster Coco Lai look like this. Coco Lai frowned in embarrassment. She asked him if he had forgotten about that bet. Stillwaters, looking at the book, said with a smile that he had made a lot of big and small bets. He asked her which one she was talking about. She shouted that she was talking about the bet he made with Lang Si and told him to enter the top 10 in team leaderboard within a month. Stillwaters said he remembered. He looked at her and asked her what was wrong with him. He said it had been a few days since then. Coco Lai leaned her hands on the table and said that the name of their team was Shadow. She said that they are that four-person team that suddenly appeared in team leaderboard, Shadow. She said she'd already confirmed it with Tiana. Coco Lai said that she followed them closely, and Shadow became quite popular, and there are a lot of posts about them on the forum. Frowning, she said that this guy was quite arrogant, and she didn't like him very much when they met, but it seems that he really has skills. Adjusting their glasses, Stillwaters asked what their score was right now. Coco Lai replied that the result of the first week has not yet been calculated, but the records they set are quite amazing. She said that she would send him the dungeon records that they had recently completed. Looking at the dialogue box, Stillwaters said he was an impressive guy. He said that it seems like his understanding of Heavenland must be incredible to achieve such results. Frowning, he said that they had subconsciously compromised the privileges of some people with important names. Coco Lai asked in surprise if he meant that some guilds would start hunting down Ling Si and his friends. Stillwaters said that a hike naturally attracts wind. She said that then they should send someone to protect them. 
He said they didn't need to do anything. Coco Lai raised an eyebrow in surprise and said that no matter what, he was still a member of the Nebulous Guild. She added that they couldn't miss out on a guild member with such skills. Stirring the tea with a spoon, Stillwaters said that it was precisely because it exceeded his expectations that he wanted to see how far Ling Si could go alone. He raised his cup of tea with a smile. Xiao Lan called out to the main character. Turning around, he said that he didn't expect to see them here. Xiao Lan exclaimed with glittering eyes that it must be fate. Ling Si indifferently asked if they were able to raise their level. She said that without it, the level up became very slow. Jay Run exclaimed that, as expected, he is a member of Team Shadow. The protagonist worriedly told him not to shout so loudly. Jay Run said that when he saw the dungeon completion record set by Shadow on the forum, he even thought that it was fake. He said that now that he knows it was his team, he's sure it's true. Ling Si told him that it wasn't as incredible as he thought, and they just used special strategies, and his teammates are very impressive. He said that without them, he couldn't have done it alone. Xiao Lan's eyes sparkled behind him. She said with a grin that, as before, he was very humble. Blushing, Xiao Lan asked him why he removed them from his friend list right after they split up. Exhaling, the main character replied that it was his fault and this is his habit. She asked if he could help them level up. She said that they've been slowly leveling up lately and there's no way they can pass the Fishman's Tide dungeon. Leng Si replied that they hadn't changed at all either. Long Face said irritably that he was trying his best to find a guide for this dungeon. The main character asked if they were stuck on the last underwater battle due to lack of oxygen. Xiao Lan asked how he knew. Leng Si said that the most difficult part of the dungeon is its last one full, and they can first go to the fisherman village, where there will be a hidden shop selling branchia grass. He said he would send them his location. Jay Run admiringly asked the main character if he knew everything. Long Face was exasperatedly silent. The main character started giving recommendations for combat strategy, but Long Face interrupted him. Gritting his teeth, he thanked him for the hints and told him that they didn't need the rest and would figure it out on their own. Xiao Lan told him that it would be much easier for them if they knew Ling Si's strategy. Long Face turned around and said that he had already helped them a lot and they couldn't force him to help them with everything. Getting angry, he called them to go and told Xiao Lan that even that clue was enough. She asked irritably why he was scolding her. She demanded that he say something. Anti-mainstream put his hand on the main character's shoulder and said that they would meet again next time. Jay Run asked with a frustrated face about how it was rare for them to get a chance to meet Ling Si and they were leaving so quickly. Wong Face shouted at him to stop complaining and start walking. He said that if they were late, the hidden shop would close. The main character looked after them with a smile. Xiao Lan told him that they were leaving. She shouted at Long Face to slow down. Jay Run waved and shouted to the main character that they would meet next time and he would try his best while playing as a thief. He added that Ling Si will always be the strongest. Looking after them, the protagonist thought of the words about the strongest. Frowning, he thought that this wasn't the case, and he was still far from the title of the strongest. He placed three silver coins on the table and thought that he was still no match for that person. He remembered Dark Lion's face. Ling Si thought that he was running out of time and needed to speed up and reach level 15 as soon as possible to become an awakened one. Waving his hand, he thought that this would be a new beginning. It was getting dark all over the stone houses, and the main character thought that this was also the only way to solve the problem with the old man's debt of one and a half million. A week later, the shadow team, under the close attention of countless people, for the first time got into the top 20 in the team leaderboard. The main character and his team were standing in front of the portal. The leaderboard's top 20 has always been occupied by prominent figures from either workshops or big guilds. This has once again attracted the attention and alarm of big workshops and guilds and even created a new wave of competition for the positions on the leaderboard. Two weeks later, the shadow team took the 15th place and this became a well-known topic for discussion. In addition, as no one stepped out to confirm Shadow's identity, it gave Shadow a sense of mystery. In an instant, the topic about whether Shadow is able to enter the team leaderboard's top 10 became a hot topic of discussion among players and on the forum. After its third week, Shadow met expectations and broke into the top 10 on leaderboard. With short dungeon clear times, Shadow set new records everywhere with the experience Ling has from his previous life. The big guilds were utterly helpless against this team that appeared out of nowhere. System prompt, total score of the team, 16,058. This has ignited the flames of the players' expectations even more and Shadow has even become the mysterious idols of some players. However, as the four continued to strive for the top, the hidden danger that was waiting for them finally appeared. A dagger appeared in the protagonist's hand, and he said what he told them. Putting himself in a fighting stance, he said that they had taken a share from other people, so it was unavoidable. Ruko frowned and said that it looked like it was a big guild and they came prepared. He said that they had absolutely no fighting morale. The protagonist's team was surrounded by people in white hoods. The guy said they finally found Shadow. 
He said to report it to the superiors and prepare for an attack. The other person took the order. Tilly's frowned and said that she was getting bored of going through the dungeons lately and was glad that she was finally able to move around. She thought that there were quite a few of them, and she would call for backup if the situation got worse. Darkfeather frowned and said GG. Ling Si thought that there were approximately 20 thieves here, most of them level 10. He whispered to his team not to waste too much time here, and they needed to finish this quickly. People in white hoods were standing around Shadow. The dark-haired guy frowned, thinking that they were dark horses that had recently appeared. He thought that they hadn't left a trace before, but they were finally able to catch them here. He thought that even their boss, Squirrel, had told them to be extra careful. A week ago, Squirrel clasped his hands behind his back and said that it looked like these four from Shadow were really skilled. He said that not only did they manage to avoid many of their traps, but they didn't let anything stop them from setting new records in the dungeons. Squirrel said that he also said to return them to level zero. Chuckling, he said that it looked like he had greatly underestimated them. The guy in the white hood folded his hands and apologized for the fact that they were useless. He said they would increase the scale of their traps. Squirrel replied that it wasn't related to how useless they were, they were just stronger than them. He said that even if they did meet them, they wouldn't be able to do anything to them. The boy looked at him. Squirrel told him if they found them, stall for time as long as possible. He said he would like to meet them in person. The guy thought that since Squirrel has already put it that way, they should just stall for time. He shouted for everyone to split up into teams of five and one team each. He told them to stall for as long as they could. The white hooded men jumped in to attack the protagonist's team. The guy gave the order to attack. Lang Si said that they would fight separately. Ruko agreed. The assassins fired the crossbows on their sleeves. Ruko covered himself with the shield and the arrows flew off the shield. Ruko, wrapped in yellow energy, shouted that it was useless. The guy in the white hood stared in surprise at the huge fur-covered fist approaching him. Ruko's punch sent the boy flying to the side. He slammed his huge hand on the ground, knocking the opponents away. The guy in the white hood asked in surprise how it got bigger. Ruko with a smirk told them to taste the pure power. Ruko behind Tilly's lifted the thief he was holding in his hand into the air. Tilly struck the ground with her staff. Yellow energy appeared under the staff. She used flaming snake's dragon lock, and the opponents were surrounded by flames in the shape of a snake. The guy in the white hood shouted that it was a fiery crowd control skill. Tilly said that should be enough to deal with them. Frowning, she told me to play with her for a while. The shot went through the leg of a running guy in a white hood. System prompt, cripple, a certain part of the body has been subjected to a destructive attack, causing the temporary loss of that part's ability to move. The beast-eared guy shouted to the guy who was wincing in pain, telling him not to let the distance between them grow, because it would be an advantage for his firearm. Darkfeather fired his sniper rifle. The guy with the animal ears exclaimed in surprise. The shots hit everyone standing around him in the head. Darkfeather said that the rest is just him. The boy looked in his direction, startled. The shot hit him in the head. Darkfeather said, GG. The guy shouted to the team leader that these people were much more difficult than they expected and their methods of fighting were too unfamiliar. He screamed in pain. Their team leader gritted his teeth as he thought that these four from Shadow were much stronger than they thought, and they were no match for them at all. He thought that if he had known, he wouldn't have accepted this mission. He thought that all the strong thieves in the guild didn't want to accept this thankless task. He wondered if he was too inexperienced. He thought that these thieves most likely knew from the very beginning that Shadow was very strong, and so gave up on the quest. Ruko was grinning and Tilly's was standing there with a serious expression on her face. The guy thought that these people had hidden their real equipment and levels, and they were really unfathomable, especially this thief. Darkfeather stared ahead, frowning. Ling Si ran forward, swinging his dagger. The guy thought that he managed to crush four of their guys in just a few moves, and he couldn't even see what techniques he was using. Gritting his teeth in fright, he thought that if he hadn't taken the opportunity to quickly escape, he would have been finished. The voice from behind said a little that he was wondering why he was missing one person. Ling Si behind him said with a smirk that hiding was not nice of him. The boy gave a startled cry. Swinging the dagger, the protagonist told him to keep his team company underground. The boy squeezed his eyes shut as the dagger approached him. The black bladed dagger stopped the protagonist's dagger. Squirrel told the main character, who was looking at him in surprise, that it was cruel. The main character thought that he was very fast, and even he didn't notice when he appeared here. Squirrel asked if they were Shadow. The guy behind him said he was finally here. Darkfeather fired his revolver. In Squirrel's other hand, another dagger appeared. The main character was surprised to see that he was fighting with two daggers. Squirrel blocked the shot with a dagger and asked why they were so impatient. Darkfeather stood with his two revolvers held out in front of him. Ling Si asked Squirrel if it was true that he was depraved Squirrel, Vice Guildmaster of the Wolf Fang Guild. Ruko repeated the words about Vice Guildmaster with a frown. Frowning, Ling Si said that judging from the fact that he can dual wield, he has successfully awakened. 
Squirrel said he was pretty experienced. He said that he was truly an awakened one. Wrapped in blue electricity, he asked with a smirk if he had fought the awakened one before. Squirrel looked at the main character with a smirk. Tilly's asked in surprise that he was an awakened one. Dark Feather stared at him intently in silence. Ruko exclaimed with a smirk that he didn't care if he was awakened or not. He said he was the enemy. Rushing forward, shield in hand, he asked what was the point of listening to his ramblings. Ruko said he would go first. Ling Si ran after him with his hand out and shouted at him to take your time, because this guy is not an ordinary opponent. Ruko increased by saying that he knows and it's just a job change. He told the protagonist that they had already reached the 15th level, and if they worked together, they wouldn't lose. The main character is gritting his teeth. I wondered if he still knew what Awaken meant. He thought that they were on a completely different level from normal players, especially since they still hadn't changed their professions. Ling Si ran forward and shouted that he would go after Ruko. He told Tilly's and Dark Feather that he would count on their support. Dark Feather agreed and said that it looks like Ruko doesn't really know. Tilly's agreed. The main character thought hard that although Squirrel wasn't as strong as Dynamic Darkness, he was one of the top 10 thieves in his previous life. He thought that they should escape from this battle as soon as possible, and as long as they were still red-listed, they couldn't deal with him. Ruko swung a huge fist and said that they should meet stronger players to become stronger, and these guys were not even worth mentioning. Squirrel stood still and unperturbed as the fist approached him. Ruko used Mountain Cleave, kicking up a cloud of dust with a strong blow to the ground. Ling Si shouted to him that they were red-listed and they should retreat as soon as possible. Squirrel, who dodged Ruko's attack, said that the saying all brawl and no brain was created specifically for people like him. He leaped up past Ruko, swinging his dagger. The main character looked at what was happening in surprise. Squirrel used Tiger Subduing Dragon Clamp Act 1, approaching the main character, and swung his dagger. The dialog box described Tiger Subduing Dragon Clamp Act 1, an awakened skill. When faced with many attackers, this skill can effectively counterattack. The extent of the counterattack is based on the number of attackers. Ruko, wrapped in blue energy, gritted his teeth and thought that he was too fast and even faster than Ling Si. The dialogue box says, You have been restricted, you are now unable to move before the opponent makes a move. Squirrel said that those who kill an overworld will definitely be red-listed, and the red-listed status of Ling Si is rather glaring. The main character looked in surprise at the approaching Squirrel. Squirrel asked what he thought of killing him and stripping him of his gear. The main character thought that he could kill him before he used any skill, and this is the gap between awakened players and normal players. He frowned. Squirrel said that he heard that he is the strongest in Shadow, but in reality, he is just a thief who can't even hold his dagger tightly. Tilly's used Flame Dance Flight of the Phoenix, and a stream of fire in the shape of a bird headed towards Squirrel. Squirrel dodged and used Tiger Subduing Dragon Clamp Act 2. Ruko gritted his teeth and found an explosion above his head. Tilly's, surrounded by flames, looked ahead with a frown. Squirrel, jumping to the side, noted that a female battle mage is a rarity. He saw a bullet coming toward his face. The shot hit him in the head. Dark Feather stood amidst the scattering dust with a sniper rifle in his hands. Looking through the scope, he said GG. Ruko praised him with a smirk. Ling Si turned around tensely. He shouted to Dark Feather about being behind them. Squirrel, wrapped in blue electricity, stood behind Dark Feather. Dark Feather thought it was a clone. The blue energy in the shape of a squirrel was disappearing on the tree branch. Squirrel said with a grin that shooters with firearms are also rare. He said that he would be useless in a short-range battle. Turning around, Dark Feather noticed that he was very close and thought about how terrifying his speed was. Squirrel held a dagger to his throat and said that he hated characters who attacked from the dark like him the most. The main character jumped in their direction. Kicking Squirrel, he shouted for Dark Feather to run. Squirrel, with an evil grin, asked the main character if he was trying to be a hero. He said that in that case, he would die first. Lang Si noticed the approaching dagger. Gritting his teeth, he ducked and dodged the blow. Squirrel was surprised to notice that it was top time. He kicked him in the stomach. Ling Si and Squirrel were facing each other in battle stances. Squirrel, touching the cut on his cheek with his finger, thought that it wasn't surprising that he could bulldoze ordinary players. A round purple object appeared in the protagonist's hand, and he suggested splitting up and retreating. A purple cloud of smoke enveloped them. Squirrel, looking up into a cloud of smoke, said they had escaped. A voice called out to him. Squirrel, noticing the people in white hoods, asked them that they were reborn. The guy told him that they ran away from the graveyard right after they were reborn. Another guy asked where they were. Squirrel replied that they had escaped and there was no need to pursue them. He said to let them escape because they are ordinary players who haven't even changed their profession. He said that he thought they were some high-level awakened players. Nebulous 3rd Division Captain Meeting Room Tiana, noticing the message from Ling Si, thought it was rare. On the dialogue box, there was a message from the main character asking Tiana to help him tell the guild head that he had done what he asked. 
Shadow could have tried to take the first place, but there were unforeseen circumstances, so they will stop there, because all the members of the Shadow team have more important things to do right now. The main character wrote that this is a change of profession. Tiana's mouth dropped open. Frowning, Ling Si stood near the tree, looking at the dialogue box and thinking about the awakened ones. Gritting his teeth, he mentally told Squirrel to wait for him. The sun shone on the roofs of buildings in a dark city alley. The old man told Ling Si that he still had a good appetite today. He said it was good because he was still growing and he needed to eat more to be stronger. Ling Si, putting the chopsticks in his mouth, said that it was because it wasn't an exaggeration to say that what he was going to do would determine his entire future so he wanted to be in the best shape possible. He frowned as he held a bowl of rice in his hand. The old man asked what the important matter was and if there was anything he could do to help him. The main character replied that there was no need and everything was fine. Smiling, he said that it was something he should do on his own. Entering the game, the main character thought that the most important moment in his life had finally arrived and today the change of profession would begin. He frowned. Ling Si raised an eyebrow in surprise. Seeing the crowd of people in front of him, he thought in frustration that it looked like he had underestimated the level up speed of players in Heavenland. Job change lobby. The main character found himself in a brightly lit building with stained glass windows. He thought that so many people had already come to get their job change assignment. A person in the crowd said that he hoped that everything would go smoothly so that he could get an easy mission and successfully change professions to successfully become an awakened one. Another person asked in surprise that there are different levels of difficulty for the job change task. The guy with the elf ears said that he had heard about it from a friend who had already completed it. He said that each profession has three missions of varying difficulty, A, B, and C, and the goals and requirements of each mission are different. He added that, in order to ensure fairness, the goal of each mission will adjust to the player's attributes and characteristics to prevent players from preparing for the task in advance. The main character listened to their conversation in silence. Closing his eyes, he thought that now that he thought about it, he still remembered the feeling of despair from his previous life. He thought about how in his previous life, even though he was able to complete the profession change mission, he was unable to awaken because after the profession change task, his chance of awakening was 12%. Ling Si recalled how he was standing in a crowd of people in the rain with a gloomy face. He thought that overall performance is only a small fraction of what determines a player's chance of awakening, and it still depends heavily on the level of completing the profession change task. The main character thought that in his previous life, he had encountered difficulties during the task of changing professions, which made his chance of awakening extremely low. Ling Si raised one eyebrow. He wondered if this was all arranged by fate, or if fate was just playing with him. He thought that in his previous life, he had gotten the Thief's Sea mission, where he had to fight a version of himself with doubled stats. He remembered standing in front of his clone appearing in front of him. The main character thought that Ling Si, who was created by artificial intelligence, not only knew all his data, but also knew exactly his attack and defense rates, and even though there was such a big advantage over him, his copy also had twice the characteristics. He recalled his battle with his copy. Ling Si thought that even though he had persevered until the time was up and barely completed the task, the chance of awakening was extremely small, and with an extremely low chance of awakening of 12%, he was unable to awaken. He thought that he had heard that other players who received quests he only needed to fight the dungeon boss, and the boss attributes were changed to match the player's attributes. After that, he went to the forum to ask about it, but no one got a task where they had to fight themselves, and his luck in the past life was just terrible. The main character thought that in this life such a task should not appear, if only because its characteristics are completely different. He thought that no matter what task he received this time, he had absolute confidence that he would be able to pass it. He decided that he should get an excellent chance of awakening and becoming an awakened one. Frowning, he thought that he wouldn't allow any failure in this life. The blonde-haired girl standing next to the chair said with a smile that she was worried. The guy downstairs told her that she could handle it and everything would go well. The girl sat down on a chair. The chair's wooden arms wrapped around the surprised girl. On the back of the chair was an old man's face that greeted the human archer. The chair closed its eyes, thought for a moment, and said it understood. Glancing at the girl, he said that she was an archer who was good at position herself, and according to her stats and performance in the past, as expected, Mission B was most suitable for her. The chair let go of the girl who was sitting surrounded by red squares. The guy shouted that she could handle it, and he would wait for her outside. He said she should be able to handle it. After a burp, the chair called the next one. Ling Si thought that every time he sees this scene, it seems strange to him. The main character went up to the hill. He sat down on a chair, and the chair wrapped its arms around him. The chair, saying that it was a human thief, thought about it. He said that he was a great all-rounder, and according to his stats and performance in the past, as expected, he was best suited to task a Ling Si smiled nervously and thought that he got mission A, which is to explore the map. 
he thought that he was incredibly lucky and he is confident that he can get a great result and even a better record. A golden insignia appeared on his clothes. Noticing this, the chair exclaimed wait. The main character turned his head in surprise. The chair said that this is the first time he has encountered such a situation and it is very strange. Lings he asked what was wrong. The chair frowned and said that he had the same aura as them. The main character started to disappear and wondered what that meant. He was surprised to think that he had never heard of anything like this before. He asked me what was going on. The chair said, task as the main character began to fall through the multicolored space. The chair was empty again, and the guy asked if he had imagined it and why it was colored. He asked if all portals were white. He worriedly asked what had just happened and why the stone throne had announced two different missions. He asked what it was at the end and does this game have an S task. He asked if time shouldn't be just A, B or C. Another person said that he probably heard it wrong, and this is mission A, and mission S does not exist. It was raining. Raindrops hit the wet pavement. The main character was walking down a city street in the rain. A dialogue box greeted him on the job change task for thieves. Ling Xi stood with his hands in his pants pockets. Looking up, he thought of this place. The dialogue box says that he was given task as the main character, swearing at fate, wondered if she was deliberately making things difficult for him and why she was making fun of him so much. Several copies of Ling Xi appeared in the rain, and he wondered if she wanted to plunge him into despair in this life as well. There were three copies of Ling Xi in front of the protagonist, and he was surprised to think that there were three of them this time. The dialogue box says, Mission Objective, Defeat Your Mirror Selves. Mission Description, The Mirror Selves attributes are double of yours. Defeat them. Mission Time, Unlimited. In a previous life, Ling Xi. It was raining over the city. The main character is standing in an alley, breathing heavily, gritting his teeth. He wondered why such a mission existed. He thought that he had found out so much about it, but he had never heard of such a mission. Frowning, the protagonist thought that he couldn't fail it, and if he wanted to change his life, he had to become an awakened one. Looking up tensely, he thought that he couldn't fail it. Peeking around the corner, he thought that his copy's attributes were twice as high as him, and he couldn't fight it directly. He decided to keep circling it and stall for time until it was over. A copy of Ling Xi appeared behind him. It leaped at him, swinging its dagger. The replica hit the ground hard. The main character, falling to the ground, looked at his copy in fright. The copy stood with a dagger in his hand in a combat stance. With a startled frown, Ling Xi thought this was crazy. The protagonist in the present tense frowned as he thought about why he had to remember his shameful past right now. He told himself not to get stuck in his head and calm down. He thought that this life was different. The main character was standing in front of his three spears. The dialogue box says, there are 10 seconds left before the mission starts. Each of the participants is prohibited from using skills during the mission. The main character, crouching down, thought that in the previous life it was a battle of foundation techniques, and this time the task has no time limit, and the strategy with delaying time will not work. After jumping up, Ling Xi thought that he would leave this place first to avoid the three of them attacking him later. Looking at his faceless coppers, he thought that he needed to think things through well, he had plenty of time to think, and he needed to calm down. The Ling Xi replica's eye glowed red. The dialogue box says that the job change task has started. It wished me luck. Copies of the main character instantly took off. Ling Xi, looking at them from the window, thought that there were three copies against him this time, and they would surely split up to quickly find him. Frowning, he thought that this meant that once they found him, he had a short period of time in which to fight them one on one, and if the fight dragged on until the other two arrived, he would definitely die, and he couldn't relax. He thought that as soon as a player dies during a profession change task, it ends. The main character thought that three of his copies had doubled his stats, and he was trying to raise his stats as much as possible in this life. He thought he could safely say that, within the same rank, as long as they're a thief, he wouldn't lose to anyone. He thought that whether it was attacking, defending, or even habitual actions, such copies could be called flawless. The main character thought about what to do. Looking out the window, he thought that if he wanted to increase his chance of awakening, he should get as high a completion rate as possible. He thought about how he could increase his completion rate. He tensed as a copy of himself with a glowing red eye appeared behind him. A copy of Ling Xi pulled the main character out of the window by grabbing his arm, breaking the glass. Gritting his teeth, the protagonist thought that they had attacked him from outside. The main character swung his leg in front of his copy. With two jumps, he climbed to the roof of the building, and the replica jumped after him. Gritting his teeth in fright, the protagonist blocked the attack of his copy. Lang Si jumped to the side, and his copy jumped onto the roof, standing in front of him. Frowning, he thought that if he had thought for a moment longer than just now, he probably would have been stabbed in the heart by now. He thought that their speed was terrifying, and his doubled attributes were terrifying. The main character ordered himself to calm down, because this is him. 
The copy of Ling Si was looking at him with its head tilted with a glowing red eye. Ling Si ordered himself to think about what he would do. His copy interrupted his thoughts, charging in with glowing red eyes. The copy hit him with an elbow, and Ling Si dodged, jumping to the edge of the building. Gritting his teeth, he thought that he was too fast and attacked him before he could even finish his thought. The main character thought that the fact that he can't use his skills is already putting him at great disadvantage, and using only foundation techniques to defeat his copies that have doubled his stats, he has no chance. The copy leapt towards Ling Si, swinging its dagger. The main character thought it was really unreasonable. Falling from the roof, the main character hit the ground hard, raising a cloud of dust. He stands in the clearing cloud of dust, covered in wounds. Frowning, he thought that he didn't have a second to rest. The copy of Ling Si rushed towards the main character. The copy struck several times with the dagger. A dialogue box informed the main character that he was affected with defense break. Ling Si was running away from his copy that was chasing after him, jumping away from buildings. The replica was right behind him with glowing red evil eyes. Ling Si thought about what he should do. Gritting his teeth, he thought that he couldn't find a single weakness. He was thrown back by the impact and wondered if this life of his would be the same as his last. Frowning, he fell down with blood coming out of his mouth. He thought that things might be even more hopeless in this life. There were three copies of him in front of him, and they jumped in after him. Ling Si asked in his mind how much longer fate would mock him. Closing his eyes, he thought that this mission was impossible, and he could forget about it. He decided to let it all end. Opening his eyes, he remembered something. A dagger appeared in his hand, and he thought he understood now. Putting himself into a fighting stance, Ling Si thought that there was still hope. Ling Si grabbed one of his copies by the wrist and blocked the other's attack with his dagger. The third copy of Ling Si was watching from the rooftop. The copy noticed something in surprise. The main character was standing between two copies of himself. Frowning, he said that, as he thought, this was the solution. Ling Si jumped up. The copy charged, swinging its dagger. The copy slashed out with the dagger, and Ling Si dodged, swerving back. He and his copy landed on the ground. The main character was standing in front of his three He said he needed to thank him for that rooftop attack, because it gave him the clue he needed. Recalling the copy's punch, he said that his dagger hits twice as fast as his, however, he managed to block it before he could think. He said with a grin that this was the solution. Pointing a finger at his head, he said that he should act before he thinks. The main character said that even though their attributes are twice as large as his, in the end they are just numbers, and even if they can predict his habitual action using data, they can't know something that he hasn't realized yet. Frowning, Ling Si said that these were his conditioned reflexes. Holding out his dagger, he said that they were also called top time. As he pushed off from the ground, he thought that he needed to trust his senses and trust in his reflexes from the signals that his body receives. Rushing forward to attack towards the he thought that the anxiety he had just felt as a result of fear was the real reason why he had failed in his previous life. He thought top time was a talent exclusive to them, the people. Standing between his three spears, he stabbed with the dagger and thought how could he forget about it because of the nervousness caused by the memories of the past. The main character thought about what he should be afraid of in this life. Grinning, he said, their strength is really impressive. After kicking the copy, he said that even though their stats were twice as big, some things still didn't change. Once behind the back of his copy, he said it was hit recovery time after they were attacked. System prompt, hit recovery, certain types of attacks, such as inflicting a status ailment an opponent, will render said opponent unable to act for a short period of time. The higher the stagger resistance, the shorter the duration. This does not affect the time taken to cast skills, receive blows, fall, get up from the ground, and so on. After stabbing the copy in the back, Leng Si said with a serious face that even if the attributes were a hundred times greater than his, this fixed mechanic couldn't be changed. Frowning, he said that none of them had a chance of beating him. He swung the dagger, and the purple silhouette of his replica disappeared into thin air. Grinning, he asked the remaining spears if they wanted to fight him alone or together. After blocking the attacks of two from both sides, the protagonist thought they were fast, but that's nothing compared to top time. Tossing the copies aside, he thought he could feel it. Ling Si thought that top time is divided into three levels, beginner, honed and instinctive. As he dodged the dagger wielding, he thought that when a person who had mastered top time fought another person who hadn't mastered it, it was comparable to a trained martial artist fighting an ordinary person. He thought that his top time had finally reached the level of honed. Frowning, he thought that, as long as they were unable to simulate a state like top time, they wouldn't be able to do anything against it, no matter how fast they were. The main character appeared next to the copy. Frowning, he thought, now. He hit his copy, and the impact sent it flying into the air. Glancing at the third copy, he said with a threatening face that there was only one copy left. Grinning, Ling Si said that it looked like the roles of hunter and prey had finally been reversed in this life. Stillwaters asked about the change of profession. 
Tiana answered in the affirmative and said that it looked like Ling Xi had her own plans. Holding a red folder of papers in her hands, she said that he had already fulfilled his requirement to enter the top 10 in team leaderboard. Stillwaters said that he knows about it, and it would be hard for him not to know about it, given how famous Team Shadow has become lately. Coco Lai said with a smile that a change of profession is a good thing. She said that when Ling Si was advancing on the team leaderboard, countless players raised their level just for the sake of getting a profession change as soon as possible and becoming an awakened one. She said that given how unyielding and headstrong Ling Si is, she's sure he won't be happy to be left behind. Coco Lai said that some time ago, other guilds also organized several waves of massive profession change teams, and there should be quite a lot of awakened ones right now. Tiana agreed, and said that she had heard that the influence of the awakened in real life was becoming more apparent. She said that she was sure that Ling Si was in a hurry to become an awakened one as soon as possible. Stillwaters said that since he was a professional player, there shouldn't be any problems. He told Tiana to come see him when he got back after waking up. Tiana bowed and obeyed. She thought with an uncertain smile that if it was Ling Si, then he would be fine. Lightning flashed in the sky, and the protagonist loudly asked why. The dialogue box congratulates you on completing the task of changing your profession. Ling Si, gritting his teeth and looking at the dialogue box, asked what was going on and what went wrong. The dialogue box says, you'll be awarded with an all-new job system for the thief class. More exciting ways to play await your discovery. The main character is standing in the rain, looking at the dialogue box. The purple silhouette of his replica lying on the ground was disappearing. Clenching his hand into a fist, the main character thought that he had done everything he could and everything should not be like this. Gritting his teeth furiously, he asked why everything was still like this. The dialogue box says, after evaluation, your awakening rate for the S mission is determined to be 12%. Unfortunately, you have failed to become an awakened. The dialogue box says, awakening rate, 12%. Result of awakening, failure. There are two buttons on the dialogue box, exit and next. Standing in the rain, Ling Si asked what went wrong. Standing on the wet asphalt, he stared at the dialogue box with a grim face. He asked why his chance of awakening was still 12%. He said that this cannot happen, and it cannot be equal to 12%. Falling to his knees, he prayed that this was his past life again from the beginning. With a bitter frown and gritted teeth, he asked what he should do. To be awakened is to be a person who is able to receive special streams from the game device, which activates special areas of the brain. This allows a person to use the skills they have learned in the game in real life. The state-developed game Heavenland was created with the goal of awakening a person's hidden potential for unknown reasons. Those who successfully awoke, especially those with a high chance of awakening, achieved incredible achievements in many areas and as a result became even stronger in the real world. In this way, strong awakened ones receive special treatment from the state and become specially designated warriors of the country, receiving an official state post. Even the lower class citizens of the slums have the opportunity to reach the top in one night and change their lives forever. In this era, the status of an awakened is the decisive status of one standing. The main character remembered Huey Gu's face. The main character thought that he, having failed to awaken in his previous life, had become a member of the lower caste along with the rest of the vast majority. Because of his orphan status, whether in a game or in real life, he was always bullied and looked down on. A life in which he could barely survive, desperately accepting small part-time jobs, a life in which he had no dignity or honor, and a life in which he was treated like trash with no sense of presence and no hope. Lang Si squeezed his eyes shut in sadness. For him, the past life was painted gray. He didn't want to go through that again, he thought. Opening his empty eyes, he wondered if he would have to live this life like trash as well. Ling Si was surprised to notice something on the dialogue box. He asked what the two options were. The dialogue box had two buttons, exit and next. Looking at the dialogue box, I thought that he was too upset by the failure alerts and didn't even notice them. The main character thought that after completing the profession change mission, only the exit button is available, which sends the player back to the lobby. He thought that he had never heard of the next button. He thought that there shouldn't be such a button here. Frowning, he wondered if he should choose between these two options. He wondered if it was possible that there was a right and wrong choice. Ling Si thought about what the next button does. The protagonist with a grim face thought that this profession change quest was very unusual and he had never heard of an s rank quest. He thought that even his contents were very strange. Ling Si thought that even though he hadn't been able to awaken, at least the change of profession was a success. He wondered intensely if choosing the next button would affect his career change, if it would only make things worse. He thought that if he also failed his profession change mission because of her, then he would have to wait another month before he could accept a new profession change mission. Holding his finger over the buttons, he considered what to choose. Ling Si decided to choose the safe path because it would be one disaster after another if it affected the job change assignment. The main character remembered being hung by his feet from a tree. 
Ling Si looked at himself from his previous life, hanging upside down from a tree and surrounded by three people. Looking at his battered face, he thought that he would never back down. He remembered with a grim face that he would never back down in this lifetime. He looked resolutely ahead, frowning. The main character swore at the exit button, hitting the button on the dialog box. The dialog box indicated that he had chosen to go to the second phase of the job change task. The following dialog box says, the second phase will start soon. Your results from the first phase have been saved. The main character asked in surprise why there is a second phase in the task of changing a profession, and what it means that his results were saved. The dialog box reported that his final score will be determined when he exits the job change task. The following dialog box says, Please keep in mind, the chances of waking up from different phases can be added up. Leng Si asked in surprise about the fact that the chances of waking up could be stacked. Frowning, he asked if he had heard correctly. The dialog box asked you to prepare and said that the second phase will start soon. Leng Si shouted that his final chance of awakening wouldn't be 12%, and he still had a chance of becoming an awakened one. The dialog box says, Phase 2 Mission Objective Defeat Your Mirror Selves. Number of Enemies, 6. Mission Description, The Mirror Selves attributes are double of yours. Neither party is allowed to use skills. Defeat them. Mission Time, Unlimited. The main character shouted that it doesn't matter what happens in the second phase, he is ready for it. The dialog box indicated that the second phase would start in 10 seconds. Ling Si thought that 6 copies is twice as much. The dialog box says, upon the completion of the second phase, your acquired awakening rate may be stacked with the awakening rate from the first phase. Ling Si, grinning, thought that was all he needed to hear and he will fight with as many copies as they want. A dagger appeared in his hand and he thought that he wanted to see what he could achieve in this life. The dialog box announced the start of the countdown and wished you good luck. Coco Life round and asked about the fact that Ling Si still hadn't come out. Tiana said that his status still says unable to contact. She assumed it meant that he was still on a career change assignment. Coco Lai, sitting cross-legged on the red sofa, asked him what he was up to and if it had already been more than half a day. She said that based on his abilities, the job change task shouldn't take him that long. She asked if he could have gone out on a date and then deliberately put a do not disturb status. Cocking an eyebrow, Coco Lai said that it only took her in Stillwater's half an hour to complete the job change task. She asked him why it took him more than half a day. Tiana said that he wasn't that kind of person, and he most likely ran into a problem. Tiana recalled Ruko telling her that he had completed his profession change assignment, successfully awakened with an 83% chance of awakening. He was telling her that he had an interesting mission and it was to measure his damage potential in a limited amount of time. He said that he immediately transformed and dealt damage without thinking, and it was the first time he had dealt damage in such a pleasant way. Tiana thought with a sad face that she remembered that Ruko went on his profession change assignment around the same time as Ling Si, but came out less than an hour later. Coco Lai said that she heard that Shadow was recently ambushed by a thief from Wolf's Fang near the forest area. She said that their attack was personally led by their guild's vice head, Squirrel, who seems to have successfully changed professions. Frowning, Coco Lai said that Squirrel attacked Shadow, but Ling Si didn't report it. She said that Stillwaters believes that the enemy doesn't know that Shadow is part of the Nebulous Guild, otherwise they wouldn't have acted so recklessly. Tiana jumped up from the table and shouted that this was the first time she had ever heard of this, and Elling C hadn't told her anything about it. She said it wasn't surprising then that he told her that their entire team was going to go on a career change mission. With a frown, Tiana thought that he was proud and probably didn't want to let it go for nothing. Coco Lai said that Wolf's Fang has been acting presumptuous lately, and they've been picking fights with teams from their guild very often, and their heads turn a blind eye to the behavior of their guild members. She said that they are biding their time and they need to deal with this sooner or later, however, Nebulous is ready to fight them at any time. Tiana thought that if the skirmishes between Nebulous and Wolf's Fang escalated, a full-fledged war would be inevitable. Frowning, she thought that she hoped Ling Si would do well. She thought that she was looking forward to Shadow's growth. The main character fights with his coppers. Three coppers with the eye glowing red stand in a combat stance. Ling Si stands in front of them with a dagger in his hand, surrounded by a scattering cloud of dust. Nebulous 3rd Division Headquarters. 3rd Division Lounge. Lots of people were coming out and in through the doors. The man behind the door exclaimed that the mission was completed and everything went smoothly. The person said that Ruko Zong is really a good leader to rely on. Ruko walked with his hands in his pants pockets. Above his head, you can see that he is level 25. People surrounded him. One person said that they wanted him to go to the dungeon with them for one hour to help them. Another person said that they were missing one strong T in the team. Ruko agreed and told him to just text him when the time came. Dialogue prompt, T, short for tank. As a subclass of the warrior class, they are essentially a meat shield, defined by their high HP and high defensive stats, 
Their role is to absorb damage for the team and to attract the attention of dangerous boss level enemies. A team can have both primary and secondary tanks. The guy thanked Ruko and said that they were very lucky to have him ready to help the third division. He said he would notify him when the time came. Ruko chuckled awkwardly. Another guy said that Ruko needs to be given a break sometimes because he just finished helping another team. He said that if Tiana found out, they would be scolded badly. Ruko waved as he left and said that it was fine and he had nothing else to do anyway, and he could raise his level by helping them with the dungeons. He said he was going to get ready. The guy said that Ruko is really impressive. The guy in the steel helmet agreed and said that it was hard to imagine that this was the same person who used to be called Little. He said that before, Ruko was a rookie that no one wanted to deal with. He asked if he remembered that monthly guild war. The guy said he never wanted to team up with him, and they all ran away as soon as they saw him. Looking at Ruko, who was looking at the game's interface with a serious look, they remembered his crying face. The other guy replied that he remembered, but now no one dares to look down on him or call him little Ruko, only Ruko Zong or even Brother Zong. He said that even though he is no longer affiliated with the third division and is now a member of the Shadow Group, thanks to Tiana, he sometimes comes to help them. He said that otherwise, with his current abilities, he would be able to become a core player for the second or even first division guild. The guy in the helmet agreed and asked if he had heard the news about the shadow leader. He said that this thief who made a fuss recently seems to have gone missing. Another guy wrapped his arms around his neck and told him to keep his voice down because it was about their guild's reputation. He said he'd heard about it from his buddies. Frowning, he said that this thief seemed to be the steamrolled by his head of the Wolf's Fang Guild and no one had seen him for a whole month. He suggested that he might be too ashamed to show himself in front of others. Ruko stood silently with a sad face. He thought that he hadn't been able to contact Ling Si for a whole month. Ruko thought that he had become much stronger, just like Team Shadow. A dialogue box informed him that he had received a message from a friend. There was a chat dialogue on the dialogue box. Tilly's asked about the fact that there was still no news about him. Ruko replied that there was no news. He said that he believed in him and Ling Si would definitely contact them. Tilly's cursed and asked him what he was doing. She said that the job change task would have taken a maximum of one day, but it had already been a full month. She said she really wanted to scold him. Tilly said that Dark Feather is also asking about this, and she is afraid that if Ling Si doesn't show up soon, then Team Shadow will have to disband. Ruko looked sadly at the chat dialogue box. Ruko replied that he believed in Ling Si. Tilly's was standing near the rocks, looking at the dialogue box. Above her head, you can see that she has reached level 27. She thought that when this guy showed up, he would definitely beat him up. Tilly's thought that he had been offline all this month without any news. She wondered if he'd abandoned his account. Frowning, she thought that if he returned now, it would be too late for him to catch up with their levels. She thought that because of the number of job changes over the past month, leveling up had become much easier, resulting in a wave of level grinding frenzy. Looking at the 15th level of Ling Si on the dialogue box, she thought that it put him on a par with low-level players. The armored guy shouted at her to stop slacking off and hurry up to deal damage. Frowning, he said that her father had asked him to look after her, and before that, he had given her too much freedom. Tilly's agreed, naming the man Uncle Quan. Holding her staff in both hands, she asked if they couldn't handle such a simple boss on their own. She said that there's no challenge at all. Quan shouted at her to stop talking and start dealing damage. Frowning, she agreed, and the staff in her hand was shrouded in yellow energy. She thought with a serious face that if Ling Si didn't show up again soon, then she would have to go back to work at the workshop. Coco Lai slammed her hands down on the table and asked how dare they. She said that this was no longer just the Wolf's Fang Guild entering their territory, but a clear act of provocation. Stillwaters clarified that she said they had invaded Station 3. Coco Lai said this was true, and they agreed to split the rewards for a guild-owned dungeon in this area in half. She said that there are a total of six checkpoint stations, and each of them gets three. Coco Lai exclaimed that the guilds agreed that when the dungeon is fully released, they will fairly divide the rewards among themselves. Frowning, she shouted that their Station 4 had invaded their Station 3, which was closest to them, and if they didn't answer, Wolf's Fang might think Nebulous was afraid of them. Stillwaters asked how long it would be before this dungeon was released. Coco Lai replied that this dungeon is classified as a guild resource competition, and the release is approximately one week away. Stillwaters said that one week is enough for them to retaliate, but since they made the first move, he wants to do more than that. Folding his hands in front of him, he said that they would do to them what they had done to them. Tilting their head, Stillwaters said that they would invade and take over another Wolf's Fang Guild checkpoint, and it would also increase their dungeon profits in the future. Frowning, Coco Lai paused for a moment and said that the nearest station to them was Station 4 right next to them, but it was likely to be heavily guarded, and if they attacked by force, 
they would face heavy losses. They added that the station farthest from them would require them to pass through the abyssal terrain to get there, an option they would have to cross out. Stillwaters asked what had happened to Ling Si and Shadow. He said it's been a month and they haven't heard a word about them. Coco Lai replied that no one had heard from him after he entered the job change assignment, and Tiana was also very worried about not being able to contact him. Stillwaters said he hopes this guy doesn't disappoint him. He said that the success of their mission relies on Shadow setting up an ambush. Meanwhile, in the dungeon of the job change task, Ling Si stands surrounded by his clones. The faceless clone fell to the ground. Many fallen clones of the main character were hanging from the roof of the building. Ling Si exhaled heavily. The dialogue box reported that he had passed the tenth phase of changing his profession. The many clones of the main character in front of him started to disappear. Ling Si, covered in wounds, said that a month had passed. The clouds in the sky dispersed, revealing a clear blue sky, and Ling Si said that it was finally over. The dialogue box says, Congratulations. By stacking all your awakening rates, you have obtained an awakening rate of 100% you will be receiving a special reward. Smiling, the main character said that it was time to go back. He put his foot on the bridge railing. The sun was shining on his face. The ground was littered with dead Ling Si clones. The dialogue box congratulated him on completing the task of changing the thief's profession. The main character was enveloped in a pillar of blue light, rushing into the sky. The dialogue box reported that he had unlocked a dual-wield class ability. Looking at the dialogue box, the main character thought that his reward is a weapon. The dialogue box says, here is your reward for completing the mission, Bone Knife of the Undead Mercenary. On the dialogue box, there was an image of two daggers with a purple blade. Ling Si thought that this was much better than the extra 10 dexterity points he had obtained in his previous life. He wondered what grade this weapon had. A dagger appeared in his hand, and he raised his eyebrows in surprise. The dialogue box reported that the weapon's rank was, Whiteboard. Looking at the weapon in his hand, Ling Si cursed, asking why it was of the lowest rarity. He thought with a frown that all class-specific equipment obtained after changing professions could be divided into seven grades, from lowest to highest, whiteboard, bronze, silver, gold, mithril, legendary, mythical. Lang Si thought that there was no need to say anything about mythical equipment, and just owning it could seriously change a player's fate. Frowning, the protagonist thought that whiteboard has absolutely no special attributes, and these are just ordinary items. He thought that the reward for changing professions is determined by the results of his performance during the task. The main character thought that he was sure that he deserved a better reward. The dialogue box says, Bone Knife of the Undead Mercenary, a ceremonial dagger that hails from the abyss. Description, no one knows the specifics of this dagger's origins, let alone the identity of its forger. It is said to have been found in one of the stalls on the streets of the undead. According to the stall owner, Face Eater, he came across the dagger by sheer chance at the river bank of the vast, spider-lily filled bloodied river. Later, someone realized that the source of the bloodied river is the mysterious Eudadadar. Current grade, whiteboard. The main character was surprised to pay attention to this description. The dialogue box says, you have triggered the mission. The minion of the mercenary phase one. Mission description, with bone knife of the undead mercenary equipped, defeat 300 elite enemies. Mission rewards. One, the gone knife of the undead mercenary will be upgraded to bronze rank, changing the attributes of the weapon. Two, when equipped with the bone knife of the undead mercenary, you will be able to use the skill, Dominion of the Mercenary. Skill Description, Dominion of the Mercenary, summons three undead warriors to battle with you. The attributes of the summoned undead warriors will be derived from the player's attributes. Mission Progress, 0 out of 300. Ling Si, holding the daggers in his hand, thought that it might be improved. Clutching the dagger in his hand, he paid attention to the words on the first phase and wondered if this meant that they could be improved further. He thought about what would happen if he could upgrade this weapon to mythical grade. The fallen clones of the main character began to crumble into glowing fragments. Lang Si looked in front of him in surprise. Turning around, he saw that the other clone next to him was also beginning to crumble. The air in the location was filled with glowing shards rising up. The location around the main character started to disappear. He thought with a grin that in the end, he himself had lost count of how many of his clones he had defeated. Ling Si started flying through the blue space. A face shrouded in blue squares appeared in front of him. The dialogue box congratulated the main character on being successfully awakened. He thought that he had never heard of such a scenario in his previous life. He assumed it was because of his 100% chance of waking up. The face told him that he had completed a total of 10 phases and remained undefeated, even facing the attack of 1,536 of his clones in the final phase. It told him that he, a person who never once thought of giving up, was the first player to achieve a 100% chance of awakening. Ling Si thought with a raised eyebrow that to his surprise, 
This electronic voice looked like a female's. The voice noted that he seemed to have other hidden powers. The main character was surprised to ask about hidden powers and said that he did not have them. The insignia on his waist began to glow brightly with yellow light. Taking it in his hand, he asked why Badge of the Glorious appeared on its own. The face said that's what he felt. He said that he was one of the candidates to become the Glorious One. Ling Si asked if that meant there were others besides him. The person replied that, in addition to him, there are three candidates to become the Glorious One. The main character thought that it didn't seem like this was a unique mission. He thought that ever since he received this mission at Sunfall Peak, he hadn't been able to find the time to search for related information. Thinking back to how Dark Lions had put his hand on his shoulder, Ling Si thought that from what Dark Lions had said, it was possible that he was so strong because he also had something similar. The voice said that now, as a perfect awakened who reached a 100% chance of awakening, he would receive a reward. The main character, wrapped in yellow energy, thought that he would finally get the reward for becoming the perfect awakened one. The voice congratulated him on becoming the perfect awakened one. The dialog box described bonus sigil bestows the player with the attributes of one additional class. You may choose from any class apart from your current class. You will be allowed to learn the skills of the chosen class from now on. Looking at the dialog box in front of him in surprise, Ling Si realized that it was dual class. The dialog box says, please select an additional class apart from thief as your sigil class. You may not change your selection, and the sigil will take effect immediately. Now, this means that any class-related rewards you receive in the future will apply to your current thief as well as your chosen class. If any conflicts arise in the rewards, the system will prioritize the reward that applies to the thief class. There was a huge dialogue box in front of the main character. The next dialogue prompt, note, as always, the damage of your sigil class skills will be determined by the associated attributes of the chosen class. Please select a sigil class. Suddenly, a light flashes in front of your eyes. Now, it splits into four. You may select from warrior, archer, mage, cleric. The main character thought that he needed to calm down. He was thinking about which class to choose with a surprised face. Frowning tensely, he thought that this choice would significantly affect his future fate, and he should think carefully about his choice. Ling Si was hovering in the air in front of a huge dialogue box, and the person asked him to hurry up with his choice. The main character remained silent as his heart pounded with excitement. He thought that since he was a thief, the cleric and warrior classes didn't fit his playstyle, which focused on maximizing net damage and performing lightning-fast maneuvers. Frowning, he thought that he himself had never had any interest in these two classes. Ling Si thought that the thief class already had options for ranged attacks, and choosing the archer class would give him more variety in the number of ways he could deal damage from afar. This, he thought, fits perfectly with what he considered the ideal change. Looking at the class symbols on the dialogue box, he thought that only the mage was left. The main character grinned. Clicking on the dialogue box, he thought about the incredible magic damage, unpredictable enchantment attributes, and terrifying summoned creatures. He thought that this was exactly what he wanted from his second class. The dialogue box reported that he had selected the wizard class. In front of the main character was a purple mage symbol. A dialogue box informed him that he would be issued a mage sigil. The magus purple sigil approached Ling Si's forehead. He thought that he would be the very first spellcaster thief. The dialogue box reported that he had received a magus sigil. The purple sigil dissolved on his forehead. The main character was enveloped in a bright yellow light. The face said that he was now an awakened one. Ling Si extended a hand that was shrouded in yellow energy. The dialogue box congratulated him on becoming the perfect awakened one. Yellow energy was dissipating around the main character, who was standing with his hand outstretched. Grinning, he said that it was time for him to go, and Ruko and the others must be worried waiting for him. Job change lobby. The portal began to glow blue. The main character came out of it. He thought about how it had been a full month since he had last seen another living creature. He thought that he couldn't believe that this was making him feel emotional. Scratching his head, he thought that he still had a slight itchy feeling on his forehead, but at least it looked like the mage sigil had been concealed. Ling Si thought that he was glad that it could be hidden, otherwise a similar thing on his forehead would attract a lot of attention. The dialogue box reported that it has unread messages from friends. He thought they must be from Tiana since he had been away for so long. The main character opened his eyes in surprise. A huge number of dialogue boxes appeared in front of him. A guy in the crowd exclaimed that he had an incredible amount of alerts. Another guy asked if he owed someone money, and loan sharks got to him in Heavenland. The main character looked around worriedly. The dialogue box said, You have 432 unread messages from Ruko Zong. You have 69 unread messages from Tilly's. You have 3 unread messages from Pure Dark Feather. You have 3654 unread messages from Tiana. The main character asked if Tiana finally lost it. He thought with a smile that all the messages were from Ruko saying that he was worried. He thought that he had finally learned to worry about others. Ling Si thought Tilly's was furious. 
he opened messages from Dark Feather. The dialog box shows that he sent him one message once a week, containing one word each. Chuckling awkwardly, the protagonist thought that he thought so. He asked what those more than 3,000 messages from Tiana were. He stared at the dialog box in silence. Clouds drifted across the sky above the roof of the building. Leng Si, sitting on the steps, thought that he seemed to have learned about everything that happened outside in the month that he was gone. He thought there was a bit of nagging in between. Frowning, he thought about wave of level grinding frenzy. He thought that it looked like he was far behind in terms of level. He noticed Tiana's message on the dialogue box, the people from Wolfsfang have become increasingly arrogant. Relying on the fact that their number of post-promotion members are a little more than ours, they've invaded out checkpoint station number 3 of the guild-owned dungeons. The guildmaster is asking for assistance from Shadow. Ling Si thought it was about Wolfsfang again. On the dialog box was a message from Tiana, I hear Celestial and Wolfsfang are now allied. That would explain their recent attitude. Ah, it's all rather fuzzy. Ling Si, it's been a whole month, when are you coming back? The protagonist frowned as he thought about how Celestial and Wolfsfang had become allies. He thought that he didn't recall them working together in his previous life. He thought that, of course, not everything would be exactly the same as in his previous life, and he would have to pay attention to these changes. Closing the dialogue box, the protagonist exhaled. Straightening up, he said gravely that he was back. Guild-owned dungeon, station 3. The armored beastman shouted that he would send the people from Wolfsfang back to where they came from. The guy informed him that they had more troops and resources, and they should continue requesting reinforcements from headquarters. They turned around, gritting their teeth when they heard a voice prompting them to call for reinforcements. The voice asked if they were afraid. There was a crowd of people outside their walls, and one of them laughed and said that his gang of 50 brothers and he couldn't wait any longer. A mustachioed man with blonde hair said that they had already requested support, and their comrades were rushing here right now. He said that teleportation was forbidden here, so they would need some time. He told everyone to hold on, because reinforcements from the second station are already coming. The guy with the staff told the captain that he had been fighting non-stop for two hours straight and they were running out of consumables. He said that the opponents continue to send wave after wave against them, immediately replacing the groups as soon as they are exhausted and they gradually reach their limit. The man with the mustache shouted that the enemy had planned this for a long time in advance and caught them off guard. He said that I just need to be held until reinforcements arrive. The guy in the steel helmet said that it wasn't that they didn't want to hold on, but they wouldn't be able to hold on. He said that at this rate, they would all be sent to the cemetery. The dark-haired guy laughed and asked what was wrong. He said that even his teammates didn't want to fight anymore. He grinned and asked where their brotherhood was now. Laughing, the guy said that the members of the Nebulous Guild were worthless. The mustachioed man, swearing at the Wolfsfang Guild, said that they broke the peace between their guilds and attacked their checkpoint station, and yet dare to say such things. A guy with dark hair asked if they use their brains when they play games. He said it was called strategy. Folding his arms, he told them to quickly call for backup if they wanted to say that Wolfsfang was hurting them. Laughing, he added that he couldn't bear to look at how pathetic they were anymore. They noticed a voice that agreed and said there was no point in talking to small fries from Wolf's Fang. He furiously asked who had interfered with their conversation. The main character, sitting on a tree, said that since this is a planned attack, they must have some goal in mind. A guy in the crowd asked if it was one of them. The guy in the helmet asked why they only sent one guy. Lang Si jumped to the ground and said that they were deliberately provoking them with words, but refrained from attacking, and it was all to slowly exhaust them. He said it would play into their hands if they called in reinforcements from other checkpoint stations, because it meant they would weaken the fighting force at the remaining stations voluntarily. The main character said that if this happens, Wolfsfang will most likely launch an all-out assault, which will cost them at least two checkpoint stations. Turning around, he asked the captain if this was true. Startled, the captain wondered who the thief was. He wondered if he didn't look like one of the stations nearby, and if he was from headquarters. The captain thought that what he said sounded very plausible, and those rascals from Wolf's Fang would do anything to win. He decided that he needed to notify his comrades at other stations. The captain asked the main character what his level was. He added that he had never seen it before. He thought that this thief had a completely different aura, and he was definitely a professional sent by the guild. Turning around, Ling Si replied that he was level 15 and had just been promoted. They looked at him in disappointment. The beastman furiously asked if he was seeking his own death with this level. Another guy tearfully said that all the people defending the checkpoint station were promoted and have at least level 23. He asked what a level 15 like him was doing here. The guy with the dark hair laughed and said they were just something. He asked the main character if he came to be a mascot for good luck. He asked who he thought he was. Ling Si quickly put a dagger to the guy's throat and asked, so what if he's only level 15? Startled by his speed, the guy asked when he did it. 
Grinning, the main character said that there are all 50 people here. He said that he would be able to test his new weapon on them. The beastman asked in surprise when this level 15 guy managed to rush over there. The captain asked in surprise what he was thinking. Frowning nervously, he asked if he had hit his head to rush into such a large crowd of people. The dark-haired guy gritted his teeth and wondered if he had heard correctly that he was level 15. He thought that from the way he moved, it didn't look like it was true. Frowning, he thought that he was level 25 and would just destroy this brainless thief to show off his strength in front of his brothers. Jumping back, he exclaimed that it looked like they had someone stupid here. He asked if he was forcibly making villains out of them, Wolf's Fang. He told him not to cry afterwards about being mobbed, because he would defeat him himself. The guy behind him told him to show him. The main character thought that he was used to fighting large groups after spending so much time fighting his clones, and charged out of reflex. A sword appeared in the dark-haired boy's hand, and he urged him to end it quickly, because he didn't have time to waste on the likes of him. Grinning evilly, he thought that he had just returned from a career change and decided that he was invincible. Chuckling, he wondered why such cocky newbies like him kept popping up. He thought that he would show him the cruelty of reality, and it would be a good deed on his part. Swinging his sword, he used swift blade judgment. Ling Si thought about the fact that he was a warrior, and he needed to watch out for his melee skills. The boy swung his sword. He noticed the main character's movement in surprise. Slamming the dagger into the opponent's arm, Ling Si knocked the sword out of his hand. Blood gushed out of the guy's hand, and he wondered how he was able to accurately hit between his finger while he was using his skill. Opening his mouth in surprise, he thought about the incredible agility and reaction speed needed to interrupt his skill in such a way. The boy thought that the slightest inaccuracy would be enough to prevent him from interrupting him. Looking at the main character, he wondered why he was so confident. Above the dagger swings was written, 0.75 seconds. The main character struck the enemy with a dagger, hitting weak points and dealing critical damage. The boy's eyes were blank. He fell to the ground next to Ling Si, and the people around asked in surprise about how he had defeated him in one hit. The main character frowned and thought that he was too slow, and every one of his actions, even his breathing, was full of openings. He thought that this was equivalent to him standing still. He thought that it looked like he was too used to the speed and frequency of his clones, and even their movement was carefully calculated, and every attack and defense was executed flawlessly. When he opened his eyes, he thought that if his actions had been even a second slower, he would have easily been destroyed in one hit. The main character thought that in comparison to them, the abilities of ordinary players are simply insignificant. Standing with a dagger in his hand and a serious expression on his face, he told the other guy that it was his turn now. He told him to get ready and thought that they were too weak in comparison. The captain asked what the situation was. The guy in the helmet said it looks like things are escalating. The beastman said that it looked like that level 15 thief was finished. There was a cloud of dust in front of them. The man in the dust cloud shouted to hurry up and spread out. He ordered the mages and archers to move back. Another person shouted that he needed shields, and this thief was too fast. The beastman said he would take a look. He added that they raised a storm of dust. Another guy told him to try not to be surrounded by them. The main character fought with people from Wolf's Fang, kicking one of them in the back. A guy in the crowd shouted that they needed to stay away from him. The beastman exclaimed in surprise. He asked how this was possible. Ling Si, surrounded by a cloud of dust, stabbed the attacking people in the back with a dagger. The armored guy frowned and shouted don't be afraid, because it's just one person. The guy with the elf ears said in a frightened voice that he wasn't scared, he just couldn't aim. The main character defeated another guy in a wizard's hat, and the guy said that he needed to take aim before he could attack him. Another guy replied that his speed could be compared to the best thieves in their guild and even squirrel. He said that his level should be very high. Ling Si, still fighting, apologized and said that he was level 15 and had recently promoted. The guys were shouting while the main character was hitting them. Ling Si stood in the midst of a scattering cloud of dust, surrounded by the defeated enemy. The mage shouted that his attacks were terrifying. He ordered them to surround him. The other guy ordered the mages to use magic shields. The main character, looking to the side, thought that after promoting, his damage and critical damage multipliers increased several times. He wondered if it was because he had become the perfect awakened one. He thought that, on top of that, any attacks on weak points dealt double damage, and these people were completely unprepared for defense and their equipment was silver grade at best. The main character thought that even their tanks couldn't hold up after he dealt them a few blows. He thought that the main event would start when the guild owned dungeon is released. Ling Si thought that in order to conserve their strength, it was unlikely that they had sent their professionals here. Grinning, he thought that no guild would send their best players on such a low-level provocation mission. Jumping up to attack, he thought that he was using them to help him get used to this state. The boys exclaimed that he was attacking. 
The other guy shouted hold on and said that they had already requested reinforcements. He said that their brothers from the nearest checkpoint station number 4 are already running here. The beastman opened his mouth in surprise and asked about the fact that they were destroyed by a thief of only the 15th level. The captain shouted to the wolf's fang people that they had underestimated them. Shouting that this was their chance, he ordered everyone to attack. They ran to the place where the main character is fighting with the people from Wolf's Fang. The voice asked what they were doing here. He said that he couldn't believe that he had to come here to save them. The people from Nebulous turned around in surprise. Captain of Checkpoint Station Number 4, Level 28 Berserker folded his arms and asked if their mission wasn't just to provoke them. He is dressed in black armor, has white hair and a scar on his face. Someone exclaimed in surprise that reinforcements from Wolf's Fang had arrived. The people from Wolf's Fang turned around and cheered that their captain had come. The guy shouted to his companions to hold on, because this thief was just taking advantage of their weak formation. He ordered them to regroup with the captain and turn the tide of battle. Ling Si calmly looked ahead. The beastman asked the captain if they would be joining the battle. The captain frowned and said that he was a berserker, and that this was a special subclass of warrior that might or might not appear during promotion. He said that it gives the player berserk mode, as well as double resistance and an incredible attack power that surpasses that of a normal warrior. Gritting his teeth, he thought that he was unlucky, and after the promotion, he turned out to be an ordinary armored warrior. He thought that although their in-game performance wasn't much worse than berserk's in the early game, berserk was indeed better than him in every aspect. The main character, standing next to them, said with a grin that it was a berserker. He told the captain that it would be too much for him. The captain angrily shouted that he didn't need his reminder. The boy shouted that their archers were coming. Many yellow magic arrows shot down from the sky. The captain called out to the protagonist to see what he had brought upon them. He ordered the mages to activate their magic shields. A rain of yellow arrows hit the magic barrier. The mage said that their arrows were too relentless and they didn't have enough mana. Berserk closed his eyes and thought that for a talent like him, serving as the captain of an advanced station was a waste of time. He thought it was boring and he wanted to get it over with as soon as possible. Berserk thought that, as usual, they would break their formation with a few waves of ranged attacks, then lead the charge to beat them in close combat. He thought that with his berserk fighting power, it would be very easy. He opened his eyes and someone shouted at him to turn around. Someone used colossal mountain pressure, and a burst of yellow energy scattered the ground and people. The main character said he was here, and he thought it would take him longer. The captain looked ahead in surprise. Ruko said with a grim grin that if it was a challenge from Ling Si, it would certainly come at lightning speed. He looked ahead with a grin. Yellow arrows continued to rain down from the sky, and someone shouted not to let this little to escape. Ruko, standing with a shield in front of the main character standing behind the magic barrier, said that he ran here as soon as he received a message from Ling Si, so he didn't have time to respond. The main character said that because he didn't answer, he thought he was in a dungeon. He said it looked like he had grown up a bit. He asked if his equipment was silver grade. Ruko smiled awkwardly and said it was a mix of different sets and he didn't have many good options right now. Frowning, he came to his senses and asked the protagonist where he had been all this time. He exclaimed that he had been gone for a whole month, and he was very worried because he disappeared without saying a word. The captain ordered the mages to continue using their spells. The main character, grinning, said that he had a little problem when he was going through the task of changing his profession. He said there was nothing to worry about since he was back. Ruko said that Tana was terribly worried and he'd better see her after they were done here. Lang Si replied that he would do so. Remembering the face of Vankafis, he said that he also needed to visit Vankafis. He said that he was too busy lately. Raising an eyebrow, he said that he had given her all the materials she needed and was curious about how she was doing. Ruko said that the last time he saw her, she said something about wanting him to stop by when he had time. Smiling, he said that he thought he had something to tell him, but he had forgotten about everything else. Chuckling, he said that they would swear at him. Grinning, Ling Si said that he would go there when they were done here. The captain angrily shouted at him not to stand and talk, but to help him. The beastman asked the captain about Little War. The captain said it was Ruko from Shadow. He asked me what he was doing here. The beastman said that he had heard that he was particularly active in the 3rd Division recently, and there were members of the 2nd Division who had personally invited him to help them. He said that he seems to have become very strong after promoting. He said that there were people even from the first division who invited him to join their team permanently, however, he turned them all down. Frowning, he said that it was something that people could only dream of. He asked what he was doing. The captain said that he had heard Ruko refer to this thief as Brother Ling Si. He asked if he was the head of the independent shadow team. Looking at the main character's back, the captain asked if he didn't quit the game because no one had seen him for a whole month. The guy shouted to Berserk that they were ignoring him. Cursing, the berserker said that he didn't even know that they were going to die soon. He said he uses them to break his boredom. 
Pointing a finger at the dark-haired guy, he told ranged DPS to attack from where they were standing, and targets like them were like glass cannons. He ordered the others to follow him. Everyone obeyed. Wrapped in red energy, he called for an end to them. Berserk used surging battle intent. Frowning, he looked ahead. The dialog box described surging battle intent, active skill, greatly increases damage output for a short duration. The user will gain battle intent from attacking, and when the gauge is full, raging smash may be unleashed. Standing in front of the berserker shrouded in red energy, Ling Si started talking about them leaving the berserker to him. Ruko interrupted him and said with a smirk that he would take the berserker on himself. He said he was leaving the others to him. Ling Si looked at him in surprise, smiling, he thought that he had completely forgotten that he had grown up. He thought that in his previous life, he was after all the almighty sacred mountain Ruko Zong. The beastman asked the captain about the two of them going forward and what they should do. A sword appeared in the captain's hand, and he said they were mad. He ordered everyone to follow him. He shouted that they can't let others talk, that they only know how to look from the side, and they are also strong opponents. The captain used vigorous brilliance. The dialogue box described vigorous brilliance, or a skill, grants a boost to both physical and magical defense while increasing movement speed. The more allies there are within the aura, the stronger the defensive buffs. Effects from the same aura cannot stack. The guy shouted that they would show them what they're not to be messed with. They ran into battle. Running past Lang Si, the armored guy agreed and shouted to the opponents to attack. Ruko was standing in front of the nebulous men, frowning and holding out his shield. The main character jumped to attack the people from Wolf's Fang. Frowning, he thought that he still hadn't asked if Ruko was promoted to any special subclass after the job change quest, nor about the changes in his attributes. He thought that his greatest strength was his blessing of bravery. Looking down, Ling Si thought that Ruko had a long way to go before he could fully master his blessing. Ruko was running towards the berserker shrouded in red energy. The main character thought that he should try not to get beaten up by berserk, because they are a very strong subclass in the early game. He thought he wanted to see what he was capable of now. Ruko blocked the berserker's strike. Berserk frowned and said that he thought because of huge fanfare that he was some professional player and he was just a level 25 run. Laughing, he said that he, a level 28 berserker, would teach him how to play as a warrior. Blocking the blow with a shield, Ruko said that level 28 is not bad, but it's not good enough to teach him how to play. He said that maybe he would teach it himself. Ruko's shield, shrouded in yellow energy, increased, pushing the opponent back. The blow of yellow energy pushed the berserker away, and he laughed. Ruko gritted his teeth, frowning. Shrouded in red electricity, the berserker said with a malicious smile that he was just a little fool who didn't even have his hair fully grown. He said he would teach him instead of his parents. He swung his axe, and Ruko blocked the blow with his shield. Using Raging Smash, Berserk said that he will rearrange Ruko's face with this. Swinging his axe, he leapt at Ruko. With a forceful impact, it left a crater in the ground. Seeing Ruko standing in the dispersing cloud of dust, he was surprised to think that he was able to withstand his Raging Smash without using any skills. He wondered why he felt like he was getting stronger. Ruko frowned at him from behind his shield. The main character thought that Ruko had an interesting shield in his hands. Stepping forward, Berserker gritted his teeth as he thought about how this little guy was holding something so heavy in his hands. Ruko raised a huge fur-covered hand with a grin. He hit his opponent with it, sending him flying backwards. A dialogue box informed Berserker that his weapon was broken. Gritting his teeth in surprise, he wondered if this was a joke. A huge Ruko, wrapped in yellow electricity, asked who was small now. The axe in the Berserker's hands was broken in half. The guy, looking at Ruko's huge silhouette, asked why this guy could transform. Ruko, standing in front of the berserker, asked again who the little one was now. The berserker asked what the skill was. Dropping to one knee, he asked if this is some kind of special post-promotion subclass. He asked if it was a special subclass of warrior. Ruko said with a smirk that he didn't deserve the right to see his subclass. He swung his huge arm. Using Gaia output, he hit the ground hard. The dialogue box says, immobilized. The berserker stood surrounded by rocks that rose from the ground. A guy in the crowd shouted that ground has collapsed. Another guy shouted that it was dot skill and they needed to get out of here. Jumping over them, the main character said that ground has collapsed indeed. The people on the ground were shrouded in yellow electricity. Ling Si said with a smirk that it was time to clean up. Using the throat slasher, he struck enemies with daggers. A level 25 guy coughed up blood in front of the main character who was shrouded in blue energy. Ling Si thought with a frown that it looked like his low level skills from the early game didn't deal enough damage, and it looked like he wouldn't be able to finish them off this way. He thought that he would have to replace all the skills he got before promotion. Ruko jumped forward and shouted that he would take care of the others. In front of the main character, a huge cloud of dust rose, throwing the enemy into the air. 
Ryuko hit the ground, scattering people and rocks. A berserker littered with rocks while lying on the ground said he was careless. Ryuko asked about the fact that he was careless. The berserker looked at him as it disappeared. Ryuko, standing straight in front of him, said with a smirk that if he was offended, he was always ready to fight again. Ling Si, landing next to him, said that he did a great job and only small things remained. Ruko, shrinking, said that he can't lose face like this. Grinning, he gave a thumbs up and added, especially when Ling Si is around. A voice called out to the captain. The main character said that they leave the rest to them and leave. The captain thought that with such terrifying stats and skills, these two would surely be able to take down these wolf's fang guys even without their help. He called to them to wait. He asked if they would participate when the guild-owned dungeon opens in a week's time. Turning around, the main character replied that he would think about it. Ruko said his goodbyes. The beastman told the captain that he was confident that with their help, the chances of winning would increase significantly. The captain raised an eyebrow and said that especially this level 15 thief, because the way he played, it felt like he was a level 50 pro at least. He shouted that the conversation was enough and called for dealing with the remnants of the people from Wolf's Fang. Someone shouted at them not to run away. Another person asked if they were real heroes. Ruko, washing his hands in the river, said that they would have to walk a good distance to the teleport from here. The main character asked what his post-promotion subclass was. Ruko replied that it was difficult to pronounce it. He read from the dialogue box that his subclass is Warrior, the Blessed, Beastman of the Sacred Mountain. Ling Si remained silent and thought that because of his blessing, he received a complimentary subclass after his promotion. He thought that he could never have imagined being so close to a legendary person like Sacred Mountain Ruko Zong in his previous life, but now they are indeed comrades. He thought that the Ruko legend had just begun. Ruko chuckled and said that there wasn't much other information about it, and it signed as growth type. He asked if it was possible that it knew that it had just turned 12 this year. He asked, how is he supposed to go about growing? The main character said how good it is to be young. Turning around, Ruko said that he spoke as if he was an old man. He asked if he had told Tiana that he was back. He said he was very worried. Ling Si said he sent her a message, but would look for her later. He said he needed to see Vankafis before he went offline. He said he could go first if he was busy. The main character thought that a currency exchange system was recently released in a state-sponsored game, Heavenland. You can link your bank account to the game account. However, only gold coins can be exchanged, and at the moment one gold coin is equivalent to $1,000 in real life. Other in-game equipment and resources were adjusted accordingly. Ling Si thought that he had spent quite a bit of his own money on the Vankafis potion shop, and the shop's rental period would soon end. He thought about how, on top of all that, there was the cost of furniture and equipment. The main character thought that he now does not have a single gold coin, and he hopes that Vankafis got used to his business. He thought it was time to visit her. Ling Si thought that he almost forgot because of the job change assignment but the deadline for a debt of one and a half million is also close. Frowning, he thought that he needed to find a way to get his hands on this money as soon as possible before it came to them. He thought that awakened players could earn a lot of money in the world outside, but he had never been an awakened one in his past life, so he didn't have any experience. He thought it was just a financial crisis. With an awkward grin, Ruko asked the protagonist if he was going to join Bankafis. Blushing slightly, he said that he would also go if he wasn't busy. Ling Si silently looked at him with a smile. He called for him to follow. Ruko agreed with a smile. Casfato's commercial leasing street. A man in line at the counter shouted to someone that this was his last warning. He demanded that he stop pushing. Another asked if he didn't have enough spare parts in his head. He asked if he could see who was climbing out of line. The man behind the counter shouted about the last ten bottles. Vankafis, holding potions in her hands, reminded with a smile that there is only one potion per person and she writes them all down. She said that if they buy for the first time, prepare the money first. She asked how much of Type C they had left. The person stirring the contents of the huge vat replied that there were six left, and they each had three Type A and Type B. Vankafis told them to prioritize restoring the Type A quantity to 12 bottles. She thanked them for their hard work and said that she would raise their pay for tonight by 30%. The boys with sparkling eyes obeyed and thanked him. Ling Si walked up to the counter and suggested that he must be allowed to pass out of line. The guy in the queue exclaimed in displeasure, what is he doing? Bankafis, without turning around, started asking him to go back to the back of the queue. The main character called out to her, and she turned around. Ling Si stood in front of her with a smile on his face. After releasing the potions, she happily exclaimed that he had finally arrived. The main character asked that she wants to open other branches of the store. He said the store had been open for less than three months. He asked her if she was sure. Bankafis responded positively and said that this job was too much for her to handle alone, so she took the initiative and hired three assistant alchemists. She said that she acted based on the principle that more labor yields more output. 
She said that even though their productivity has increased, it is obvious that they need more labor. The protagonist saw books and potions scattered around the Van Caffes table, and she said with an awkward smile that because she couldn't contact him, she decided to allocate some of the profits to procuration of more ingredients. She said that if possible, she would like to improve and expand the store as well as hire experienced alchemists, otherwise it would be a pity if they couldn't keep up with the large flow of customers. Lang Xi said that he understood the general gist. He asked if she could give him an overview of the so far potion sales business. Sitting on a crate next to the main character, she said that after a period of trial and error, her chance of success in alchemy increased. But at first, the store didn't have an influx of visitors, so she spent some money to hire people to advertise. She said that, to her surprise, it worked well, and more and more people started coming to buy her potions. She added that since there was a long way to go before realizing the business vision of the Ling Si Empire, she decided to go all in and hired three rookie alchemists. Bankafis said that they learned very quickly, and although the store's performance improved, she couldn't help but feel that Ling Si would be disappointed with such a pace. She said that as soon as he had the rights to improve and expand the store, she was very worried about talking to him about it. She explained that this way they will be able to expand their business and hire new workers. Ling Si was surprised to think that she had an impressive business acumen. He thought that he thought that the Van Caffes from his previous life had made a name for herself solely through her potions, however, it seemed that there were more things that helped her earn the title of Alchemist Emperor. The main character asked how much profit their store had made up to this point. Waving her arms awkwardly, Van Caffes said she was going to start talking about it. She said that she even applied to link the profit to Ling Si's player ID, but this can only be done with his permission. She said that there are records of every transaction, and if they add up all the profits for today, it comes out to 363 gold and 65 silver. The main character and Ruko paused in surprise. Van Caffes frustratedly told Ling Si that she had let him down and her goal was 600 gold. Smiling awkwardly, the protagonist said that it wasn't bad and she needed to keep working. He thought that he expected nothing less from Alchemist Emperor. Ruko was surprised to say that, compared to gold farmers, who continuously fight all day to earn a couple of silver coins, this is impressive. Leng Si, imagining himself lying in a pile of money, thought that it looked like her demands on herself were much higher than anything he could imagine. He thought that it looked like his investment in potions would make an incredible profit, and if he successfully opened the store's branches, he would be able to make more investments when virtual real estate launched. He thought that he would become a rich landlord in Heavenland. After clearing his throat, Leng Si turned to Van Caffes. There was a send contract button on the dialogue box. He said that starting today, he wants to sign an official employment contract with her, according to which she will be paid 30% of all the store's profits. The main character said that he saw what she was capable of, and he has faith in her judgment. He said that 30% of the store's profit also includes profits from all future branches, and he will cover the cost of improving the store, hiring workers, and training them. He told her to just do what she was doing and let him know if she needed anything. Van Caffes exclaimed happily and started counting how much money dozens of stores would bring her. Leng Si gave a thumbs up and said that it was all right and she would become a rich woman in the future. Van Caffes happily said it was too much. Getting up from the box, the main character said that whether this can happen depends on her efforts and diligence. He said with a smile that even though money was important, her original goal was to show her worth to the world. With a confident smile, Van Caffes raised her fist and said that she understood and she wouldn't let the money blind her. She said that she wanted to become the alchemist emperor that he described to her and wanted to implement his idea of a business empire. She said she wants to reach her potential and be the best version of herself. The bright-eyed Van Caffes said that, after all, nothing is more important in life than achieving your goals. The main character looked at her with a smile. Ruko exclaimed about her piercing aura of aspiration. Leng Si told her, if she agreed, to sign the contract. He said that the terms of consent are described inside, and she doesn't need to call him boss anymore. Van Caffes agreed, calling him the boss. The main character thought that this was the first time he logged out of the network after being promoted. The old man, noticing that he was up, called him to breakfast. He said with a smile that after breakfast they would need to talk about school. Ling Si raised an eyebrow after hearing about the school. His eyes widened with tension. Wrapped in yellow energy, he wondered what was happening to his body. He thought that his muscles and meridians were spamming violently. Gritting his teeth, the protagonist thought that the nerves in his brain were pulsing like crazy. Frowning, he realized that he was awakening. A yellow flash flashed in the darkness. A yellow energy enveloped his body, which shows his bones, and he thought that his body was evolving. The old man anxiously ran over to Ling Si, who was shrouded in yellow energy, and asked if he was okay. The main character wondered if awakening should be so painful. Clutching his neck, he shouted that he was in pain. He got to his feet, and the yellow energy pushed the old man into the wall. 
a pillar of yellow energy broke through the roof of the building, shooting up into the sky. A man in a business suit is walking down the street with a round device in his hand. He has white hair and beard, a hat on his head, and dark glasses on his eyes. Behind him, a pillar of yellow energy pierces through the clouds. Looking at the needle of the device shaking on the red zone, he said that this chance of awakening is frightening. He said it was even higher than the guy's performance from last time. Adolf said that if this awakening surge is even stronger than the last guy's, it's possible that this is the perfect awakened one. Looking up at the sky, he thought of the slums. As he stood among the crowd of people crossing the road, he thought that it looked like he needed to go there. An old man amidst a cloud of dust asked Ling Si if he was okay and what had happened. He heard a knock on the door. The man opened the door with his foot. It turned out to be a guy in a red shirt who was demanding money from them. He asked if they were trying to destroy this place before fleeing. Frowning, he said that two months had passed and time was up. The guy said he had been standing guard outside all day in case they tried to escape. He asked what that loud noise was. Pointing his finger at the old man, he demanded to give him his money, calling him a pathetic beggar. The old man looked at him worriedly. The main character, coming out of a cloud of dust, said that they are noisy. He asked who it was called Lolives. The cloud of dust dispersed, and Ling Si told the guy to say it again. The white cat approached the dumpster. It started eating garbage. A cloud of dust rose in the building from the impact. The guy in the red shirt was standing in a half crouch, surrounded by his fallen comrades. The main character asked why he wasn't talking anymore. The guy gritted his teeth, noticing his aura, and thought that he must be an awakened one. He thought that his aura was much stronger than the other awakened ones in their organization. He thought that he must have just woken up recently. He wondered why of all the days he had to meet him on the day of his awakening. The guy thought that today was not his lucky day. He thought ruefully that his performance rating for this month. The main character, standing in front of him, ordered him to speak. He thought that he needed to get out of here, and no matter how strong they were, ordinary people couldn't stand up to the awakened ones. He thought that the most important thing was to save his life. Walking back, the guy said that he would tell you everything. He said that he was blind for daring to make a fuss. He begged for mercy and said they were just doing their job. The old man asked Ling Si, peeking out from behind the door, what he was doing. Turning around, the protagonist told him not to worry because he was fine. The old man hesitantly replied that it was fine as long as he was fine. The guy, after bowing down to the main character, said that they were wrong to interrupt their breakfast, and he was just worried about completing the task assigned to them. He said that there are too many people who are not paying their debts lately, and this is a problem for them too. He said that they had no choice but to behave in this way. The guy added that if they couldn't raise the money they were supposed to raise, they would be skinned. He said that he must have heard of their boss's ruthless character since he was also from the slums. The main character said that he didn't really know anything about their boss. He told him to take him to him. The guy asked if he was serious. An abandoned building. The guy sitting on the throne asked if he wanted to say that he got hurt at such an important moment. He said the dark race was about to start. He asked where he could find another suitable awakened one to participate. Sitting on the throne was a guy in a white suit with a fur collar. His name is Chris, also known as Silver Viper of the East, one of the four heads of the slums, East District. Chris said he said it was a very important race. The guy with the cast on his arm apologized and said he was careless. This is an awakened one with a 12% chance of awakening. Its class is Armored Warrior. He said he lost his head after drinking with his brothers and insisted on driving. The guy said he was willing to risk his life for this. The shot hit the head of the guy behind him. Chris's gun was blowing smoke. He said he got behind the wheel drunk, crashed the car and broke his arm. He said that his chance of awakening was already less than his opponent's, and now he has no chance at all. He said that if it wasn't for the fact that awakened ones willing to volunteer for the dark race are hard to find, he would have ended up like that fool long ago. Chris said that even though he was an awakened person, he should be afraid of bullets. The guy crouched down, trembling, and said that he would definitely risk his life to win for him. He thanked him for sparing him. The guy, standing behind the other guys, asked if he had seen it. He said it was their boss, a man who would kill without a second thought, a man called the Silver Viper of the East. The guy in the red shirt said that they were finished, and the competition that their boss was waiting for would be ruined. He said he must be in a terrible mood right now, and he'd probably get shot too. Ling Si silently stared ahead, holding the guy's shoulder. Frowning, he assumed that the dark race was some sort of underground competition that only the awakened could participate in. He thought about how this competition was very important to this guy. He asked what if he would participate for him. The guy told him not to add fuel to the fire. Chris turned around. The guy with the cast asked who brought this newbie here. He said he didn't belong here to talk. The main character asked if he would tell him what class the opponent has and what are the conditions for victory. Chris raised the gun and asked if he was sure he was talking to him. The guy in the red shirt apologized and said that he had brought this client here. 
He said he brought him here to discuss his death. Smiling awkwardly and trembling with fear, he said that he had jumped out on his own and it had nothing to do with him. Chris gritted his teeth, the veins in his face bulging, and said he was surrounded by fools. He fired his gun. The bullet started coming at the guy in the red shirt. The boy squeezed his eyes shut and tears came out. The main character held out his hand to the bullet. The guys in the crowd exclaimed in surprise. Chris's eyes widened in surprise. After catching the bullet, Ling Si said that he was right and it was none of his business. The guy in the red shirt fell to his knees in fear. The main character asked if they needed awakened ones who were willing to take part in the dark race for him. After letting go of the bullet, he said that he was sure that he would like his abilities. Chris frowned and shouted for everyone to get out of here. Chris asked about the million and a half. The main character said that if he won the contest, he would forget about the debt of one and a half million. He asked what he thought. Chris chuckled and said that if he won this competition for him, even five million wouldn't be a problem, let alone one and a half million. He said, cigar in mouth, that the dark race this time will be a big gamble with the Southern District. He said that if they win, the properties of the Eastern District will more than double, and they will be able to get unimaginable privileges. Chris said there were some things he needed to know first, his chance of awakening, the level in the game, and the awakened class. The main character thought that even though they are a spell thief, he hasn't received any spells yet, which is why he is just a common thief in practice. He said with a smile that he was level 15, he had just awakened, his chance of awakening was good, and he was a thief. Chris asked him what he meant by his chance of waking up is good. He asked if he was sure he would be okay with his level. She said that if he lost, there was a chance that he would die. He added that the dark race is very important to them all and he won't let anything go wrong. The main character told him not to worry, and he just needs to keep his word. He said that when he won, his debt would be cleared. Chris frowned, wondering if that was their only choice. He thought that all the better awakened ones were poached by the state, and they gave them generous conditions and good treatment, not to mention those with a high chance of awakening. Chris thought that competitions like the Dark Race were forbidden by the state, and the awakened usually avoided having their records tainted so as not to interfere with their future careers. He thought that from what he had heard, their opponent was an archer with a 28% chance of awakening. Looking at the main character, he thought that from the way he was moving just now, this guy is quite agile and maybe he can really win. Chris called out to him. Ling Si asked where. Chris, with his back to him, asked if he wanted to take part in the Dark Race. Turning around, he said that she would be here tonight. The main character followed him, and Chris said that if they went now, they would arrive just in time. An expensive red car drives among high night skyscrapers. The main character, sitting inside the car, thought about the awakened ones. Looking at his hand, he thought that he couldn't believe that he could actually catch a bullet with his bare hands. He thought that he just moved on instinct back then, and even though his palm still hurts a little, the awakened's potential continues to surprise him. Looking at the huge advertising banner, he thought that although he had never been able to awaken in his past life, he had heard a lot about it on the news in real life. The protagonist thought that he had heard news like how an awakened single-handedly destroyed a large terrorist group, or how two awakened people destroyed half the city when a fight broke out between them. He thought that back then, he had always thought that such things were incomprehensible and unrealistic. He thought that apart from the fact that they didn't have any game equipment, the awakened ones had all the game skills and stats in real life. Grinning, Ling Si thought that now, he could sense on his own the infinite potential of an awakened one. Thinking back to Dark Lines, he thought that he was wondering what heights he could reach in real life if he could maximize his performance as a spell thief. He thought that he would take the number one title in Heavenland out of his hands. The main character thought that he would become the best awakened not only in the game, but also in real life, and in this life he would change his life to the extreme. Chris thought, looking at the main character, that even though he knew he was going to be competing to the death, he didn't look nervous at all. He thought that he was as calm and collected as ever and it was even impressive. He thought it was an incredible mentality for someone who looks 20 years old. The car stopped and Chris said they were there. A man in a black suit opened the gate to greet Chris. Pointing at Ling Si, he said that this guy was his hand. On the way down the stairs, the protagonist asked him if it was a code word. Chris replied that it was a secret dark slum battle arena, open only to its members. He said that the people who come here are either incredibly rich, or people who run districts like him. Chris said that since the rule states that they can only bring one awakened to be their right hand man, they just shorten the name to hand. Ling Si suggested that betting on each match here is related to unspeakable acts. Chris gritted his teeth and told him not to think that such bloody underground competitions only existed in the slums. He said that what happens here is nothing compared to dark match arenas in rich neighborhoods. Chuckling, Chris said that he just never saw it with his own eyes. He said that those who have money and power can do crazier things than people like them. 
The door in front of them opened with blinding light, and Chris said they were here. Ling Si squeezed his eyes shut as he passed through the door. In front of him was an arena surrounded by a crowd of people and lit up by many bright spotlights. Chris asked if he liked it. He said that here he hears the screams of the slum's most oppressed voices. He asked, doesn't this get him all fired up? The main character thought that he couldn't believe that such a huge place existed underground. Chris called to introduce him to the place. Ling Si thought that he had no desire to get acquainted with this place. A voice behind him called out to Chris and said that he had heard that he had made a bet with a smiling tiger. A guy with a black mustache and goatee and a pink suit asked why he had asked him to join in. His name is Fu Anzeng, also known as Pink Daddy, one of the four slum heads responsible for the Western District. Chris said it was the head honcho of the Western District, Fu Anzeng, who everyone calls Pink Daddy. He said that the smiling tiger he mentioned was the boss of the Southern District, and it was with him that he made a bet this time. Chris told Fu Anzeng that this is a case between East and South, and there is no need for the West to stick its nose in it. Fu Anzeng said that if they genuinely want to contribute, it's not out of the question. When he noticed the main character, he asked if it was his hand for today. He asked if it was the big guy from Crew Cut. Chris folded his arms across his chest and said with a grin that he had some circumstances and had to arrange a replacement. Fu Anzang chuckled and told him to be careful, because the smiling tiger had come prepared this time. He said that he had heard that he had hired an awakened warrior with a 36% chance of awakening from a rich area. Grinning, he said that he was very strong and had participated in seven dark battles with six wins and one loss. Chris gritted his teeth and asked about the 36% chance of waking up. He thought that he had actually managed to find an awakened of this level. He thought that if it was still an awakened archer with a 23% chance of awakening, this guy would be able to use his speed to force a melee duel. But this is a warrior. Frowning, he wondered what would be difficult and if he could really count on this thief. Ling Si was looking at the arena. The voice announced that it was now the turn of tonight's headliner. The crowd cheered and raised their fists. The voice said that the next bet was between their boss, the Silver Viper of the East, and the boss of the South, Smiling Tiger. The voice announced that two awakened fighters were entering the ring. Two silhouettes appeared in the arena. A voice shouted that on the left side of the ring, they had an awakened warrior known as Frankenstein, who had fought in seven battles with six wins and one loss. Under the spotlight, a man with blue skin covered in stitches was standing there. Crowds loudly called him Frankie. The voice announced that on the opposite side of the ring, they had an awakened thief with no titles or combat experience. Leng Si stood under the spotlight with his hands in his pants pockets. A guy in the crowd laughed and said that Frankie would flatten this guy to death with two fingers. Chris clicked his tongue and gritted his teeth, saying it was going to be a tough fight. The man at the back told him that he really didn't know his limits. He said he thought he would take this bet much more seriously. He said that as his senior, he was very disappointed in him. Chris chuckled and said he knew he was old but that doesn't make him his senior. Behind him was an elderly man in a black suit with a red shirt. His name is Lai Kai Ozi, also known as Smiling Tiger, one of the four slum heads in charge of the Southern District. Chris said they didn't know who would win yet. Standing next to him, Lai Kai Ozi said that this Frankenstein is a person he hired in a rich area, and whether it's experience or strength, it satisfies him in everything. He laughed, and Chris looked at him, gritting his teeth. The voice announced a battle without rules, regardless of life or death. The voice called for getting your gear ready. Various weapons started raining down on the ring. A voice announced the start of the battle. Frankenstein stepped forward. Using upheaval stomp, he kicked hard on the ground, causing objects in the ring to fly apart. The judge said he didn't seem like he was going to give his opponent a chance to find a weapon, and as expected of Frankenstein, he has a wealth of combat experience. He asked if the thief only had to retreat. Standing among the flying batons, the protagonist frowned and thought that he didn't think he needed a weapon to defeat him. He thought that with his current speed, he could at least catch bullets. Opening his eyes wide, he thought that if he was fast enough, he would be able to deal massive damage even with his bare hands. Frankenstein, grabbing a huge axe, told the protagonist that he would take his life with his axe. Fate exclaimed that Frankenstein was attacking. He asked if the thief could dodge his furious swing. Swinging his axe, Frankenstein leapt to attack Ling Si and told him that he was really out of his depths. He told him to move and asked him if he was too scared to move. The main character thought that there was only one thing left for him to think about. Frankenstein swung his axe in front of him, but to his surprise, Ling Si disappeared. His eyes widened in surprise. The main character ran behind him. He swung a fist that was shrouded in purple energy. The audience watched in surprise. Frankenstein stood shivering, foaming at the mouth. The referee announced in surprise that it was a one-punch knockout. Leng Si, standing in front of the opponent, said that the only thing he needed to think about was how much strength to use so that he wouldn't accidentally kill him. 
Frankenstein fell to his knees in front of the main character. He fell to the floor. The audience looked at the arena in surprise. The protagonist thought that it looked like this guy didn't put enough stat points into defense. He thought that if one didn't have the skills to make up for it, it was a bad idea for a warrior to focus solely on DPS. He thought that, otherwise, fighting a class with high damage after awakening would be dangerous. Smiling Tiger asked what had happened. Chris asked if he was imagining it, and he won. The voice announced the awakened thief's victory, praising his peerless strike. Ling Si left the arena. The main character told Chris to go because he had his own things to do. Chris gave him a thumbs up, complimented him on his good work, and thought it looked like he'd hit the jackpot this time. Grinning, he told Smiling Tiger that this was his victory. He said that their agreement would go into effect immediately, and from today on, people from his eastern district would do business in the designated areas of his southern district. He told him that he will be counting on his care. Frowning, Smiling Tiger cursed. The main character and Chris are driving around the city at night in a red car. Chris laughed and said it was nice. As he turned the steering wheel of the car, he asked if he had seen the face of the smiling tiger. Laughing, he said that he looked like he was choking. Chris said he was willing to bet that he wouldn't sleep tonight. He exclaimed that it was a great day. The main character reminded about their agreement. Chris asked him why he was still talking about this little thing. He said that everything is forgiven, and he will even give him one million as a personal gift, and refunds are not accepted. Looking at Ling Si, Chris thought that even though he was just awakened, but judging from his terrifying performance, this guy's future was immeasurable, and he'd better get along well with him. Ling Si thought that although he was sorry, he might owe him a favor, and he couldn't accept gifts that were given to him just like that, but he could ask for a favor. He said he accepted his good intentions, but he could keep the million. He said with a grin that his lackeys had made a mess of his old man's house. He imagined the guy in the red shirt saying that he was lying, and he made this mess himself. Chris put the phone to his ear and said it wasn't a problem and he didn't have to worry about it, because he would take care of everything, because it was his responsibility. Speaking on the phone, he said that he was talking about the apartment of this young guy and his old man. He said to deal with it according to protocol. Taking the phone away from his ear, Chris said that everything was done and he ordered his men to deal with it as quickly as possible. Grinning, he said that it was getting late and it was all on him today and he would take him along to relax and have a good time. Chris said that thanks to him, today he has a few girls from an expensive neighborhood. He handed him the cigars. Ling Si thanked him and said that he did not smoke. He added that this method of relaxation is not suitable for him, and for him the best way to relax is to go home and get a good night's sleep. Chris thought that he was too innocent and it would be hard for him. He agreed and said that everything would be fine if he rested. He told him to contact him if he needed anything in the future, and as long as it was within his power, he would be happy to help him. Ling Si thanked him. Chris thought that he hadn't shown any fear towards him, the head of the Eastern District, from the very beginning. The main character said that the street where he lives is narrow, and he can drop him off at the corner. The main character was standing in front of a dark alley. He looked ahead in surprise. There was a shiny golden door in front of him, and he asked if they had overdone it. Ling Si knocked on the shiny door. A voice announced that he was coming. The old man opened the door and happily asked Ling Si that he was back. He asked if he was okay and if they had done anything to him. The main character asked what they could do. He said he didn't have anything to worry about, and he just took care of their debt. Ling Si looked inside in surprise. Their house was richly furnished and gleaming with cleanliness. The old man said that about ten large men had recently come in, and they just went inside with their tools and got to work. He said he didn't know what they were doing and even thought he was going to die, but they just fixed their house and left without saying a word. The main character, remembering Chris who told him to rely on him, smiled awkwardly and said that it could be said that they were too effective. The old man asked him how he had dealt with the $1.5 million debt. He asked if they had forced him to do something bad. Ling Si replied that they didn't owe them any more money, and he just did them a small favor and it's fine now. The old man with bright eyes thanked him and said that he wouldn't ask him anything else. Closing his eyes, he said that he also wanted to thank him on behalf of his deceased son. Ling Si was told that it was nothing special and he didn't need to worry about it. He said with a smile that if it wasn't for him, he would have starved to death on the street long ago. He asked if he had treated him like one of his own all along. He said he should thank him. The old man agreed and told them not to be so polite to each other because they were family after all. He reminded him that he had to report to the school tomorrow and he filled out all the paperwork for him. He said that he took the initiative and recorded him as his grandson. The old man said that he managed to get a free place in the third high school under their welfare scheme. He said that young guys like him had better have some ink in their stomachs. The main character, sitting on a chair, looking at the paper in his hand, thoughtfully said about the third high school. He wondered intently if it was fate that he would go to third high school in this lifetime as well. He thought it was a place full of memories. The old man, remembering, said that they had replaced something for him, 
and he didn't really understand what it was, so he just put it away. He handed him the game helmet. Ling Xi exclaimed that this is the second generation of the smart gaming headset. Looking at the helmet, he thought it was beautiful. The main character thought that this is a new second generation gaming helmet, and it not only improves the realism of the experience inside the game, but also gives noticeable improvements in graphics and ease of operation. He thought that, on top of this, he could release more targeted neurocurrents during the game to regulate various body functions. After putting on the helmet, Ling Xi thought that with the improved equipment, he could increase the accuracy of his micro-movements. He thought that this was something that he didn't even dare to dream of in his previous life, and if he remembers correctly, at the time of release, this helmet was selling for 120000 he thought he'd better try twice as hard in the game. Ling Xi told the old man that he would enter the game and he had better rest. The old man told him to try harder. Entering the game, the main character thought that, as expected from the second generation gaming helmet, the tactile sensations became much more realistic. He grabbed the doorknob. Opening the door, the main character thought that the sensitive recoil became much clearer and this will definitely help him in future battles. Tilly's was annoyed about how he disappeared for a month and now appears out of nowhere with such an attitude. Looking ahead, Ling Xi thought that now that he had dealt with the problems in the real world, it was time to take care of the unfinished business here. Tilly's, Ruko, and Dark Feather all turned around when they noticed his appearance. Frowning, the protagonist thought that it was time for Team Shadow to regroup. Ruko happily exclaimed that Ling Xi had come. Dark Feather said, GG. Tilly's, with her hands on her waist, said that it was better for him to properly explain why he disappeared for a whole month. The main character thought that now their goal is to raise their place in the leaderboard in a week. Nebulous Guild Front Garden The main character told Tilly's and Dark Feather that they had not seen each other for a long time, and they had new equipment. Tilly's told him to stop talking nonsense. She said that he told Ruko to gather them all here, and she thought that he quit the game and deleted his account. Dark Feather asked if he received a very special job change task, and why it took him a whole month. Ling Xi said that it was a long story, and the task he received had different phases, and he needed to fight countless clones of himself. He said that since the rewards could be continuously stacked, he decided to continue completing the task until he was happy with what he had achieved. Dark Feather remained silent, and Tilly said that this was a strange task for changing professions. She added that the system does produce different tasks based on each player's differences. She said that her task was simply an NPC escort task. Tilly said that, compared to his strange mission, Hers seemed to be much better. Dark Feather asked why he gathered them here. Ling Xi said with a smile that first of all, he had not seen them for a long time. Opening his eyes, he said that he would like to invite them all to the guild owned dungeon next week. Dark Feather and Tilly's exclaimed in surprise. Tilly's said that she and Dark Feather do not belong to the Nebulous Guild. Ling Xi said that they might have to temporarily join Nebulous when the time came, and once they were done with this dungeon, they could leave the guild whenever they wanted. He asked about the fact that none of them joined the guild. Dark Feather agreed and said that as long as it was interesting, he was fine with it. Tilly said she couldn't. Placing her hand on her chest, she said that she was a member of the workshop and it had rules that prohibited them from joining guilds at will. The main character told her not to worry because it was just for a day. Walking past her, he added that Squirrel from Wolf's Fang would also be there. He asked her to come with him to repay him for what happened last time. Tilly's, remembering Squirrel's face, said that he says that this rat will be there too. A vein bulged on her face and she agreed. Tilly's, with burning eyes, said that this time she would beat him so hard that he would crawl on the ground, trying to collect his teeth. Ling Xi chuckled. Ruko exclaimed happily that Shadow hadn't gone on a mission together for a long time. The main character, closing his eyes, said that he needed to spend a week raising his level. A voice interrupted him, calling his name. Ling Xi turned around and Wasabi said that it had been two months and he had finally found him. Above Wasabi's head you can see that he is level 23. He said that he was sure that he remembered his promise to challenge Shadow. Ruko exclaimed in surprise when he saw Wasabi. He said that they had not seen him for a very long time. He asked where he had been. Ruko noticed that he had already reached level 23. Tilly's asked who it was. The main character looked at him silently. Wasabi frowned and told Ling Xi to accept his challenge. He said he came prepared this time. Nebulous Guild Backyard. Two silhouettes stand opposite each other. Tilly's asked about this being a one-on-one -on -one duel. He asked to let her fight him. Dark Feather said, GG. Ruko said that this was their friend from the guild, and he was a little hurt that he wasn't included in the team. He suggested that it be left to him to decide who he wanted to challenge. Daggers appeared in Wasabi's hands and he thought that he had been working hard, leveling up like crazy for the past two months, and was successfully promoted. He thought that the members of Team Shadow were really strong. Wasabi thought with a frown that, as a gadget thief, he was confident that he would be able to give them a fair fight. Ling Xi asked who he wanted to fight. Wasabi said that there are two people he wants to fight. 
He said that the first one is Ruko and the second one is Ling Si. Ling Si and Ruko looked at him in surprise. Wasabi said that he was curious to know how much stronger Ruko had become, and he wanted to know if the gap between him and Ling Si had changed since their last battle. Ruko asked if there were any rules. He thought that no matter what, Wasabi was his friend from Nebulous and he shouldn't go too far. Wasabi replied that there were no rules. He asked not to hold back and said that he would also give it his all, otherwise there would be no point in this match. Ling Si told Ruko to do as he said and give it her all. Ruko's shield increased and he said that he would not hold back. Pushing off the ground, Wasabi rushed to attack Ruko. He hit Ruko's shield, which was shrouded in purple energy. Ruko thought that Wasabi was a thief, which meant his specialty should be speed and he would need to be on the lookout for any surprise attacks. He noticed Wasabi attack him from behind. He unfurled his shield. The yellow energy hit Wasabi and his purple silhouette disappeared into thin air. Ruko, frowning, exclaimed that it was a clone. Gritting his teeth, he thought that he could not muster his strength. Wasabi threw several objects and Ruko found himself surrounded by fog. Ruko, holding his shield on the other, thought it was the weakening mist. Wasabi jumped out of the fog behind Ruko. There was a purple magic circle under Ruko's feet, and he thought that he needed to quickly get out of the weakening mist's range because it not only reduced his field of vision, but also slowed down his movement speed. Wasabi, swinging his daggers, shouted to Ruko that he was standing where he needed to, and now he had nowhere to run. Wasabi frowned as he thought that, like the gadget thief, he could enhance his attacks with various items and cause all sorts of unexpected effects. He opened his mouth in surprise. Ruko, shouting, put his shield forward with his huge hands and pushed Wasabi away. Looking at him, Wasabi thought that he must be paralyzed in one place for at least one second. He wondered what was going on. Ruko gritted his teeth and his eyes began to glow yellow. Using shield storm assault, Ruko jumped up, extending a huge hand towards Wasabi. Wasabi thought that he wouldn't be able to dodge in time. Ruko grabbed Wasabi and said with a grin that it looked like it was his turn. Ling Si said that it looked like his turn would come soon. Ruko grabbed Wasabi with a huge hand. Dark Feather said he's sure this guy has already figured out who won. Wasabi gritted his teeth and thought that if he moved without thinking, the only fate that awaited him would be to be crushed by that huge hand. He thought that this duel against Ruko would end in his defeat. Ruko, after letting him go, apologized and said that he becomes like this as soon as he becomes serious. After landing, Wasabi thought about his words. Ruko scratched the back of his head awkwardly. Wasabi gritted his teeth, frowning. Ling Si told him that it was his turn now. Tilly's told Ruko that he timed it very well. She said he completely foiled the enemy's plans. Ruko said he wasn't sure if it was appropriate and it could seriously hurt his morals. Tilly's, opening one eye, told him not to worry because she was sure that Ling Si would fight him for a while and let him enjoy the joy of battle. Ruko agreed. Ling Si and Wasabi stood opposite each other. Ruko thought that he was sure that the kind Ling Si would use his actions to show Wasabi that his efforts were not in vain. Ling Si ran to attack. He instantly found himself behind Wasabi. Wasabi swung his dagger. Using evil spirits and visibility, the main character ended up behind Wasabi. The Ling Si clone disappeared into thin air in front of Wasabi. Ling Si told him that he had lost. Wasabi screamed loudly. He was shrouded in a huge purple cloud in the shape of the face of an evil spirit. Ruko said that he defeated Wasabi straighter than he expected. Wasabi said with a gloomy face that it was all for nothing. He remembered how Ling Si, standing behind him, put his foot on his back, he thought that he was also defeated in exactly the same way. Wasabi said that he thought he could close the distance between them with hard work just a little bit, but he was lying to himself all this time. The main character said that he doesn't have to behave like that. Ruko looked at Wasabi with a sad face. Wasabi, rising to his feet, told the protagonist that he could not understand the efforts of people like him. He said his efforts are always nothing compared to people like him who are blessed by the system. With tears in his eyes, he said that all his efforts were useless. He remembered how he fought and read books. Looking at Wasabi's back, Ling Si told him that the Vancafis potion shop that recently opened was doing well. He asked if he had gone there. The main character, closing his eyes, said that it seems that she has not yet completed her job change task because she is constantly managing the store and training new workers. He said she would likely be part of the players who level up the slowest. Wasabi asked in surprise what he was trying to say. Ling Si told him that he didn't have to force himself to do things just to get closer to them. He said they all have their own strengths and passions. Wasabi looked at him in surprise. The protagonist said that if Vankafis gave up her hobby of alchemy to try to master magic, they would lose the all-powerful alchemist emperor in the future. He said he doesn't know if fighting is his forte, but it's definitely not something he enjoys. Wasabi thought about what he liked. He said that he enjoys collecting and learning different types of information. He asked what was the use of this. Ling Si said that he needed someone on his side who was good at gathering and sharing information. 
He said this is a very important thing for the team's operations. Approaching Wasabi, Ling Xi told him with a smile that if he wanted, he would gladly fund him. He asked to help him build an intelligence network. He added that he leaves things like staff and other things to him. Wasabi opened his mouth in surprise. He asked that he wanted him to create an intelligence network inside the game. The main character replied that he wanted information about everything, be it dungeons, items, other guilds, or even the latest news about the best players. He said this is an important thing for the team in the future. Frowning, Ling Xi said that having detailed information would allow him to do things more efficiently. He said that in a week, the Nebulous Guild will fight Wolf's Fang in the Guild-owned dungeon. He said that although the scale of the battle is not that big, they heard that Wolf's Fang's vice guildmaster, Depraved Squirrel, was going to come there. The main character asked if he would help him gather information about Squirrel and his team. He added that the more detailed the better. Wasabi frowned and said that he liked doing this, but it was too sudden. The main character, holding a gold coin in his hand, said with a smile that the initial budget for the intelligence team would be 50 gold coins, and Wasabi is free to call the shots. Wasabi's eyes sparkled. Taking the coin from his hand, he agreed. He told him to wait, and then he would see that he would even recognize the color of the panties he wore to bed. Smirking, Wasabi said that he would not find anyone better at this matter. Ling Xi said with a grin that if their intelligence network covers the entire Heavenland in the future, then as its head, he will receive such profits that he cannot even imagine now. Ruko exclaimed happily that Wasabi was now one of them too. Ling Xi said that Shadow is only fighting while the Vancafis store is in charge of selling and supplying potions. He said that now that they had Wasabi, they would leave the information gathering to him. He told him to take what he enjoys and develop it to new and unprecedented heights. The main character thought that he didn't intend to build an intelligence network so early, but Wasabi really looks like the right person for the job, and if he can actually provide him with useful information, that will be a good bonus. Ruko asked if he was embarrassed. Wasabi, blushing, said no. Tilly's asked Ling Si if he was trying to create a guild. Wasabi turned around and asked if it was true. Ling Si, scratching his head and looking into the distance with a smile, replied, Who knows? Tilly's remained silent. The main character, looking at her, added that it is better to always be prepared. They looked at him. Ruko asked him if he said that he was going to go level up. He asked if he wanted to take him with him, if it was a dungeon, and if they would go now. Ruko asked if one week would be enough for him, since he was only at level 15. Ling Si replied with a smile that everything was fine and Ruko would not be able to go to the place he was going to. He added that one week would be enough for him. Ruko asked in surprise that this was a place where he couldn't go. Tilly's asked how many levels he plans to raise in one week and if he has a plan. The main character said with a smile that he did not know how many levels he could raise in one week. Looking forward and raising his index finger, he said that he plans to get into the top 10 on the level leaderboard. The main character sits on a stone among the rocks, looking out of the dialogue box. Swiping his hand over the interface, he thought that he had received 200 gold from Bankathis and the rest was spent on running the store. Frowning, he thought that between today and the opening of the guild-owned dungeon, he had exactly seven days. Ling Xi thought that he needed to carefully plan his level up every day. The blue portal was surrounded by bones protruding from the ground. The main character thought that he would squeeze his strength dry for the next few days. Rising to his feet, he said it was time for him to go. There was a stone castle with red roofs in the forest. Ling Xi thought that he was about to leave the territory of the human race and step into the territory of the beast people. This is an area owned by players level 40 and above. The giant portal is one of the many ways to travel between zones in Casfado. Unlike regular portals, giant portals of this type can send a person into the territories of other races. Ling Xi walked out of the giant portal. Each race in Heavenland has its own territory. Each territory occupies a huge space. Due to the fact that they are separated by huge distances, they can only be reached using these portals. The main character frowned. Although there is no level limit in different areas, other than a few thrill-seeking players or treasure hunters looking for valuable items, no player can dare to enter an area where even the weakest of monsters can kill them with one hit from their current level. Beastman Territory, Pav Barlow, the main character, standing in front of a tall building, thought that he could. Standing with his hands in his pants pockets, he thought that when he came to this place in his past life, he was already above level 70 and he came with the team. He thought that, after all, because he had been carried so many times, he had become familiar enough with the area to write guides about it and make some money. Lang Si thought that his reason for coming to the Beast People's Territory was to be a secret merchant. This is the only place where he can get the item needed for his plan to level up. This secret merchant is hidden in a very hard-to-find cave, high in the mountains. The secret merchant in his past life was found randomly by a player who was being chased by monsters and had nowhere to run. 
He then shared it on the forum, which caught the attention of other players. Ling Xi jumped onto the rock and ran past the monsters. Looking down at them, he thought that before he found the secret merchant, he first needed to obtain one quest-related item. Ling Xi hid behind a rock from creatures with dragon wings flying past. The main character climbs a cliff while a purple dragon flies in the night sky. Abandoned house near a cliff, the main character climbed onto a rock. Near the building in front of him, a bear with many horns on his head was sleeping on the ground. Above his head you can see that he is level 69 and is an elite monster. Lang Xi said with a smile that they have not seen each other for a long time, and his size is as amazing as before. He thought he wanted that crumbling house behind that menacing looking bear. He thought that, according to the usual sequence, he would wake up as soon as someone came close and then rush furiously at the intruder. Smirking, the protagonist thought that this gave him a chance to use something. A golden ring appeared in his hand and he thought it was the petrification ring he got in the broken Buddha dungeon. He thought that it was precisely because of this item that he went to this dungeon back then. As Ling Xi put it on his hand, he thought that with such a strong effect, it was a one-time item. The main character stood in front of a sleeping bear. Frowning, he thought about what he needed to do now. He ran forward. The bear rose from the ground, its eyes glowing blue. Ling Xi put forward his fist with a ring shrouded in blue energy and said that now is the time. He used petrify and the bear was enveloped in blue energy. His body began to become covered with stone. Dialogue box described, Petrify, an inescapable effect from the petrification ring. It causes creatures to be petrified for three seconds. On players, the effect is shortened to one second. Note, boss level creatures, dragons, and spirit type monsters are immune to the petrification. The main character, running past the bear, thought that he only had three seconds and he had to be as fast as possible. He kicked down the door of the house. Ling Xi began to climb up the spiral staircase with a tense face. Three seconds left. When he climbed up, there were two seconds left. He ran forward to the wooden cabinet and said that it was right here. One second left. The bear let out a loud roar as Ling Xi gritted his teeth and inspected the contents of the wooden cabinet. Frowning, he glanced inside. A dialogue box informed him that he had received the pendant of the exiled beastman researcher. There was a necklace in his hand and he said that he had found it. Using a grappling hook, he dodged the bear's attack. The bear used scarlet breath, shooting a stream of red energy from its mouth. The main character flew past him, twisting in the air. He began to approach the top of the cliff. Grappling hook began to fall from the cliff along with the main character. Having caught on a ledge in the rock, the hook stopped. Ling Xi landed safely on the cliff. Exhaling, he said that he was glad that he knew this procedure like the back of his hand. The main character stands in front of a cave. A dialogue box informed him that he had found a secret merchant, the exiled beastman researcher. The beast man looked at him and said that this was a rare sight. He said that he was the first person to come here. Ling Xi thought that in addition to this, he had specially brought something that he would need later. Ling Xi grinned and thought that the plan to level up was starting right now. The chameleon, sitting on a tree, looked around. The beastman told the main character that he was not interested in how he got here. He asked him what interest he could have in an eccentric man who had lost everything and was driven out by his own people. Ling Xi thought that he would not be able to trigger the event flag if his response did not include the exile keyword. He replied that he had heard about it. He asked why an educated scientist was expelled by his own people. The beastman chuckled and said that it was because those stubborn fools refused to acknowledge his hard-earned discoveries. There was a bottle of liquid in his hand, and Ling Xi thought that he had triggered it. The beastman said as the only beastman scientist in his clan, he returned after finishing his studies outside, but this beastman clan only worships strength and might, and they branded him as unorthodox heretic and a deviant. He exclaimed that after this they expelled him and his wife from the village. Gritting his teeth, the beastman said that he was disheartened, and he was sorry that his gentle wife had to suffer with him, however, he never thought that there were radicals in his clan who were ready to destroy them. He said that under the cover of darkness they surrounded the small cliff house he had built with his wife. The beastman squeezed his hand, and the bottle in his hand burst. He said they killed his poor wife, and he jumped off a cliff in the middle of the chaos, and managed to survive because his fall was broken by dense tree branches. The beastman said with a gloomy face that many years have passed, but he still has not forgiven himself and will never be able to forgive these people. He said he didn't even have a memento to remember his wife. Beastman said that the necklace he gave her once upon a time should still be in the cliff house to this day. He said he didn't have the courage to go back there. The dialogue box says, You have activated the hidden quest, the exiled Beastman researcher's regret, the Beastman researcher is buried in grief and rage. His wife's favorite pendant is still in the dilapidated house by the cliff. If the pendant were to be retrieved and returned to the Beastman researcher, Ling Xi thought with a smile that, as expected, he had triggered a hidden quest. He thought that normally a person would go looking for this item after the quest had been started, but he had already obtained it beforehand. The main character told the Beastman that he sympathized with him for everything that happened to him. 
He said he accidentally came across a house near a cliff on his way here. The main character extended his hand with the necklace and, asking to look, asked if this was the necklace he was talking about. The beast man turned around and asked in surprise that he had actually found him. Ling Xi replied that it was true. He thought that all he had to do now was hand over the necklace. He thought it was fast. The beast man, joyfully looking at the necklace in his hand with tears in his eyes, told the main character that he was deeply grateful to him. He said he didn't have much to offer him, but he had some magic bombs that he made himself. He said he was sure they would be useful to him. A dialogue box informed the protagonist that he had unlocked the exiled beastman researcher's hidden shop. The main character, looking at the dialogue box, thanked him and said that he was sure that they would be useful to him. The beastman replied that he sincerely hoped that his creations would be useful to him. Ling Xi thought that he had entered the long-awaited hidden store. An image of a blue bomb with a skull appeared on the dialogue box. Dialogue box described, magical bomb of shattering shards, magic bombs created by the exiled beastman researcher. This special bomb can deal tremendous damage to the beastman race. Perhaps it's because they contain his deep hatred for his people. Smirking, the protagonist thought that he would rely on this thing to raise his level this week. He thought they were expensive, there were ten of them in each set, and each set cost ten gold. He guessed that even the guild masters of the big guilds would not allow themselves to spend money like this. The dialogue reported that he purchased 15 sets of magical bomb of shattering shards for 150 gold. Frowning, Ling Xi thought that it was definitely worth it. The main character stood on a rock. In front of him was a settlement with huts. Putting his hands in his pockets, he thought that this was a village of level 40 beastmen. He thought that he chose this place because of the chance of spawning elite rank beastmen. A dagger appeared in his hand and he thought that after all, he needed to kill 300 elite monsters to upgrade his bone knife of the undead mercenary. The dialogue box says, bone knife of the undead mercenary, equipped, defeat 300 elite monsters. Mission rewards, 1. The bone knife of the undead mercenary will be upgraded to bronze rank, changing the attributes of the weapon. 2. When equipped with the bone knife of the undead mercenary, you will be able to use the skill dominion of the mercenary. Skill description. Dominion of the mercenary summons three undead warriors to battle with you. The attributes of the summoned undead warriors will be derived from the player's attributes. Mission progress, 0 out of 300. Looking at his dagger, Ling Xi thought that it was a weapon that could summon the dead, and he was waiting impatiently. Frowning, he thought that now he just had to clear wave after wave, and then repeat. The main character jumped down from a cliff. The beastmen turned around when they noticed him. Running through a settlement full of beastmen, he thought that the first step was, of course, to lure them. Ling Xi thought with a grin that since they have a big difference in level, no one can lure them in at close range like before. He took out a handful of stones and thought he was completely prepared. The main character began to quickly throw stones at the beastmen. The beastmen began to turn around as the stones hit them. Jumping off the walls, he continues to throw stones at the beastmen. Frowning, he thought that he couldn't miss a single one. Ling Xi was being chased by a huge crowd of beastmen. While running away from them, Ling Xi thought that the time had come. He turned sharply to the side and jumped onto the roof of the building. A blue bomb appeared in his hand. Pushing off from the ground, Ling Xi sank a little lower, shrouded in blue electricity. He told them with a grin to get this flurry of bombs. A huge blue explosion thundered on the ground under the main character. Blue flames enveloped the beastmen. Their health sank lower and lower as they were engulfed in blue flames. The dialogue box says, you have killed two elite monsters. Bone knife of the undead mercenary mission progress, two out of three hundred. Ling Si, shrouded in yellow energy, exclaimed that this was thrilling. A dialogue box informed him that he had raised his level. Smiling, he exclaimed that this speed of leveling up was very pleasant. A dialogue box informed him that he had raised his level. The main character stands surrounded by beastmen burning with blue flames. A dialogue box informed him that he had raised his level. Ling Xi stands with a bomb in his hands over the body of a beastman burning with blue flames lying on the ground. The main character hit the throat of a beastman shrouded in blue flame with a dagger. Ling Xi, surrounded by dead beastmen shrouded in blue flames, thought that after clearing this wave, he would teleport to the rebirth zone, and he could do this three times a day. Shrouded in yellow energy, he thought that his magical bombs of shattering shards were enough to get him to at least level 30. Smirking, he thought that in these few days he would change thoroughly. Ling Xi has been clearing wave after wave like crazy for the past few days, resulting in a hefty boost to his levels. The main character stands in a settlement, surrounded by fallen beastmen. Today is the fifth day, and from level 15 he has risen to 32. Ling Xi looks at the game interface. The ground is covered in blue flames. Level 32 is visible above his head. Ling Xi frowned and thought that perhaps if other players knew about his level up speed over the past five days, they would suspect him of using cheats. He thought that, from a certain point of view, perhaps this was not so far from the truth. The protagonist with a tired face thought that this method of raising the level was pleasant, but it was becoming terribly boring. 
As he stretched his shoulder, he thought that he felt as if he had a frozen shoulder from constantly throwing bombs the last few days. A dialog box informed him that he had received six pieces of Beastman's sawing knife. Looking at the dialog box, Ling Si thought that this was finally the last wave. Looking at the leaderboard, where people with levels 35 to 41 were visible, he thought that since he had made his level information private, he did not appear on the level leaderboard. The main character thought that, in the meantime, quite a few professionals also decided to hide their information, and they also disappeared from the leaderboard. He thought that at the moment the highest level on the leaderboard is 41, but he is sure that there are players who have a higher level. Smirking, Ling Si thought that he had taken 10th place and barely made it into the top 10. He thought that he really didn't have time to rest. Due to the fact that leveling up has become much easier after being promoted, competition has become fierce when it comes to player levels. The competition will only get hotter from here on out, and on top of that, as players upgrade their gear, the rate at which they level up will only increase. The dialog box says, Bone Knife of the Undead Mercenary Mission Progress, 272 out of 300. Picking up the dagger, the protagonist thought that there were fewer elite monsters here than he expected, and he still needed a little more. Looking at his dagger, he thought that he had two days left and he needed to get the first upgrade to his weapon. The main character thought that he should find another place and come up with a way to clear more waves. He thought that now that he had unlocked the exiled beastman researcher's hidden shop, he could bring Ruko and the others to level up later as well. Smirking, he thought that he must ensure that the members of Team Shadow were in the best shape in terms of levels and abilities, otherwise they would not be able to stand out among the sea of professionals in Heavenland. He remembered Tilly's asking him if he was trying to create a guild. Ling Si thought that Shadow still lacked highly skilled players from other classes, and he would have to spend time finding them too. Looking up, he thought that creating a guild was one of the goals in his current life, and he had never forgotten about it. But if he was too slow, the skilled players would be taken away by the big guilds or workshops. The dagger in his hand disappeared and he thought about how much he had to do. He thought that it was not time yet. Nebulous 3rd Division's Meeting Room Chiana asked Ling Si in surprise how he jumped from level 15 to level 32 in 5 days. Shocked, she exclaimed that even the rocket was not that fast. The main character threw up his hands and said that he simply took advantage of the experience bonus from hunting monsters that were much higher than his level to catch up with the others. He added that the process was labor-intensive. Tiana, having calmed down, said that it was still shocking. The main character was looking at the books on the bookshelf, and Tiana thought that this guy continues to make the impossible possible. Lang Si looked at her and asked if what she told him earlier was true. He asked about Stillwaters wanting Shadow to do a solo mission in the Guildone dungeon that would open in two days. Tiana replied that it was true and he told her about it today. She said she didn't know the details and he just told her to tell him. Frowning, she assumed it had to do with gaining control of the checkpoint stations. Frowning, the protagonist asked what she meant. Tiana said with a gloomy face that he wanted to capture the three checkpoint stations of the Wolf's Fang Guild and take over the entire zone for himself. The main character thought that Tiana's assumption was not groundless, and they quietly endured various provocations from the Wolf's Fang Guild, but he is sure that deep down no one wants to leave things just like that. He remembered Stillwaters closing his book. Ling Si said that if this was the case, then it would be different from ordinary skirmishes, and it would be an open show of hostility. He said it looked like things were about to get interesting. Tiana frowned in surprise and said that now that the Celestial have become allies of Wolf's Fang, she is afraid that the situation will be extremely disadvantageous for Nebulous if they allow them to continue. The main character spread his hands and said that even if the sky fell, Stillwaters would still be able to hold him, so there was no need for the captain of the small third division to worry about such things. Tiana angrily asked if he was being too short-sighted. Closing the book, Ling Si told her to calm down because he was just joking. He told her to share the details of the mission when she knew more. Tiana looked after him worriedly. Ling Si told her to tell Stillwaters that he accepted the mission. He added that he still has an account to settle with one person during the Guildone dungeon and can complete the quest along the way. Tiana, frowning, asked if he was really thinking about attacking the vice guildmaster of the Wolf's Fang Guild, Squirrel. She told him not to be too impulsive because he is their vice guildmaster, and he too has probably become stronger by leaps and bounds over this period of time. She said she knows he beat them last time, but he should know what they say about revenge being a dish best served cold. Ling Si frowned and replied that he did not have time to wait for it to cool down. Looking ahead, he replied that he had always been one to give an eye for an eye. He thought that he would never again silently endure insults and humiliation as in his previous life. As he left, the main character said that this was enough talking and he left. Tiana asked what he was up to this time. He replied that since he also needed to complete a mysterious mission from the head of their guild besides taking revenge on someone, he had better strengthen his abilities. He told her to text him if she needed anything and he would read it when he had time. Tiana thought that there was nothing she could do about him. 
The next day, Ling Xi searched for several spawn locations of elite monsters based on his memory, and went with the other three members of Team Shadow to kill monsters above their level with some tactics. The main character's team stood opposite a red monster in armor. On the one hand, this allowed them to level up, and on the other hand, he did this for the bone knife of the undead mercenary. Ling Xi stood with a dagger, shrouded in purple energy. There were blue flames around him. After being exhausted from clearing waves of monsters all day, his bone knife of the undead mercenary finally evolved. Not only did it have minor appearance changes, but more importantly, its grade increased from whiteboard to bronze. The red and white blade of the dagger was shrouded in purple energy. Besides the attribute improvements, the skill he had been waiting for all this time, Dominion of the Mercenary, was finally unlocked. A huge blue spirit in armor towered above the ground. With this weapon in hand, the protagonist's next big plan began the day before the launch of Guildone Dungeon. This plan is to find the spell that suits him best, having mage as a second class, abandoned chapel of the vile serpent. A huge purple snake towered over the stone castle. Ling Xi thought that the spell he was looking for, Kiss of the Vile Serpent, was inside this terrifying creature. Standing in a cloud of yellow gas with a purple mask on his face, he thought that this particular spell was originally created for battle mages because it gave a hefty boost to agility and damage output. Frowning, Ling Xi put his dagger forward and thought that now there is no more suitable spell for him with a dual class who has set foot on the path of becoming a spell thief. A dialogue box informed him that he had activated the Dominion of the Mercenary skill. The main character raised his dagger up, and purple hands appeared from the ground. Huge blue spirits crawled out of the ground. Frowning and staring at the snake in front of him, Ling Xi thought that his spell thief journey begins now. The main character and his spirit stood in front of the castle, above which a huge purple snake towered. Purple leaves fell in the air. A huge snake enveloped the castle tower. The blue spirit stepped forward in a cloud of yellow gas. With a wave, he dispelled a cloud of yellow gas in front of him. The serpent, shrouded in violet energy, looked at them with eyes glowing red. He charged, hitting the ground with his tongue. The blue spirits rushed to attack. The spirit jumped into the attack, swinging its sword. He hit the snake in the head, and it opened its mouth wide. Ling Xi thought that his spectral warriors were immune to vile serpent's poisonous aura. The spectral warrior pierced the head of the serpent, from which violet energy was emanating. The main character ordered them to take a triangular formation and attack. The spectral warrior's face was illuminated by a bright light. The tower that had Ling Xi on the roof was broken in half. The spectral warriors ran in front of the snake, and the main character shouted to them to take this huge snake away from here. Frowning, he thought they needed to lure him aside so he could sneak inside. The serpent crawled out of the castle in pursuit of the spectral warriors. Crouching in front of the entrance, Ling Xi thought that he needed to hurry up because spectral warriors of this level would not be able to hold out for long. Using a grappling hook, Ling Xi entered a room with a book glowing red. Noticing the book, the main character thought that his goal was this book. He landed on the stone floor. The pedestal in front of him began to glow with a bright yellow light, and Ling Xi wondered what kind of mechanism it was. A huge snake appeared behind him. Having dodged his blow, the main character thought that it was able to return so quickly. Frowning, he thought that this had exceeded his expectations, and he had only managed to obtain this book in his previous life with the help of the team, so he had never paid attention to such details. Raising the dagger into the air, he shouted to the spectral warriors to protect him while he dealt damage. Spectral warriors emerged from the ground. The snake tore one of the spectral warriors in half with a blow of its tongue. The main character ran to the side and thought that he did not have time, and if his spectral warriors were killed, then he would not have another chance to get close. He ran towards the book, enveloped in purple energy, and thought that he had to try regardless of whether it worked or not. The snake turned around, looking at the main character with eyes that sparkled red. He swung his tail over Ling Xi, who was running towards the book with his hand outstretched. The snake hit the ground with its tail, and the main character dodged it, jumping to the side with a book in his hand. Looking at the book in his hand, he thought he had done it. Summoning the spectral warriors, Ling Xi ordered them to hold the vile serpent in one place. Spectral warriors emerged from the ground. The main character ran to the exit. Smirking, he mockingly said goodbye to the snake. The moon was shining in the sky, and the main character, after many jumps, landed on the ground. He thought that once news of this skill book spread, he was sure that many battle mages would risk their lives to obtain it. Looking at the red book with a grin, he thought that in this life, he should be the first person to obtain this skill. A dialogue box asked if he wanted to learn the kiss of the vile serpent skill. Smirking, the protagonist thought that there was no spell more suitable to be his first spell as spell thief. A dialogue box informed him that he had learned the skill kiss of the vile serpent. A dialogue box described Kiss of the Vile Serpent, a mage-exclusive skill. Locking down an enemy target, the soul of the Vile Serpent will constrict the target while dealing magic damage. After locking down on a target, the player's physical attacks will generate stacks of Vile Flames continuously. 
When vile flames are activated, the Dragonic Serpent's Kiss will rise with the ground below and deal magic burst damage equivalent to attack multiplied by 150% to the target and the surrounding area. Ling Si thought it was a job well done, and now all that was left was to wait for the Guildone Dungeon to open tomorrow. He thought that he had forgotten one thing, and if the old man had not woken him up, he would probably have forgotten that he had to go to school today. On the card was a portrait of the main character. Ling Si thought that, to be honest, the thought of going back to school again made him even more nervous than entering the game after his regression. Ling Si stood in front of the school building. Looking up, he thought that he had no pleasant school memories from his past life. He thought that he was offended, humiliated, and that he was the target of cruelty. Looking down, he thought that he could not even imagine that he would return here as a transfer student. The notice about the entrance to the third high school says, Class, Year 1 Class 3. Student, Leng Si. Status, Transfer Student. Leng Si grinned and thought that he knew that things would be completely different from now on. The main character walks down a road full of other schoolchildren, thinking about reliving the wonderful life of school. The main character wrote his name on the board with a black marker. With his hands in his pants pockets, he greeted everyone and introduced himself. He thought that something had changed, and in his previous life he was in class 6. He thought that when he saw class 3 on the alert, he thought it was his imagination. Homeroom teacher and language teacher, Zhu Ting, a girl with dark hair and a ponytail and wearing a yellow shirt with a white cardigan, said that starting today, Leng Si will be part of class 3. She said that the semester has just started, and they will have plenty of time to get to know each other, and she is confident that they will be able to get along. She said to provide Leng Si with a warm welcome. The protagonist thought that he didn't have a strong impression of Zhu Ting from his past life memories. He thought he had only seen her a couple of times, and from what he remembered, she was a young and hardworking teacher. Looking at her, Ling Si thought that this was her first year as a homeroom teacher, and it seemed that she was not yet accustomed to this role. He figured that dealing with a bunch of kids at the peak of puberty wasn't that easy after all. Ling Si looked forward when he heard a voice asking if he should introduce himself properly and if he was only going to tell them his name. The leader of the group, Tang Ki, a guy in a white shirt with black hair, asked what this white hair was and if it violated school rules. Placing his face on his hand, he asked if he got here through connections. Another guy, with his hands behind his head, said with a grin about nepotism. Zhu Ting asked him not to make things difficult for his new classmate. She said that Ling Si transferred to this school due to some family circumstances. Ling Si closed his eyes and thought that he knew this guy, and he was one of the students known for causing a lot of trouble for the school. He thought that there always seemed to be one or two of these characters in every class. The main character said that he likes to lead a lonely and quiet lifestyle. He added that he enjoys playing games, as he assumes everyone else does. Ling Si said that his hair color is natural, and the school board should be aware of this. He told him not to hesitate to ask questions if he had any. Tang Ki clicked his tongue in irritation. He said with a grin that he still had questions, but he would ask them himself later when he had the chance. Zhu Ting told Ling Si to take a seat. She asked if a seat in the back would suit him, since he transferred so suddenly. The main character, looking at the desk near the window, thought that this was the so-called protagonist's seat. Tang Ki called out to the guy at the next desk with a grin. Smiling, the guy put his foot in front of the protagonist's legs. Imagining how he would trip and fall, he thought that he wanted the guy with white hair to trip. Ling Si said that this is lame. The guy looked at him in fear. Ling Si, looking at him with a threatening expression, stepped on his foot with force. The guy fell from the chair and grabbed his leg with a scream. Zhu Ting asked what happened. The guy replied that it was nothing. He wondered what was wrong with this guy and how he was able to exert so much force when his foot landed. Approaching Tang Ki, the protagonist quietly told him that he should be grateful for holding back his powers. Frowning, he quietly told him that otherwise he would have broken his footman's bone. Ling Si approached the guy, asking if he was okay and if he was sitting incorrectly. He helped him up. Zhu Ting smiled awkwardly and said that their classmate just happened to fall. She urged, since everything was fine, to continue the lesson. Tang Ki gritted his teeth and thought that this guy seems to be strong. Zhu Ting said she would continue the lesson. The main character, opening the door, said, he is back. The old man greeted him. Standing in a pink apron in the middle of a sparkling kitchen, he asked how his first day of school was. Ling Si replied that it went quite well. The old man said he was glad to hear this. He told him to take a shower and that lunch would be ready soon. He guessed he must be hungry. The old man told him that he must study hard now, because having knowledge in his belly is much more important than filling it with just food. After undressing, Ling Si thought that he was still not used to their renovated home. Standing under the shower, he thought that they had not come for him even after school. He frowned. The main character, covering his body with soap, thought that even a blind person would have understood that their facial expressions when they looked at him did not contain a particle of goodwill. He wondered if they had to play out the typical bully the transfer student scenario. 
He thought that these people really had nothing to do. Turning on the water, Lynx he thought that now he doesn't care about such things happening to him. Smiling, he thought that current him is quite looking forward to such things unfolding. Lynx he remembered his past life with a blank look. He remembered several people standing around him in the toilet while he lay on the floor, clutching his head. The main character thought that even when he was forced into the toilet to be beaten, he had to endure it all. He thought it was because he had no one to talk to about it, and even if he talked to the teachers, nothing would change and all they could do was scold them in the office or meet with their parents. Lynx he thought that he was not some top student after all, so there was no need for them to go all out for him. He thought that, on the contrary, he was beaten even more if he did something. Lynx he thought that the reason why they offended him was very simple. Lynx he sits on the ground, surrounded by other disciples. The contents of his bag are scattered on the ground in front of him. He thought it was because he didn't have parents and that's why no one cared about him. People throw various office supplies at the main character's back. Lynx he remembered the two men discussing him behind his back. A man with blonde hair and a pink jacket said to look at that orphan. He said it looked like he had been beaten again. The man in the blue jacket laughed unpleasantly. Lang Si thought that no one wanted to be friends with such a special person, and such a person was an ideal target for bullying. He thought that no one cared about him, be it his classmates, teachers or neighbors. Lang Si looked forward blankly. He closed his eyes. The main character thought that in this life he wants to stand up for himself from his past life, whether in the game or in real life. Game character Ling Si stood with his hands in his pants pockets. Remembering his teammates, he thought that he would not allow anyone to mock him again. A dialogue box informs you that guild-owned dungeons are now open. The main character and his team stood among other people with swords. A crowd of people is walking down the street. A dialogue box stated that guild-owned dungeons are finally open. Ling Si, Ruko, Tilly's, Dark Feather and Tiana stood in a street full of people. Ruko told the protagonist that he heard that they were a little outnumbered this time, especially in terms of reinforcements. The main character called out to Wasabi, and he responded, being behind him. He said he had almost everything he asked for. Lang Si said that he believes in him. He told him to continue. Wasabi said it's bad, and it looks like Wolf's Fang is taking Guildone Dungeon very seriously. He said that for the sake of reinforcements alone, they had mobilized members of their second division for almost all reinforcement slots. Frowning, Wasabi added that, as he already knew, their vice guildmaster, Squirrel, would be leading them this time. He said that this was a rare occurrence, and of all the five major guilds, only Wolf's Fang had sent someone at the level of a guild leader to lead the team. The protagonist asked if he had learned anything about their goals. Wasabi said he can't say for sure that this information is true, but he thinks it must be true. He said that from what he heard, Squirrel had a sudden surge of power, and on top of that, he secretly founded a team called Black Hunt. He said that all its members are elite from their first division. Wasabi, frowning, said that their goal this time should be to seize control of the remaining three checkpoint stations under the ownership of Nebulous with one fell swoop and gain complete control over the dungeon's resources. Chiana sounded worried. Ling Si frowned and said that this was an incredible coincidence. One hour before the opening of the guild-owned dungeons, Chiana called Ling Si over with a hand gesture. The main character asked what happened. She fussily repeated for him to come to her. Ling Si asked where they were going. He said he wasn't done with delegations yet. Tiana said they arrived. She told him to go that way. In front of him was the silhouette of a man sitting at a table. Stillwaters closed the book upon noticing Ling Si. He apologized with a smile for forcing him to come here even though he was still busy. He asked him to sit down. Ling Si refused and thought that it was the hardest for him to deal with such people. Stillwaters, standing up, asked the main character what he thought about their chances of winning the Guildone dungeon this time. Ling Si asked again in surprise. He wondered why he was suddenly asking him such a strange question. He thought that it was impossible for him to waste time thinking about such lame things. Stillwaters said that he knows that the situation looks bad for Nebulous, and after all, Nebulous is still ranked last among the five major guilds. He watered the yellow flowers from a steel watering can. Stillwaters asked Ling Si how he, as the head of the guild, would rate their chances of winning this dungeon. The protagonist replied that based on their current powers, he would say the odds are 4 to 6 between Nebulous and Wolf's Fang. He added that this is only in the most ideal circumstances, because after all, Wolf's Fang is in third place. Stillwaters asked him what he thought they should do. Ling Si asked again. Frowning, he thought. Ling Si raised one eyebrow and said that they needed to avoid large-scale battles and focus on maintaining their advantage by properly using their elite forces. He said that they need to gather their forces and avoid direct confrontations, perhaps. Stillwaters praised him for his perceptive analysis. He said he now has even higher expectations for Shadow. Embarrassed, Ling Si thanked him hesitantly. Setting the water ink on the table, Stillwaters said his method was very simple. Turning around, he said that this way is never compromise, never retreat and continue to fight until the very end. 
Smiling, he added that they had yet to see the view from the top. Lang Si remained silent in surprise. Stillwaters said that is why he wants to ask for his help. Smirking, he said that, as he said, Shadow is their elite team. He said that he needed to lead Shadow in this dungeon to capture the outer checkpoint of the Wolf's Fang Guild station. Stillwaters told him to work together with their comrades, who would attack from the inside to surround them and capture the three checkpoint stations under the control of the Wolf's Fang Guild with one fell swoop. The main character thought that everything was as Tiana had suggested. He remembered her saying that she thought Stillwaters wanted to take over all three checkpoint stations of the Wolf's Fang Guild and take over the entire area for themselves. Ling Xi thought there was something wrong with him leaving this to Team Shadow. The main character said that, as far as he knows, Shadow is just one of many elite teams under his command. He asked if he was worried about leaving it to an independent team like his. Stopping, he realized something. Stillwaters grinned. The main character opened his eyes in surprise. Looking at Stillwaters, who was adjusting his glasses with a smile, Ling Xi thought that he was indeed very prudent. Lang Si said that he understood. As he left, he said that he accepted the task and they would talk later. Coco Lai, standing around the corner, said that he most likely already understood his intentions, and this Lang Si is very smart. Stillwaters said that Lang Si gives him a strange feeling because he looks like he knows everything but still rushes into chaos. Turning to Coco Lai, he said that he would use this opportunity to understand him better, be it in terms of competence or dedication to the guild. Frowning, he said they would see if he deserved their trust. Tiana said her guess was correct. Turning to Ling Si with a worried face, she said that he was saying that Stillwaters was trying to test his competence and loyalty. She asked if this made him angry. Ling Si asked why this should make him angry. He said he didn't care. He said it didn't interfere with his original plan anyway. Ling Si said that he stayed in Nebulous all this time because of all the help she provided him, so there is nothing insincere about him being here. Tiana looked at him, blushing. Ling Si said that the dungeon will open soon. He told her not to waste any more time here. A dialogue box announced that the battle for resources in Guildone Dungeon was beginning. Ling Si and his team stood in front of the high stairs to the top. The protagonist, frowning, told Tiana that they would leave the battle for resources to them. Walking forward, he mentally called the shadow team behind him. Ling Si thought that he didn't expect that their missions with Squirrel would be the same. Several people dressed as warriors and magicians ran along the mountain path. Ling Si and his team stood in a place with a huge staircase and wooden buildings, standing in a half squat. Ling Si said that the fourth checkpoint station of the Wolf's Fang Guild is right in front of them. He told them to follow him and they would go around behind him. The main character said that the people who bribed Wasabi would be waiting for them there. He said that they were on shift now and they would open the back door for them to enter the checkpoint station. Tilly said, frowning, that she thought they would force their way through. She said it was boring. Ling Si took a look at her and said that once the dungeon officially opens, every checkpoint station will be filled with high-level players. He said that they would be on a completely different level from those they fought before. The main character, peeking out from behind a rock, asked her if she was sure that the four of them, with their current equipment, could cope with about a hundred of these players. Tilly's frowned and said that she thought that the players at the station checkpoint would be in a hurry to fight for resources. She said she had never participated in guild-owned dungeons and didn't know it would be like this. Ruko said that these checkpoint stations outside guild-owned dungeons serve two functions. He said that the first role is a point for the revival of players who died in the dungeon, and the second is a point for the arrival of those who were sent as reinforcements. Ling Si said that the dungeon is a battlefield for both sides, and successfully obtained resources can be exchanged for glory points for the guild. He said that the higher the guild's glory points, the better the rewards. He added that they will not be involved in a battle for resources this time. Tilly's, embarrassed and frowning, said that it still sounded like a pain. Ruko said with a smirk that while Ling Si was stuck in his job change task, he ran through some small-scale guild-owned dungeons with other guild guys. He said that it seems that the larger the scale of a guild-owned dungeon, the more checkpoint stations there are. He asked Ling Si if he planned to reach their destination through the Wolf's Fang Guild territory. Ling Si said that this could be called a shortcut. He said that from inside the lands of the fourth checkpoint of Wolf's Fang Guild station, they could reach the outskirts of the dungeon in the shortest time. Ling Si said that the task that their team was assigned was to get to the first checkpoint station of the Wolf Fang Guild, which is located on the outermost side. He said his plan involved avoiding direct confrontation and sneaking in through the rocks. He said it should be effective. Dark Feather grinned and said that capturing all the checkpoint stations was like declaring war, and that was interesting. Ling Si chuckled and said that Wolf's Fang probably wasn't worried at all because they were the number three guild. He said that they didn't seem to be afraid to fight back if they lost their stations. He added that if Nebulous captured them all, then they would have a stronger reason to declare war on them. Tilly said that guilds are such a pain. 
She said that workshops are much easier, and they simply do any work that they give them, and if there is no work, then they go through the dungeons to sell objects. She said that all these schemes only cause her headache. Lang Si called them to the territory of the fourth station. He told them to try to be as invisible as possible. They jumped down. The dialog box says, unaffiliated member. The back door cannot be opened. Lang Si entered the password, which was agreed by Wasabi and another party. A green checkmark appeared on the dialog box. The man, opening the door, asked Lang Si whether he, who he confused the door. Lang Si replied that a warrior of love came. Tilly's laughed at this secret code. The protagonist thought irritably what kind of secret code was. He thought that Wasabi must have done it on purpose. The guy said this is the right code. He extended his hand, he said to give him the rest that they agreed, and he will let them go. Ling Si gave him a small white bag. Ling Si and his team ran inside, and the guy at the door told them to hurry and hide. Closing the door, he grinned. The voice shouted that he was wondering how many of them would come. Ling Si frowned in surprise. There were several people from Wolf's Fang in front of him, and one of them laughed. Tilly said that, it seems, Wasabi was deceived. Ling Si replied that it looks like that. The guy, smiling viciously and laughing, said that he decided to play along with them when he came to them. He said they were a bunch of fools since mess with Wolf's Fang are trying. A large girl in level 35 in a magic hat said that she was sorry that there are only four of them. She said that she could not believe that 15 people were sitting here in anticipation for this. Laughing, she was glad that they did not report this to others because it would be a shame. The guy with a sword told them to be grateful for treating them so well, nobody's from Nebulous. Having frowned, Ling Si said that they did not tell others, this is good news. He said that it would be difficult if there were more. The girl raised an eyebrow irritably. The guy behind her said that these four look familiar. Dark Feather, shrouded in dark energy, said he would look for a good vantage point. Ling Si told him to take care of everyone who tries to escape. The dialog box described, Scattering Crow, Post-Promotion Skill, An Archer Exclusive Skill, Vanish into thin air for 6 seconds, like a crow scattering in the air and disappearing from sight. When attacked, the casting of the skill will be interrupted. The girl, pointing her finger at them, asked what they were discussing. She asked if they were trying to help at least one of their comrades escape. She said they were naive. The girl ordered to be more careful and not allow the one who had become invisible to escape. The guy in the helmet said in surprise that these four were from a team that had recently made a lot of noise. He tried to remember what it was called. The girl asked what he was talking about. Tilly said that after rushing the team leaderboard they did not appear in public, and it was only natural that they would not recognize them. Ling Si and his teams went to meet them halfway. The girl asked who they were. The guy exclaimed that he remembered, and he was the same thief. He said they were Shadow from Nebulous. Ling Si looked at them with a frown. Rushing up, he hit the guy with a dagger. The girl opened her mouth in surprise. The guy screamed in pain. The girl thought that he was fast. A staff appeared in her hand and another guy shouted that it was Shadow from Nebulous. He ordered them to be killed immediately. The girl, looking around, wondered where he had gone. The bullet, shrouded in yellow energy, cut through the air. She rushed towards the magician girl. The girl twirled the staff above her head, and the bullet hit the ground next to her. Dark Feather stood on the corner of the wall. They exclaimed that it was an ambush and that it was the archer who had just disappeared. Dark Feather, looking through the scope of a sniper rifle, said, GG. He pulled the trigger and the shot hit one of the guys in the head and the other in the back. Tilly struck with her staff covered in flames, scattering the wolf's fang men. Ling Si ordered them to act quickly and not leave anyone alive. Ruko obeyed. Tilly stood frowning, surrounded by flames. The girl, pointing her finger at them, asked where this voice came from. She ordered that this thief be found immediately. Ling Si's silhouette appeared behind her. He said he was here. Turning around, she saw the main character in front of her with a dagger in his hand. The sun was shining above the checkpoint station, surrounded by rocks. There was an explosion at the back of the station. Tilly's, surrounded by flames, said they were too slow. Frowning, she told her opponent that his casting speed was no good. Hearing the scream, she looked to the side. Ling Si slammed his dagger into the girl's red magic barrier. The guy, waving his sword between them, ordered to protect the captain. He ordered the clerics to hurry up and heal the captain. The captain, gritting her teeth, used the energy barrier. Dialog box described, energy barrier, mage skill. This spell can be cast without the use of a staff. Magical energy is gathered within the body and released at one go to repel all surrounding enemies, as well as create a high defense magic shield that will last for 15 seconds. It is an excellent life-saving skill. Ling Si frowned and thought it was their captain. He thought he wished he could kill her with one blow. He ordered everyone to refrain from using flashy skills, otherwise they would attract even more people here. The captain swore. Pointing her hand forward, she shouted how dare they ambush them. She ordered them to be surrounded. The guy jumped at Ling Si, swinging his sword. 
the main character blocked his attack with his dagger. The guy was surprised to see the approaching attack of the main character. Lang Si stabbed him with a dagger, and the guy was enveloped in purple electricity. The guy will believe that they will surround them and attack. He ordered to focus on the thief first. The two guys charged at Lang Si, swinging their swords and daggers. Two shots of yellow energy hit the guys, and they asked in surprise what it was. They were enveloped in yellow electricity from the electro binding skill. Lang Si turned to Dark Feather and said that he had learned electro binding. He said that was not bad. The captain asked what their archers were doing. She ordered to hurry up and take down this gunner. The archer exclaimed that he was too far away and his position was too high and they would not be able to find a good position to attack in such a short time. The captain, frowning, shouted that she didn't care. She ordered to hurry up and find a way. Standing behind the box, the archer said that he had found a place and they could get into it from here. As he pulled back his bow, he grinned. Ruko appeared behind him. Frowning, he said that he would not give him such a chance. Using Gravitron Swirl Phase 1, he lifted objects and people into the air. A guy with black hair, looking at the silhouette of a huge Ruko, asked in surprise what this thing is that is increasing in size. Looking at Ruko, he asked if it was a monster. He used Gravitron Swirl Phase 1 and the purple energy began to pull people and objects towards Ruko. The guy shouted that his body no longer listened to him. He asked what kind of skill this was. The captain, surrounded by red magic, asked if they thought she became captain for no reason. She demanded that her people be released. Enveloped in pink energy, she used Song of Cleansing. Dialogue box described, Song of Cleansing, Mage Skill, summons a diamond-shaped barrier. This barrier can remove all crowd control effects. If any form of damage is taken, the barrier will disappear after one second. Ling Si frowned and thought that she was going to interrupt Ruko and he should stop her. He was surprised to notice that Dark Feather called out to Tilly's in a whisper. He said he would break her barrier and the rest would be up to her. He fired a sniper rifle. Tilly's replied that she understood. Lang Si swung his daggers and struck two opponents. Grinning, he noticed that they were making up strategies as they went along. He decided to see how they would handle it. The bullet approached the pink barrier and penetrated it. Tilly's swung her fire staff behind the captain. The captain said with a grin that even if her barrier was broken, the gravity swirl would not affect her. Enveloped in pink energy, she said that they would not be able to break her spell. Tilly's asked if this was true. Hitting her with the staff interrupted her use of the spell. The captain flew down from the force of the blow. Using the flaming ring of judgment, Tilly's shouted at her to fall into the swirl and receive the justice of these flames. The inscription said that the combined skill had been achieved, and they used flaming gravitron swirl of judgment. The flames have been tempered by gravity, and the blazing ring of judgment shall rise above the disrespectful. Enveloped in purple energy and flames, the captain ordered those remaining to hurry and call for reinforcements. The shot hit her in the head and her health dropped to zero. Dark Feather, with a gun in his hand, apologized and said that he couldn't let her do whatever she wanted. Frowning, he said, GG. Ruko grinned and Tilly's frowned. Lynx he thought when they learned to use combined skills. He thought that this was to be expected from the best players from his past life, and the combined skills are all about timing. He thought that by rushing or slowing down even a little, he could ruin everything. The main character thought that they were growing much faster than he expected. Smirking, he thought that perhaps he was no longer able to predict the heights that Shadow would reach in the future. As he walked towards his comrades who stood next to the huge flames, he thought that he could allow his growth to be slower than theirs. People stand, swinging pickaxes over purple crystals. The pickaxe pierced the purple crystal. Battle for resources in the Guildone dungeon. A lot of people are mining crystals around the huge blue portal. Tiana held out her hand and ordered the sixth room to move forward. Frowning, she told all units to retreat and heal if they took damage. She ordered the clerics to prioritize healing the tanks. Dira, clashing swords with a guy in armor, told Tiana that they were calling for reinforcements much faster than them. Above Dira's head you can see that she is level 26. She said that at this rate they would slowly be pushed out of the areas they controlled. She added that in addition to this, the average level of Wolf's Fang members is higher than theirs. Dira asked why they didn't call for reinforcements from the 2nd Division. Tiana, using green magic, told her to calm down. She said that she had everything taken into account and they just needed to try to hold out now before calling in reinforcements from the 2nd Division. The man behind Tiana swung his sword at her. Dira, waving her sword, shouted that she would not allow them to lay a finger on Tiana. Using Earthquaking Slice, she pushed the attacker away and rushed towards Tiana. Grabbing her from behind, she asked if she was okay. Holding her sword forward, Dira said that her task was to protect her, not this position. Tiana, blushing, asked what she was saying. Dira said that she is the captain, and without her they will lose the backbone of the team. She asked, stuttering, who would protect her if not her? 
Tiana, creating a blue magical barrier, told her to stand behind her magical shield. Dira continued to talk about how it was her duty to keep her safe. Tiana thought with a frown that she hoped they could hold out until they got the signal. Before the opening of guild-owned dungeons, Ling Si told Tiana that based on the guild master's intentions, this battle would rely on the synergy between Shadow and the division Tiana commanded. Frowning, he told her to promise him that until the signal was received, they would limit their encounters with Wolf's Fang to minor skirmishes and not reveal their true strength. The protagonist said that at the last critical moment they would surprise them with a wave of coordinated attacks. He said that when that time came, if Wolf's Fang's forces fell, they would be able to destroy them with one blow and capture all of their checkpoint stations. Ryuko, hiding behind a rock near the fifth station, said that he thought they would attract the attention of the people from Wolf's Fang, but in the end they were able to get out without any problems. He chuckled. Tilly's told him to be quiet. She asked if he wanted them to be found. Leng Xi told them both to be quiet because they were at the outskirts of the fifth station. He said that there were a lot of people from Wolf's Fang here, and if they attracted their attention, they would be in big trouble. Frowning, he told them to follow him. The main character said that they would leave the fourth station, pass by the fifth and sixth stations and head straight to the edge of the cliff. Darkfeather asked if he was sure that they could get to the sixth station through these rocks. He said he's not sure where he gets this information. He asked if he had tried this before. Smirking, Ling Si said that although he had not tried it, he was confident that it would work. He said he was willing to bet that no one had discovered this method yet. Tilly's, placing her hand on Ruko's head, said with a frown that she always wanted to ask where she gets these unusual strategies from. She said that he constantly comes up with completely unexpected solutions. Tilly's asked if it was possible that he had some secret connections. She asked if there was someone telling him the details in person. Ling Si smiled awkwardly and said that they should watch the forums often, pay attention to the official write-ups on the dungeon maps, and spend a lot of time in the Heavenland Library, and then they would be able to come up with unconventional ideas. The others remained silent. The main character, grinning awkwardly, thought that he could not tell them that he was a regressor. He said that, simply put, it's all about research. He said the time had come and told them to follow him. Tilly's, Ruko and Darkfeather looked at him with raised eyebrows. They looked out from behind the rock. Ling Si threw Ruko over the wooden wall. Ling Si's team sneaks past the battlefield. Ling Si's team fights a group of opponents. Ling Si asked if they had lost them. Dark Feather, looking through the scope, said that there was no one behind them. Standing on the tree, Ling Si suggested starting to prepare. He said they would go around this rock. Ruko, climbing the tree, exhaled heavily and said that they had finally arrived. He said he was tired. Looking at the cliffside, Ruko asked if that was there. He said there was no one here. Tilly's and Ling Si jumped forward and the protagonist said that this was their chance. Standing on the rock, Ling Si said that no one was guarding it. A dark magical seal appeared under their feet. The main character opened his eyes in surprise. He noticed that it was a rune trap. Ruko asked what it was. A dialogue box reported that rune prison has been triggered. Ling Si jumped up and ordered a retreat. The dark energy from the trap enveloped them. The dialogue box described, contact-based rune prison, item-based spell, a hidden spell that will be triggered upon contact. This high-level spell is a proud invention of the legendary wizard Durant. The rune prison has to be continuously channeled by two mages to be maintained. If either mage is interrupted, the spell will be cancelled. Imprisoned targets cannot use their skills. The maximum duration of the spell is six minutes. Ling Si jumped away from the dark magic circle. Gritting his teeth in surprise, he thought about when they were discovered. He thought that it was impossible and they couldn't be pursued, and Dark Feather confirmed this too. Frowning, Ling Xi thought that someone had set this up in advance. Hearing the voice, he looked up. The voice asked why it was the four of them again. The silhouette on the rock above said that he believed they would have to be taught a lesson again. Ling Xi looked up. He was surprised to see that it was Squirrel. Frowning, he thought it was him. He thought about those behind him. Several silhouettes appeared behind him. They were dressed in black hoods. Ling Xi thought that he was wondering when his black hunt would show up. Silhouettes of people stood on the rocks in front of Ling Si. Ruko, Tilly's and Dark Feather stood inside a dark magic circle. Squirrel said that he believed that all people should have a clear understanding of their limits. He said that he only let him go last time because he didn't want to corner them all. Ling Si repeated his words about not wanting to corner them all. Squirrel, closing his eyes, said that it was true and their actions were easy to predict. He said there was no challenge in that. Squirrel said that Nebulous seemed to lack professional players since they decided to resort to using the likes of them. Exhaling, he said that he knew Nebulous was up to something, so he guessed they would attack the most unprotected border. Opening his eyes, he said he didn't expect to be right. A dagger appeared in his hand and he said he didn't want to spend too much time on such trivial things. Squirrel said he was giving them one chance to drop their equipment and escape. 
The guy with the beard took off his hood and said with a smirk that by doing so, they, Black Hunt, would spare their lives. Links he told them that they should know one thing. He said that they are not insulting him, but Shadow, Tilly's, Ruko, and Darkfeather stood inside the magic circle with grim faces. Ling Si frowned and looked at Squirrel. Ruko told Ling Si that he would leave it to him to interrupt their mages. The mage on the rock behind Squirrel raised a staff shrouded in blue energy. The guy with the eye patch said he could talk big. The mage girl told Squirrel that she wasn't sure if he noticed, but this thief did manage to dodge contact base rune prison. She told him through the dialogue box that it was a bit of an unexpected reaction speed. The mage said that as far as he knew, contact-based rune prison is a skill with a cast time length of a second, and he managed to leave the range of the skill despite that. Squirrel said with a calm face that it wasn't surprising. He said that they probably just missed a bit when they used the spell, or it could just be trivial luck. He added that it was also possible that he had prepared in advance. Squirrel said that he couldn't have such speed otherwise. He was surprised to notice that Lynx he had disappeared. The protagonist appeared behind the mage. Turning around, Squirrel ordered him to take a protective stance. He was surprised to think of Ling Xia's speed. Grabbing the mage's arm, the guy with the beard blocked Ling Xia's strike with his shield. The guy swung his dagger behind the protagonist's back. Pushing off the opponent's shield with his foot, Ling Xia jumped to the side, dodging the dagger guy's strike. He said that he didn't expect anything less from the number 3 guild's elite team. Smirking, he said as they quickly regrouped into a defensive stance. Crouching on the rock above them, Ling Xi said that they said that his speed was simple luck. Straightening up, he asked why don't they see if what happens next can be achieved by simple luck. Squirrel with a grim face asked if he was threatening him. Frowning, he said he was the underdog he had defeated earlier. Squirrel ordered him to be killed, and Black Hunt rushed into attack. The guy with the eye patch used Bird Tracer and asked how dare a simple thief from Nebulous act so cocky in front of them. Wolf's Fang. A dialogue box described Bird Tracer, thief exclusive skill. The user of this skill will speed up after locking onto their target. Their first subsequent attack will deal three times the damage. This skill lasts for two seconds. Shrouded in purple electricity, the guy rushed forward, hitting Ling Si with his dagger. The guy with the shield cursed and said that he got to him first. The guy with the eye patch grinned. Gritting his teeth, he noticed that Ling Si had turned into a purple evil spirit. Noticing that it was a clone, the guy wondered when he had done this. Ling Si jumped through the crowd of opponents towards Squirrel. Squirrel said that it seemed like he had really gotten stronger. He ordered him to block, and a guy with daggers appeared between them. They started exchanging blows. The guy with gray hair clenched his teeth and thought he couldn't believe the frequency of his attacks and the way he was blocking their blades. He thought he was being pushed back. The guy thought that he was deliberately not giving him time to use his skills. He thought about the fact that he should not forget that he had teammates to back him up. Behind Ling Xia's back, a guy with a sword and a guy with a shield appeared. The guy with gray hair shouted at them to get this guy off him. One of the attackers used Crashing Sword Ripple. The other one used Sword Edge Shadow. Ling Xi frowned and thought about the two of them attacking together, which was convenient. Ling Xi was enveloped in purple energy. Using Rapid Shadow Thrust, he flew past the attackers. The mage shouted to them about being behind him. The guys turned around in surprise. Squirrel frowned in surprise, wondering if he had taken advantage of the 0.3 seconds of invulnerability from Rapid Shadow Thrust to avoid guided skills like Crashing Sword Ripple. A dialogue box reported that he had cancelled Rapid Shadow Thrust's follow-up damage. Ling Si smirked. Squirrel thought about the fact that he had done this at the same moment that Crashing Sword Ripple's follow-up damage was being dealt. He wondered if it was possible. Ling Si, flying between the opponents, hit the ground in front of Squirrel. Squirrel, humming, said that as expected, it was still a top-time micro-movement. Smirking, he told him to attack and show him if he had indeed gotten stronger. Squirrel called him a loser. Ling Si stood in front of him with daggers in his hands. Squirrel and Ling Si stood opposite each other. Squirrel, shrouded in dark energy, frowned and said that the result would be the same. Using the shadow snake technique, he rushed forward. Ling Si watched his approach in surprise. Striking with his dagger, Squirrel asked if his top time was only good for dodging, or if he was trying to tell him that was all he was capable of. The guy with the beard said with a smirk that he wasn't using any skills, and along with that, mimicking the way this thief exerted pressure on them. He said the Squirrel is playing with him. The other guy said that this thief doesn't seem to be able to stand up to Squirrel at all, and he can only defend himself. Squirrel wondered if he was really too overwhelmed by his attacks to fight back. He thought that he was able to flawlessly dodge each of his attacks. Looking at Ling Si, he thought that this was what he expected from top time. Squirrel thought that these attacks were not enough for him to slip up. The protagonist grinned and thanked him for bringing him here. He said this was exactly where he wanted to go. Eyes widening in surprise, Squirrel thought that something was wrong and he had been too focused on him all this time. Ling Si was next to the mage. Squirrel thought that he had been leading him all this time. 
The mage called out to Squirrel, Lang Si was using Throat Slasher. Squirrel angrily shouted that he was playing with it. Lang Si struck with his dagger, and the mage blocked his attack with her staff. A dialog box announced that casting had been interrupted. The protagonist smirked and said that if he hadn't, he wouldn't have relaxed enough to let him get close to them. The other maid shouted to Squirrel that she could not cast the spell on her own, and the prison was dissipating. Squirrel, shrouded in dark energy, swore. Lang Si grinned and apologized for not taking him seriously. Ruko, Tilly's, and Dark Feather appeared next to him, and the main character said with a smirk that they could now. He told Shadow to repay them a thousandfold. Squirrel, pointing his hand forward, ordered Black Hunt to kill them. The mage used Azure Flames of Destruction, pointing the blue flames forward. Ruko used Golden Shield, blocking the spell with his shield. The mage opened her mouth in surprise, and Tilly's, who was nearby, noted that he was playing with fire. Tilly's said that she would take her up on that. Frowning, she said to leave the mage to her. The shot hit the dagger. Dark Feather said he was interested in fighting thieves. Holding a golden pistol in his hand, he said to leave those two to him. Ruko smirked. Frowning, he found himself enveloped in purple energy. Magnifying himself, he shouted to leave the warriors to him. He swung his huge hand. Ling Si, smirking, said that everyone seemed to have chosen their targets. He asked to be allowed to settle the score with Squirrel. Squirrel stood in front of him. Ruko swung a huge arm. Behind him, Tilly's was fighting the mage. Ruko hit the ground with force. Dark Feather was aiming with a pistol. The guy under the invisibility effect said he couldn't believe that an archer would send himself to be executed. He said he was being very presumptuous. He asked where the glass cannon archer got the courage to challenge them, the thieves, much less the two of them. The other guy whispered to him with a smirk, urging him to work cohesively and use the backstab on him at the same time. He said he was willing to bet they could kill him in one hit. They rushed behind Dark Feather's back. Dark Feather smirked. He fired his pistols. The shot hit the guy with the dagger. A dialogue box announced that his invisibility status had been revoked. Another shot hit the other thief with the dagger. The guy with gray hair frowned in surprise and asked how he had managed to spot them both at the same time. Dark Feather said it was a simple matter to defeat them. He said he doubted they knew it, but he thought the most important thing for an archer was good eyesight. His eye glowed yellow, and he used Starlit Goldeneye. A dialogue box described Starlit Goldeneye, archer exclusive skill. Pupils are transformed into golden eyes, massively boosting the user's perceptiveness and observation for a short duration. No manner of disguise or invisibility can hide from these eyes. Duration, 60 seconds. Links, he said, seeming like everyone was busy doing business. Squirrel stood in front of him, shrouded in black energy. Links, he called out to Squirrel. Remembering the previous battle with him, he said that it was time for them to settle the score as well. Squirrel said with a smirk that he seemed to have made some progress. Links, he stepped forward and said that it was probably more than he could imagine. Rushing forward to attack, he thought it was time for a showdown. Coco Lai asked Stillwaters if he thought Ling Si would be able to accomplish the task. Sitting at the table, she said that if their data was correct, his team would face serious opponents. Stillwaters said the name Squirrel thoughtfully. Coco Lai said that she didn't think he would put together his team, Black Hunt. She said that according to what they could figure out from their data, six members of the Black Hunt team were in the first division of the Wolf's Fang Guild. Stillwaters, standing next to the pink flowers, asked what was wrong with that. Coco Lai said that he had entrusted an extremely important step to Ling Si, and if his plan failed, it would directly affect the outcome of the entire operation. Frowning, she said that although Ling Si is promising, she is afraid that his opponent is very strong. Recalling Squirrel's face, Coco Lai said that to be honest, she is not sure if she can defeat him herself. She asked if he knew which dungeon Squirrel had been going through for the past few days. She said it was the dark crevasse of the depths. Coco Lai said that there are rumors that you can get a very strong skill in this dungeon, and since the official instructions are vague, the specific details are unknown. She said that the chance of falling out is so low that no one has gotten this skill yet, but Squirrel has formed several teams to go through this dungeon over a hundred times. She said she didn't know if he was able to get it. Stillwaters repeated the name of the dungeon with a smile. He said that it would be an even bigger challenge for Ling Si. Coco Lai frowned and said with a cluck of her tongue that he makes her look stupid for being worried. She said she doesn't understand why he has so much confidence in him. Stillwaters asked if she remembered what he said to her when he invited her to Nebulous. Coco Lai was silent for a moment. Stillwaters looked out the window with a smile. Coco Lai, relaxing her eyebrows, replied that she remembered. She asked how she could forget such shocking words. She remembered Stillwaters asking her if she would help him find a truly capable leader with the power to surpass that man. Coco Lai said that he said about a leader with the power to surpass that man. Covering her eyes, she said that at first, she thought it was empty words, because that person was the head of the number one guild, Divine Chamber, Kaiser Storm Mountain. 
Coco Lai, closing her eyes, said that she didn't know what spell he used on her back then since she just agreed. She exhaled. Stillwaters said that he was never a person throwing around empty words. He said she should know what he was like from childhood. Coco Lai, embarrassed, said she wasn't his very close childhood friend or anything like that. Stillwaters said he didn't say that. He said she hasn't changed at all. Laughing, he said she keeps getting so worked up every time he talks about their childhood. Turning around, he said he has always sought the so-called view from the top, but he realizes he lacks the ability to achieve it on his own. Stillwaters said with a smile that he will never be Storm Mountain's equal, whether in Heavenland or in real life, he has always been better than him since they were kids. Coco Lai said that she didn't think so. Stillwaters said that Storm Mountain managed to make Divine Chamber the number one guild in the game, and there is no better proof of that than that fact. He said that in the beginning he tried his best in hopes of one day surpassing it. Taking off his glasses, he said that, after a while, he changed his mind. Looking ahead, he said that if he couldn't surpass him himself, he could just use his abilities to find someone who was capable of doing so. Stillwaters said that if he could find an even more capable leader, then he could lead him to the view from the top. Frowning, he said that he might even be able to lead him above that. Coco Lai, raising an eyebrow, asked if he wanted to say that Ling Si was the one he was looking for. Putting on his glasses, Stillwaters said he wasn't sure about it himself. He said he has seen videos of Ling Si and his team in battle on the forum, and he may not be the best in terms of skills, but he senses that possibility from the look on his face. He said that this facial expression is not something you can see on a normal person. Coco Lai asked what look he is talking about. Stillwaters said, an undying will. Lang Si on the screen stood with a serious frown on his face. The main character ran to attack Squirrel. They began to exchange dagger strikes. Squirrel said that fighting a person who had mastered top time was very rare. Smirking, he said that this opportunity is even rarer if that person is of the same class. He said that it was interesting. A dark energy struck Lang Si. Frowning, the squirrel said that he had a pretty good idea. Using rapid comprehension, he pierced a copy of Lang Si and said that he had already noticed his evil spirit's invisibility. Lang Si thought in surprise that he had managed to read his movements. The squirrel told him that he wasn't the only one with evil spirit's invisibility. A black and green evil spirit appeared in front of the protagonist. Turning around, Ling Si thought to himself from behind. Squirrel struck with his dagger, and Ling Si blocked its strike. Smirking, Squirrel said that he blocked his strike, and he wasn't bad. Using bullet velocity, Squirrel pushed the main character back. A dialogue box described bullet velocity, a skill usable by all classes. A basic attack launched at the traveling speed of a bullet. It may be a basic attack familiar to everyone, but it can still serve to turn the tide at a critical moment. The protagonist gritted his teeth and thought that, as expected of a vice guildmaster of Wolf's Fang, his top time had gotten noticeably better. Squirrel said that it looked like it would end the same way as last time. He told Ling Si that he thought he could think of something that would surprise him in all the time that had passed. Smirking, he said that he still had a hard time landing a killing blow on someone with top time. Squirrel said to get it over with quickly. The object in his hand was shrouded in a red aura. He attached a small skull to the hilt of his dagger and said that he would show him the treasure he obtained in the dark crevasse of the depth's dungeon. Ling Si, frowning, wondered if it could be that skill. The squirrel, shrouded in a red aura, used the brilliance of gazing into the crevasse and said that killing him with this technique was his gift to Ling Si. At the foot of the cliff, the battles continued. Dark Feather was shooting at the two thieves with his pistols. Noticing something, he turned around. Behind a cloud of dust, he saw two huge red hands. Tilly's asked what it was. A large red eye appeared on the squirrel's forehead. Ruko turned around and frowned, thinking he had a bad feeling from that light. The guy exclaimed that it was the brilliance of gazing into the crevasse of their boss. The guy with the beard replied that he knew Squirrel used that skill. He said it was an honor to see him in action. Squirrel stood in a fighting stance, shrouded in a red aura. The eye on his forehead was glowing red, and two huge red hands were sticking out from behind his back. The dialogue box described the brilliance of gazing into the crevasse, warrior and thief exclusive skill, a power that stems from the darkness of the crevasse. The eyes of Asura will grant you a greater range of vision, enhancing your agility and perception. The unsettling power of darkness will shape your hands and aid you in battle, doubling all damage dealt. The insolent power of darkness has existed since time immemorial, and it is said that all who seek to grasp it will eventually be left crippled by fear. Dark Feather, frowning, thought that this looked bad for Ling Si. He thought that if he lost the duel against the squirrel, it would be over. The guy with gray hair said that it looked like squirrel wanted to end it quickly. The guy with the eye patch said that they can't embarrass him and they should end it soon too. Dark Feather replied that that assumes they are capable of doing that. With a wave of his pistol, he did a somersault and, using Silver Blossom Rainstorm, began to rain bullets down on his opponents. The guy with gray hair gritted his teeth and used bladed shield and told the other guy to get behind him. 
Darkfeather changed his weapon to a sniper rifle. Looking through the telescopic sight, he said he would get through that shield. He noticed one of the opponents approaching him from the side. The thief swung his dagger, and Darkfeather blocked the blow with his rifle. Smirking, the guy with the eye patch said he blocked his blow with his sniper rifle. He said he was doing pretty good for an archer. He said next time he wouldn't get away with just a scratch on his face. Darkfeather frowned with a cut on his cheek. The mage in the white magic hat directed a stream of purple electricity at Tilly's and said that they really overestimated themselves. With a smirk, she said that a girl fighting mage was ridiculous. Tilly said with a smirk that it looks like this is working out. Standing up straight with her staff in her hand she said that she hadn't been this interested since she fought Link C. Smirking, she added that they were just trash who relied on their numerical superiority to attack her with the two of them. She asked what right they had to say that. The mage with purple hair got angry and asked how dare she. The other mage said they wouldn't let her get away with it. Smiling, Tilly's told them to memorize every word they said. She split her staff into two pieces. She used mana materialization, form of fist, and a pink energy appeared over her hand. Tilly stood in a fighting stance, spreading her arms out to the side, enveloped in pink flames. Clenching her fists, she said making them pay for her words. A jolt of yellow energy raised a huge cloud of dust above the ground. The guy with the shield ordered to defend himself. In front of them stood a huge Ruko surrounded by golden writing and the guy asked what it was. He asked if it was an illusionary skill, why did it last so long? The guy asked, with such physique and explosive power, is there anyone besides those deviants in their guild who can even scratch it? The guy with the pointy ears frowned and said that it wasn't like an illusionary skill and he had never seen anything like it. He added that his strength was terrifying as well. Ruko said with a smirk that it was embarrassing. He asked if this was all that the warriors in the first division of Wolf's Fang Guild were capable of. He added that he thought he had something to look forward to. The guy pointed his finger at him and angrily shouted that he was only babbling because he had such physique and strength. He shouted that he had simply never met a deviant from their guild and he would be unrecognizable after they were done with him. He demanded that he fight them without transforming. Ruko replied that he was not stupid. He asked why he would shrink for the sake of fighting them. Swinging his arm, he struck the ground with force and asked if they thought he had extra time. Stones shrouded in yellow energy began to rise above the ground. Ruko said that since they couldn't satisfy his craving for a good fight, he would just finish with them and go help his teammates. The rocks in front of him gathered into a pile, shrouded in yellow energy. The squirrel with three red eyes said that he had to admit that he had found some pretty interesting teammates. Ling Xi agreed and said that they had exceeded his expectations. Pressing a button in the game interface, he suggested that he take care of himself first. Squirrel said with a smirk that there was no need for that because he was sure that his alone was more than enough to defeat the four of them. Throwing himself into the attack, he said that this fight would end just like last time. A mage sigil appeared on Ling Xi's forehead, and he said that he would try it out on him. Squirrel wondered what it was. Shrouded in yellow energy and purple electricity, Ling Xi said that this was his grand debut as a spell thief. Tiana, putting her clipboard of papers forward, ordered to hold formation. She ordered the 6th division to move forward. Gritting her teeth, she saw the dialogue box. The dialogue box announced that she had received a message from a friend. Ling Xi had written her a message saying that it was time to move. Tiana smiled and thought that his plan had finally worked. Pointing her hand forward, she ordered everyone to listen. Tiana ordered them to retreat from the battlefield and go with her to attack the Wolf's Fang Station checkpoint. A stream of yellow energy rushed into the sky between the rocks. Lang Si stood with two daggers in his hands, shrouded in purple electricity. A mage sigil could be seen on his forehead. It was glowing with yellow energy. The Wolf's Fang guy asked if this guy had some kind of skill that improved his attributes like Squirrel. Dark Feather thought with a smirk, wondering what trump card he had that they didn't know about. Tiana said with a smile that she had a good feeling about it. Ruko said with a smirk that it looks like Ling Si is finally getting serious. Ling Si, standing in front of Squirrel with huge red hands, said that he has waited too long for this day. Squirrel looked at him in surprise, frowning. The protagonist found himself behind his opponent's back. He struck with his dagger and Squirrel, blocking the blow, exclaimed that it was insolent. He mockingly apologized with his four hands. Squirrel struck the protagonist with his red hand and blue energy appeared under Ling Si's feet. The red hand struck the spectral warrior that appeared. Squirrel wondered what it was. A dialogue box reported that he had used the dominion of the mercenary skill. Ling Si, surrounded by spectral warriors, apologized and said that it meant he had eight hands to fight. Squirrel, smiling evilly, asked about the summoning skill. Swinging in for an attack, he said he didn't know anything about the mechanics of his summoning skill, but if that was his limit, it wasn't even worth looking at. Using Leap of Thorns, he started firing numerous red projectiles. Ling Si ran forward, dodging them. He swung his dagger and Squirrel, blocking his strike, asked if he still intended to try to compete with him in speed. 
Their faces drew closer together. The impact raised a huge cloud of dust. Ling Si ordered the spectral warriors to attack, and they rushed forward. The three spectral warriors began to strike the squirrel at the same time, and he blocked them by clenching his teeth. The main character used Throat Slasher. Staring at him with his third eye, Squirrel used Piercing Edge. Ling Si hit Squirrel with a stream of blue energy, and he blocked it with a sweep of his huge red hand. Squirrel grinned and asked if he was trying to find an opening by making his summons attack him. He said it wouldn't work on him. Ling Si, frowning, thought to go find the best moment. They turned around, noticing a huge explosion of yellow energy. The huge Ruko stood with a huge shield made of stones, shrouded in yellow electricity. Smirking, he thought that this was what he expected from the Wolf's Fang Guild's first division, and any other tank would have fallen long ago when faced with their coordinated attack. Hitting the ground, he said that it ends here. The guy with the pointy ears asked the guy with the huge sword if he was okay. He replied that the size and strength of the thing was incredible and he was fine. The guy replied that he had the same thing, that his skill consumption was too high. Skill vacuum, a period of time when all of the player's skills have been used and are on cooldown. It is an extremely dangerous state to be in as opponents can take advantage of this vulnerability easily. The boy opened his eyes in surprise. He saw many huge stones flying towards them. The stream of rocks knocked them down, throwing them backwards. The guy with the pointy ears, covered in wounds, told the other to hold on. Ruko swung his huge arms. A huge cloud of dust rose above the ground from the impact. The mage asked the purple-haired mage to help her stall, but she didn't finish her sentence. The purple-haired mage looked to the side in surprise. She saw Tilly swinging her fist shrouded in a pink aura. She used blazing rainbow fist, breaking the ground with the blows of her fist shrouded in flames. The purple-haired mage shouted that she couldn't hold her off because she was too fast. The other replied that without cover, they had no way to deal damage. Tilly said with a smirk that while a battle mage's skills do less damage than other mages, their agility is something the likes of them could never achieve. With a frown, he said that she would now make them shiver in fear every time they encountered a battle mage in the future. A pillar of fire rose above the ground and the mages shouted loudly. Dark Feather stood in a cloud of dust, pointing his pistol forward. The boy wondered why it felt like his bullets had eyes. The shots hit him and the guy with gray hair in the shoulders. Dark Feather said with a smirk that like he said, he had very good eyesight. The guys shouted, and Dark Feather said, GG. The guy holding his palm out back shouted for everyone to look. The guy behind him asked why the nebulous people suddenly seemed to go crazy. The guy with the bow asked why they were running away. The guy with dark hair grinned and said they were probably too scared of them. The guy with the bow said uncertainly about the direction they were heading. The smile fell off the dark-haired guy's face, and he looked forward. He exclaimed in surprise that they were coming out of the dungeon. A voice from the dialogue box asked him what the situation was in the dungeon, and if the nebulous were going to come back to attack their checkpoint station. Looking at Tiana in a cloud of dust, the guy ordered the squirrel to report it. Ling Si stands in front of squirrel, shrouded in red energy. Frowning, the protagonist thought that Tiana has started to move. On the dialogue box in front of squirrel was a message that the nebulous people had split up, pretending to retreat, but they had actually left the dungeon to attack their checkpoint station. Squirrel said with a smirk that they didn't seem to be as docile as he expected. He said they backed off to regain the initiative and catch them off guard. Frowning, he said that they would still see if nebulous was capable of that. Ling Si, surrounded by spectral warriors, said that he was right and this was a race against time and an operation to seize the initiative from the start. Frowning, he thought that he couldn't waste any more time here with him. The guy with the big sword told everyone to quickly approach him and Black Hunt gathered in one place. Ruko said he was sorry he could kill them with one shot. Ruko, Tillys, and Dark Feather stood in front of them. Ruko asked if they were now trying to attack him in a mob. The guy looked around and asked if all six of them had lost to their opponents. The green-haired mage yelled that he didn't expect all three of them to be that strong, and they wouldn't be able to defeat them with their current abilities. Ruko and Tillys looked at them with a smirk. The guy with the eye patch told them, frowning, that although they weren't the best elites from the first division, they had Squirrel with them. Smirking, he said that Squirrel can't lose, and they have no idea how strong Squirrel is. The guy said he's on a whole other level from them. Tillys told them that they didn't seem to beat them enough and their breath still stinks. The guy grinned and agreed that they had indeed lost and there was no point in continuing their fight. He said that it was up to the two of them now. Ling Si ordered the spectral warriors to attack. Squirrel ran forward and said that he would get rid of those three annoying things first. He ran forward beside his two red clones towards the three spectral warriors, using Pseudo Flower. The dialog box described Pseudo Flower allows the user to create a clone that will last for one minute. The clone will also be able to deal damage and apply status effects, but will immediately disappear upon taking damage. The squirrel clones pierced two spectral warriors. The squirrel with a dagger in his hand said that they were mindless summons. Ling Si moved behind squirrel's back with a quick movement. 
With a sweep of his daggers, he killed two of Squirrel's clones. Squirrel said that it seemed that he too preferred to fight one-on-one. -on -one. Frowning, he thought that his speed just now was incredible. Looking at Ling Xia's back, he thought that even his third eye couldn't see his movements. The guy with the eye patch clenched his fist and shouted to his boss to finish him off and show the difference between them. Ling Xi, frowning, thought that stacked attacks wouldn't work on him because he would definitely interrupt him with his attack. He thought that if he wanted to pull off his next move, he had no choice but to pit his body movements against his. The protagonist thought that he would use his body movements to create a gap. Ling Xi pushed himself off the ground, and Squirrel, frowning, told him to attack. The protagonist used Kiss of the Vile Serpent, and a huge purple serpent appeared behind him. Ling Xi was enveloped in purple energy, and the mage sigil on his forehead glowed with yellow energy. A dialogue box described Kiss of the Vile Serpent, mage exclusive skill. This skill locks onto one target. The soul of the vile serpent wraps around the opponent and deals magic damage. After a target is selected, your physical attacks will accumulate vile flames continuously when the vile flames effect is activated. The ground will rise along with the kiss of the dragonic serpent, dealing burst magic damage based on attack power multiplied by 150% to the target and the surrounding area. Squirrel wondered what kind of skill this was. He swung a huge red hand. Lang Si dodged it by jumping between the red hands. The mage sigil on his forehead glowed yellow. Squirrel, frowning, thought in surprise at the fact that he was not keeping up with his top time. The protagonist frowned and thought he detected a gap. Purple energy approached the squirrel. Huge red arms above his head struck each other and a purple kite flew next to him. As it flew next to him, it tore the clothes on Squirrel's side. Squirrel was surprised to think that he had managed to use top speed to make the hands behind him bug out from high FPS lag. He wondered if it was possible. Ling Xi behind him told him that he had already told him that he had come here to settle accounts. Behind him was a huge purple serpent. The protagonist asked if he was ready to be poisonously kissed by the evil python. A pillar of purple energy rushed upwards. Ling Xi, running up to Squirrel, told him that his rhythm was in a mess. Squirrel ordered himself to calm down, thinking that he couldn't let it throw off his rhythm. Looking at Ling Xi, he thought that he would attack from the left. Ling Xi hit him with his dagger from the right. Gritting his teeth, Squirrel wondered if his judgment was wrong. Ling Xi said that he had no time left to recover his rhythm. He said he would give him that kick back. The people from Black Hunt called out Squirrel in surprise. Dark Feather said that Squirrel was now in full panic mode. Looking at their battle, he said that with such lightning fast attacks, it would be hard for him to focus after he panicked. Squirrel thought that he would attack his lower abdomen and he would block the strike and then counterattack. Ling Xi, approaching him, told him that he was wrong. Gritting his teeth, Squirrel thought that he had predicted his prediction. Kicking his opponent with his foot, Ling Si, shrouded in purple energy, told him that his top time was better than his. Blood rushed out of Squirrel's mouth and he thought why his top time was better than his. The guy with the big sword shouted to him that they were coming to help him. Squirrel yelled for them to leave because he didn't need anyone's help. Ling Si asked if he really didn't need help. From the impact, Squirrel flew off to the side. Ling Si stood with his knee up, and the Black Hunt men ran up to Squirrel worriedly. The guy with the shield asked if he was okay. The guy with the eye patch ordered the mages to treat him. Looking at the black fire on his arm, Squirrel thought that it hadn't dissipated. Ling Si smirked, and shrouded in purple energy, he waved his hand and said, Vile flames. Snapping his fingers, he said, Burst. Squirrel tensely said, Too late. A huge dark purple serpent appeared above them. A dialogue box described Kiss of the Vile Serpent, mage exclusive skill. This skill locks onto one target. The soul of the Vile Serpent wraps around the opponent and deals magic damage. After a target is selected, your physical attacks will accumulate Vile Flames continuously when the Vile Flames effect is activated. The ground will rise along with the Kiss of the Dragonic Serpent, dealing burst magic damage based on attack power multiplied by 150% to the target and the surrounding area. Black flames enveloped the squirrel, dealing AoE damage. Shrouded in black flames, he asked how this was possible. The black flames dealt him damage based on his attack power multiplied by 150%. The black flames enveloped black hunt and squirrel. The dialogue box says, dealt burst magic damage. Seven people have been one shot. The mage sigil on Ling Xia's forehead began to fade, and he said with a smirk that their score was settled. Ruko shouted to Ling Xi about how very cool he was. He asked what that skill was because he had never seen him use it. Tilly said that this fire was on par with her flame. Ling Xi told them that he would tell them later. He told them to prepare the equipment he gave them earlier. Ruko grabbed the grappling hook. The dialogue box says, Disposable short distance paraglider has been equipped. Disposable grappling hook has been equipped. Ling Xi said that it would be a while before Squirrel was revived. He told them to coordinate with Tiana and attack from the outside. They shouted that they were ready. Ling Xi told them to follow him. He said they would go around the cliffs and land at the Wolf's Fang Station checkpoint. 
After pushing off from the ground, they began to soar through the air. The main character called out to capture all of their checkpoint station. Initially, from Wolf's Fang's perspective, with Vice Guildmaster Squirrel's line of defense, any plan Nebulous could come up with would automatically collapse in front of his might. However, not a single person in Wolf's Fang could have predicted the appearance of an unpredictable factor like Ling Si, a person who would be able to completely disrupt Wolf Fang's rhythm and launch a pincer attack to break through Wolf Fang's defense line. In the considerable time it took Squirrel to revive, the Nebulous members, led by Ling Si and Tiana, invaded and captured all three checkpoint stations with incredible speed. Ruko stands on a crate with a red flag in his hands. Finally facing an attack, they had no chance of withstanding, Squirrel could only resentfully retreat and give up the rights to the dungeon. Nebulous successfully captured the remaining checkpoint of Wolf's Fang Guild Station. This battle for the rights to a small dungeon that both of the participants had been planning for a long time was finally over. Nebulous meeting Lobby. Coco Lai told Stillwaters that the battle for the rights to the Guildone dungeon was finally over. Stillwaters, looking out the window, asked what the result was. She said it was just as he predicted. She said it was a victory. Stillwaters turned around with a slight smile on his face. Coco Lai said with a smile that Ling Si had executed the plan perfectly, and under Tiana's leadership, Nebulous had successfully captured all the checkpoint stations. Stillwaters said to pass on his orders. Coco Lai opened her eyes in surprise. Stillwaters said with a smirk that the entire guild is to go receive Ling Si and the rest. Nebulous main gate portal. A crowd of people were greeting Ling Si and his team. Confetti was falling in the sky. Tiana walked down the street with a smile. Coco Lai outside the window said that Tiana seemed to have become much more confident than before. Stillwaters told her to go first and distribute the awards to Tiana and the others who brought them this victory. He said he wanted to talk to Ling Si in person. The door opened and Stillwaters asked to come in. Ling Si appeared in the doorway. Stillwaters praised him for his work in completing the task. Ling Si looked at him calmly. Stillwaters said that Wolf's Fang would probably have a hard time accepting this. The protagonist, grinning, said that he didn't know about Wolf's Fang, but he knew that Squirrel didn't want to accept the truth. Stillwaters, sitting down in his chair, said he was curious to know something. Looking at the protagonist, he asked what exactly he wanted to accomplish. Ling Si, noticing his gaze, thought that he wanted him to put their statuses aside and give him an honest answer. Frowning, he said that he wanted to get to a point where no matter what angle one looked from, he was the unrivaled number one. Stillwaters thought that even though he knew he wanted to reach the top, he still couldn't help but be struck by his aura. He thought that this is the attitude he is hoping for. Folding his hands, he said that if that was the case, he could help him become unequivocal number one. He asked if he liked that thought. Ling Si surprisingly said that it was a bit sudden. With a smirk, Stillwaters asked why. He asked if he lacked confidence or if he doubted his abilities. Ling Si noticed his aura in surprise. Frowning, he thought that he was always calm during their interactions, and because of that, he almost forgot that the person in front of him, Stillwaters, was one of the five greatest clerics in his past life. Stillwaters sat in front of him with his leg folded over his leg. Ling Si said, his eyes starting to hurt. Smiling, Stillwaters apologized and said he added some glowing special effects. The protagonist, raising his hand, said he was honored, and putting aside his confidence in him, he knows his limits, and with his current abilities he's too far from what he needs. Ling Si said Heavenland is a new frontier with endless possibilities, and there are still plenty of lurking professionals. Stillwaters said it's not a problem and he can wait for it. He added that he hopes he won't dawdle, and he'll wait for the moment when he can confidently stand in front of him and say he's ready. Stillwaters smirked. Ling Si glanced at him, walking away. He thought that even after he left the meeting room, it still seemed unrealistic to him, and he didn't expect Stillwaters to have such high expectations for him. He speculated that perhaps he was taking a costly gamble on him. The protagonist took off his gaming helmet. Sitting on the bed, he thought that he had gained one level from this guild-owned dungeon. Ling Si thought as he gained level 33, he had fallen out of the top 10 of level leaderboard in this short period of time. Closing his eyes, he thought that the level leaderboard was indeed really competitive, and he remembered that the highest level attained so far was level 45. He thought that he had gotten a clear understanding of his weakness after the battle with Squirrel. Putting his foot down on the floor, he remembered Vankaf's face and thought that he needed to replace all his pre-promotion skills, and on top of that, besides the dagger that could evolve, all his equipment was no longer enough. Looking at his hand, Ling Si thought that the Vankaf's potion shop should do extensive recruitment, and on top of that, he should find time to investigate what this mysterious badge of the Glorious was. He figured he had a lot of things to do, and he didn't have time to relax. The protagonist looked at the note from the old man, on which he wrote about going out to get groceries and reminded him to go to school after breakfast. Smiling, Ling Si thought that although it was exhausting, it wasn't a bad thing. He thought that whether it was a game or real life, he had never felt so fulfilled. 
Ling Si walks past some high school students talking about their own things. A guy asks another guy if he saw the episode last night. The other guy, catching up with someone, yelled for him to wait. Noticing the voice, Ling Si glanced to the side. The voice asked where his apology was for crashing into him. Tang Ki stood in front of the guy lying on the ground with his arms folded on his chest. The guy said he didn't do it on purpose and he was just wiping his glasses and that's why he didn't see him. Tang Ki said that he should know about the fact that he didn't care about it. He punched the guy in the face and his glasses fell off. Tang Ki said it was the first time they met, so he will say straight up. He said he hurt him, so he has to pay. The guy crawling on the ground asked to let him pick up his glasses first. He said with a worried face that his mother had bought them for him not long ago. Tang Ki, hearing that they were new, maliciously smirked. Swearing, he swung his foot and shouted that he was talking to him. He asked why he was still talking about his glasses. With a forceful stomp of his foot, he smashed the glasses lying on the pavement. The guy touched the shards from his glasses with a trembling hand. The guy behind Tang Ki, who was laughing angrily, noticed Ling Si. He tried to call out to Tang Ki. Ling Si swung his hand and told him not to block his way. He swung his hand. The guys ended up on the ground. One guy asked what he had just done. The other shouted to Tang Ki that it was Ling Si, the exchange student. Tang Ki reprimanded and the guy put his hand on his shoulder and said that people were watching and they better leave because they couldn't lose to him here. As he ran away, he yelled that he would pay for it. Ling Si asked the guy if he was okay. He replied that his mother worked hard to buy him those glasses. Ling Si held out three purses to him and told him to take them. The guy exclaimed in surprise that they were three purses. The protagonist told him with a smile that it was three that accidentally dropped them, and the money inside should be enough to buy him a new pair of glasses. The guy hesitantly said that he didn't have to. Leng Si told him that he should. A voice from behind caught Leng Si's attention, and he turned around in surprise. Adolf, taking off his hat, asked him if he was awakened. The guy said he was cool, getting to his feet. Adolf told him he had to hurry or he would be late. The guy smiled awkwardly and caught himself. Ling Si told him with a smile not to worry either that they would surely come for him in the future. He told him not to make his mother worry and to go buy new glasses. The boy thanked him. Adolf told the protagonist that he was a kind guy. Ling Si asked who he was. Putting his hat on his head, Adolf told him not to worry because he would answer all his questions. Looking at the protagonist, he said that he should talk elsewhere. The afternoon sun was shining above the red building. Ling Si, standing next to the seated Adolf, told him to talk because he would risk being late on his first official school day because of talking to him. Adolf pulled out a gun and suddenly shot at the protagonist. The bullet headed in his direction. Ling Si caught the bullet and swung his arm. He frowned while looking at Adolf. Adolf tucked the gun into the inside pocket of his jacket. As the fist approached his face, he told him to wait. The protagonist stopped, and Adolf said it was a test. Ling Si told him to explain himself. Adolf said that it was an extreme plastic bullet made of a very lightweight plastic that wouldn't cause any injuries, although it might hurt a little. Looking at the protagonist, he said that this was the way the most direct way to figure out if he was talking to a strong awakened or not, while still saving time. He thought it took him a second to catch the bullet he was aiming at his chest with. What kind of speed is that, he thought. Ling Si unclenched his palm with the bullet and asked if he was going to introduce himself. After a bit of silence, he replied that his name was Adolf. Folding his hands on his chest, he said that he was a middleman who recruits Awakened into the army. Ling Si, frowning, thought he remembered that in his past life, most of the Awakened had actually joined some kind of organization. He thought that, it turns out, it was an army. Adolf said that, simply put, the army needed the power of the Awakened, and so they, the mediators, were using aura sensors to find the Awakened and invite them to join. The protagonist, grinning nervously, said that he had an interesting way of inviting them. He asked what the benefit to him was in joining the army. Adolf said that if he was looking for status, it was an excellent way. Ling Si thought that he was unfamiliar with a word like status, and this something that was so out of reach was suddenly so easily accessible. Ling Si smirked and said that it was interesting. He asked if he had passed the test. Adolf, interrupting him, replied that of course not. Fixing his hat, he said that what he meant was that he had only passed his preliminary screening and that simply confirmed that he was the awakened one he was looking for. He added that he would still have to go through the official army screening. Ling Si asked when it would take place. Adolf, interrupting him again, said with a smirk that it would happen today, and more specifically, in an hour. Ling Si exclaimed in surprise and said that he didn't think not showing up on his first day of school was a good idea. Adolf told him not to worry because they would take care of it. Ling Si closed one eye and said he will remember his words and he will file a complaint against him if something goes wrong. Adolf said that he had already prepared the helicopter. The protagonist exclaimed in surprise. There was a helicopter hovering above the octagon-shaped building in the sky. Ling Si thought that as he expected from the army, they have an incredible scale and imposing style. 
a voice said to someone that they were all waiting just for him, and could he not hurry up? Looking around, Ling Si wondered if all the people in line were also awakened. A guy with red hair and beard looked at the main character. The man in a cap behind the glass told Adolf that this time they had all five candidates to investigate. He said his last-minute request to accept an additional candidate was not part of the regulations. A third ground force general, the Western District's awakened supervising examiner, added that he said he said he would give them a surprise. He offered to see if it could really surprise them. Adolf told him he would not disappoint them. The third general asked if this guy could match that guy with a 54% chance of awakening. He said this guy is the most standout of them all. He looked at the guy with red hair standing in line in front of Ling Si. The third general asked if he had measured the awakening chance of the guy who had just joined. Adolf said that since he found him at the last minute, he hadn't measured his exact awakening chance yet, so he just brought him here directly for them to check him out. The third general replied that they would wait and see. There were six people standing in line. In front was a pale guy with a spiked collar around his neck with a 12% chance of awakening at the first dimension. Behind him was a guy in a blue cap and white hoodie with an 18% chance of waking up. To the side of him stood a girl with red hair with a 39% chance of waking up. Behind the guy in the blue cap was a guy with black hair and a white shirt with a 27% chance of waking up. Behind them was a big guy with red hair with a 54% chance of waking up. Ling Si was standing behind all of them. He was missing the record of the chance of awakening at the first measurement. The man on the screen announced that an official examination was about to take place. He said that it would be something known as a one versus many battle, and the final result determined the attitude with which they would be treated. Ling Si asked if they were going to measure their chance of awakening with a battle royal. The guy in front of him, grinning, told him that he was overthinking it, and before they made sure they had that chance of awakening that they needed, they meant nothing to the army. The guy, smirking, said they wanted their individual combat stats. He said that if he wasn't confident in himself, now was his chance for a chance to get out. The voice announced that their battlefield was ready. He said that an elite anti-supernatural ground army would be waiting for them. In front of them were many people dressed in dark exoskeletons. The voice said that the elite anti-supernatural ground army was the strongest army in their arsenal at the moment. He said that they are the strongest soldiers that remain in formation even after countless of the most brutal battles. He said they once took a city from the control of 3,000 terrorists with a team of 100 men. The voice said that, before the special existence of the evolved awakened ones, they were by far the strongest human beings, and now one day the strongest human army and the awakened ones with superpowers would determine who was the strongest through battle. He called for the beginning. The eyes of the man in the exoskeleton glowed blue. The voice announced that now, according to the order in which they were lined up, they needed to go out one by one to fight the 15 anti-supernatural soldiers. The guy with red hair said that this exam seemed to be interesting. The voice announced that they would gather the necessary data based on their individual performance and estimate their current combat awakening rate. The voice asked number one to get ready. The guy in the collar stepped forward with his hand in his pants pocket. Frowning, he thought about the fact that fighting against 15 of these people would be problematic. The gate behind them closed. A voice announced the beginning of the examination. The guy in the collar went towards the soldiers and, waving his hands, told them to attack. He said that he didn't believe that as an awakened, he had anything to fear from so-called elite soldiers like them. The third general said that underestimating elite soldiers who had been in all sorts of life and death situations was not the smartest move. They watched him through the blue screens. Number one pushed himself off the ground and jumped to attack the soldier, swinging his fist. A blue shield appeared on the soldier's arm, and the blow pushed him back. Number one was surprised to think that it didn't work. The soldier looked at him with glowing blue eyes. The guy thought that his attacks must pierce steel. Two soldiers rushed at him to attack him from behind. From their impact, the guy flew up in the air, falling to the floor. Blood spurted from his mouth. A voice announced that the outcome was clear. The guy was lying on the ground. The guy in the blue cap said that it was these anti-supernatural soldiers' incredible fighting strength. The man in the suit sitting behind the instruments told the general that the awakening rate on the first measurement of candidate number one was 12%. He said that this study determined that his actual combat awakening rate was 6%. The general said there was no need to report those results. He said to continue with the exam. Adolf thought that, just like the general said, most awakened in reality had only reached the level of bullies. He thought that they might behave tough on the outside, but once they were up against soldiers with incredibly strong fighting abilities, they had no chance of winning. Frowning, he thought that this wasn't the type of awakened that the army needed. After that, candidate number two, Number three and number four were also defeated by the coordinated attacks of the anti-supernatural soldiers. Only candidate number three, with an awakening rate at the first measurement of 39%, was able to scrape by with an actual combat awakening rate of 33%.
The girl with red hair stood there covered in abrasions. A voice told awakened candidate number five to get ready. The guy with red hair kneaded his fists and said that his turn had finally come. He said these four pieces of trash in front of him had done nothing but waste his time. The general said it finally came through numbers five. He said he had heard that among this batch of candidates, he was the one to watch. The man behind him said that is true and number five has an awakening rate at first measurement of 54% and he is a rare talent. He added that according to him, he is an experienced brawler. A flame appeared in number five's hand and he asked with a smirk, how about attacking him altogether? His body was enveloped in flames, he stomped his foot with force. He used a combat power pull, drawing his opponents towards him. Ling Si noticed with a smirk that he was using his skills from the game in real life. He thought that he should learn about it too. The general said that he wasn't bad and he was different from the previous candidates who only used their strength. He said he seemed to have had time to awaken his gaming skills. The man said that his current awakening rate instantly jumped to 42% and is still rising. Number 5, laughing, raised his hand up in the air with a flame and said that he would show them what a true awakened was. Using Great Axe Double Strike, he hit the soldiers with a sweep of yellow energy. The soldier put his arm out in front of him and ordered him to cover and fall back. Examination bullets, similar to the extreme plastic bullets, they can inflict injuries, but no mortal wounds. Number 5, smiling, said that he was a warrior and he could shield. Using total counterattack shield, he thrust his arm forward and an orange magic barrier appeared in front of him. He said counterattack. The bullets that hit his barrier headed in the opposite direction. The soldier's orders were to dodge as the bullets rained down on them. Number 5 stood, shrouded in flames, in front of a huge cloud of dust. Smirking, he exhaled and said that they wouldn't be able to get a decisive outcome in such a short time. The general watched through the screen as Number 5 offered a draw. The man said about his actual combat awakening rate going up to 52%, and it equaled his awakening rate at the first measurement. The general suggested ending it there because that kind of performance is more than enough for him to pass. A voice from the dialogue box told him that he had passed the exam. It asked him to go to the rest area. Number 5, grinning, said that was the expected result. The voice asked awakened candidate number 6 to get ready. Number 5, passing by Ling Si, told him not to embarrass them, the awakened. The protagonist remained silent, frowning. He thought that he hadn't yet realized how best to use the powers he had gained as an awakened. He wondered just now, as number 5 used his skills, if he hadn't synchronized his mental state with his physical form. Stepping forward, he wondered if this was what one had to do to synchronize with one's mind. Ling Si raised his fist with his eyes closed, enveloped in purple energy. Opening his eyes, he thought that it wasn't difficult. The outline of a dagger appeared in his hand. The general asked in surprise as he summoned his gaming gear. The man behind the devices said about if he wasn't dreaming, his awakening rate instantly jumped to 100%. Ling Si transformed into his in-game character with his in-game equipment. He glanced forward with a smirk. A voice ordered both parties to get ready. He announced that the examination would begin now. Ling Si, standing in front of the soldiers, told them to hurry up because he still had a chance to make it back to school in the afternoon. The man behind the instruments exclaimed that his awakening rate had already reached 100% at the moment. Adolf said to let him watch. He thought in surprise that it was terrifying that he could believe that his awakening rate had reached 100% to begin with. Adolf thought that he had only heard of people with awakening rates of around 90% appearing in other areas, and he thought that this was already something extraordinary. He thought that he couldn't imagine that a perfect awakened could actually exist. The general said that he thought the perfect awakened existed solely in theory. Folding his hands in his lap, he said that it was indeed possible, and they should hold on to that person at all costs. The general, looking at Ling Si on the screen, said that they should give him whatever he wanted, and he should hold him back. Number 5, stammering, asked in surprise if he had heard correctly that he was the perfect awakened one. He asked who he thought he had just spoken to. Ling Si, thrusting his dagger forward, said that it felt pretty good, and all he had to do was visualize his in-game state and it would appear on its own. He said that now there was no difference between him in-game and in real life. The soldier asked his captain if they would be making their first move. The captain thought about the fact that they had been to all sorts of battles and met all sorts of vicious and brutal opponents. The captain's eye was glowing blue, and he thought that he had never encountered anything like this uncontrollable fear that he was feeling right now, looking at this young man. Looking at Ling Si, he thought that even if they were the strongest people, it was possible for them to defeat such an awakened power. The protagonist, frowning, said as he started. As he approached his opponents, he used rapid shadow thrust and throat slasher, flying through the enemy ranks, leaving behind a swirl of blue energy. He said with a smirk that they all fought well. A voice announced that the battle was over after one hit with a combined skill. The general, looking at the screen, exclaimed in surprise that he had won with one strike. He said that it was a single flash. 
He exclaimed that this was how an awakened one should be. Smiling nervously, the general ordered the results to be announced. He said he had to greet him personally. The general thought that with someone like him on their side, even if the day of prophecy comes, there is still hope for humanity. A voice announced that the battle was over and candidate number six had passed the examination. Military VIP lounge. Adjusting his hat on his head, Adolf told Ling Si that he would say it this way. He told him that if he wants to work together with the army, they promise him that they will give him a position and remuneration that matches his performance. Ling Si asked if there was anything he had to do if he wanted to work with them. The voice told him that he doesn't need to do anything yet. Ling Si smiled slightly. Adolf saluted the general. Ling Si asked if he should salute. The general smilingly told Ling Si that he didn't need to be so formal because he was a treasure of their district. Ling Si, raising an eyebrow, said that it sounded strange. The general, raising his palm, said that he was the third general of the ground forces as well as the West District's supervising examiner, and Ling Si's performance really impressed them. The protagonist asked in surprise if this meant that he had passed, what was next, and what was the situation now. He said that there was no such thing as a free lunch and he wasn't going to do anything that would be at a loss to him. The general told him that, just as he said, he didn't have to do anything yet. He said that he passed the examination, which means that he meets their recruitment requirements, and they will provide him with everything he needs in daily life in exchange for his cooperation in the future. Ling Si, frowning, asked what kind of cooperation. The general, frowning, told him that he might not know it, but there are more and more awakened ones now, and although many want to join the army, most of them don't want to. He said that there are some anti-social awakened who are using their powers for evil to commit all sorts of crime and destruction. The general said that he fears that there will only be more such awakened ones. Ling Si, frowning, asked about wanting them awakened to help them deal with these awakened criminals. The general replied with a smile that was correct, and it was always a pleasure to talk to smart people. He thought that once the prophecy comes to pass, things won't be that easy, and all they are doing now is preparing for the future. The general asked Ling Si what he thought. Ling Si, after thinking about it, replied that he was fine with everything. He said that his place is quite small and there is no room to turn around. The protagonist said with a smirk that he had also heard that there was a new gaming helmet. Trying to remember what it was called, he guessed it was called the gaming cabin. Satisfied with his guess, Ling Si said that he had heard that it was quite good. The general, laughing, said he understood him and they would not force him to work for free and he could take it as a sign of their sincerity. He told Adolf that he would leave it to him. He told him to provide Ling Si with new housing and the newest gaming cabin. Adolf said he understood. The general, as he left, said he looked forward to their next meeting. He said to tell Adolf if he needed anything. The general told Adolf that he would be in charge of communications with Ling Si from now on. Adolf told the protagonist that he would prepare everything he asked for as soon as possible. He asked to start by letting him take him back. The helicopter flew in the sky. Ling Si stepped out of the helicopter that landed. The protagonist frowned and thought that it was getting late and school was surely over by now. He thought that he wanted to experience the joys of school life and apparently he would have to save that for next time. Ling Si thought that it looked like he would finally be able to provide the old man with a new place to live. He thought that the old man would probably be happy for a bigger place. A dialogue box welcomed him to Heavenland. Ling Si, standing in front of the tall castle, thought that now that this game was affecting his status in real life, it was time for him to strengthen himself. A dagger appeared in his hand, and he thought that he needed to keep evolving this dagger, improve his equipment, and keep raising his level. Coming out of the portal, he found himself in the Casfado Magical Origin Institute. He thought that the most important thing was to turn his unique dual-class spell thief into an invincible existence as soon as possible. Looking at Ling Si walking up the stairs, the guy asked if this guy was a magical soar. He asked about whether Magical Origin Institute wasn't exclusive to mages. The other guy replied that judging from his equipment, he didn't look like a mage. He assumed that he was here on a special mission. Ling Si saw a man in gray clothes in front of him, who was talking about how he would have no problem taking the top spot in the Institute's mission rankings today. He told the people around him to just follow him. This guy's name is Soren, he's level 30, and he's a luminous mage. There were several girls standing around him. The girl with the white magic hat said that they would rely on him then. She said that if they could hold the first place, they could exchange points for advanced spells, all thanks to him. Soren said with a chuckle that it was nothing. He said that he had told them many times that as long as he was here, no one would be able to get more points than them. The dialogue box showed five stars. Soren asked if they had noticed that they were the only ones who dared to accept the five-star assignments, which were the most difficult. A voice from behind apologized, and Soren turned around. Ling Si pressed the accept button on the interface. A dialogue box informed him that he had accepted the five-star assignment. It asked him to wait for the assignment to load. Soren and the girl looked at Ling Si entering the portal. He turned around, and Soren exclaimed in surprise that he had taken the five-star assignment alone. 
Soren looked at the protagonist in shock. The girl beside him, noticing Ling Xi's clothes, asked in surprise if it was a thief. Ling Xi stood in front of them with his hands folded in his pockets. Someone said that he hadn't noticed and he was indeed dressed as a thief. The girl asked about whether mages weren't the only ones allowed to enter the Magical Origin Institute. Soren, with a nervously raised eyebrow, said that he was just trying to pretend to be mysterious. He said that he was probably a mage that no one wanted to team up with, so he decided to wear a costume to draw attention to himself. Pointing his finger at Ling Xi, Soren asked if they noticed that he even withheld his information. He said it was because he was afraid of being exposed. He said he has seen a lot of people like that, and Heavenland is lacking in many respects, but there are always a lot of fools like that. Laughing, he said he had seen a lot of such fools. The girl beside him, folding her arms, said she understood. Soren asked who he was trying to scare by taking the most difficult five-star task alone. Ling Xi raised an eyebrow as he exhaled and thought about how it was exhausting him. He thought about why there were so many people like this everywhere in this game. With a glance back, he turned around. Soren asked what he was looking at. Frowning, he asked what he wanted. He said he would call for help if he got closer. Ling Xi asked him how much money he had with him. He asked how much his equipment and gear cost together. Soren asked what he cared about. The protagonist said he wanted to make a bet. He said he heard everything he said about him earlier and he is very displeased. Soren asked what kind of bet. Lang Xi said with a smile that if he couldn't get the top spot on the mission ranking board today, he would pay him 10 times his current net worth. With a smirk, he said that if he could rank first, he would just have to give him everything he had. He asked if that was okay with him. He added that it was fair. A man in the crowd exclaimed that he was giving away money for nothing. Soren asked if he was serious. A person in the crowd asked someone if they heard what he said. Another man in the crowd said he wanted to make a bet instead if this mage didn't have the courage. Soren, smirking nervously, said he was not afraid. He said he is challenging him to sign an e-gamble agreement with him, and then the system will be their judge. Ling Xi, smiling, said that with the e-gamble agreement, the system will forcefully force the execution of the result no matter what. He said he was fine with that. Soren said he would sign first. A blue pen appeared in his hand, and Ling Xi held out his hand. Soren grinned evilly, wondering if this guy was a brainless rich kid. He thought that there was no need to put on such a show even if he were rich. He figured today was his lucky day. Soren said that he was done and now it was his turn. Ling Xi, smiling wickedly, said he wasn't going anywhere and he was very happy to sign it. Soren wondered why goosebumps ran down his back. Ranking board mission in progress. Five star mission. The price of the three elements. On each side of the lake, which was divided into three parts, stands an NPC mage, each dressed in a different colored robe. The three mage girls were dressed in red, yellow and blue robes. The dialogue box says, the price of the three elements mission, the elemental mages guarding the elemental lake have fallen into a deep slumber. Seize their elemental crystals to obtain their unique spells. Any player who approaches the lake will startle them from their slumber and earn their fury. After 24 minutes have passed, teams holding onto at least one elemental crystal will be rewarded with the corresponding elemental spell, as well as the mission points of this five-star mission. Three crystals of yellow, red, and blue are surrounded by electricity. A dialogue box announced that time starts now. The lake, divided into three parts, was surrounded by purple electricity. Ling Xi stood among the rocks. Bouncing off the rocks, he thought that according to what he had found out, on this mission of Magical Institute, one could obtain incredibly strong elemental spells. Frowning, he thought, he was sure that he was sure that no one in this life had yet found out that there was a hidden reward in this mission. Hanging on a branch over a portion of the lava-covered lake, the protagonist thought that if someone were to possess all three crystals when the countdown was complete, would not only be rewarded with three elemental spells, but would also receive an additional powerful spell. Swinging around while holding onto a tree branch, Ling Xi thought that they had come just for these spells. The mage, pointing his finger forward, ordered to follow him and listen carefully because he had done this before with many different commands. Standing on a giant piece of paper with a yellow magic seal, he said they would focus on getting just one of the crystals. He said not to even think about the other two because getting all three crystals was impossible. A huge yellow lightning bolt flashed in front of them and he said someone had already activated the defense spells. A mage in red robes held a staff shrouded in flames. The mage shouted about the guardian golems coming. A huge golem began to rise from the lava. A magma golem, a thunder golem, and a steam golem appeared in front of them. Soren told them to remember to pay attention to the other players once they get the crystal. He said that the chances of them trying to steal the crystal from them were low, but it was better to be on guard. The mage on the staff asked why it was unlikely. He replied that it was because once they got the elemental crystal, they would get the elemental crystal's protection. Smirking, Soren said that he had gotten the elemental crystal three times, and it was really cool to be protected by the guardian golems. He told them to remember to support him while he was taking damage. 
He said that once they defeat these golems, it will remain to be seen who can defeat the elemental mage first. Soren said he was very confident about getting the crystal. The mage with green hair obeyed. The magma golem in front of them swung its hand. Soren grinned and thought that this mission was already in his pocket, and once he successfully completed this first five-star mission, he wouldn't have to worry about the missions after that. He thought that he needed to get the top spot on the mission ranking board today, and he should win the bet with this brainless guy. Lang Si flew over his head and told them to move over. The mage exclaimed that this costumed mage, standing up on the green-haired mage staff, the main character said that he would go forward. Smirking, he told them not to forget about their bet. He jumped forward from her staff. Lang Si used the backstab and once behind the golem's back, he said that thanks to them, he was at a distance where he could use the backstab. He used Dominion of the Mercenary and three Spectral Warriors appeared around him. Soren, looking surprised at his movements, asked if he was a mage or a thief. While the Spectral Warriors were fighting the golem, Ling Si jumped towards the red-clothed mage. With a smirk, he said that he would take the first elemental crystal. Looking at Ling Si surrounded by purple lightning, Soren wondered if this guy was really a mage and if his movements were too nimble. Ling Si was jumping in the air above the mage dressed in red clothes. The mage frowned and shouted, surrounded by flames. Standing on the golem's arm, she used fire elemental dragon flame, and a fire dragon appeared above her head. Ling Si thought that if her opponent was a mage, he would really need a team to overpower her. He thought that since they needed to get close to her, they would probably have to expend a lot of effort to do so. The main character's hand holding the dagger was enveloped in purple energy. The spectral warriors behind him were fighting the golem, and Ling Si jumped to attack and said that unfortunately, he wasn't only a mage. He used rapid shadow thrust, flying past the fire dragon straight towards the red-clothed mage. As he approached the mage, he said that he was also a thief. Ling Si stabbed the mage with his daggers and a pop-up dialogue box reported that he was hit with a 63 attack, the damage has been stacked and the opponent has been taken down in one shot from the piercing damage. The dialogue box says, congratulations, you have obtained the fire elemental crystal, please keep it well protected before the countdown ends. The protagonist grinned and said the job was done. A dialogue box announced that as the bearer of the elemental crystal, he had obtained immunity to fire-type damage, and additionally, he could now control the magma golem. Ling Si, standing on the magma golem's arm, said that no matter how strong their spells were, it would end up like this if they let a thief like him get close enough. Smiling, he said that he had just thought of an interesting way to play this out. The dialogue box congratulated the player with the hidden name for obtaining the fire elemental crystal. It reported that the location was marked on his mission minicart. It asked to get the crystal before the end of the countdown. The mage spoke of how they were able to even get a glimpse of the elemental mage and the elemental crystal had already been taken. She asked what kind of speed it was. Soren gritted his teeth and ordered himself not to panic. He figured there were a lot of people here and it might not be the same poser. Frowning, he figured there were two other elemental crystals and he still had a chance. The mage with the green hair asked him if she thought it was her. Soren glanced forward questioningly. In front of them stood a magma golem with a lynxy standing on its arm. The mage asked what it was. Soren asked if it was a player or a boss. Not understanding, he asked what it was. Ling Si grinned and thought that although it was pretentious, getting the golem to clear his path greatly simplifies things. Soren shockingly exclaimed that it was indeed that guy. The mages asked who might have the guts to take away a crystal from a guy like that. Ling Si, pointing his finger forward, ordered to listen to his orders. He told the golem to go straight into the area with the remaining crystals. After gaining control of the magma golem, Ling Si headed into no man's land. The magma golem and the thunder golem stood opposite each other in a fighting stance. With the help of the magma golem, the thunder elemental golem and the water elemental golem were alternately defeated. The magma golem and the water elemental golem fought each other. The remaining players could only watch helplessly. Using the thief class's close-range burst attacks, Ling Si commandeered the remaining two crystals. Ling Si stands with three elemental crystals floating in the air above his hands. The dialogue box reads, Congratulations on obtaining the fiery flames elemental crystal. Congratulations on obtaining the swirling water elemental crystal. Congratulations on obtaining the thunderous punishment elemental crystal. Ling Si smirked. This was the first time since the launch of the game that all three elemental crystals had been collected by a single player. For the rest of the day, Ling Si would reach new heights, unseen before since the game's launch, on Magical Origin Institute's mission ranking board. On Ling Si's forehead was a purple magician's sigil. This was his undeniable dominance over the other players as a spell thief. Round 2 of the 5-star mission. Ling Si, surrounded by purple electricity, used elemental manifestation Thunderflash, striking the mages surrounding him with it. The dialogue box described elemental manifestation Thunderflash, you will be transformed into lightning and bestow thunderous bolts of judgment from the heavens to surrounding enemies, dealing massive magic damage. 
Round 3 of the 5 Star Mission Ling Si, surrounded by water, used elemental manifestation cover water, encasing the mages around him in water bubbles. The dialogue box described elemental manifestation covert water, you will be transformed into a lethal water fog and bestow blasts from the deep waters upon surrounding enemies, dealing massive magic damage. Round 4 of the 5 Star Mission Ling Si, surrounded by flames, used elemental manifestation burning lava. The dialogue box described elemental manifestation burning lava, you will be transformed into fiery lava and bestow scorching flames on the surrounding enemies, dealing massive magic damage. Round 5 of the 5 Star Mission Lang Si smirked. A dialogue box described elemental spell, a hidden spell granted from gathering the three elemental crystals. Ling Si stands surrounded by three crystals enveloped in electricity, water, and flames. The dialogue box described body of the restless chaos, in the name of heaven and earth, gather the elements of thunder, fire, and water into one body. You will temporarily obtain the body of chaotic elemental power. Within 9 seconds, you can control chaotic elemental power to perform ranged burst attacks and deal massive magic damage. Lang Si hit the fleeing mages with a mixed attack of fire, electricity, and water. At the end of the day, an unprecedented phenomenon occurred at Magical Origin Institute's Mission Ranking Board. People crowded around the Mission Ranking Board. A guy in the crowd asked if something was wrong with the board. Another person asked what happened to today's Ranking Board. They asked why there was only one player on the Ranking Board. On the dialog box, the player with the hidden name came first. It wasn't a mistake, it was just that aside from Ling Si, all the other mages who participated in the task were cornered and hunted down. Ling Si didn't allow anyone to get any points. Today's Magical Institute missions have come to an end. The magicians walked down the wooden stairs. A man walked out of the blue portal. A man in the crowd exclaimed that today's missions had finally come to an end. He said to hurry up and ask people what happened. The guy with blue hair frowned and turned around. Soren, coming out of the portal, fell to his knees and said that they had finally gotten out. The mage with green hair said they had run into a bugged player. Another person said that he was killing everyone indiscriminately. A man in the crowd asked what happened. Soren said that they were finally seeing the light again, and he would finally no longer have to suffer in this endless cycle of being killed. Closing his eyes, he said frustratedly that it was a nightmare. Ling Si, coming out of the portal, famously said hello. He said, what a coincidence. Soren tensely opened his reddened eyes upon hearing his voice. He turned around and the protagonist asked him with a smile why he was kneeling on the floor. Soren, trembling, begged for mercy. He said he would never be so cocky again. Ling Si asked what he was talking about. He reminded him that they had made an e-gamble agreement. The guy with blue hair yelled in surprise to look at what was above the protagonist. Above Ling Si's head was a sign that read, Today's number one. He grinningly told Soren to take off everything he had. A loud scream echoed over the institute. Soren, covering himself with a piece of white cloth and blushing, shouted that he was a bully and wouldn't even let him keep his pants. A mage girl in the crowd, blushing, asked if it was an exhibitionist. Ling Si, holding a staff in his hand, grinned. Raising an eyebrow, he said with a smile that he was a fast runner. He said that his items seemed to be quite expensive. Looking at the dialogue box, Ling Si thought that it was about time for him to get a new gear. Lowering his gaze to his clothes, he thought that he had been using this for quite some time. He thought that if he wanted to forge a set of the best equipment at the moment, it would take a long time. It hit him, and he exclaimed. Looking up, Ling Si thought, how could he have forgotten about this place? He thought that he should visit Bankafis before doing so. He glanced at the Alchemist Emperor's inscription. Ling Si was standing on Casfado Commercial Leasing Street. In front of him was a building with a sign, Alchemist Emperor's Store Number 1. For potions, go to the Alchemist Emperor. Take on any boss you want. The Alchemist Emperor's potions are potions you can trust. The more you buy, the more you save. The neon sign had a simple portrait of Vancafis on it. Lang Si said that it was interesting. Looking up, he wondered if he had come to the right place and if it had really expanded to such a large scale already. The guy behind him exclaimed that it was the most expensive carriage in existence. A luxurious carriage with blue monsters stopped nearby. A man in the crowd said that as far as he could remember, one of those cost at least 300 gold pieces. He asked if anyone could afford one. Another person said that it had to be the alchemist emperor and she was the only one with that much extra money. Yet another person exclaimed about being envious. The foot of the man who had stepped out of the carriage stepped onto the pavement. Bankafis, frowning, said they needed to find the cheapest supply channels. She said that was their top priority. Noticing Ling Si, she stopped and called him boss. People turned around at the protagonist, who awkwardly raised his hand. The guys behind Vankafis exclaimed in surprise that he was the boss. Vankafis shouted that he never read her messages. Raising an eyebrow, Ling Si awkwardly greeted her. There were large blue dialogue boxes around the building. The alchemist emperor's office. Vankafis said that she had written to him a long time ago, but he never replied. 
She said that's why she continued to expand the store based on her own ideas. Sitting on the chair, she said that the fact that he gave her the rights to make decisions on her own was good, otherwise, they would have gotten into trouble. Lang Xi told her to stop calling him boss because she is more like a boss than him. Van Kaffes fussily told him not to misunderstand her. She said her current appearance is only to give her more weight when she negotiates with vendors. Van Kaffes said that when she tried to partner with others, she was looked down upon because of her appearance and had to package herself. She said she even had to learn how to behave properly and everything like that. Wang Xi told her that she didn't need to explain anything because he was joking and he trusted her. He thought about suppliers, negotiation and packaging. He thought that he finally understood and the so-called alchemist Emperor Van Kaffes relied not only on her talent of alchemy, but her genius business acumen. Wang Xi thought that she seems to be running and expanding this potion store as an enterprise and she is impressive. Van Kaffes said she was glad he trusted her. The protagonist asked what the scale of their potion store is at the moment. Van Kaffes said that, along with what she purchased today, they have nine branches. Ling Si turned around and exclaimed in surprise. Van Kaffes said that was correct, and they currently have 50 employees. She said that since this number one store is much bigger, they need more employees, and they will definitely expand in the future. Ling Si awkwardly asked about their daily turnover. Van Kaffes, raising her index finger to her face, said that if market fluctuations are not taken into account, their total turnover from nine branches is 12 gold per day. She said that their total profit is approximately 900 gold, and since some of them are still in the process of development, she is confident that their results will improve soon. Ling Si shockingly thought that with such profits, not considering cases like the five major guilds, they were on par with some of the famous top guilds. Imagining himself bathing in gold coins, he thought that he was set for life. Smiling, he thought that his wealth could now compete with the guilds, and now he too was a tycoon. Blushing, he laughed stupidly. Van Kaffes asked if he was all right. Ling Si, coughing, said that he was fine and it couldn't be better. He asked how much he could use right now. He said he needed to take care of a few things. Van Kaffes, holding the shiny black cards in her hand with a smug smile, said she'd been reporting back to him in private messages, but he'd never responded, so for security reasons she hadn't entered his ID. She said that their total assets equaled about 60,000 gold pieces, however, most of that was used for development and maintenance of the stores. She said that was all she could give him. Demonstrating the black cards in her hand, she said that they were six ID less obsidian gold cards, each with a thousand gold in them. Van Kaffes said that such a card is not tied to the user's identity and can be used for any transaction, leaving no trace of your personal particulars. She said she believes this convenience is what he needs. Van Kaffes told him to take this 6,000 gold for now and let her know if he needed more. She said she would keep the rest safe for him. Ling Si smiled awkwardly and reached out for the cards, wondering why he felt as if he was being kept by a sugar mommy. Smirking, he thought that, in that case, he now had even more confidence in creating a blueprint for his perfect number one. He thought that the development of Alchemist Emperor was far beyond his expectations, and perhaps he should be bolder in the future. Van Kaffes told him to remember next time to make an appointment in advance so she could schedule their meeting. Casfado's Auction House Number 3 People wearing black hoods are standing in a luxurious room with columns. Ling Xi thought that by dressing in the identity-concealing set of auction house outfit, he is ready. He smirked, thinking that it was now much more efficient for him to purchase new equipment at the auction. The huge doors opened. The men found themselves in a dimly lit room. The stage with the auction host was screened off by a steel fence, and there was a large holographic blue screen in the middle of the room. The protagonist thought that Sekfado's auction house number 3 counted as a good-sized auction hall in the human clan. He thought that his number was 33, and he didn't expect that there would be so many people here. Ling Si thought that he had never set foot in such places in his previous life, after all, the entrance fee is as much as 100 gold. He thought that there are many rich people in Heavenland. The clatter of a wooden hammer sounded. A man with glasses and a flashy hairstyle welcomed everyone to auction house number 3. He said that they not only had equipment with excellent attributes, but also all sorts of exotic goods. Ling Si thought that it seems like the people who come to places like this are either guild representatives or whales who have already started throwing around money. He thought that they grab anything valuable and then sell it after the market prices go up, making a profit from the difference. A man in the crowd said he couldn't wait. Another said that it was finally starting. Ling Si thought that some of those wearing masks are people who have good reasons to hide their identity. He thought that some people purposely don't wear masks, probably because they are very confident in their own status. The protagonist thought that usually the auction house holds three auctions a day, the last one being the highlight of the day, and it also has the highest number of visitors. He figured that there would be equipment and skills of all classes, things like scrolls and potions, and, never, there would even be mythic-grade equipment. 
A girl with purple hair and wearing a rabbit costume appeared next to the auction host, holding an orange transparent holographic box in her hand. The auction host announced the start of the auction and began to announce their first item. Wang Si, smiling, thought that he too now counted as an entry-level tycoon. He decided to see what other treasures he would be able to find today besides the equipment exclusive to the thief. The host announced that the first item was an item that could only be equipped at level 30. A green shield appeared above the head of the girl in the rabbit costume. The host said that it was a majestic glass shield, irresistible to all female warriors. He said that while this elegant glass shield doesn't have the best attributes, the chance of it falling out is extremely low and it's a valuable addition to any collection. He said it has such a high potential appreciation value and its design is of an extremely rare very decorative style. The host said the starting bid was 60 silver coins. He swung a wooden mallet and announced the start. The price rose first to 70 and then to 80 silver coins. Ling Si closed his eyes and thought that a level 30 decorative shield should in theory cost approximately 30 silver coins. The host shouted out that someone had offered one gold. Opening his eyes, the protagonist thought that, due to the low chance of falling out in appearance, the price had already jumped to one gold. He thought that if someone decided to resell it, he could probably make a good profit because there were quite a few girls in Heavenland and such decorative shields were actually very popular. Pointing his finger at the person who raised his hand up, the announcer said that this gentleman had offered one gold. After counting to three, he announced that the item was sold and struck the wooden hammer. Looking at the interface, the presenter smilingly congratulated the man for acquiring the majestic glass shield. He said that their staff would contact him after the auction. He announced that it was now the turn of their second item, and it was a very good one. A girl in a bunny suit brought out an item covered with a red cloth. Looking at the audience, the presenter said that it was a very rare skill book. Leng Si thought that such items were also quite popular at the auction, and he remembered hearing about mythic grade skill books appearing for sale in some large scale auctions in his past life. He figured the prices were astronomical, of course. The host took off the cloth, which revealed a red book underneath, and said that it was a skill book for a thief, Bloodthirsty Shadows. Opening his eyes, Leng Si said that it was interesting. The dialogue box described Bloodthirsty Shadows, a thief exclusive skill, transform into multiple afterimages in an instant. Each afterimage will attack the nearest target and absorb 10% of the damage dealt as HP. The player is invulnerable in the afterimage. The protagonist, looking at the dialogue box, thought that this skill is really rare, and this one and a half seconds of invulnerability makes it tempting. He thought that it also had an HP absorption effect, and not only could it save a life at a critical moment, but it was also a strong counterattack skill. The host said about the starting bid of one gold. He told everyone to place their bets. People bid one after another, raising the price of the item to one gold and fifty silver. The person with number eleven raised his hand and said, three gold. The host, pointing his finger at him, shouted out that someone was bidding three gold. It was a guy with elf ears and gray hair. A person in the crowd said about it being people from Abundant Days Consortium. The girl with red hair said that Abundant Days Consortium showed up in Heavenland recently with great fanfare. The guy told her to forget it because he wouldn't try to compete with those finance consortiums. He said that they came with thousands of gold and only big guilds would be able to compete with them. The host yelled out that it was a guest from Abundant Days Consortium and the bet was three gold. He asked if there were any other bids. An elderly man raised his hand and bid four gold. He laughed as he repeated the name of Abundant Days Consortium. This is a representative of the Leap of Change Consortium. The man in the crowd said that it was Leap of Change Consortium, and it turns out they are here too. He said it looks like it's about to get interesting. Another person said that, in terms of capital, Abundant Days Consortium is stronger than Leap of Change. Another person said that this finance consortiums are not here for the game at all, but for the benefits the game can create. He added that he who is rich can speak the loudest. The host shouted out that a representative from Leap of Change Consortium had bid for gold. He asked if there were other bids. The representative of Abundant Days Consortium clucked his tongue irritably. The girl with purple hair told him to forget about it, reminding him that their goal today was that set of equipment. She told him to concede that item to them. The host started counting down. The Leap of Change representative grinned and said that was correct and they should let them have it. The host counted down to two. Ling Si thought about apologizing to the finance consortiums, but this skill book is his. He started to raise his hand when the person in front of him bet five gold. The host announced that the Nebulous Guild had bid five gold. Ling Si opened his eyes in surprise. The person in front of him asked Tiana why she needed this skill book when she wasn't even a thief. Ling Si was surprised to think that it was Tiana. Standing next to Tiana was Coco Lai, folding her arms on her chest. A person in the crowd exclaimed about Nebulous being here as well. Another person said that they must have gotten news of some special item. The main character thought that it looked like Tiana was here from Nebulous. He figured he wasn't expecting that. 
The host announced that Nebulous had offered five gold pieces. Coco Lai raised an eyebrow and told Tiana that that wasn't what they came here for. She told her not to weaken their bid opportunities for later. Tiana said that after seeing that it was a relatively rare skill for a thief, she thought that Ling Si could use it. Coco Lai, smirking, asked her if she had developed feelings for Ling Si. Tiana, blushing, asked what she was talking about. She said that he was part of their guild and leaving good things for their people was natural. Ling Si, looking at the two of them, wondered what they were doing. The man raised his stick and bet 10 gold pieces. The host exclaimed that the representative from Leap of Change had raised the bet to 10 gold. The old man, grinning, said that it was nothing. He told Nebulous not to underestimate them even though they were one of the top five guilds. Coco Lai told Tiana to forget about it and not to forget about the task Stillwaters gave them. She said that they were only here for that set of equipment and they didn't need that. Ling Si placed 50 gold behind them. The host, noting his extravagance, exclaimed that this gentleman had raised the bet to 50 gold. Stepping forward, Ling Si stood next to Tiana. Tiana exclaimed in surprise, seeing Ling Si. The protagonist smilingly thanked her for her good intentions. The old man gritted his teeth and asked where this weirdo came from. He said that he must be crazy since he offered 50 gold pieces. Coco Lai, pointing her finger at the protagonist, asked if he was crazy and why he immediately offered 50 gold. She asked why he was acting so extravagant and if he thought he was a tycoon. Coco Lai told him about how he should raise the price gradually. She asked even if he is rich, is he capable of competing with consortiums? She unhappily clucked her tongue. Lang Si said it was fine, and he took some money with him. He said he just didn't want to waste time. Tiana silently glanced at him. Lang Si smirked and asked if it wasn't nice to just make a bet that others wouldn't want to compete with. He added that he would use it to bring a profit that would exceed 50 gold pieces. The host, after counting to three, struck the wooden hammer and announced that the item had been sold. He congratulated the protagonist on his purchase and said that their staff would contact him after the auction. Coco Lai, closing his eyes, said that he really did get it for 50 gold. He said that it was a reckless spendthrift. Tiana asked him if he also heard the news and came here specifically for this set of equipment. The protagonist replied that the fact that he came here today was just a coincidence. The anchor talked about how their next item is the highlight of the day and when they got it, even they themselves were shocked and delighted. The host announced that it was the highlight of the day. Tiana, Ling Si, and the representatives from Leap of Change and Abundant Days Consortium watched carefully. Frowning, the host announced that it was a level 30 mithril grade equipment set for a thief. They removed the red cloth, and a set of dark purple armor appeared in front of them. The host announced that it was a mithril-grade Black Vipers Scorching Venom. The set of armor glistened in the light, and a dialogue box described Black Vipers Scorching Venom, Grade, Mithril. Class, Thief. Level Requirement, Level 30. Attributes, when equipped, the player's HP capacity will be decreased by 15%. All of the player's attacks will have an added poison effect. In addition, the player will be immune to 45% of the damage dealt by all poison-type attacks. When inflicted with the poison status, the damage dealt by the player will be increased by 30% during the entire duration. The dialog box said, Description, according to the legends, this is the special equipment of Bereaved Scorpion, the legendary thief of the Black Blood Desert who strikes fear in all who hear his name. It has been soaked for countless days in the venom of the deadliest snake of the desert, the Black Sun Viper, then laid in the blazing heat of the relentless desert sun. One has to be prepared to be eaten away by it before putting this on. Only those who can be cruel enough to themselves and their enemies have the right to own it. Ling Si smirked, thinking that he didn't expect there to be mithril-grade equipment in today's auction. Looking forward, he thought that although it wasn't a top-tier mithril-grade item, it was more than enough for now. Looking at the people around him, he thought that it seemed like all these people had come here for him. After all, any mithril-grade equipment at this stage of the game was very rare. Coco Lai told Ling Si that this mithril-grade equipment is what Stillwaters told them to get. She said that they only knew that it would be in the auction because they had gotten the news about it beforehand. Frowning, Coco Lai said that a complete set of equipment like that is hard to find, and they themselves know how valuable a set of good equipment can be. The main character agreed and said that the others were probably thinking the same thing. Coco Lai said that they could let it fall into the hands of others. The host said that he was sure everyone had seen the details of this mithril-grade outfit. He said that, the starting bid was 30 gold and they could place their bids. People raised their hands up, gradually raising the price to 35 gold. The representative of Abundant Days Consortium raised his hand and offered 100 gold. A guy in the crowd said in surprise that they were really very rich. The Leap of Change representative grinned and offered 150 gold. The host shouted out that the Leap of Change representative's bid of 150 gold outbid the Abundant Days Consortium's bid. The old man from Leap of Change stood with his hand up in the air and a smirk on his face. Tiana said that they had started their betting war, and it was only the early stages. Coco Lai raised her hand and offered 300 gold. 
She told them to stop wasting her time and stop trying to sound each other out and show them what they have. The representatives of Abundant Days Consortium looked at her, frowning. The old man from Leap of Change grinned and said that this girl was brazen. He said that they couldn't let others belittle the Leap of Change Consortium. The big man next to him raised his hand and offered 500 gold. The host announced that the Leap of Change Consortium had offered 500 gold. He asked if there were higher offers. A representative from Abundant Days Consortium offered 600 gold. The host waxed on about Abundant Days Consortium offering 600 gold. Chiana, raising her hand, offered 700 gold. Ling Si, standing behind her, smirked and thought about how a woman's desire to buy should not be underestimated. He thought that these two's aura was very different from their usual aura. The representatives of the consortiums and the Nebulous Guild continued to bid, raising the price to 1,000 gold. The people in the crowd were thinking about how rich they were. The host announced that the price had reached 1,000 gold. He asked if there were any higher offers. Raising her hand, the purple-haired girl from Abundant Days Consortium offered 150 gold. The host shouted out that Abundant Days Consortium had offered 150 gold. With a cluck of her tongue, Coco Lai offered 16 o gold and thought to herself that it's such a headache when these rich finance consortiums really get going. The old man from Leap of Change offered 1,700 gold. Gritting his teeth, he thought that it looked like they had come prepared today as well. The girl with purple hair offered 2,000 gold. The host, noting their extravagance, shouted out that Abundant Days Consortium had offered 2,000 gold. The guy with gray hair next to her grinned, thinking that when it came to shopping, women really were ruthless. He wondered if Leap of Change thought they would be able to always suppress them, Abundant Days. He wondered if this set of equipment would be taken by them. The man put his hand on the old man from Leap of Change's shoulder and told him that they had only taken 2,000 gold with them, and they would have to stop there. Scolding, the old man said that they would show them mercy this time. The host started counting down, swinging a wooden hammer. Tiana and Coco Lai said that there was nothing they could do against 2,000 gold. The host counted down to two. The guy with gray hair turned around and said with a smirk that he was glad they knew their place. Ling Si raised up his token with the number 33 on it. He said that he was betting 2,500 gold. The host exclaimed in surprise about the 250 gold. Everyone turned around to look at the protagonist. A guy in the crowd, noticing that it was him again, asked where the rich guy came from. Coco Lai and Tiana looked at him in surprise. Ling Si asked if something was wrong. He asked if there was something wrong with him offering 250 gold. The old man asked about the guy who bought Bloodthirsty Shadows for 50 gold. He assumed that he must be the representative of the financial consortium. The man next to him replied that he hadn't heard anything about there being other financial consortiums. The guy with gray hair asked in surprise who he was and if he was from Nebulous. The girl with purple hair frowned and replied that if he was from Nebulous, they had no need to make bids separately. Tiana asked Ling Si if he was serious and if he knew about offering 25 gold as an individual member. The protagonist replied with a smile that he was aware of it and there was nothing to worry about. The host started to count to two. He was interrupted by a voice offering 3,000 gold. Ling Si turned to the side. The host exclaimed that Abundant Days Consortium had raised the price to 3,000 gold. The girl with purple hair stood there, frowning. Ling Si offered 4,000 gold and the girl glanced in his direction. The protagonist said with a smirk that no matter how much she offered, he would offer more. The people around looked at him in surprise. With a confident face, he offered her to fight to the end. Ling Si nervously thought that it was enough because he didn't have much left. The girl with purple hair unhappily clucked her tongue. The guy with gray hair said shockedly about the tycoon appearing out of nowhere. The host, striking a wooden hammer, announced that the item had been sold for 4,000 gold. In the end, the Black Viper's scorching venom went unreservedly to Ling Si, and it became the most astounding phenomenon of this auction. Ling Si made up a random excuse to hoodwink the others, although Tiana and Coco Lai didn't believe it for a second. Finally, Ling Si was able to put on a set of mithril-grade equipment like he wanted. Right before he had a chance to catch his breath, something unexpected happened. The dialogue box in front of the protagonist read, Important notice, congratulations to player, whose name is hidden, for being the first to reach level 50. The protagonist thought about the fact that someone had indeed already reached level 50. He thought how could he have forgotten about such an important DLC. The dialogue box says, Important notice, the new DLC will be open after today's updates. Dear adventurers, Heavenland's unknown territory is about to be unveiled. You are about to welcome the new era of Heavenland. The beacon towers of the 12 cities will open their doors. All guild players can obtain torch fire by completing the related missions. Light up the beacon towers to seize the cities. Adventurers, the era of contention has come. Frowning, Ling Si thought that after level 50, 
Heavenland was waiting for the oppression of levels to get worse, and the twelve cities were the bringers of a new era, the era of guilds. Thinking about level 50, he thought that perhaps it was time for him to start looking for ways to start climbing the level rankings. Nebulous Guild Lounge The guy said that it had only been three years since the twelve cities DLC was released, but the competition was already heating up. He said that since it will be mission-based, every guild will be able to participate, and every guild will fight for control of the city's beacon towers, and the guild that lights it at the end will get to own the city. Another guy replied that he too has been doing some missions the last few days and has gotten some torch fire, but other guilds are keeping up too. Stillwaters asked Coco Lai if she was still having trouble contacting Ling Si. She replied that he wasn't responding to messages at all and probably didn't even read them. She said they haven't seen or heard from him since the auction. Stillwaters said he sent him a message three days ago before the alert appeared. On the dialogue box a message about Ling Si asking him to give him some time. He said he would respond as soon as he got back and wished him luck with the new update. Stillwaters said that, to be honest, he was happy to see his message at first because it shows that he hasn't forgotten his words. Exhaling, he said that no one knows how long this will last for a while. Coco Lai asked him with a smirk that he was worried about him. Smiling, he said that at the auction, Ling Si exuded the kind of confidence that would definitely make others want to trust him, and she feels like she understands why he chose him. Stillwaters replied with a smile that he never thought he would catch the day when his strict childhood friend would speak well of someone else. Blushing, Coco Lai fussily asked who he called closer than neighbor's childhood friend. Looking away, she said that since he made his decision, she should support him. She called him a fool. Stillwaters said he understood her. He suggested that she hoped he could hurry up with whatever he was busy doing. Closing the book with the title Taking Down Your Childhood Friend, he said that they might still have to rely on him to complete 12 cities. The main character holds a red book in his hand. Standing in front of the bookshelves, he thought, this place hasn't changed at all. Casfado Information Archives Standing among the bookshelves, Lynx he thought that there was almost no one here. He thought that three days ago, when the DLC was officially released, the usually dormant badge of the Glorious had responded. He remembered how the badge of the Glorious on his belt started to glow with a bright yellow light. Ling Si thought that looking for clues should normally be like looking for a needle in a haystack, but this time, the clue had unexpectedly presented itself on a silver saucer. He thought that he had a suspicion that this clue had something to do with one of the cities from the Twelve Cities. Ling Si thought as he thought about it, he had thoroughly researched everything he could find about each of the Twelve Cities, but found nothing, and there was no sign of anything that could activate the quest, yet his gut told him that he was on the right track. Looking at the Badge of the Glorious, the protagonist thought that the unusual activity of the Badge of the Glorious must have something to do with one of the cities. Ling Si, walking past the bookshelves, thought that surely there must be something he had missed. Frowning, he thought that perhaps he could find the answer here. Noticing a silhouette among the bookshelves, Ling Si thought he had found it. Above the head of an old man in white and purple robes, it was written that it was the Information Archive Administrator. As he approached him, the protagonist thought that, as usual, he would have to raise his affinity level with the NPC before he could ask his own questions. He thought that probably not many people knew about this mechanic. Ling Si greeted the administrator and asked if there was anything he could help him with. The administrator asked him if he could help him put those files back on the shelves. The protagonist replied that he would be happy to help him. As he put the books back on the shelves, he thought that helping the old man put the books back on the shelves would activate the inquire function. Looking at the books in front of him while the receptionist happily looked down at him, Ling Si thought that if he wanted to know something in the future, he could come directly to him, and with his reliable information, he would save a lot of time. The dialog box says, you have increased your affinity level with the administrator. You have unlocked the inquire function. Ling Si told the administrator that he had finished cleaning up the files. The administrator thanked him and said that patient people like him are rare these days. The protagonist said that there was something he wanted to know. He asked if there were any files here related to the recently released 12 cities. He added that he would like to read them. As he walked down the stairs, he thought he should use the keyword, inquire, to say what he wanted so that the NPC would respond accordingly. The administrator told him to follow him. With a smirk, Ling Si thought that went well. Ling Si found himself in front of a bookcase with a glass door. The administrator said that these were files related to the 12 cities. The protagonist thanked him. Looking at the book, he said it was just information about the lore and traditions of the 12 cities, some interesting myths and legends, but no significant clues. He said there was nothing here related to the badge of the glorious. He wondered if he was overthinking it. The administrator turned to Ling Si. He asked if he had just said badge of the glorious. The protagonist wondered if badge of the glorious was a special trigger keyword. Ling Si said that it was. He asked if he could tell him anything about it. The administrator asked him if he knew which of the 12 cities was the oldest and most ancient. The silhouette of a headless horseman against the backdrop of a night castle popped up in Ling Si's mind. 
he said that it was Moonlight City, which was ruled by the headless horseman Moonlight lacked. The administrator replied that this was correct, and of the twelve cities, Moonlight City is the one that strikes the most fear into the hearts of all who hear its name. He said that it wasn't just because it was the territory of the headless horseman Moonlight lacked, but also because it was filled with a thick terrifying aura, and people talk about how Moonlight City can only be entered after nightfall. Ling Xi agreed and thought that it was exactly as he said, and of all the twelve cities, Moonlight City's quests were the least popular among players. He thought about the fact that not only was its map incredibly large, but all the missions could only be completed at night due to the terrifying setting. He thought that on top of that, the player would sometimes be chased by a headless horseman. Lang Xi concluded that no one would be willing to accept this city's missions. The administrator asked him if he knew what Moonlight Lack's name was before he became a headless horseman. Lang Xi, apologizing, said that he did not know. He thought about whether there was something like that. Thinking back to the way he read the books, he frowned and thought that he didn't remember coming across anything related to it when he was digging through the files. The administrator said with a serious face that Moonlight Lacked was formerly known as the Glorious Knight. A man in steel armor was riding a black horse. The administrator said that it was the champion of the Glorious One as well as one of the protectors. He said that the Moonlight City they knew used to be known as the Glorious City and the secret of the badge of the Glorious was hidden there. A knight in armor was holding a glowing sword. The administrator said that this was exactly what Moonlight Lacked was protecting. Lang Xi looked at the administrator in surprise. He wondered what was going on. The protagonist thought that the information from this NPC was far superior to what the infoship of the Twelve Cities contained. He was surprised to notice that Badge of the Glorious was responding. Badge of the Glorious began to glow brightly. The bright light was coming out from between the bookshelves. The administrator said that it was time for him, the bearer of the Badge of the Glorious, to conquer the champions of the past once again. In front of the surprised Ling Si, the Badge of the Glorious hung in the air. The administrator told him that his glorious journey had begun. The guy reached out his hand towards the fire and said that he had received 15 torch fire. He asked the others if they had gotten the same amount. Another man said they did, and they together contributed 75 torch fire in total. He replied that they would continue after healing up, and they could do three tasks a day. The guy in red said that went without saying, and the boss had already told them that their top priority at the moment was to scale the torch fire leaderboard. The guy behind him agreed and said it's been three days. He said that although it had just started, they couldn't take it lightly, and the momentum of the five main guilds was too strong. The man in the wizard hat said that, as expected, the number one guild is in first place overall scoring 36,129 torch fire. He said that they overtake the second place guild by 6,000 torch fire. Ruko asked about if they will be participating in this torch fire event. He said it looks interesting. Tilly said they won't, it will bring them little benefit and is not an effective way to spend their time. She said you can tell at a glance that this event is designed for guilds and it doesn't make sense for them to participate. Tilly said that Ling Xi told them to raise their level while he was doing something very important. Looking up she said that from what she heard, the quests vary in difficulty from 1 to 5 stars and solo quests are much harder even with the same difficulty settings. She said that while the reward for a typical team mission is 10 torchfire per participant, the reward for a solo mission of the same level is about 10 times more, making it 100 torchfire. Ruko said with glittering eyes that it would be great if they could trade them for experience. Tilly's replied that it wasn't really surprising and the higher the difficulty, the better the rewards. She said that even if the five main guilds no one does solo quests, due to the probability of failure being too high, so no one does them so they don't waste their time. Ruko said with a smirk that it makes sense. He said with a chuckle that he felt like if it was Ling Si, he'd probably accept the harder five-star solo task that gives the best rewards without blinking an eye. Tilly's responded that it sounds a lot like him. Ruko said he was wondering what he was doing right now. Moolite City, Ling Si is standing in front of a steel fence. He thought it's finally nightfall, and he can't believe that he has to wait for nightfall to accept quests from Moonlight City. The dialog box says, you have accepted a solo quest. Difficulty, 5 star. Reward, 3000 torch fire. Quest requirement, destroy the headless horseman, Moonlight lacked. Remembering the administrator, the protagonist thought about the fact that, of the 12 cities, Moonlight City was the largest and most destroyed, and according to what that old man said, it was formerly known as Glorious City. In front of Ling Si was a large dark castle. He thought that this was really unexpected, and if it wasn't for his connection with the Badge of the Glorious, this city would be no different from the other eleven cities. Ling Si, holding the Badge of the Glorious in his hand, thought that moreover, the moment he stepped into this place, he felt as if the Badge of the Glorious was being beckoned by something because it kept glowing. The Badge of the Glorious in his hand began to fade, and he wondered if perhaps what he was resonating with was the Headless Hunter, the former Glorious Knight. 
The gate in front of the protagonist opened and he ran inside, thinking about what was exciting, and it had been a very long time since he had been looking forward to something so much. Jumping down from the tree, Lynx he found himself next to the building. Looking at the moon, he thought that since he had only come here for command missions in his past life, he didn't feel anything much. The protagonist thought that he didn't expect that coming here alone would give him goosebumps. As he looked back, he pondered, trying to gather his thoughts, and thought that the goal of this quest was to take down the Headless Knight, but the main point was to find clues. There was a raven sitting on the tombstone. Ling Si thought that in order to find the Headless Knight, he must first find its grave, otherwise, considering how fast and mysterious it moves, he would lose it quickly. Above Ling Si's head, ghosts were flying in the air. Looking at them, he thought that in his past life, he was not at the head of the clue search and he was only responsible for dealing damage. Ling Si, swearing, thought that while accepting the task, he had forgotten that he was bad at this sort of thing. The ghost-like man asked the protagonist who he was looking for. Ling Si turned pale and ran aside in fear with a scream. The man asked if he needed help. The protagonist blushed with a surprised face. An ordinary old woman stood in front of him, and Ling Si exhaled and said that it was a person. He thought this scared him. He asked the elderly woman if she had ever heard of a headless horseman. The older woman grabbed him by the shoulders and yelled that it couldn't be said out loud here because it was a cursed name. The girl with gray hair asked her grandmother not to say anything stupid. Grandma asked why she came out. She asked how many times she had told her not to go outside at night because it wasn't safe. She said they already had one foot in the coffin so she didn't care, but she couldn't let anything happen to her again. The girl said with a smile that it was fine and she just walked out the door. She told her that she was worrying too much. The older woman yelled that it wouldn't work that way and told her to go inside. She asked how she would face her father and mother if something happened to her. The girl asked the protagonist if he would mind talking inside them. She said that maybe she could help him with what he just said. Ling Si agreed and said, pardon my intrusion. The full moon was visible through the open window. On the table was a picture of a man and a woman. Ling Si, looking at the photo, thought that this girl looked like these two. The girl said that those were her parents and they had died. Ling Si said he was sorry to hear that. He thought he couldn't believe that they had programmed the answers for this as well, and the artificial intelligence of these NPCs was just something. The girl with a blank stare said that they were killed by a headless horseman. Looking down, she said that her parents were decapitated that night, and all that was left of them was a pair of decapitated bodies. She said it was just her and her grandmother left, and she was getting old, but she still took risks, going outside at night to find wild vegetables, in order to keep them both alive. Remembering the headless horseman with two severed heads in his hand, the girl said that in the last two years, the headless horseman has beheaded about a hundred people in their village. She said that everyone knows that the headless horseman, Moonlight Lacked, went crazy looking for his own head. Ling Si asked how many villages like them there were in Moonlight City, and if the same thing happened to all of them. The girl, gritting her teeth, replied that their village was the only one here, and the only other settlement was the big city above. She said that they were the only ones being chased by the headless horsemen, and besides the people who disappeared and those who escaped, the only people left in the village were the weak and old. Ling Si, frowning, wondered why they were the only ones being haunted. The protagonist thought that all these things he had never heard in his past life, and it seems like he needs to treat this as a completely new assignment. He figured that the assignment about Badge of the Glorious would probably not be an easy one. The girl said she had heard some of the elders say that the mayor of the upper city seemed to have made some sort of secret agreement with the headless horseman. The image of the mayor popped up in her mind, and she said that she had always had suspicions that this mayor of the city was the reason for their unfortunate fate. Ling Si closed his eyes and thought about the headless horseman and the mayor of the city. It hit him and he opened his eyes. Standing up from his seat, he asked about what she meant. He thought it was an event flag trigger. The girl said that was correct, and she suspected it was him. Frowning, the girl shouted that she thought he was the one with the head of the headless horseman. The dialogue box says, Congratulations on activating the hidden prologue mission, Trails to the Path of Glory, Chapter Headless Rider. For the sake of revealing the secret of the headless rider, follow the young lady to meet with the town mayor. Proof of glory overall progression, 5%. The badge of the glorious glowed yellow. A dead man's head emerged from the ground. Ling Si stood frowning with the badge of the glorious in his hand. The girl, frowning, said that she was ready to show him the way to the upper city because she must make him pay for what he had done. At the foot of the cliff stood a stone building. Ling Si and the girl stood behind a tree. There were two silhouettes in front of the building. Looking at the men in armor, the girl said that they were the mayor's personal guards, and she had heard that they were all strong warriors. The protagonist asked her if they were going to force their way in, or if she had a better idea. The girl, apologizing, said that she didn't have a good goes how to get through them. She said with a sad face that she was too reckless and forgot that there were guards here. Ling Si turned around, noticing something. Peeking out from behind a tree, he said that a guard was walking towards them. 
The girl worriedly asked what they should do. Ling Xi frowned and thought that since the NPC who brought him here didn't have any better ideas, he would just force his way through by force. Ling Xi stood in front of the guard, saying hello. The guard asked who was here. He said that this was the mayor's residence. The guard had a level 30 view above his head, and as he swung his spear, he said that he seemed to have his eyes just for beauty. He said not to blame them for being rude. The guard struck with his spear, and Ling Xi dodged and said that it was very nice of him to show him his health scale. Smirking, he said that if he didn't show it, he would be wondering if he had mistakenly attacked a neutral NPC. Ling Xi struck with his dagger using throat slasher, and the guards blocked the blow using combined skill chain guard. The protagonist, standing in a cloud of dust, noted from the strong defense and said that it looked like such an attack wouldn't do anything against them. Shrouded in purple electricity, he used elemental manifestation thunder flash and told them to try it. He struck the guards with lightning and they were enveloped in purple electricity. The guards shrouded in electricity fell to the ground. The girl said that it was incredible. Ling Xi said that the physical attacks didn't work, but he was willing to bet that they didn't expect him to be a mage as well. The girl in the maid costume said that they seemed to have gotten through their defenses. Waving her hands, the maid said that they were allowed to enter. Ling Xi thought that she might have just invited them inside earlier, or that was also part of the mission. The protagonist found himself inside a luxurious building with stone columns. The mayor was cutting a steak on his plate with a knife. Holding a glass in his hand, he asked about the fact that he had heard that someone was looking for him. The maid said that was correct and an adventurer from a foreign land was asking to see him. The mayor asked what he wanted. The mayor laughed and said it was a good joke. He asked with a smile what this ruthless killing machine could have in common with him. Ling Xi asked why then the headless horseman only attacks the village below, while the town directly above them remains untouched. The mayor, interrupting him, asked about the fact that he wanted to know why his town remained safe. Ling Xi answered in the affirmative and thought that, in any case, he needed to continue using the keyword headless horseman. The mayor, grinning, said that it was expected from an outsider. Glancing at Ling Xi, he asked him about what he didn't know about the dark forest behind Moonlight City. The girl opened her eyes in surprise upon hearing about the dark forest. The protagonist asked what kind of place it was. The girl lowered her eyes and said that there is a forest behind Moonlight City and because of the curse, all the trees in it died. She said that people called it the dark forest because of fear, and it was a forbidden place where no one dared to set foot. The mayor said that, also, the dark forest is where the headless horseman is buried. Ling Xi thought in surprise that this is completely outside the lore of the Twelve Cities, and the original Moonlight City that he knows had nothing like the Dark Forest. The mayor said that the reason his city remains untouched by the Headless Horseman's rampage is because he found a death witch in the Dark Forest. He touched his eye with his hand with a sinister smirk. The mayor said that it was this omniscient freak who told him how to avoid such a disaster. He pulled his eye out of the eye socket. Ling Xi and the girl looked at him in surprise, and the mayor said that he too had paid the price for this knowledge. With a crazy smile showing them his eyeball, he said that he knew that there were rumors that he had hidden the head of a headless horseman in his place and was using it as a leverage. The mayor said there are too many such rumors and he has been used to them for a long time. Ling Xi asked where in the dark forest he could find the death witch. The mayor told him to go towards the moon and she would be right under the moonlight. Ling Xi and the girl found themselves in the dark forest surrounded by dead trees. The protagonist thought about how he knew it was a game, but this atmosphere was weighing on him. He told the girl that it was her own insistence to go with him, and if she didn't regret it yet, she could go with him. A dialog box indicated that he had accepted the NPC's request to go with him. They continued to make their way through the dark forest. The girl hurt her leg and bruises were visible on it. Ling Xi jumped forward, placing her on his back. The dialog box read, You have chosen to not abandon the NPC and carry on with her on your back. Standing in front of a house shrouded in tree roots, Ling Xi asked about the fact that this must be the place. He said that the style was exactly what one would expect from a witch's dwelling. The protagonist asked if they should knock. The door opened and a voice asked if they came looking for answers. Ling Xi and the girl looked at the door in surprise. The witch, taking a skull in her hand with green fire coming from her eyes, said that they should offer their tribute first. Dressed in a green robe, she said that then they would have the right to go inside. The witch with an evil smile pointed her finger at the protagonist and said that she needed one left hand. The dialog box says, the witch of death asks for your left hand. Do you accept her request? If you do, hand over your left hand and gain entry into the house. If you refuse, you will fail this mission permanently. Note, if you agree, you will lose your left hand forever. You will never be able to perform all actions and maneuvers that require your left hand. Looking at the dialog box in surprise, Ling Xi asked if this is for real. There were bats flying among the dead trees. There were two choices on the dialog box, agree or refuse. Ling Xi thought about the fact that he could only continue the task by agreeing but then he would lose his left arm forever and refusing would result in instant failure. 
He thought that he knew that the badge of the glorious task wouldn't be easy, but this was just crazy. Frowning, Ling Xi thought that the price would be the loss of his left arm, and isn't that one of the permanent curses? He thought that in Heavenland, it sometimes happened that players would trigger various debuffs known as permanent curses. He figured it was a permanent kind of debuff, meaning it would be permanently attached to the player. Ling Xi, frowning even harder, thought that permanent curses came in all sorts of shapes and forms, and in his past life, he had heard that there was one player who had accidentally triggered a permanent curse from a treasure chest and could never wear chest armor again. He thought that being a warrior, this was fatal to him and he had no choice but to create a new account and start over. Looking at his arm, he wondered if he would give up his left arm forever or if it would be restored once the task was completed. Gritting his teeth, he thought that if it could be restored, there would be some clue about it. Glancing at his hand again, the protagonist thought about the fact that the title of Glorious One would give him even greater power. The witch, pointing her finger at him, said that the requirement for entry was one left hand. She asked if he had made up his mind. Ling Si shouted that he would try, hitting the dialogue box with his hand. The witch grinned, frowning and gritting his teeth. The protagonist said that if he couldn't recover it, he would just have to learn his one-handed dagger technique. The dialogue box says, you have agreed to give up your left hand. You will lose your left hand forever. A scythe appeared in the witch's hand, and raising it above his head, she laughed and said that she would take his left arm. Ling Si tensed up, clenching his teeth. The witch struck the scythe with force. The protagonist opened his eyes and was surprised to see that a girl with a severed arm was standing in front of him. The girl's hand flew into the air. Ling Si shockedly asked why. Ling Si, looking at her, wondered what was going on. He thought about how she really helped him, and wasn't she just an NPC? The witch laughed and said that it was fine as long as it was a left-handed person, and any left-handed person would be fine with her. With a smirk, she told them that they had fulfilled the requirement. The dialogue box says, The maiden you've been taking care of the entire way here has taken the initiative to sacrifice her left hand to help pave the way for your path to glory. And so, you have completed the exchange with the witch without the loss of your left hand. Ling Si worriedly stood beside the girl with the severed hand. The witch told them to come in and said she would answer their questions. The girl told the protagonist that he couldn't lose his left hand. She said she was sure he had a greater purpose ahead of him. The protagonist thought that because of his protection and care, this NPC offered his left arm instead of him, and that must have been how the scenario was intended. The girl, looking at the protagonist with weakened eyes, asked him to keep going forward and uncover the secret of the headless horseman at any cost. She said that only then would her parents and all the villagers be able to rest in peace. Ling Si, after thanking her, promised her that he would get to the bottom of this. He told her to rest for now. The witch called the protagonist inside. There were skulls, candles, and bottles on shelves covered in cobwebs. Ling Si, standing at the entrance, said that it was quite an uncomfortable sight. Standing next to the cauldron, said that he could ask three questions. Ling Si, thinking about it, thought that he had expected that he could only ask one question. He said he would ask his first question. The protagonist, remembering the mayor, asked what method the mayor used to save his city from being killed by the headless horseman. The witch said she told him what the headless horseman feared most. She said that he had two questions left. Ling Si, frowning, thought that this was succinct, and he really doesn't want to waste another question to find out what the headless horseman fears the most, but it seems like the mayor is using this against him. He thought that many things in this assignment were different from what he had seen in his previous life. Ling Si asked where the head of the headless horseman's head was located. He thought that, taking the headless horseman's grave as an example. The protagonist thought that in his past life, it was in the depths of Moonlight City, and the player only had to fight to get there and engage in battle with the headless horseman. He thought that they were rewarded with a large amount of torch fire for winning. Ling Si frowned and thought that now even the location of the tomb had changed, and it was no longer in the depths of the city, but somewhere in this previously unheard of dark forest. The witch asked, the head. Ling Si asked where the head of the headless horseman's head was located. He thought that, after following the trail of clues, he is sure that the head is the key to solving this mystery, and he must find it. The witch turned around and said that there was no such thing inside Moonlight City. Ling Si asked in surprise about it not being there. The girl appeared in the doorway and shouted about how it was impossible and she was lying. She said that the headless horseman started his series of murders precisely because he is looking for his head and it can't be that it doesn't exist. Crying, the girl asked about what her parents had died for in that case. Grinning, the witch asked about them questioning her answer. She said that they had one last question left. Ling Si thought that he should get straight to the point. The girl behind him stood trembling. Frowning, the protagonist asked where exactly in the dark forest was the headless horseman's grave. The witch was silent for a moment. She pointed with her index finger and said that the headless horseman's grave, moonlight lacked, was beyond this path. There was a dark stone passage in front of it. The witch said, through the tunnel, beneath the glorious moon. Ling Si and the girl found themselves in front of a tomb illuminated by moonlight. There were many flowers around it. 
Ling Xi tensely thought that the headless horseman's grave was drastically different from the one he had seen in his past life. Ling Xi and the girl noticed something. In the sky in front of them was a horse made of dark energy. The grave began to glow with a bright blue light, and the girl said to look at the grave. The tombstone that the dark energy horse was standing over had fallen apart. Jumping out of the grave, the man in armor landed on the horse. A level 40 headless horseman appeared in front of the protagonist. Flower petals flew in the air, illuminated by the full moon. Two daggers appeared in Ling Xia's hands, and after noticing that the boss in front of him was a level 40 boss at feudal lord rank, he said that they really weren't making things easy for him. The headless horseman's sword in front of him was shrouded in blue energy. The headless horseman pointed his sword at him, and Ling Xi wondered if he was just going to attack him. He wondered if that was it, and if all he had to do was defeat him. Frowning, the protagonist thought that he had no other choice, and could only attack him head on. He wondered if the strategies from his past life would work. The headless horseman rushed to attack, and the protagonist yelled to the girl to hide in a safe place. The headless horseman hit the ground, knocking Ling Xi back. Using backstab, the protagonist, shrouded in yellow electricity, was behind the enemy. He struck with his dagger, and the headless rider blocked the blow with his sword. Ling Si, frowning, wondered what kind of recovery speed this was. He thought that things were clearly different from his past life. With a swing of his sword, the headless rider struck Ling Si. The protagonist in front of him turned into a purple evil spirit. Ling Si used evil spirit's invisibility and as he looked at the headless horseman surrounded by the purple evil spirit, he thought about how he was huge but also very agile. He thought that he was glad he had used evil spirits and visibility beforehand. Shrouded in purple energy, Ling Si used flow and thought that it looked like he had quite a problematic opponent. The headless horseman and the protagonist headed towards each other. The horse kicked the ground with its hooves. The headless horseman used trample of lamentation, breaking the ground, from which many blue little ghosts flew out. Ling Si thought about how incredible its strength was. He thought that it felt like the strength of a pile driver. The protagonist landed in front of the headless horseman. The headless horseman used Knight of the Gathering Souls and his horse hit the ground with its hooves. Ling Xi thought that he even had such a move. He thought that he wouldn't be able to defeat it with ordinary strategies. Raising his dagger up, the protagonist used Dominion of the Mercenary and three spectral warriors appeared from the ground around him. Ling Xi rushed towards the headless horseman, who was surrounded by his spectral warriors. With the strikes of his daggers, the protagonist sliced the spectral warrior of the headless horseman in half. With a swing of his dagger, he struck another spectral warrior. Smirking, he thanked him for giving him the opportunity to get free stacks. Shrouded in purple electricity, the protagonist used elemental manifestation Thunder Flash and Throat Slasher. Cutting the spectral warrior in half, Ling Xi shouted at him to get shredded by his thunderous judgment. The headless horseman swung his glowing sword. He used Moonlight Cleaver, and a stream of light shrouded in blue electricity headed towards the ground, destroying the spectral warriors. There was an explosion, a bright blue flash illuminating everything around him. Dust shrouded in purple electricity scattered above the ground. Ling Si, gritting his teeth, said that it wasn't bad. Above his head, he could see that he had less than half of his health scale left. Pushing off from the ground, he rushed forward, enveloped in purple electricity. The headless horseman noticed him in surprise. Running along the trunk of a tree, Ling Si leaped upwards. Standing in front of the full moon in the air, surrounded by fire, electricity and water, he said that he was not the only one who knew how to compliment the moon. Frowning, he said it was his turn. Ling Si used spell thief combination skill, vessel of the restless chaos and bloodthirsty shadows, and a stream of yellow, purple and red energy was directed towards the headless horseman. There was an explosion on the ground. The girl looked forward in surprise, and a huge cloud of dust rose up in front of her. A dialogue box described bloodthirsty shadows, a thief exclusive skill. Transform into multiple afterimages in an instant. Each afterimage will attack the nearest target and absorb 10% of the damage dealt as HP. The player is invulnerable in the afterimage state. This effect will last for 1.5 seconds. The headless horseman scattered, and Ling Si asked him about the impressive damage. A dialogue box congratulated the protagonist for defeating the headless horseman, Moonlight Lacked. The protagonist was surprised to notice that his badge of the glorious began to glow with a bright yellow light. He looked in front of him in surprise. Ling Si asked why it was coming back to life. The headless horseman began to recover from the blue shards it had just crumbled into. The headless horseman told the protagonist that the light of glory was shining within him. Ling Si opened his mouth in surprise. The headless horseman calmly looked at him. Stabbing his sword into the ground, the headless horseman knelt down on one knee and said that it was him, his honorable master. The dialogue box read, Mission updated. The guardian, Moonlight Knight, the headless rider, recognizes you as his master. Please restore him to his original form. Find a way to help the headless rider recover his original identity. Badge of the glorious overall progression, 15%. 
Ling Si exclaimed in surprise at being his master. Looking at the knight bowing before him, he thought that this was what the headless rider, Moonlight lacked, was like when he was a knight. The girl approached the protagonist, noticing that he had taken the form of a knight, and asked about the fact that he was now his master. Ling Si said it looked like it. A yellow energy surrounded the protagonist. Ling Si thought in surprise at what an incredible amount of experience this was, and he immediately reached level 40. A dialogue box announced that he had reached level 40. The protagonist, surrounded by a glow, wondered if it was because the quest was related to the Badge of the Glorious. He thought it was a special quest that gave an incredible amount of experience. The full moon shone over the headless horseman. Ling Si, noticing that the knight's image had disappeared, thought that it seems that being recognized as his master is the way needed to return the headless knight to its original state. The headless horseman told the protagonist that he needed to find his head. Ling Si was surprised to notice that he had spoken. He wondered if it was because he had defeated him. The headless horseman, standing in front of the protagonist, told him that the glory he bestowed upon him in the past was buried along with his head and long forgotten in the sands of time. He said that his head was stolen by someone with evil intentions and hidden in another territory. Ling Si wondered if that meant it was in another map. Remembering the witch, he thought that was why the witch said that there was no such thing here. The protagonist thought it was because the head wasn't anywhere on this map. The headless horseman replied that that was correct and she was not in Moonlight City. He said that before he met him, losing his head caused him to lose his rationality as well. The headless horseman remembered his kills and said that he had killed indiscriminately in his mad hunt for his lost head, and looking back, the mayor's words that he knew where his head was were just lies. Ling Si thought that this must have been the weakness of the headless horseman that the mayor had learned about from the witch. The protagonist, frowning, thought that this must have been what the mayor used to make a deal with the headless horseman. Stabbing his sword into the ground, the headless horseman said let the world be bathed in the light of glory once more. He asked him to release his great brilliance once more. Bowing down on one knee, he said he vows to follow him on his journey. The dialogue box says, you have learned a special summoning phrase. Congratulations on obtaining the right to summon the headless rider, Moonlight lacked. Leng Si looked at the horse in the air, shrouded in blue energy. He thought about how the fact that he summoned his master and it gave him the right to summon it. The dialogue box read, you have obtained a mount summoning whistle. Congratulations on obtaining the right to summon the spectral horse. A white whistle appeared in the main character's hand. He thought that it was a mount function, and in his past life, mounts had appeared in another DLC update. Ling Si, looking at the dialogue box in surprise, thought about whether he was the only player in the entire game now who had a mount. He pressed the summon button, and a horse clad in steel armor appeared in front of him. Ling Si exclaimed at how cool this was. The headless horseman told him that they had no time and must go to the other eleven cities in search of his missing head. Standing under the full moon, he said that once he regained his identity and regained his former powers, he could be there to protect him. People near the huge screen said about Nebulus's torchfire count suddenly increasing by 3,000. Another asked in surprise if it was because of the quest. On the screen was a notification and receipt of 3,000 torch fire from an anonymous player. The guy in the helmet asked what city this reward was from. He said their team missions didn't give them more than 100 torch fire. The guy with the blue hair replied that it was probably a very difficult mission, but he didn't believe a mission with that kind of reward could be done alone. He started talking about how there was still a lot they didn't know about the 12 cities. The guy in the helmet turned around and told him to look. The guy with blue hair turned around and asked what was wrong. In front of them was Ling Si on a blue ghostly horse. The guy in the crowd exclaimed that this was very cool. Ling Si thought about the fact that there was a main road leading through all 11 other cities. He thought that since he didn't know where the head was, he would have to search each of them one by one. Determinedly looking ahead, the protagonist thought that along the way he could also take on some solo quests to earn some torch fire for Nebulus, however, it was best to stand out as little as possible. Riding forward on his horse, Ling Si thought about the fact that he was heading to 11 cities. A guy in the crowd asked if there were any mounts at all in this game. The guy in the helmet said he was seeing things. He asked if they were dreaming too. For the next few days, Ling Si searched for the headless horseman's head, taking the most challenging solo quests in different cities along the way. These days were also when the legends of Ling Si were born. Players made theories about whether the creature that appeared after the release of 12 cities was a player or an NPC. He rides a spectral warhorse, accompanied by an intimidating knight who towers over them. However, his movements are shrouded in mystery, and there have been numerous instances where players have spotted him from a distance, only to have him vaporize in the next instant. This continued until Ling Si finally found the headless horseman's head in the ninth city. On the ground lay a purple monster. Ling Si, standing with his back to the headless horseman, opened the chest from which a bright blue light sparkled out. Holding the head in his hands, he told the headless horseman that they had finally found its head. 
Holding out the headless rider's head, the protagonist told him that it had been hard and they had been searching for it for many days. The headless horseman bowed down on one knee and said that he was extremely grateful to him, and with this he could finally regain his identity and strength. The head joined the headless horseman's body. The dialogue box says, the headless rider has regained his missing head. He shall restore his glorious entity as the Moonlight Knight and regain his massive power. Lang Xi stared at the light coming from Moonlight Knight's head. The knight stood in front of him directly with a sword in his hand, surrounded by blue energy. The dialogue box said, mission updated. The guardian, Moonlight Knight, has returned. Congratulations on restoring Lack's identity. You are now one step closer to the status of the Glorious One. You may summon the powerful guardian, Moonlight Lact. The protagonist, smiling nervously, thought that the rewards from Badge of the Glorious were incredible and he wondered if the rewards would get even better. The dialogue box says, in addition, the spectral horse mount will now be your permanent mount. Please continue to search for more clues and find the past guardians. The path of glory continues. Badge of the Glorious overall progression, 20%. You are currently ahead of the other two candidates, Ling Si smirked, thinking that he was finally starting to realize why there were some players in his past life who had become so inconceivably strong. Keeping his hands in his pants pockets, he thought that perhaps they were just like him now and had also accidentally discovered extraordinary quests. Frowning, the protagonist thought that he needed to keep in mind that he was only one of the three who had been chosen. The dialogue box says, congratulations on player with hidden info for obtaining Heavenland's very first mount. The mount function shall be implemented in the next update, along with the mount ranking board. Adventurers, go forth and seek your very own mount. A guy in the crowd exclaimed that this god-tier player triggered the mount function. Another person exclaimed that they were finally releasing the mount function. Another person said that he had been waiting for this and he had to find a mount to get on the mount ranking board. He said that he couldn't wait for the next update. Ling Si in the real world, folded his arms on his chest and smilingly thought that now that the game was being updated, he could finally visit the school. On top of the school building, white clouds floated across the blue sky. Ling Si, looking out the window, thought that the birds outside the window have a lot of freedom. The protagonist thought that he couldn't wait for school to be over. He thought what the old man would cook for dinner tonight. Ling Si thought it would be great if there was fried chicken. The man whispered to Tang Ki that lessons were almost over and they should teach him a lesson this time. Tang Ki said with a smirk that they should repay him for everything he had done. Grinning, he said he asked his cousin to come over. The guy replied that he didn't expect anything less from his boss. Tang Ki said his cousin awakened. An expensive red car stopped. Tang Ki said that he is also the handler for this district. Grinning evilly, he said that he had just talked to him over the phone. The man got out of the car and Tang Ki said that he was waiting for Ling Si outside the school gate right now. A large man with dark short hair and a cigarette in his mouth stood next to the car.